the black water nipping at her thrashing heels was freezing. Not the bite of winter chill, or even the burn of solid ice, but something colder. Deeper. The cold of the gaps between stars, the cold of a world before light. The cold of hell, true hell, she realized as she bucked against the strong hands trying to shove her into that cauldron. True hell, because that was Elaine lying on the stone floor with the red-haired, one-eyed fey male hovering over her. Because those were pointed ears poking through her sister's sodden gold-brown hair, and an immortal glow radiating from Elaine's fair skin. True hell, worse than the inky depths mere inches from her toes. Put her under, the hard-faced fey king ordered. And the sound of that voice, the voice of the male who had done this to Elaine. She knew she was going into the cauldron. Knew she would lose this fight. Knew no one was coming to save her, not sobbing Faya, not Faya's gagged former lover, not her devastated new mate. Not Cassian, broken and bleeding on the floor. The warrior was still trying to rise on trembling arms. To reach her. The king of Hyben, he had done this. To Elaine. To Cassian and to her. The icy water bit into the soles of her feet. It was a kiss of venom, a death so permanent that every inch of her roared in defiance. She was going in, but she would not go gently. The water gripped her ankles with phantom talons, tugging her down. She twisted, wrenching her arm free from the guard who held it. And Nesta Archeron pointed. One finger, at the king of Hyben. A death promise. A target marked. Hands shoved her into the water's waiting claws. Nesta laughed at the fear that crept into the king's eyes just before the water devoured her whole. In the beginning. And in the end. There was darkness. And nothing more. She did not feel the cold as she sank into a sea that had no bottom, no horizon, no surface but she felt the burning. Immortality was not a serene youth. It was fire. It was molten or poured into her veins, boiling her human blood until it was nothing but steam, forging her brittle bones until they were fresh steel. And when she opened her mouth to scream, when the pain ripped her very self in two, there was no sound. There was nothing in this place but darkness and agony and power. They would pay. All of them. Starting with this cauldron. Starting now. She tore into the darkness with talons and teeth. Rent and cleaved and shredded. And the dark eternity around her shuddered. Bucked. Thrashed. She laughed as it recoiled. Laughed around the mouthful of raw power she ripped out and swallowed whole. Laughed at the fistfuls of eternity she shoved into her heart her veins. The cauldron struggled like a bird under a cat's paw. She refused to relent. Everything it had stolen from her, from Elaine, she would take from it. Wrapped in black eternity, Nesta and the cauldron twined, burning through the darkness like a newborn star. Part 1 Novice Chapter 1 Cassian raised his fist to the green door in the dim hallway and hesitated. He'd cut down more enemies than he cared to tally, had stood knee-deep in gore on countless battlefields and kept swinging, had made choices that cost him the lives of skilled warriors, had been a general and a grunt and an assassin, and yet, here he was, lowering his fist. Balking. The building on the north side of the Sidra River was in need of new paint. And new floors, if the creaking boards beneath his boots as he'd climbed the two flights had been any indication. But at least it was clean. Definitely grim by Valaris's standards, but when the city itself had no slums, that wasn't saying much. He'd seen and stayed in far worse. He'd never understood, though, why Nesta insisted on dwelling here. He got why she wouldn't take up rooms in the House of Wind it was too far from the city, and she couldn't fly or winnow in which meant dealing with the ten thousand steps up and down. But why live in this dump, 
when the townhouse was sitting empty. Since construction had finished on Faya and Reese's sprawling home on the river, the townhouse had been left open to any of their friends who needed or wanted it. He knew for a fact that Faya had offered Nestor a room there and had been rejected. He frowned at the door's peeling paint. No sounds trickled through the sizable gap between the door and the floor, wide enough for even the fattest of rats to meander through, no fresh scents lingered in the cramped hallway. Maybe he'd get lucky and she'd be out, perhaps sleeping under the bar of whatever seedy tavern she'd frequented last night. Though that might be worse, since he'd need to track her down there instead. Cassian lifted his fist again, the red of his siphon flickering in the ancient phalites tucked into the ceiling. Coward. Grow some damned balls. Cassian knocked once. Twice. Silence. Cassian almost sighed his relief aloud. Thank the fucking mother. Clipped, precise footsteps sounded from the other side of the door. Each more pissed off than the last. He tucked his wings in tight, squaring his shoulders as he braced his feet apart. A traditional fighting stance, beaten into him during his training years, now mere muscle memory. He didn't dare consider why the sound of those footsteps sent his body falling into it. The snap as she unlatched each of her four locks might as well have been the beating of a war drum. Cassian ran through the list of things he was to say, how Faya had suggested he say them. The door was yanked open, the knob twisting so hard Cassian wondered if she was imagining it as his neck. Nesta Arkheron already wore a scowl. But there she was. She looked like hell. What do you want? She didn't open the door wider than a hand's breadth. When had he last seen her? The end of summer party on that barge in the Sidra last month. She hadn't looked this bad. Though he supposed a night trying to drown oneself in wine and liquor never left anyone looking particularly good the next morning. Especially at. It's seven in the morning, she went on, raking him over with that grey-blue stare that always kindled his temper. She wore a male's shirt. Worse, she wore only a male's shirt. Cassian propped a hand on the door jam and gave her a half grin he knew brought out her claws. Rough night? Rough year, really. Her beautiful face was pale, far thinner than it had been before the war with Hyben, her lips bloodless, and those eyes. Cold and sharp, like a winter morning in the mountains. No joy, no laughter, in any plane of it. Of her. She made to shut the door on his hand. He shoved a booted foot into the gap before she could break his fingers. Her nostrils flared slightly. Faya wants you at the house. Which one? Nesta said, frowning at the foot he'd wedged in the door. She has five. He bit back his retort. This wasn't the battlefield and he wasn't her opponent. His job was to transport her to the assigned spot. And then pray that the lovely home Faya and Reese had just moved into wouldn't be reduced to rubble. The new one. Why didn't my sister fetch me herself? He knew that suspicious gleam in her eye, the slight stiffening of her back. His own instincts surged to meet her defiance, to push and push and discover what might happen. Since winter solstice, they'd exchanged only a handful of words. Most had been at the barge party last month. They'd consisted of Move. Hello, NES. Move. Gladly. After months and months of nothing, of barely seeing her at all, that had been it. He hadn't even understood why she'd shown up to the party, especially when she knew she'd be stuck on the water with them for hours. Amran likely deserved the credit for the rare appearance, due to whatever bit of sway the female held over Nesta. But by the end of that night, Nesta had been at the front of the line to get off the boat, arms tight around herself, and Amran had been brooding at the other end of it, nearly shaking with rage and disgust. No one had asked what had happened between them, not even Faya. The boat had docked, and Nesta had practically run off, and no one had spoken to her since. Until today.
Until this conversation, which felt like the longest they'd had since the battles against Hyben. Cassian said at last, Feya is high lady. She's busy running the night court. Nesta cocked her head, gold brown hair sliding over a bony shoulder. On anyone else, the movement would have been contemplative. On her, it was the warning of a predator, sizing up prey. And my sister, she said in that flat voice that refused to yield any sign of emotion, deemed my immediate presence necessary. She knew you'd likely need to clean yourself up, and wanted to give you a head start. You're expected at nine. He waited for the explosion as she did the math. Her eyes flared. Do I look like I need two hours to become presentable? He took the invitation to survey her, long bare legs, an elegant sweep of hips, tapered waist too damn thin and full, inviting breasts that were at odds with the new, sharp angles of her body. On any other female, those magnificent breasts might have been enough cause for him to begin courting her the moment he met her. But from the instant he'd met Nesta, the cold fire in her eyes had been a temptation of a different sort. And now that she was high fey, all inherent dominance and aggression and piss-poor attitude he avoided her as much as possible. Especially with what had happened during and after the war against Hyben. She'd made her feelings about him more than clear. Cassian said at last, you look like you could use a few big meals, a bath, and some real clothes. Nesta rolled her eyes, but fingered the hem of her shirt. Cassian added, kick out the sorry bastard, get washed, and I'll bring you some tea. Her brows rose a fraction of an inch. He gave her a crooked smile. You think I can't hear that male in your bedroom, trying to quietly put on his clothes and sneak out the window? As if in answer, a muffled thud came from the bedroom. Nesta hissed. I'll be back in an hour to see how things are proceeding. Cassian put enough bite behind the words that his soldiers would know not to push him, they'd remember that he required seven siphons to keep his magic under control for good reason. But Nesta did not fly in his legions, did not fight under his command, and certainly did not seem to recall that he was over 500 years old and... Don't bother. I'll be there on time. He pushed off the door jam, wings flaring slightly as he backed away a few steps. That's not what I was asked to do. I'm to see you from door to door. Her face tightened. Go perch on a chimney. He sketched a bow, not daring to take his eyes off her. She'd emerged from the cauldron with, gifts. Considerable gifts, dark ones but no one had seen nor felt any sign of them since that last battle with Hyben, since Amran had shattered the cauldron and Feyre and Rhys had managed to heal it. Elaine, too, had revealed no indication of her seer's abilities since then. But if Nesta's power remained, still capable of leveling battlefields, Cassian knew better than to make himself vulnerable to another predator. Do you want your tea with milk or lemon? She slammed the door in his face then locked each of those four locks. Whistling to himself and wondering if that poor bastard inside the apartment would indeed flee out the window, mostly to escape her, Cassian strode down the dim hallway and went to find some food. He'd need the sustenance today. Especially once Nesta learned precisely why her sister had summoned her. Nesta Arkheron didn't know the name of the male in her apartment. She ransacked her wine-soaked memory as she returned to the bedroom, dodging piles of books and lumps of clothing, recalling heated glances at the tavern, the wet, hot meeting of their mouths, the sweat coating her as she rode him until pleasure and drink sent her into blessed oblivion, but not his name. The male had already leaned out the window, with Cassian no doubt lurking on the street below to witness his spectacularly pathetic exit, when Nesta reached the dim, cramped bedroom. The brass poster bed was rumpled, the sheets half spilled on the creaky, uneven wood floor, and the cracked window banged against the wall on its loose hinges. The male twisted toward her. He was handsome, in the way most high fey males were handsome. A bit thinner than she liked them, practically a boy compared to the towering mass of muscle that had just filled her doorway. He winced as she padded in, 
his expression turning pained as he noted what she wore. I. That's. Nesta tugged off his shirt, leaving nothing but bare skin in its wake. His eyes widened, but the scent of his fear remained, not fear of her, but of the male he'd heard at the front door. As he remembered who her sister was. Who her sister's mate was. Who her sister's friends were. As if any of that meant something. What would his fear smell like if he learned she'd used him, slept with him, to keep herself at bay? To settle that writhing darkness that had simmered inside her from the moment she'd emerged from the cauldron. Sex, music, and drink, she'd learned this past year, all of it helped. Not entirely, but it kept the power from boiling over. Even if she could still feel it streaming through her blood, coiled tight around her bones. She chucked the white shirt at him. You can use the front door now. He slung the shirt over his head. I is he still, his gaze kept snagging on her breasts, peaked against the chill morning, her bare skin. The apex of her thighs. Goodbye. Nesta entered the rusty, leaky bathroom attached to her bedroom. At least the place had hot running water. Sometimes. Thea and Elaine had tried to convince her to move. She'd always ignored their advice. Just as she'd ignore whatever was said today. She knew Thea planned a scolding. Perhaps something to do with the fact that Nesta had signed last night's outrageous tab at the tavern to her sister's bank account. Nesta snorted, twisting the handle in the bath. It groaned, the metal icy to the touch, and water sputtered, then sprayed into the cracked, stained tub. This was her residence. No servants, no eyes monitoring and judging every move, no company unless she invited them. Or unless prying, swaggering warriors made it their business to stop by. It took five minutes for the water to actually heat enough to start filling the tub. There had been some days in the past year when she hadn't even bothered to take the time. Some days when she'd climbed into the icy water, not feeling its bite but that of the cauldron's dark depths as it devoured her whole. As it ripped away her humanity, her mortality, and made her into this. It had taken her months of battling it, the body-tensing panic that made her very bones tremble to be submerged. But she'd forced herself to face it down. Had learned to sit in the icy water, nauseated and shaking, teeth gritted, had refused to move until her body recognized that she was in a tub and not the cauldron, that she was in her apartment and not the stone castle across the sea, that she was alive, immortal. Even though her father was not. No, her father was ashes in the wind, his existence marked only by a headstone on a hill outside this city. Or so her sisters had told her. I loved you from the first moment I held you in my arms, her father had said to her in those last moments together. Don't you lay your filthy hands on my daughter. Those had been his final words, spat at the king of Hyben. Her father had squandered those final words on that worm of a king. Her father. The man who had never fought for his children, not until the end. When he had come to save them, to save the humans and the fae, yes, but most of all, his daughters. Ha! Huh. A grand, stupid waste. Unholy dark power flowed through her, and it had not been enough to stop the king of Hyben from snapping his neck. She had hated her father, hated him deeply, and yet he had loved her, for some inexplicable reason. Not enough to try to spare them from poverty or keep them from starving. But somehow it had been enough for him to raise an army on the continent. To sail a ship named for her into battle. She had still hated her father in those last moments. And then his neck had cracked, his eyes not full of fear as he died, but of that foolish love for her. That was what had lingered, the look in his eyes. The resentment in her heart as he died for her. It had festered, gnawing at her like the power she buried deep, running rampant through her head until no icy baths could numb it away. She could have saved him. It was the king of Hyben's fault. She knew that. But it was hers, too. Just as it was her fault that Elaine had been captured by the cauldron after Nesta spied on it with that scrying, 
her fault that Hyben had done such terrible things to hunt her and her sister down like a deer. Some days, the sheer dread and panic locked Nesta's body up so thoroughly that nothing could get her to breathe. Nothing could stop the awful power from beginning to rise, rise, rise in her. Nothing beyond the music at those taverns, the card games with strangers, the endless bottles of wine, and the sex that made her feel nothing, but offered a moment of release amid the roaring inside her. Nesta finished washing away the sweat and other remnants of last night. The sex hadn't been bad, she'd had better, but also much worse. Even immortality wasn't enough time for some males to master the art of the bedroom. So she'd taught herself what she liked. She'd obtained a monthly contraceptive tea from her local apothecary, and then she'd brought that first male here. He had no idea that her maidenhood had been intact until he'd spied the smeared blood on the sheets. His face had tightened with distaste, then a glimmer of fear that she might report an unsatisfactory first bedding to her sister. To her sister's insufferable mate. Nesta hadn't bothered to tell him that she avoided both of them at all costs. Especially the latter. These days, Rhysand seemed content to do the same. After the war with Hyben, Rhysand had offered her jobs. Positions in his court. She didn't want them. They were pity offerings, thin attempts to get her to be a part of Feyre's life, to be gainfully employed. But the High Lord had never liked her. Their conversations were coldly civil at best. She'd never told him that the reasons he hated her were the same reasons she lived here. Took cold baths some days. Forgot to eat on others. Couldn't stand the crack and snap of a fireplace. And drowned herself in wine and music and pleasure each night. Every damning thing Reese and thought about her was true, and she'd known it long before he had ever shadowed her doorstep. Any offering Reese and threw her way was made solely out of love for Faya. Better to spend her time the way she wished. They kept paying for it, after all. The knock on the door rattled the entire apartment. She glared toward the front room, debating whether to pretend she'd left, but Cassian could hear her, smell her. And if he broke down the door, which he was likely to do, she'd just have the headache of explaining it to her stingy landlord. So Nesta donned the dress she'd left on the floor last night, and then again freed all four locks. She'd installed them the first day she'd arrived. Locking them each night was practically a ritual. Even when the nameless male had been here, even out of her mind on wine, she'd remembered to lock them all. As if that would keep the monsters of this world at bay. Nesta tugged open the door enough to see Cashin's cocky grin, and left it ajar as she stormed away to search for her shoes. He strode in after her, a mug of tea in his hand, the cup probably borrowed from the shop at the corner. Or outright given to him, considering how people tended to worship the ground his muddy boots walked on. He'd already been adored in this city before the Hyben conflict. His heroism and sacrifice, the feats he'd performed on the battlefields, had won him even more awe after its end. She didn't blame his admirers. She'd experienced the pleasure and sheer terror of watching him on those battlefields. Still woke with sweat coating her at the memories, how she couldn't breathe while she'd witnessed him fight, enemies swarming him, how it had felt when the cauldron's power had surged and she'd known it was going to strike where their army was strongest, him. She hadn't been able to save the 1,000 Illyrians who had fallen in the moment after she'd summoned him to safety. She turned away from that memory, too. Cassian surveyed her apartment and let out a low whistle. Ever thought of hiring a cleaner? Nesta scanned the small living area, a sagging crimson couch, a soot-stained brick hearth, a moth-eaten floral armchair, then the ancient kitchenette, piled with leaning columns of dirty dishes. Where had she thrown her shoes last night? She shifted her search to her bedroom. Some fresh air would be a good start, Cassian added from the other room. The window groaned as he cracked it open. She found her brown shoes in opposite corners of the bedroom. One reeked of spilled wine. Nesta perched on the edge of the mattress to slide them on, tugging at the laces. She didn't bother to look up as Cashin's steady steps approached, then halted at the threshold. 
He sniffed once. Loudly. I'd hoped you at least changed the sheets between visitors, but apparently that doesn't bother you. Nesta tied the laces on the first shoe. What business is it of yours? He shrugged, though the tightness on his face didn't reflect such nonchalance. If I can smell a few different males in here, then surely your companions can, too. Hasn't stopped them yet. She tied the other shoe, Cashin's hazel eyes tracking the movement. Your tea is getting cold. His teeth flashed. Nesta ignored him and searched the bedroom again. Her coat. Your coat is on the ground by the front door, he said. And it's going to be brisk out, so bring a scarf. She ignored that, too, but breezed by him, careful to avoid touching him, and found her dark blue overcoat exactly where he'd claimed it was. She opened the front door, pointing for him to leave first. Cassian held her gaze as he stalked for her then reached out an arm and plucked the cerulean and cream scarf Elaine had given her for her birthday this spring off the hook on the wall. He gripped it in his fist, dangling it like a strangled snake as he brushed past her. Something was eating at him. Usually, Cassian held out a bit longer before yielding to his temper. Perhaps it had to do with whatever Faye wanted to say up at the house. Nesta's gut twisted as she set each lock. She wasn't stupid. She knew there had been unrest since the war had ended, both in these lands and on the continent. Knew that without the barrier of the wall, some Fey territories were pushing the limits on what they could get away with in terms of border claims and how they treated humans. And she knew that those four human queens still squatted in their shared palace, their armies unused and intact. They were monsters, all of them. They'd killed the golden-haired queen who'd betrayed them and sold another, Fassa, to a sorcerer lord. It seemed only fitting that the youngest of the four remaining queens had been transformed into a crone by the cauldron. Made into a long-lived fae, yes, but aged into a withered shell as punishment for the power Nesta had taken from the cauldron. How she'd ripped it apart while it had torn her mortal body into something new. That wizened queen blamed her. Had wanted to kill her. If Hyben's ravens had been correct before Bryaxis and Resent had destroyed them for infiltrating the House of Wind's library. There had been no whisper of that queen in the fourteen months since the war. But if some new threat had arisen. The full locks seemed to laugh at her before Nesta followed Cassian out of the building and into the bustling city beyond. The riverfront house was actually an estate and so new and clean and beautiful that Nesta remembered her shoes were covered in stale wine precisely as she strode through the towering marble archway and into the shining front hall, tastefully decorated in shades of ivory and sand. A mighty staircase bisected the enormous space, a chandelier of hand-blown glass, made by Valaris artisans, drooping from the carved ceiling above it. The fey lights in each nest-shaped orb cast shimmering reflections on the polished pale wood floors, interrupted only by potted ferns, wood furniture also made in Valaris, and an outrageous array of art. She didn't bother to remark on any of it. Plush blue rugs broke up the pristine floors, a long runner flowing along the cavernous halls on either side, and one ran beneath the arch of the stairs, straight to a wall of windows on its other side, which looked out onto the sloping lawn and gleaming river at its feet. Cassian headed to the left, toward the formal rooms for business, Faya had informed Nesta during that first and only tour two months ago. Nesta had been half drunk at the time, and had hated every second of it, each perfect room. Most males bought their wives and mates jewellery for an outrageous winter solstice present. Reese had bought Faya a palace. No, he'd purchased the war decimated land and then given his mate free reign to design the residence of their dreams. And somehow, Nesta thought as she silently followed an unnaturally quiet Cassian down the hall toward one of the studies whose doors were cracked open, Faya and Reese had managed to make this place seem cosy, welcoming. A behemoth of a building, but still a home. Even the formal furniture seemed designed for comfort and lounging, for long conversations over hearty food. Every piece of art had been picked by Fea herself, or painted by her, many of them portraits and depictions of them, her friends, 
Papa, new family. There were none of Nestor, naturally. Even their God's damned father had a portrait on the wall along one side of the grand staircase, him and Elaine, smiling and happy, as they'd been before the world went to shit. Sitting on a stone bench amid bushes bursting with pink and blue hydrangea. The formal gardens of their first home, that lovely manor near the sea. Nesta and their mother were nowhere in sight. That was how it had been, after all, Elaine and Faye doted on by their father. Nesta prized and trained by their mother. During that first tour, Nesta had noted the lack of herself here. The lack of their mother. She said nothing, of course, but it was a pointed absence. It was enough to now set her teeth on edge, to make her grab the invisible, internal leash that kept the horrible power within her at bay and pull tight, as Cassian slipped into the study and said to whoever awaited them, she's here. Nesta braced herself, but Faya merely chuckled. You're five minutes early. I'm impressed. Seems like a good omen for gambling. We should head to Rita's, Cassian drawled just as Nesta stepped into the wood-panelled room. The study opened into a lush garden courtyard. The space was warm and rich, and she might have admitted she liked the floor-to-ceiling bookshelves, the sapphire velvet furniture before the black marble hearth, had she not seen who was sitting inside. Faya perched on the rolldom of the couch, clad in a heavy white sweater and dark leggings. Reese, in his usual black, leaned against the mantel, arms crossed. No wings today. And Amran, in her preferred grey, sat cross-legged in the leather armchair by the roaring hearth, those muted silver eyes sweeping over Nesta with distaste. So much had changed between her and the female. Nesta had seen to that, the destruction. She didn't let herself think about that argument at the end of summer party on the river barge. Or the silence between herself and Amran since then. No more visits to Amran's apartment. No more chats over jigsaw puzzles. Certainly no more lessons in magic. She'd made sure of that last part, too. Faya, at least, smiled at her. I heard you had quite the night. Nesta glanced between where Cassian had claimed the armchair across from Amran, the empty spot on the couch beside Faya, and where Reese stood by the hearth. She kept her spine straight, her chin high, hating that they all eyed her as she opted to sit on the couch beside her sister. Hating that Reese and Amran noted her filthy shoes, and probably still smelled that mayo on her despite the bath. You look atrocious, Amran said. Nesta wasn't stupid enough to glare at the, whatever Amran was. She was high fay now, yes, but she'd once been something different. Not of this world. Her tongue was still sharp enough to wound. Like Nesta, Amran did not possess court-specific magic related to the High Fae. It didn't make her influence in this court any less mighty. Nesta's own High Fae powers had never materialized, she had only what she'd taken from the cauldron, rather than letting it deign to gift her with power, as it had with Elaine. She had no idea what she'd ripped from the cauldron while it had stolen her humanity from her, but she knew they were things she did not and would never wish to understand, to master. The very thought had her stomach churning. Though I bet it's hard to look good, Amran went on, when you're out until the darkest hours of the night, drinking yourself stupid and fucking anything that comes your way. Faya whipped her head to the High Lord's second. Reese seemed inclined to agree with Amran. Cassian kept his mouth shut. Nesta said smoothly, I wasn't aware that my activities were under your jurisdiction. Cassian loosed a murmur that sounded like a warning. To which one of them, she didn't know. Or care. Amran's eyes glowed, a remnant of the power that had once burned inside her. All that was left now. Nesta knew her own power could shine like that, too, but while Amran's had revealed itself to be light and heat, Nesta knew that her silver flame came from a colder, darker place. A place that was old and yet wholly new. Amran challenged, they are when you spend that much of our gold on wine. Perhaps she had pushed them too far with last night's tab. Nesta looked to Faya, who winced. 
So you really did make me come all the way here for a scolding. Faya's eyes mirror images of her own, softened slightly. No, it's not a scolding. She cut a sharp glance at Rhys, still icily silent against the mantle, and then to Amran, seething in her chair. Think of this as a discussion. Nesta shot to her feet. My life is not your concern, or up for any sort of discussion. Sit down, Rhys snarled. The roar command in that voice, the utter dominance and power. Nesta froze, fighting it, hating that fey part of her that bowed to such things. Cassian leaned forward in his chair, as if he'd leap between them. She could have sworn something like pain had etched itself across his face. But Nesta held Ryzen's gaze. Threw every ounce of defiance she could into it, even as his order made her knees want to bend, to sit. Reese said, you are going to stay. You are going to listen. She let out a low laugh. You're not my high lord. You don't give me orders. But she knew how powerful he was. Had seen it, felt it. Still trembled to be near him. Reese scented that fear. One side of his mouth curled up in a cruel smile. You want to go head to head, Nesta Ark Heron, he purred. The High Lord of the Night Court gestured to the sloping lawn beyond the windows. We've got plenty of space out there for a brawl. Nesta bared her teeth, silently roaring at her body to obey her orders. She'd sooner die than bow to him. To any of them. Reese's smile grew, well aware of that fact. That's enough, Fair snapped at Reese. I told you to keep out of it. He dragged his starflecked eyes to his mate, and it was all Nesta could do to keep from collapsing onto the couch as her knees gave out at last. Thea angled her head, nostrils flaring, and said to Reese and, you can either leave, or you can stay and keep your mouth shut. Reese again crossed his arms, but said nothing. You too, Thea spat to Amran. The female harumphed and nestled into her chair. Nesta didn't bother to look pleasant as Faya twisted to face her, taking a proper seat on the couch, the velvet cushion sighing beneath her. Her sister swallowed. We need to make some changes, Nesta, Faya said hoarsely. You do, and we do. Where the hell was Elaine? I'll take the blame, Faya went on, for allowing things to get this far, and this bad. After the war with Hyben, with everything else that was going on, it. You. I should have been there to help you, but I wasn't, and I am ready to admit that this is partially my fault. That what is your fault? Nesta hissed. You, Cassian said. This bullshit behavior. He'd said that at the winter solstice. And just as it had then, her spine locked at the insult, the arrogance. Look, Cassian went on, holding up his hands. It's not some moral failing, but. I understand how you're feeling, Fair cut in. You know nothing about how I'm feeling. Fair plowed ahead. It's time for some changes. Starting now. Keep your self righteous do good and nonsense out of my life. You don't have a life, Fair retorted. And I'm not going to sit by for another moment and watch you destroy yourself. She put a tattooed hand on her heart, like it meant something. I decided after the war to give you time, but it seems that was wrong. I was wrong. Oh? The word was a dagger thrown between them. Reese tensed at the sneer, but still said nothing. You're done, Faya breathed, voice shaking. This behavior, that apartment, all of it, you are done, Nesta. And where, Nesta said, her tone mercifully icy, am I supposed to go? Faya looked to Cassian. For once, Cassian wasn't grinning. You're coming with me, he said. To train. Chapter. 2. Cassian felt as if he'd loosed an arrow at a sleeping firedrake. Nesta, bundled in that worn blue coat, with her stained shoes and her wrinkled grey dress, looked him over and demanded, what? As of this meeting, 
Fair clarified, you're moving into the House of Wind. She nodded eastward, toward the palace carved into the mountains at the far end of the city. Reese and I have decided that each morning, you will train with Cassian in Windhaven, in the Illyrian Mountains. After lunch, for the rest of the afternoon, you will be assigned work in the library beneath the House of Wind. But the apartment, the seedy taverns, all of that is over, Nesta. Nesta's fingers curled into fists in her lap. But she said nothing. He should have positioned himself beside her, instead of allowing his high lady to sit on that couch within arm's reach of her. No matter that Fea already had a shield around herself courtesy of Reese, it had been there at breakfast, too. Part of my ongoing training, Fea had muttered when Cassian asked about the ironclad defenses, so strong they even masked her scent. Reese is having Helion teach him about truly impenetrable shields, so of course I have the pleasure of being the test subject. I'm supposed to try to break this one to see if Reese is following Helion's instructions correctly. It's a new kind of insanity. But one that had proved fortuitous. Even if they didn't know what Nesta's power could do against ordinary magic. Reese seemed to be thinking the same thing, and Cassian poised himself to jump between the two sisters. His siphons flared in warning as Reese's power rumbled. Cassian had no doubt Fea could defend herself against most opponents, but Nesta. He wasn't entirely sure Fea would hit back, even if Nesta launched that terrible power at her. And he hated that he didn't know if Nesta would sink low enough to do it. That things had become so bad that he even considered the possibility. I'm not moving to the House of Wind, Nesta said. And I'm not training at that miserable village. Certainly not with him. She threw him a look that was nothing short of venomous. It's not up for negotiation, Amran said, breaking her vow to keep out of the discussion as much as possible for the second time in so many minutes. The eldest of the Arkheron sisters had a talent for getting under everyone's skin. Yet Nesta and Amran had always shared a bond and understanding. Until their fight on the barge. Like hell it isn't, Nesta challenged, but didn't attempt to stand as Reese's eyes flickered with cold warning. Your apartment is being packed as we speak, Amran said, picking at a speck of lint on her silk blouse. By the time you return, it will be empty. Your clothes are already being sent to the house, though I doubt they will be suitable for training at Windhaven. A pointed glance at Nesta's grey dress, baggier on her than it had once been. Did Nesta notice the faint glimmer of worry in Amran's smoky eyes understand how rare it was? More than that, did Nesta understand that this meeting wasn't to condemn her, but instead came from a place of concern? Her simmering stare told him she considered this purely an attack. You can't do this, Nesta said. I'm not a member of this court. You seem to have no qualms about spending this court's money, Amran countered. During the war with Hyben, you accepted the position as our human emissary. You never resigned from the role so formal law still considers you an official member of this court. A wave of her small fingers and a book floated toward Nesta before thumping onto the cushions beside her. That was about the extent of the magic Amran now possessed ordinary, unremarkable high fey magic. Page 236, if you want to check. Amran had combed through their laws for this. Cassian didn't even know such a rule existed, he'd accepted the position Reese had offered him without question, not caring what he was agreeing to, only that he and Reese and Osriel would be together. That they'd have a home that no one could ever take from them. Until Amarantha. He'd never stop being grateful for it, for the high lady mere feet from him, who had saved them all from Amarantha's rule, who had returned his brother to him and then brought Reese out of the darkness that lingered. So here are your options, girl, Amran said, delicate chin rising. Cassian didn't miss the look between Fea and Reese, the utter agony in his high lady's face at the ultimatum he knew was to be presented to Nesta, and the half-restrained rage in Reese's that his mate was in such pain because of it. He'd already seen that exchanged look once today, had hoped he wouldn't see it again. Cassian had been eating an early breakfast with them this morning when Reese had gotten the bill for Nesta's night out. 
when Reese had read each item aloud. Bottles of rare wine, exotic foods, gambling debts. Thea had stared at her plate until silent tears dripped into her scrambled eggs. Cassian knew there'd been previous conversations, fights about Nesta. About whether to give her time to heal herself, as they'd all believed would happen at first, or to step in. But as Faya wept at the table, he knew it was a breaking of some sort. An acceptance of a hope failed. It had required all of Cassian's training, every horror he'd endured on and off the battlefield, to keep that same crushing sorrow from his own face. Reese had laid a comforting hand on Faya's, squeezing gently before he looked at Osriel, and then Cassian, and laid out his plan. As if he'd had it waiting a long, long while. Elaine had walked in halfway through. She'd been toiling in the estate garden since dawn, and had been solemn as Reese filled her in. Thea had been unable to say a word. But Elaine's gaze remained steady as she listened to Reese. Then Reese summoned Amrim from her attic apartment across the river. Thea had insisted that the order come through Amrim, not Reese, to preserve any sort of familial bond between Reese and her sister. Cassian didn't think there was one to begin with, but Reese had agreed, moving to kneel at Faye's side, wiping away the remnants of her tears, kissing her temple. They'd all left the table then, giving their high lord and lady privacy. Cassian took to the skies moments later, letting the roaring wind drown out every thought in his head, letting its briskness cool his pounding heart. This meeting, what was to come, none of it would be easy. Amran, they'd agreed, had always been one of the few people who could get through to Nesta. Whom Nesta seemed to fear, if only slightly. Who understood, somehow, what Nesta was, deep down. She'd been the only one Nesta had truly spoken to after the war. It didn't seem like a coincidence that in the past month, since they'd argued on that boat, Nesta's behavior had deteriorated further. That she now looked like, this. One, Amran said, raising a slender finger, you can move up to the House of Wind, train with Cassian in the mornings, and work in the library in the afternoons. You will not be a prisoner. But there will be no one to fly or winnow you down to the city. If you want to venture into the city proper, by all means, go ahead. That is, if you can brave the ten thousand steps down from the house. Amran's eyes glittered with the challenge. And if you can somehow find two coppers to rub together to buy yourself a drink. But if you follow this plan, we will reevaluate where and how you live in a few months. And my other option? Nesta spat. Mother above, this woman female. She was no longer human. Cassian could think of very, very few people who would defy Amran and Reese. Certainly not in the same room. Certainly not with such venom. You go back to the human lands. Amran had suggested a few days in a dungeon in the Hune city, but Thea had simply said that the human world would be more than enough of a prison for someone like Nesta. Someone like Thea, too. And Elaine. All three sisters were now high Fey with considerable powers, though only Thea's were let loose. Even Amran had no idea whether Elaine's and Nesta's powers remained. The cauldron had granted them unique powers, different from other high fey, the gift of sight to the former, and the gift of. Cassian didn't know what to call Nesta's gift. Didn't know whether it was a gift at all or something she had taken. The silver fire, that sense of death looming, the raw power he'd witnessed as it blasted into the king of Hyben. Whatever it was, it existed beyond the usual array of high fey gifts. The human world was behind them. They could never return. Even though all three of them were war heroes, each in their own right, the humans wouldn't care. Would stay far, far away, if they weren't provoked to violence. So, yes, Nesta might technically be able to return to the human lands, but she would find no companionship there no warm welcome or town that would accept her. Wherever she was able to find a place to live, she would be essentially housebound, confined to the grounds of her home for fear of human prejudices. Nesta turned to Faya, lips pulling back from her teeth. 
and these are my only options. I fair caught herself before she could say the rest I'm sorry and squared her shoulders. Became the high lady of the night court, even without her black crown, even in Reese's old sweater. Yes. You have no right. I. Nesta erupted. You dragged me into this mess, this horrible place. You are why I am like this, why I am stuck here. Faya flinched. Reese's rage became palpable, a pulse of night-kissed power that tightened Cashin's gut, every warrior's instinct beaten into him coming to attention. That's enough, Faya breathed. Nesta blinked. Faya swallowed, but didn't balk. That is enough. You're moving up to the house, you're going to train and work, and I don't care what vitriol you spew my way. You're doing it. Elaine needs to be able to see me. Elaine agreed to this hours ago. She's currently packing your things. They'll be waiting for you when you arrive. Nesta recoiled. Faya didn't relent. Elaine knows how to contact you. If she wishes to visit you at the House of Wind, she is free to do so. One of us will gladly take her up there. The words hung between them, so heavy and awkward that Cassian said, I promise not to bite. Nesta's upper lip curled back as she faced him. I suppose this was your idea. It was, he lied with a grin. We're going to have a wonderful time together. They'd likely kill each other. I want to speak to my sister. Alone, Nesta ordered. Cassian glanced at Reese, who leveled an assessing stare at Nesta. Cassian had been on the receiving end of that same stare a few times over the centuries and did not envy Nesta one bit. But the High Lord of the Night Court nodded. We'll be in the hall. Cassian's fist tightened at the implied insult that they didn't trust her enough to go farther than that, despite the shield on Faya. Even if the rational, warrior-minded part of him agreed. Nesta's eyes flared, and he knew she'd understood it, too. From the way Faya's jaw tightened, he suspected she wasn't pleased at the subtle jab it wouldn't help convince Nesta that they were doing this to help her. Reese would be getting the verbal beating he deserved later. Cassian waited until Reese and Amran rose before following them out. True to his word, Reese walked three steps down the hall, away from the wood doors spelled against eavesdroppers, and leaned against the wall. Doing the same, Cassian said to Amran, I didn't even know we had laws like that about court membership. We don't. Amran picked at her red-painted nails. He swore under his breath. Reese smiled wryly. But Cassian frowned toward the shut double doors and prayed Nesta didn't do anything stupid. Nesta held her spine ramrod straight, back aching with the effort. She had never hated anyone so much as she hated all of them now. Save for the King of Hyben, she supposed. They'd all been discussing her, deeming her unfit and unchecked, Anne. You didn't care before, Nesta said. Why now? Faya toyed with her silver and star sapphire wedding ring. I told you, it wasn't that I didn't care. We everyone, I mean, had multiple conversations about this. About you. We, I decided that giving you time and space would be best. And what did Elaine have to say about it? Part of her didn't want to know. Faya's mouth tightened. This isn't about Elaine. And last I checked you barely saw her, either. Nesta hadn't realized they were paying such close attention. She'd never explained to Faya, had never found the words to explain why she'd put such distance between them all. Elaine had been stolen by the cauldron and saved by Osriel and Faya. Yet the terror still gripped Nesta, waking and asleep, the memory of how it had felt in those moments after hearing the cauldron's seductive call and realizing it had been for Elaine not for her or Faya. How it had felt to find Elaine's tent empty, to see that blue cloak discarded. Things had only gotten worse from there. You have your lives, and I have mine, she'd said to Elaine last winter solstice. She'd known how deeply it would wound her sister. 
but she couldn't bear it, the bone-deep horror that lingered. The flashes of that discarded cloak or the cauldron's chill waters or Cassian crawling toward her or her father's neck snapping. Fea said carefully, for what it's worth, I was hoping you'd turn yourself around. I wanted to give you space to do it, since you seem to lash out at everyone who comes close enough, but you didn't even try. Perhaps you can find it in yourself to try a little harder this year. Cashin's words from nine months ago still rang fresh in Nesta's mind, uttered on an ice slick street blocks from here. Try? It was all she could think to say. I know that's a foreign word to you. Then her rage had ruptured from her. Why should I have to try to do anything? I was dragged into this world of yours, this court. Then go somewhere else. She'd swallowed her own response, I have nowhere to go. It was the truth. She had no desire to return to the human realm. Had never felt at home there, not really. And this strange, new fey world. She might have accepted her different, altered body, that she was now permanently changed and her humanity gone, but she didn't know where she belonged in this world either. The thought was one she tried to drown in liquor and music and cards, as often as she used those things to quell that writhing power deep inside. Fair continued, all you have done is help yourself to our money. Your mate's money. Another flash of hurt. Nesta's blood sang at the direct blow. Thank you so much for taking time out of your homemaking and shopping to remember me. I built a room in this house for you. I asked you to help me decorate it. You told me to piss off. Why would I ever want to stay in this house? Where she could see precisely how happy they were, where none of them seemed remotely as decimated as she'd been by the war. She'd come so close to being a part of it of that circle. Had held their hands as they'd stood together on the morning of the final battle and believed they might all make it. Then she'd learned precisely how mercilessly it might be ripped away what the cost of hope and joy and love truly was. She never wanted to face it again. Never wanted to endure what she'd felt in that forest clearing, with the king of Hyben chuckling, blood everywhere. Her power hadn't been enough to save them that day. She supposed she'd been punishing it for failing her ever since, keeping it locked up tight inside her. Fea said, because you're my sister. Yes, and you're always sacrificing for us your sad little human family. You spent 500 gold marks last night. Fea exploded, shooting to her feet to pace in front of the hearth. Do you know how much money that is? Do you know how embarrassed I was when we got the bill this morning and my friends, my family, had to hear all about it? Nesta hated that word. The term Fea used to describe her court. As if things had been so miserable with the Arkheron family that Fea had needed to find another one. Had chosen her own. Nesta's nails bit into her palms, the pain overriding that of her tightening chest. Fea went on, and to hear not just the amount of the bill, but what you spent it on. Oh, so it's about you saving face. It is about how it reflects upon me, upon Reese and upon my court when my damned sister spends our money on wine and gambling and does nothing to contribute to this city. If my sister cannot be controlled, then why should we have the right to rule over anyone else? I am not a thing to be controlled by you, Nesta said icily. Everything in her life, from the moment she was born, had been controlled by other people. Things happened to her, any time she tried to exert control. She'd been thwarted at every turn, and she hated that even more than the King of Hyben. That's why you're going to train at Windhaven. You will learn to control yourself. I won't go. You're going, even if you have to be tied up and hauled there. You will follow Cashin's lessons, and you will do whatever work Clotho requires in the library. Nesta blocked out the memory of the dark depths of that library, the ancient monster that had dwelled there. It had saved them from Hyben's cronies, yes, but. She refused to think of it. You will respect her, and the other priestesses in the library, Fea said, and you will never give them a moment's trouble. Any free time is yours to spend as you wish. In the house. 
Hot rage pumped through her, so loud Nesta could barely hear the real fire before which her sister paced. Was glad of the roaring in her head when the sound of wood cracking as it burned was so much like her father's breaking neck that she couldn't stand to light a fire in her own home. You had no right to close up my apartment, to take my things. What things? A few clothes and some rotten food. Nesta didn't have the chance to wonder how Faye knew that. Not as her sister said, I'm having that entire building condemned. You wouldn't dare. It's done. Reese already visited the landlord. It will be torn down and rebuilt as a shelter for families still displaced by the war. Nesta tried to master her uneven breathing. One of the few choices she'd made for herself, stripped away. Faya didn't seem to care. Faya had always been her own master. Always got whatever she wished. And now, it seemed, Faya would be granted this wish, too. Nesta seethed, I never want to speak to you again. That's fine. You can talk to Cassian and the priestesses instead. There was no insulting her way out of it. I won't be your prisoner. No. You can go wherever you wish. As Amran said, you are free to leave the house. If you can manage those ten thousand steps. Faya's eyes blazed. But I'm done paying for you to destroy yourself. Destroy herself. The silence hummed in Nesta's ears, rippled across her flames, suffocating them, stilling the unbearable wrath. Utter, frozen silence. She'd learned to live with the silence that had started the moment her father had died, the silence that had begun crushing her when she'd gone to his study at their half-wrecked manor days later and found one of his pathetic little wood carvings. She'd wanted to scream and scream, but there had been so many people around. She'd held herself together until the meeting with all those war heroes had ended. Then she'd let herself fall. Straight into this silent pit. The others are waiting. Faya said. Elaine should be done by now. I want to talk to her. She'll come visit when she's ready. Nesta held her sister's stare. Faya's eyes gleamed. You think I don't know why you've pushed even Elaine away? Nesta didn't want to talk about it. About the fact that it had always been her and Elaine. And, somehow, now it had become Faya and Elaine instead. Elaine had chosen Faya and these people, and left her behind. Amran had done the same. She'd made it clear on the barge. Nesta didn't care that during the war with Hyben, her own tentative bond had formed with Faya, forged over common goals, protect Elaine, save the human lands. They were excuses, Nesta had realized, to paper over what now boiled and raged in her heart. Nesta didn't bother replying and Faya didn't speak again as she departed. There was nothing to bind them together anymore. Chapter 3 Cassian watched Reese and carefully stir his tea. He'd seen Reese slice up their enemies with the same cold precision that he was now using with that spoon. They sat in the High Lord's study, illuminated by the light of green glass lamps and a heavy iron chandelier. The two-level atrium occupied the northern end of the business wing, as Faya called it. There was the main floor of the study, bedecked in the hand-knotted blue carpets that Faya had gone to Cezir to select from its artisans, with its two sitting areas, Reese's desk, and twin long tables near the bookshelves. At the far end of the room, a little dais led into a broad raised alcove flanked by more books and in its centre, a massive, working model of their world, the stars and planets around it and some other fancy things that had been explained to Cassian once before he deemed them boring and proceeded to ignore them completely. AZ, of course, had been fascinated. Rhys had built the model himself centuries ago. It could not only track the sun, but also tell time, and it somehow allowed Rhys to ponder the existence of life beyond their own world and other things Cassian had, again, instantly forgotten. On the mezzanine, accessible by an ornate wrought iron spiral staircase just to the left when one walked in, were more books thousands in this space alone, a few glass cabinets full of delicate objects that Cassian stayed away from, 
for fear of breaking them with his bare paws, as Maud described his hands, and several of Feyer's paintings. There were plenty of those on the bottom level, too, some in shadow and meant to stay that way, some revealed by the streaming light reflecting off the river at the foot of the sloping lawn. Cashin's high lady had a way of capturing the world that always made him pause. Her paintings sometimes unsettled him. The truths she portrayed weren't always pleasant ones. He'd gone to her studio a few times to watch her paint. Surprisingly, she had let him. The first time he'd visited, he'd found Faye tense at her easel. She was painting what he realized was an emaciated rib cage, so thin he could count most of the bones. When he spotted a familiar birthmark on the tooth in left arm beside it, he eyed the same mark amid the tattoo on her own extended arm, brush in hand. He merely nodded to her, an acknowledgement that he understood. He had never been as thin as Faye during his own years of poverty, but he understood the hunger in each brush stroke. The desperation. The hollow, empty feeling that felt like those greys and blues and pale, sickly white. The despair of the black pit behind that torso and on. Death hovering close like a crow awaiting carrion. He'd thought about that painting a great deal in the days afterward how it had made him feel, how close they'd all come to losing their high lady before they'd ever met her. Reese finished stirring his tea and set down his spoon with terrible gentleness. Cassian raised his eyes to the portrait behind his high lord's mammoth desk. The golden faylight orbs in the room were positioned to make it seem alive, glowing. Faya's face, a self-portrait, seemed to laugh at him. At the mate whose back was to her. So she could watch over him, Rhys said. Cassian prayed that the gods were watching over him as Rhys sipped from his tea and said, you're ready. He leaned back in his seat. I've gotten young warriors in line before. Rhys's violet eyes glowed. Nesta's not some young buck pushing the boundaries. I can handle her. Rhys stared at his tea. Cassian recognized that face. That serious, unnervingly calm face. You did good work getting the Illyrians back in order this spring, you know. He braced himself. He'd been anticipating this talk since he'd spent four months with the Illyrians, soothing the jagged edges amongst the war bands making sure the families who'd lost fathers and sons and brothers and husbands were taken care of, that they knew he was there to help and to listen, and generally making it very fucking clear that if they rose up against Reese, there would be hell to pay. The blood right last spring had taken care of the worst of them, including the troublemaker Callan, whose arrogance hadn't been enough to compensate for his shoddy training when he'd been slain just miles from the slopes of Ramiel. That Cassian had heaved a sigh of relief at the news of the young male's demise had lingered with him, but the Illyrians had stopped their grumbling soon after. And Cassian had spent the time since then rebuilding their ranks, overseeing the training of promising new warriors and making sure the seasoned ones were still in good enough shape to fight again. Replenishing their depleted numbers had at least given the Illyrians something to focus on and Cassian knew there was little he could add in and more beyond the occasional inspection and council meeting. So the Illyrians were at peace, or as peaceful as a warrior society could be, with their constant training. Which was what Rhys wanted. Not just because a rebellion would be a disaster, but because of this. What he knew Rhys was about to say. I think it's time for you to take on bigger responsibilities. Cassian grimaced. There it was. Rhys chuckled. You can't honestly mean to tell me you didn't know the Illyrian situation was a test. I'd hoped not, he grumbled, tucking in his wings. Rhys smirked, though he quickly sobered. Nesta is not a test, though. She's, different. I know. Even before she'd been made, he'd seen it. And after that terrible day in Hybin. He'd never forgotten the bone carver's whispered words in the prison. What if I tell you what the rock and darkness and sea beyond whispered to me, Lord of Bloodshed? How they shuddered in fear, on that island across the sea. How they trembled when she emerged. She took something, something precious. 
She ripped it out with her teeth. What did you wake that day in Highburn, Prince of Bastards? That final question had chased him from slumber more nights than he cared to admit. Cassian made himself say, we haven't seen a hint of her power since the war. For all we know, it vanished with the cauldron's breaking. Or maybe it's dormant, as the cauldron is now asleep and safely hidden in Cretia with Draken and Miriam. Her power could rise at any moment. A chill skittered down Cassian's spine. He trusted the seraphim prince and the half-human woman to keep the cauldron concealed, but there would be nothing they or anyone could do to control its power if awoken. Reese said, be on your guard. You sound like you're afraid of her. I am. Cassian blinked. Reese lifted a brow. Why do you think I sent you to get her this morning? Cassian shook his head, unable to help his laugh. Reese smiled, lacing his fingers behind his head and leaning back in his seat. You need to get out in the practice ring more, brother, Cassian told him, surveying his friend's powerful body. Don't want that mate of yours to find any soft bits. She never finds any soft bits when I'm around her, Reese said, and Cassian laughed again. Is Fear going to kick your ass for what you said earlier? I already told the servants to clear out for the rest of the day as soon as you take Nesta up to the house. I think the servants hear you fighting plenty. Indeed, Fea had no hesitation when it came to telling Reese that he'd stepped out of line. Reese threw him a wicked smile. It's not the fighting I don't want them hearing. Cassian grinned right back, even as something like jealousy tugged on his gut. He didn't begrudge them their happiness, not at all. There were plenty of times when he'd see the joy on Reese's face and have to walk away to keep from weeping, because his brother had waited for that love, earned it. Reese had gone to the mat again and again to fight for that future with Feya. For this. But sometimes, Cassian saw that mating ring, and the portrait behind the desk, and this house, and just, wanted. The clock chimed 10.30, and Cassian rose. Enjoy your not fighting. Cassian. The tone stopped him. Reese's face was carefully calm. You didn't ask what bigger responsibilities I have in mind for you. I assumed Nesta was big enough, he hedged. Reese gave him a knowing look. You could be more. I'm your general. Isn't that enough? Is it enough for you? Yes, he almost said but found himself hesitating. Oh, you're certainly hesitating, Reese said. Cassian tried to snap up his mental shields, but found they were intact. Reese was smiling like a cat. You still reveal everything on that face of yours, brother, Reese crooned. But his amusement swiftly faded. AZ and I have good reason to believe that the human queens are scheming again. I need you to look into it. Deal with it. What, we're doing some role reversal. AZ gets to lead the Illyrians now. Don't play stupid, Reese said coolly. Cassian rolled his eyes. But they both knew Osriel would sooner disband and destroy Illyria than help it. Convincing their brother that the Illyrians were a people worth saving was still a battle amongst the three of them. Reese went on. Osriel is juggling more than he'll admit right now. I'm not dumping another responsibility on him. This task of yours will help him. Reese flashed a challenging smile. And let us all see what you're really made of. You want me to play spy? There are other ways to glean information, Cass, besides peeking through keyholes. AZ isn't a courtier. He works from the shadows. But I need someone, I need you, standing in the open. More can fill you in on the details. She'll be back from Valahan at some point today. I'm no courtier, either. You know that. The thought made his stomach churn. Scared? Cassian let the siphons atop the backs of his hands shimmer within a fire. So I'm to deal with these queens as well as train Nesta. 
Reese leaned back, his silence confirmation. Cassian strode toward the shut double doors, reigning in a string of curses. We're in for a long few months, then. He was almost to the door when Reese said quietly, You certainly are. Did you keep those fighting leathers from the war? Cassian said to Nesta by way of greeting as he stalked into the entry hall. You'll need them tomorrow. I made sure Elaine packed them for her, Faye replied from her perch on the stairs, not looking at her stiff back sister standing at their base. He wondered if his high lady had noticed the disappearing servants yet. The secret smile in Faye's eyes told him she knew plenty about it. And what was coming for her in a few minutes? Thank the gods he was getting out of here. He'd probably have to fly to the sea itself not to hear Reese. Or feel his power when he. Cassian stopped himself before he could finish the thought. He and his brothers had put a good deal of distance between the stupid youths they'd been fucking any female who showed interest, often in the same room as each other and the males they were now. He wanted to keep it that way. Nesta just crossed her arms. Are you winnowing us up to the house? he asked Faya. As if in answer, Moore said from behind him, I am. She winked at Faya. She's got a special meeting with Risey. Cassian grinned as Moore strode in from the residential wing. I thought you wouldn't be back until later today. He threw open his arms, folding her against his chest and squeezing tight. Moore's waist-length golden hair smelled of cold seas. She squeezed him back. I didn't feel like waiting until the afternoon. Valahan is already knee-deep in snow. I needed some sunshine. Cassian pulled away to scan her beautiful face, as familiar to him as his own. Her brown eyes were shadowed despite her words. What's wrong? Fay rose from her seat, noting the strain as well. Nothing, Moore said, flipping her hair over a shoulder. Liar. I'll tell you all later, Moore conceded, and looked toward Nesta. You should wear the leathers tomorrow. When you train up at Windhaven, you'll want them against the cold. Nesta leveled a board, icy look at Moore. Moore just beamed at her in return. Fair took that as a good moment to casually step between them, Reese's shield still hard as steel around her. Never mind that they'd all be real damn close in about a minute. Today we'll let you get settled at the house, you can unpack your things. Get some rest, if you want. Nesta said nothing. Cassian dragged a hand through his hair. Cauldron spare them. Reese expected him to play politics when he couldn't even navigate this. Moore smirked, as if reading the thought on his face. Congratulations on your promotion. She shook her head. Cassian the courtier. I never thought I'd see the day. Faya snickered. But Nesta's eyes slid to him, surprised and wary. He said to her, if only to beat her to it, still a bastard-born nobody, don't worry. Nesta's lips thinned. Faya said carefully to Nesta, we'll talk soon. Nesta again didn't reply. It seemed she had stopped speaking to Faya at all. But at least she was going willingly. Semi-willingly. Shall we? Moore said, offering up either elbow. Nesta gazed at the floor, her face pale and gaunt, eyes blazing. Faya met his stare. The look alone conveyed everything she was begging of him. Nesta stepped past her, grabbed Moore's forearm, and watched a spot on the wall. Moore cringed at him, but Cassian didn't dare share the look. Nesta might not be gazing at them, but he knew she saw and heard and assessed everything. So he merely took Moore's other arm and winked at Faya before they all vanished into wind and darkness. Moore winnowed them into the sky right above the House of Wind. Before the stomach-dropping plunge could register, Nesta was in Cashin's arms, his wings spread, as he flew toward the stone veranda. It had been a long while since she'd been held by him, since she'd seen the city so small below. He could have flown them both up here, 
Nesta realized as he alighted and Morrigan vanished from her deadly plummet with a wave. The walls of the house were simple, no one could winnow directly inside thanks to its heavy wards, so it was a choice to either walk up the 10,000 steps, winnow and drop a terrifying distance to the veranda, likely breaking bones, or winnow to the edge of the wards with someone who had wings to fly the rest of the way in. But being in Cashin's arms, she'd rather have risked breaking every bone in her body from the plunge to the veranda. Thankfully, the flight was over in a matter of seconds. Nesta shoved out of his grip the moment her feet hit the worn stones. Cassian let her, folding his wings and lingering by the rail, all of Valaris glittering below and beyond him. She'd spent weeks here last year, during that terrible period after being turned fey, begging Elaine to demonstrate any sign of wanting to live. She'd barely slept for fear of Elaine walking off this veranda, or leaning too far out of one of the countless windows, or simply throwing herself down those 10,000 stairs. Her throat closed at the surge of memories and at the sprawling view, the glimmering ribbon of the Sidra far below, the red-stoned palace built into the side of the flat-topped mountain itself. Nesta dug her hands into her pockets, wishing she'd opted for the warm gloves Feya had coaxed her to take. She'd refused. Or silently refused, since she had not uttered a word to her sister after they'd left the study. Partially because she was afraid of what would come out. For a long moment, Nesta and Cassian watched each other. The wind ripped at his shoulder-length dark hair, but he might have been standing in a summer field for all the reaction he yielded to the cold, so much sharper up here, high above the city. It was all she could do to keep her teeth from clattering their way out of her skull. Cassian finally said, you'll be staying in your old room. As if she had any sort of claim on this place. On anywhere at all. He went on, my room's a level above that. Why would I need to know that? The words snapped out of her. He began walking toward the glass doors that led into the mountain's interior. In case you have a bad dream and need someone to read you a story, he drawled, a half-smile dancing on his face. Maybe one of those smutty books you like so much. Her nostrils flared. But she walked through the door he held open for her nearly sighing at the cosy warmth filling the red stone halls. Her new residence. Sleeping sight. It wasn't a home, this place. Just as her apartment hadn't been a home. Neither had her father's fancy new house, before Hyben had half destroyed it. And neither had the cottage, or the glorious manor before that. Home was a foreign word. But she knew this level of the house of wind well the dining room to the left, and the stairway to her right that would take her down two levels to her floor, and the kitchens a level below that. The library far, far beneath it. She wouldn't have cared where she stayed, except for the convenience of the small, private library also on her level. Which had been the place where she'd discovered those smutty books, as Cassian called them. She'd devoured a few dozen of them during those weeks she'd first been here desperate for any lifeline to keep her from falling apart, from bellowing at what had been done to her body, her life, to Elaine. Elaine, who would not eat, or speak, or do anything at all. Elaine, who had somehow become the adjusted one. In the months leading to and during the war, Nesta had managed. Had stepped into this world, with these people, and started to see it a future. Until she'd been hunted by the King of Hyben and the Cauldron. Until she'd realized that everyone she cared for would be used to hurt her, break her, trap her. Until that last battle when she couldn't stop 1,000 Illyrians from dying, and had instead been able to save only one. Him. She would do it again, if forced to. And knowing that. She couldn't bear that truth, either. Cassian aimed for the downward stairs, his every movement brimming with unfaltering arrogance. I don't need an escort to my room. No matter that his rooms were that way, too. I know how to get there. He threw a smirk over a muscled shoulder and strode down the stairs anyway. I just want to make sure you arrive in one piece before I settle in. He nodded to the landing they passed, the open archway that led into the hall with his bedroom. 
She knew it only because she'd had little more to do during those initial weeks as High Fei than wander this palace like a ghost. Cassian added, AZ is in the room two doors down from mine. They reached the level of her bedroom and he swaggered along the hall. You probably won't see him, though. He's here to spy on me. Her words bounced off the red stone. Cassian said tightly, he says he'd rather stay up here than at the river house. That made two of them. Why? I don't know. He's AZ. He likes his space. He shrugged, the fey light filtering through the golden sconces gilding the taloned apex of his wings. He'll keep to himself, so most of the time it'll be only you and me. She didn't dare reply. Not to all that statement implied. Alone, with Cassian. Here. Cassian stopped in front of a familiar, arched wood door. He leaned against the jam, hazel eyes monitoring her every step. She knew the house belonged to Reese. Knew Cassian's entire existence was paid for by Reese, just as the High Lord bankrolled all of his inner circle. Knew that the fastest and deepest way to annoy Cassian, hurt him right now would be to strike for that, to make him doubt the work he did and whether he deserved to be here. The instinct crept up, a rising wave, each word selected to slice and wound. She'd always had the gift, if it could be called that. Yet it wasn't a curse, not entirely. It had served her well. He scanned her face as she stopped in front of the bedroom door. Let's hear it, NES. Don't call me that. She dangled the words like bait. Let him think her vulnerable. But he pushed off the door, wings tucking in. You need a hot meal. I don't want one. Why? Because I'm not hungry. It was true. Her appetite had been the first thing to go after that battle. Only instinct and the occasional social requirement to appear like she gave a shit about anything kept her eating. You won't last through an hour of training tomorrow without food in your belly. I'm not training at that horrible place. She'd hated Windhaven from the first time she'd seen it, cold and bleak and full of humorless, harsh-faced people. The siphon strapped atop Cashin's left hand gleamed, a red band of light twining from the stone to wrap around the door handle. It yanked the iron downward, the door swinging open with a creak, then vanished like smoke. You were given an order, as well as the alternative to following it. You want to go back to the human lands, be my guest. Then go somewhere else. He'd likely have that preening Morrigan dump her over the border like so much baggage. And Nesta would have called the bluff, except, she knew what she'd face down south. The war had done little to warm human sentiments toward the Fae. She had nowhere to go. Elaine, mourn as she might for the life she would have had with Grayson, had found a place, a role here. Tending to the gardens of Fae's veritable palace on the river, helping other residents of Valaris restore their own destroyed gardens, she had purpose, and joy, and friends, those two half-wraiths who worked in Ryzen's household. But those things had always come easily to her sister. Had always made Elaine special. Had made Nesta fight like hell to keep Elaine safe at all costs. The cauldron had learned that. The king of Hyben had learned it, too. An old, heavy weight tugged her down, oblivion beckoning. I'm tired. Her words came out mercifully flat. Take the day to rest, then. Cassian said, his voice a shade quiet. More or Reese will winnow us up to Windhaven after breakfast tomorrow. She said nothing. He went on, we'll start easy, two hours of training, then lunch, then you'll be brought back here to meet with Clotho. She didn't have the energy to ask further about the training, or the work in the library with its high priestess. She didn't really care. Let Reese and Anfea and Amran and Cassian make her do this bullshit. Let them think it could somehow make a lick of difference. Nesta didn't bother to reply before she strode through the archway and into her bedroom. But she felt his stare on her, assessing every step over the threshold, the way her hand gripped the side of the door, 
the way she flexed her fingers before she slammed it shut. Nesta waited mere feet inside the bedroom, blinking at the glaring light through the wall of windows at its other end. A scuff of boots on stone informed her that he'd left. It wasn't until the sound faded completely that she took in the room before her, unchanged since she'd last been in it, the connecting door to Elaine's old suite now sealed shut. The wide space easily accommodated a mammoth four-poster bed against the wall to her left, as well as a small sitting area to her right, complete with a sofa and two chairs. A carved marble fireplace occupied the wall before the sitting area, mercifully dark, and multiple rugs lay scattered throughout, offering reprieve from the chilly stone floors. But that wasn't what she'd liked about this room. No, it was what she now faced, the wall of windows that overlooked the city, the river, the flatlands and distant sparkle of sea beyond. All that land, all those people, so far away. As if this palace floated in the clouds. There had been some days up here when the mist had been thick enough to block the view below, swirling so close to the window that she'd been able to trail her fingers through it. No tendrils of mist drifted by now, though. The windows revealed nothing but a clear early autumn day, the sunlight near blinding. Seconds ticked by. Minutes. A familiar roaring built in her ears. That heavy hollowness tugged her down, as surely as some fairy creature wrapping its bony hands around her ankle and yanking her beneath a dark surface. As surely as she had been shoved under that eternal, icy water in the cauldron. Nesta's body became distant, foreign, as she shut the heavy grey velvet curtains against the light. Shrouding the room in darkness bit by bit. She ignored the three bags and two trunks set beside the dresser as she approached the bed. She barely managed to toe off her shoes before she slid beneath the layers of white down blankets and quilts, closed her eyes, and breathed. And breathed. And breathed. Chapter. 4. Moore had already commandeered a table at the riverfront cafe, an arm slung across the back of a wrought iron chair, the other elegantly draped over her crossed knees. Cassian halted a few feet from the maze of tables along the walkway, smiling to himself at the sight of her, head tipped toward the sun, unbound hair gleaming and rippling around her like liquid gold, her full lips curled upward, basking in the light. She never stopped appreciating the sunshine. Even five hundred years after leaving that veritable prison she'd called home and the monsters who claimed her as kin, his friend, his sister, honestly, still savoured every moment in the sun. As if the first seventeen years of her life, spent in the darkness of the hewn city, still lurked around her like Azid's shadows. Cassian cleared his throat as he approached the table, offering pleasant smiles to the other patrons and people along the walkway who either gawked or waved at him, and by the time he sat, Moore was already smirking, her brown eyes lit with amusement. Don't start, he warned, settling his wings around the chair's back and motioning to the owner of the cafe, who knew him well enough to understand that meant he wanted water, no tea or sweets, both of which Moore had before her. Moore grinned, so beautiful it took his breath away. Can't I enjoy the sight of my friend being fawned over by the public? He rolled his eyes, and murmured his thanks to the owner as a pitcher of water and a glass appeared before him. Moore said when the owner had gone to tend to other tables, I seem to remember a time when you enjoyed that sort of thing, too. I was a young, arrogant idiot. He cringed to recall how he'd strutted around after successful battles or missions, believing he deserved the praise of strangers. For too damn long, he'd indulged in that bullshit. It had taken walking these same streets after Rhys had been imprisoned by Amarantha, after Rhys sacrificed so much to shield this city, and seeing the disappointment and fear in so many faces, to make Cassian realize what a fool he'd been. Moore cleared her throat, as if sensing the direction of his thoughts. She didn't possess Rhys's skill set, but having survived in the court of nightmares, she'd learned to read the subtlest of expressions. A mere blink, she'd once told him, might mean the difference between life and death in that miserable court. She settled, then. Cassian knew who she meant. Taking a nap. Moore snorted. Don't. 
his attention drifting to the glittering Sidra mere feet away. Please don't. Moore sipped her tea, the portrait of elegant innocence. We'd be better off throwing Nesta into the court of nightmares. She'd thrive there. Cassian clenched his jaw, both at the insult and the truth. That's exactly the sort of existence we're trying to steer her away from. Moore assessed him with a bob of her thick lashes. It pains you seeing her like this. All of it pains me. He and Moore had always had this kind of relationship, truth at all costs, however harsh. Ever since that first and only time they'd slept together, when he'd learned too late that she'd hidden from him the terrible repercussions. When he'd seen her broken body and known that even if she'd lied to him, he'd still played a part. Cassian blew out a breath, shaking away the blood-soaked memory still staining his mind five centuries later. It pains me that Nesta has become, this. It pains me that she and Fea are always at each other's throats. It pains me that Fea hurts over it, and I know Nesta does, too. It pains me that. He drummed his fingers on the table, then sipped from his water. I really don't want to talk about it. All right. The breeze ruffled the gauzy fabric of Moore's twilight blue dress. He again let himself admire her perfect face. Beyond the disastrous consequences for Moore after their night together, the fallout with Reese afterward had been awful, and Osriel had been so furious in his own quiet way that Cassian had quelled any further desire for Moore. Had let lust turn into affection, and all romantic feelings turn into familial bonds. But he could still admire her sheer beauty as he'd admire any work of art. Even though he knew well that what lay inside Moore was far more lovely and perfect than her exterior. He wondered if she knew that. Drinking again, he said, tell me what happened in Valahan. The ancient, mountainous fey territory across the northern sea had been stirring since before the war with Hyben, and had been both enemy and ally to Prithian in different historical eras. What role Valahan's hot-tempered king and proud people would play in this new world of theirs was yet to be decided, though much of its fate seemed to depend upon Moore's now frequent presence at their court as Reese's emissary. Indeed, Moore's eyes shuttered. They don't want to sign the new treaty. Fuck. Reese, Feyre, and Amran had spent months working on that treaty, with input from their allies in other courts and territories. Helion, High Lord of the Day Court and Reese's closest ally, had been the most involved. Helion Spellcleaver was unrivaled in sheer, swaggering arrogance, he'd probably made up the moniker himself. But the male had 1,000 libraries at his disposal, and had put them all to good use for the treaty. I've spent weeks in that blasted court, Moore said, poking at the flaky pastry beside her teacup, freezing my ass off, trying to kiss their cold asses and their king and queen refused the treaty. I came home on the earlier side today because I knew any more last-minute pushing from me would be unwelcome. My time there was supposed to be a friendly visit, after all. Why won't they sign it? Because those stupid human queens are stirring, their army still isn't disbanded. The Queen of Valahan even asked me what the point of a peace treaty would be when another war, this time against the humans, might redraw the territory lines far below the wall. I don't think Valahan is interested in peace. Or allying with us. So Valahan wants another war in order to add to their territory. They'd already seized more than their fair share after the war 500 years ago. They're bored, Moore said, frowning with distaste. And the humans, despite those queens, are far weaker than we are. Pushing into human lands is low-hanging fruit. Montesir and Rask are likely thinking the same thing. Cassian groaned skyward. That had been the fear during the recent war, that those three territories across the sea might ally with Hyben. Had they, there would have been no chance at all of survival. Now, even with Hyben's king dead, its people remained angry. An army might be raised again in Hyben. And if it united with Valahan, if Montesir and Rask joined with the goal of claiming more territory from the humans. You already told Rhys this. It wasn't a question, but Moore nodded. 
that's why he's asking you to look into what's going on with the human queens. I'm taking a few days off before I head back to Valahan, but Reese needs to know where the human queens stand in all of this. So you're supposed to convince Valahan not to start another war, and I'm supposed to convince the human queens not to do so, either. You won't get near the human queens, Moore said frankly. But from what I observed in Valahan, I know they're up to something. Planning something. We just can't figure out what, or why the humans would be stupid enough to start a war they cannot win. They'd need something in their arsenal that could grant them the advantage. That's what you have to find out. Cassian tapped his booted foot on the stones of the walkway. No pressure. Moore drained her tea. Playing courtier isn't all nice clothes and fancy parties. He scowled. Long moments passed in amiable silence, though Cassian half heard the wind whispering over the sidra, the merry chatter of the people around them, the clink of silverware against plates. Content to let him think, Moore returned to her sunning. Cassian straightened. There's one person who knows those queens inside and out. Who can offer some insight? Moore opened an eye, then slowly sat forward, hair falling around her like a rippling golden river. Oh? Vassa. Cassian hadn't dealt much with the ousted human queen, the only good one out of the surviving group, who had been betrayed by her fellow queens when they'd sold her to a sorcerer lord who'd cursed her to be a firebird by day, woman by night. She'd been lucky, they'd given the other rebellious queen in their midst to the Atta. Who had then impaled her on a lamppost a few bridges away from where Cassian and Moore now sat today. Moore nodded. She might be able to help. He leaned his arms on the table. Lucian is living with Vassa. And Jurian. He's supposed to be our emissary to the human lands. Let him deal with it. Moore took another bite from her pastry. Lucian can't be entirely trusted anymore. Cassian started. What? Even with Elaine here, he's become close with Durian and Vassa. He's voluntarily living with them these days, and not just as an emissary. As their friend. Cassian went over all he'd heard and observed from his encounters with Lucian since the war, trying to contemplate it like Reese and Moore would. He's spent months helping them sort out the politics of who rules Prithian's slice of the human lands. Cassian said slowly. So Lucian can't be unbiased in reporting to us on Vassa. Moore nodded gravely. Lucian might mean well, but any reports would be skewed even if he isn't aware of it in their favor. We need someone outside of their little bubble to collect information and report. She finished off her pastry. Which would be you. Fine. That made sense. Why haven't we already contacted Vassar about this? Moore waved a hand, though her shadowed eyes belied her casual gesture. Because we're just now piecing it all together. But you should definitely speak with her, when you can. As soon as you can, actually. Cassian nodded. He didn't dislike Vassar, though meeting her would also entail talking with Lucian and Durian. The former he'd learned to live with, but the latter. It didn't matter that it turned out that Durian had been fighting on their side. That the human general who'd been Amarantha's tortured prisoner for five centuries had played Hyben after being rebirthed by the cauldron, and had helped Cassian and his family win the war. Cassian still didn't like the man. He rose, leaning to ruffle Moore's shining hair. I miss you these days. She'd been away frequently lately, and each time she returned, a shadow he couldn't place dimmed her eyes. You know we'd warn you if Kia ever came here. Her asshole of a father still hadn't called in his favor with Reese to visit Valarius. Eris bought me time. Her words were laced with acid. Cassian had tried not to believe it, but he knew Eris had done it as a gesture of good faith. He'd invited Reese and into his mind to see exactly why he'd convinced Kier to indefinitely delay his visit to Valarius. Only Eris had that sort of sway with the power hungry Kier, and whatever Eris had offered Kier in exchange for not coming here was still a mystery. At least to Cassian. Reese probably knew. 
From Moore's pale face, he wondered if she knew, too. Eris must have sacrificed something big to spare Moore from her father's visit, which would have likely been timed for a moment that would maximize tormenting her. It doesn't matter to me. Moore waved off the conversation with a flip of her hand. He could tell something else was eating at her. But she'd let him in when she was ready. Cassian walked around the table and pressed a kiss to the top of her head. Get some rest. He shot skyward before she could answer. Nesta woke to pure darkness. Darkness that she had not witnessed in years now. Since that ramshackle cottage that had become a prison and a hell. Jolting upright, hands clutching at her chest, she gasped for air. Had it been some fever dream on a winter's night? She was still in that cottage, still starving and poor and desperate. No. The air in the room was toasty, and she was the lone person in the bed, not clinging to her sisters for warmth, always squabbling over who got the coveted middle place in the bed on the coldest nights, or the edges on the hottest summer ones. And though she'd become as bony as she'd been during those long winters, this body was new, too. Faye. Powerful. Or it had once been. Scrubbing at her face, Nesta slid from the bed. The floors were warmed. Not the icy wooden planks in the cottage. Padding to the window, she drew back the drapes and peered out at the darkened city below. Golden lights shone along the streets, dancing on the twining band of the Sidra. Beyond that, only starlight silvered the lowlands before the cold and empty sea. A scan of the sky revealed nothing regarding how far off dawn might be, and a long moment of listening suggested the household remained asleep. All three of them who occupied it. How long had she slept? They'd arrived by eleven in the morning, and she'd fallen asleep soon after that. She'd consumed absolutely nothing all day. Her stomach grumbled. But she ignored it, leaning her brow against the cool glass of the window. She let the starlight gently brush her head, her face, her neck. Imagined it running its shimmering fingers down her cheek, as her mother had done for her and her alone. My Nesta. Elaine shall wed for love and beauty, but you, my cunning little queen. You shall wed for conquest. Her mother would thrash in her grave to know that, years later, her Nesta had come dangerously close to marrying a weak willed woodcutter's son who had sat idly by while his father beat his mother. Who had put his hands on her when she called things off between them. Who had then attempted to take what she hadn't offered. Nesta had tried to forget Thomas. She often found herself wishing the cauldron had ripped those memories away just as it had her humanity, but his face sometimes sullied her dreams. Her waking thoughts. Sometimes, she could still feel his rough hands pouring at her, bruising her. Sometimes, the coppery tang of his blood still coated her tongue. Pulling back from the window, Nesta studied those distant stars again. Half wondered if they might speak. My Nesta, her mother had always called her, even on her deathbed, so wasted and pale from typhus. My little queen. Nesta had once delighted in the title had done her best to fulfill its promise, indulging in a dazzling life that had melted away as soon as the debtors swept in and all her so-called friends had revealed themselves to be nothing more than envious cowards wearing smiling masks. Not one of them had offered to help save the Arkheron family from poverty. They had thrown them all, mere children and a crumbling man, to the wolves. So Nesta had become a wolf. Armed herself with invisible teeth and claws, and learned to strike faster, deeper, more lethally. Had relished it. But when the time came to put away the wolf, she'd found it had devoured her, too. The stars flickered above the city, as if blinking their agreement. Nesta curled her hands into fists and climbed back into bed. Cauldron damn him, maybe he shouldn't have agreed to bring her here. Cassian lay awake in his behemoth of a bed large enough for three Illyrian warriors to sleep side by side, wings and all. Little in the room itself had changed in the past five hundred years. More occasionally groused about wanting to redecorate the House of Wind, but he liked this room how it was. 
He'd awoken at the sound of a door shutting and been instantly alert, heart hammering as he pulled free the knife he kept on the nightstand. Two more were hidden under his mattress, another set above the doorway, and two swords lay beneath the bed and in a dresser drawer, respectively. That was just his collection. The mother knew what Azed had stored in his own room. He supposed that between him, Azed, Moore, and Reese, in the five centuries they'd used the House of Wind, they had filled it with enough weapons to arm a small legion. They'd hidden and stashed and forgotten about so many of them that there was always a good chance of sitting on a couch and being poked in the ass by something. And a good chance that most of the weapons were now little more than rust in their sheaths. But the ones in this bedroom, those he kept oiled and clean. Ready. The knife gleamed in the starlight, his siphons fluttering with red light as his power scanned the hall beyond the door. But no threat emerged, no enemy breaching the new wards. Hyben's soldiers had broken through more than a year ago, nearly getting their hands on Feyre and Nesta in the library. He hadn't forgotten it, that terror on Nesta's face as she'd raced for him, arms outstretched. But the sound in the hall. Osriel, he'd realized a heartbeat later. That he'd heard the door at all told him Azid wanted him aware of his return. Hadn't wanted to talk but had wanted Cassian to know that he was around. Which had left Cassian here, staring at the ceiling, his siphon slumbering once more and knife again sheathed and set on the nightstand. From the star's position, he knew it was past three, dawn was still far off. He should get some sleep. Tomorrow would be hard enough. As if his silent plea had gone out into the world, a smooth male voice purred into his mind. Why are you up so late? Cassian scanned the sky beyond the wall of windows, as if he'd see Reese flying there. I have the same question for you. Reese chuckled. I told you, I had some apologizing to do with my mate. A long, wicked pause. We're taking a break. Cassian laughed. Let the poor female sleep. She was the one who initiated this round. Pure male satisfaction edged every word. You still didn't answer my question. Why are you snooping on me at this hour? I wanted to make sure all was well. It's not my fault you were already up. Cassian let out a soft groan. It's fine. Nesta went to sleep right after we got here and stayed in bed. I'm assuming she's still asleep. You got there before eleven. I know. It's 3.15 in the morning. I know. The silence was pointed enough that Cassian added, don't butt in. I wouldn't dream of it. Cassian didn't particularly want to have this conversation, not at three in the morning and certainly not twice in one day. I'll check in tomorrow night with an update on the first lesson. Reese's pause was again too pointed to ignore. But his brother said, more will bring you up to Windhaven. Good night, Cass. The dark presence in his mind faded, leaving him hollow and chilled. Tomorrow would be a battlefield unlike any other he'd walked onto. Cassian wondered how much of him would be left intact by the end of it. Chapter 5 If you don't eat that, you're going to regret it in about 30 minutes. Seated at the long table in the House of Wind's dining room, Nesta looked up from the plate of scrambled eggs and steaming bowl of porridge. Sleep still weighed her bones, sharpening her temper as she said, I'm not eating this. Cassian dug into his own portion, nearly double what lay before her. It's either that or nothing. Nesta kept perfectly still in her chair, keenly aware of every movement in the fighting leathers she'd donned. She'd forgotten how it felt to wear pants, the nakedness of having her thighs and ass on display. Mercifully, Cassian had been too busy reading some report to see her slink in and slide into her seat. She glanced toward the doorway, hoping a servant might appear. I'll eat toast. You'll burn through that in ten minutes and be tired. Cassian nodded toward the porridge. Put some milk in it if you need to make it more palatable he added before she could demand it, there's no sugar. 
She clenched the spoon. As punishment. Again, it'll give you energy for a short blast, and then make you crash. He shoveled eggs into his mouth. You need to keep your energy level constant throughout the day, foods full of sugar or flimsy bread give you a temporary high. Lean meats, whole grains, and fruits and vegetables keep you relatively steady and full. She drummed her nails on the smooth table. She'd sat here several times before with the members of Ryzen's court. Today, with only the two of them, it felt obscenely large. Are there any other areas of my daily life that you're going to be presiding over? He shrugged, not pausing his eating. Don't give me a reason to add any more to the list. Arrogant asshole. Cassian nodded toward the food again. Eat. She shoved the spoon into the bowl but didn't lift it. Have it your way, then. He finished his porridge and returned to the eggs. How long will today's session be? The dawn had revealed clear skies, though she knew the Illyrian mountains had their own weather. Might already be crusted in the first snows. As I said yesterday, the lesson is two hours. Right until lunch. He set his bowl on his plate, piling the silverware within. They vanished a heartbeat later, taken by the magic of the house. Which will be the next time we eat. He glanced pointedly at her food. Nesta leaned back in her chair. One, I'm not participating in this lesson. Two, I'm not hungry. His hazel eyes guttered. Not eating won't bring your father back. That has nothing to do with this, she hissed. Nothing. He braced his forearms on the table. We're going to cut the bullshit. You think I haven't gone through what you're dealing with? You think I haven't seen and done and felt all that before? And seen those I love deal with it, too? You aren't the first, and you won't be the last. What happened to your father was terrible, Nesta, but. She shot to her feet. You don't know anything. She couldn't stop the shaking that overtook her. From rage or something else, she didn't know. She balled her hands into fists. Keep your fucking opinions to yourself. He blinked at the profanity, at what she guessed was the white hot rage crinkling her face. And then he said, Who taught you to curse? She squeezed her fists harder. You L.O.T. You have the filthiest mouths I've ever heard. Cashin's eyes narrowed with amusement, but his mouth remained a thin line. I'll keep my fucking opinions to myself if you eat. She threw every bit of venom she could muster into her gaze. He only waited. Unmovable as the mountain into which the house had been built. Nesta sat down grabbed the bowl of porridge, shoved a lumpy spoonful into her mouth, and nearly gagged at the taste. But she forced it down. Then another spoonful. Another. Until the bowl was clean and she started on the eggs. Cassian monitored each bite. And when there was nothing left, she scooped up her plate and bowl and held his stare as she dumped her dishes atop each other, the sound of the rattling silverware filling the room. She again rose, stalking toward him. The doorway beyond him. He stood as well. Nesta could have sworn he wasn't breathing as she passed, close enough that a shift of her elbow would have had it brushing his stomach. She said sweetly, I look forward to your silence. Unable to help the smirk blooming on her mouth, she aimed for the door. But a hand on her arm stopped her. Cashin's eyes blazed the red siphon tethered on the back of the hand that gripped her fluttering with colour. A wicked, taunting smile curved his lips. Glad to see you woke up ready to play, Nesta. His voice dropped to a low rumble. She couldn't help the thundering of her heart at that voice, the challenge in his eyes, the nearness and size of him. Had never been able to help it. Had once let him nuzzle and lick at her throat because of it had let him kiss her during the final battle because of it. Barely a kiss about all he could manage in his injured state and yet it had shattered her entirely. I have no regrets in my life, but this. That we did not have time. 
that I did not have time with you, Nesta. I will find you again in the next world, the next life. And we will have that time. I promise. She relived those moments more often than she cared to admit. The press of his fingers as he'd cupped her face, the way his mouth had felt and tasted, tinged with blood but still tender. She couldn't bear it. Cassian didn't so much as blink, though his grip on her arm gentled. She willed herself not to swallow. Willed her surging blood to chill to ice. His eyes again narrowed with amusement, but he let go. You have five minutes until we leave. Nesta managed to step away. You're a brute. He winked. Born and raised. She managed another step. If she refused to leave the house, Cassian or Morrigan or Reese could just haul her to Windhaven. And if she flat out refused to do anything, they'd drop her in the human lands without a second thought. The realization was enough to steal her further. Don't ever put your hands on me again. Noted. His eyes still blazed. Her fingers curled once more. She selected her next words like throwing knives. If you think this training nonsense is going to result in you climbing into my bed, you're delusional. She added with a slice of a smile, I'd sooner let in a mangy street dog. Oh, it's not going to result in me climbing into your bed. Nesta snickered, victory achieved, and had reached the stairs when he crooned, you'll climb into mine. She whirled toward him, foot still suspended midair. I'd rather rot. Cassian threw her a mocking smile. We'll see. She fumbled for more of those sharp-edged words, for a sneer or a snarl or anything, but his smile grew. You have three minutes to get ready now. Nesta debated chucking the nearest thing at him a vase on a little pedestal beside the doorway. But demonstrating that he'd gotten under her skin would be too satisfying for him. So she merely shrugged and walked through the doorway. Slowly. Utterly unaffected by him and his swaggering, insufferable boasts. Climb into his bed, indeed. Those pants were going to kill him. Brutally, thoroughly kill him. Cassian hadn't forgotten the sight of Nesta in Illyrian fighting leathers during the war, not at all. But compared to the memory. Mother above. Every word, every language he knew had vanished at the sight of her striding past, straight-backed and unhurried as any noble lady presiding over her household. Cassian knew he'd let her win that round, that he'd lost the upper hand the moment she threw him that little shrug and continued into the hall, unaware of the view it presented. How it made every thought beyond the most primal eddy out of his mind. Settling himself required the entire three minutes she was downstairs. The mother knew he had enough to deal with today, both with Nesta's lesson and beyond it, without descending into thoughts of peeling those pants off her and worshipping every inch of that spectacular backside. He couldn't afford distractions like that. Not for a million reasons. But fuck, when had he last had a satisfying role in the sheets? Certainly not since the war. Maybe since before Feyre had freed them all from Amarantha's grip. Cauldron boil him, it had been the month before Amarantha had fallen, hadn't it? With that female he'd met at Rita's. In an alley outside the pleasure hall. Against a brick wall. Quick and dirty and over within minutes, neither he nor the female wanting anything more than swift release. That had been more than two years ago. It had been his hand ever since. He should have scratched that particular itch before deciding that living in the house with Nesta was a good idea. She was hurting and adrift and the last thing she needed was him panting after her. Grabbing her arm like an animal, unable to stop himself from drawing near. She wanted nothing to do with him. She'd said as much at winter solstice. I've made my thoughts clear enough on what I want from you. A whole lot of nothing. It had cracked an intrinsic piece of him, some final resistance and shred of hope that everything they'd endured during the war might amount to something. That when he spilled his heart to her as he lay dying, that when she'd covered him with her body and chosen to die alongside him, 
she'd chosen him, too. A stupid fucking hope, and one he should have known better than to harbour. So that winter solstice night on the icy streets, when he knew she'd only shown up at the townhouse to get the money Faya had dangled in exchange for making an appearance, when she'd asserted that she wanted nothing to do with him, he'd thrown the present he'd spent months hunting down into the frozen Sidra and then busied himself with quelling the growing dissent amongst the Illyrians. And he'd stayed away from her for the intervening nine months. Far, far away. He'd come so close to making a stupid mistake that night, to laying his heart bare for her to rip out of his chest. He'd hardly managed to walk away with some semblance of pride. Over his cold, dead body would she do that to him again. Nesto emerged, her braided hair now coiled across the crown of her head like a woven tiara. He made a point not to look beneath her neck. At the body left on display. She needed to gain back the weight she'd lost, and pack on some muscle, but, those fucking leathers. Let's go, he said, his voice rough and cold. Thank the cauldron for that. On the veranda beyond the dining room's glass doors, Moore landed, as if plunging from the thirty feet above the wards was nothing. For her, Cassian supposed it was. Moore hopped from foot to foot, rubbing her arms and gritting her teeth, and gave him a look that said, you owe me so big for this, asshole. Nesta scowled, but slung on her cloak, each movement graceful and unhurried, then aimed for where Moore waited. Cassian would fly them both out beyond the ward's reach, then Moore would winnow them to Windhaven. Where he'd somehow find a way to convince Nesta to train. But thankfully, Nesta knew that she had to do the bare minimum today, which meant going to Windhaven. She'd always known how to wage this kind of emotional, mental warfare. She'd have made a fine general. Might still be one, someday. Cassian couldn't tell if it would be a good thing. To turn Nesta into that sort of a weapon. She'd pointed at the King of Hyben in a death promise before she'd been turned Hyphae against her will. Months later, she'd held up his severed head like a trophy and stared into his dead eyes. And if the bone carver had spoken true about her emerging from the cauldron as something to fear. Fuck. He didn't bother with his cloak as he yanked open the glass doors breathing in a face full of crisp autumn air, and stalked toward Moore's opening arms. No ice or snow crusted the mountain hold of Windhaven, but it didn't stop the bitter cold from slamming into Nesta the moment they appeared. Morrigan vanished with a wink at Cassian and a warning glower thrown at Nesta, leaving them assessing the field stretching ahead. A few small stone houses rose to the right, and beyond them stood some new residences made of fresh pine. A village, that was what this place had become recently. But immediately before them lay the fighting rings, right along the edge of the flat mountaintop, fully stocked with various weapons, weights, and training supplies. Nesta had no idea what any of the impressive varieties were, beyond their basic names, sword, dagger, arrow, shield, spear, bow, brutal-looking round spiky ball on a chain. On their other side smouldered fire pits, clouds of smoke drifting to a fenced-in array of livestock, sheep and pigs and goats, all shaggy but well-fed. And, of course, the Illyrians themselves. Females tended to steaming pots and pans around those fires, and all of them halted when Cassian and Nesta appeared. So did the dozens of males in those sparring rings. None smiled. A broad-shouldered, stocky male whom Nesta vaguely recognized sauntered their way, flanked too deep by younger males. They all had their wings tucked in tight, perhaps to walk as a unit, but as they stopped in front of Cassian, those wings spread slightly. Cassian kept his in what Nesta called his casual spread, not wide, but not tucked in close. The position conveyed the perfect amount of ease and arrogance, readiness and power. The familiar male's gaze snagged on her. What's her business here? Nesta gave him a secretive smile. Witchcraft. She could have sworn Cassian muttered a plea to the mother before he cut in, I will remind you, Devlin, that Nesta Arkharin is our high lady's sister, and will be treated with respect. The words held enough of a bite that even Nesta glanced at Cassian's stone-cold face. 
She had not heard that unyielding tone since the war. She will be training here. Nesta wanted nothing more than to shove him off the nearby cliff edge. Devlin's face curdled. Any weapons she touches must be buried afterward. Leave them in a pile. Nesta blinked. Cashin's nostrils flared. We will do no such thing. Devlin sniffed at her, his crony snickering. Are you bleeding, witch? If you are, you will not be allowed to touch the weapons at all. Nesta made herself pause. Contemplate the best way to knock the bastard down a few pegs. Cassian said with remarkable steadiness, those are outdated superstitions. She can touch the weapons whether she has her cycle or not. She can, Devlin said, but they will still be buried. Silence fell. Nesta didn't fail to note that Cashin's expression had darkened as he stared down Devlin. But he said abruptly, how are the new recruits faring? Devlin opened his mouth, then shut it, irritation flashing there at a fight denied. Fine, he spat, and turned away, his soldiers following. Cashin's face tightened with each breath, and Nesta braced herself, a thrill slowly building in her blood, for him to rip into Devlin. But Cassian growled, let's go, and began walking toward an empty training area. Devlin glared over a shoulder, and Nesta threw him a cool look before striding after Cassian. The Illyrian's gaze lingered like a burning brand on her spine. Cassian didn't go for one of the countless weapons racks stationed throughout the training area. He just halted in the farthest ring, hands on his hips, and waited for her. Like hell would she join him. She spied a weather-worn rock near the rack of weapons, its smoothness either from the harsh climate or the untold number of warriors who'd taken a seat on it as she did then. Its frigid surface bit into her skin even through the thickness of the leathers. What are you doing? Cashin's handsome face was nearly predatory. She crossed her legs at the ankles and arranged the fall of her cape like the train of a gown. I told you, I'm not training. Get up. He'd never ordered her like that. Get up, she'd sobbed that day before the king of Hyben. Get up. Nesta met his stare. Wald has to be distant and unruffled. I am officially attending training, Cassian, but you can't make me do a lick of it. She motioned to the mud. Drag me through it, if you want, but I won't lift a finger. The Illyrian stares pelted them like stones. Cassian bristled. Good. Let him see what a waste of life, what an utter wretch, she'd become. Get the hell up. His words were a soft snarl. Devlin and his group had returned, attracted by their argument, and gathered beyond the edge of the circle. Cashin's hazel eyes remained fixed on her, though. A slight pleading note flickered in them. Get up, a small voice whispered in her head, her bones. Don't humiliate him like this. Don't give these assholes the satisfaction of seeing him made a fool. But her body refused to move. She'd drawn her line, and to yield to him, to anyone. Something like disgust filled his face. Disappointment. Anger. Good. Even as something crumpled inside her, she couldn't stop the relief. Cassian turned away from her, drawing the sword sheathed down his back. And without another word, without a glance, he began his morning exercises. Let him hate her. It was better that way. Chapter 6 Each series of steps and movements Cassian went through was beautiful and lethal and precise, and it was all Nesta could do to not gawk. She'd never been able to look away from him. From the moment they'd met, she developed a keen awareness of his presence in any space, any room. She hadn't been able to stop it, to block it out, no matter how much she suggested otherwise. Go! He had begged her as he lay dying. I can't, she'd wept. I can't. She didn't know where the person she'd been in that moment had gone. Couldn't find her way back to her. 
But even as she sat on that rock and stared at the swaying pines covering the mountains, she watched Cassian from the corner of her eye, aware of every graceful movement, the rasp of his steady breathing, the flow of his dark hair in the wind. Hard at work, I see. Morrigan's voice drew Nesta's gaze from the mountains and the warrior who seemed so much a part of them. The stunning female stood beside her, brown eyes fixed on Cassian, admiration shining in them. There was no sign of Devlin or his followers, as if they'd drifted away long ago. Had it been two hours already? Moore said mildly, he is pretty, isn't he? Nesta's spine stiffened at the warmth in her tone. Just ask him. No amusement lit Morrigan's face as she shifted her attention down to Nesta. Why aren't you out there? I'm taking a break. Morrigan's gaze swept over Nesta's face, noting the lack of sweat or flushed skin, the hair barely out of place. The female said quietly, my vote would have been to dump you right back in the human lands, you know. Oh, I know. Nesta refused to stand, to meet the challenge. Good thing being Faya's sister has its advantages. Morrigan's lip curled. Beyond her, Cassian had halted his smooth movements. Dark fire simmered in Morrigan's eyes. I knew plenty of people like you once. Her hand drifted to her abdomen. You never deserve the benefit of the doubt that good people like him give you. Nesta was well aware of that. And knew what manner of people Morrigan referred to those who dwelled in the court of nightmares in the Hewn City. Faya had never told her the full story, but Nesta knew the bare details, the monsters who had tormented and brutalized Morrigan until she was thrown to the wolves. Nesta leaned back on her hands, the cold rock biting through her gloves. She opened her mouth, but Cassian had reached them, breathless and gleaming with sweat. You're early. I wanted to see how things were coming along. Morrigan pulled her burning gaze from Nesta. Seems like today was a slow start. Cassian raked his fingers through his hair. You could say that. Nesta clenched her jaw hard enough to hurt. Morrigan extended a hand to him, and then threw one toward Nesta without so much as a glance. Shall we? Morrigan was a self righteous busybody. The thought raged through Nesta as she stood in the subterranean library beneath the House of Wind. A vain, self-righteous busybody. Cassian hadn't spoken to her upon their return. She hadn't waited to see if he'd offer lunch, either, before going to her room and taking a bath to warm her bones. When she'd emerged, she found that a note had been slipped beneath her door. In tight, bold lettering, it told her to be in the library at one. No threats, no promises to ship her off to the human lands. As if he didn't care whether she obeyed. Well, at least breaking him had been accomplished faster than she'd anticipated. She'd ventured to the library not because of any desire to obey his or Ryzen's commands, but because the alternative was equally unbearable, sitting in her silent bedroom, nothing but the roaring in her head to fill the quiet. It had been more than a year since she'd last been down here. Since those terrifying moments when Hyben's assassins had snuck in, chasing her and Faya into the dark heart of the library. She peered over the edge of the landing's stone railing, straight into the black pit far below. No ancient creature slumbered in that darkness anymore, but the dimness remained. And at its bottom lay the ground where Cassian had landed, reaching for her. There had been such rage on his face at the sight of her terror. She sliced off the thought, pushed back the tremor that went through her, and focused on the female sitting at the desk, nearly hidden by columns of books stacked there. The female's hands were wrecked. There was no polite way of describing them beyond that. Bones bent and knobbed, fingers at the wrong angles. Thea had once mentioned that the priestesses in this library had difficult pasts to say the least. Nesta didn't want to know what had been done to Clotho, the library's high priestess, to render her thus. To have her tongue cut out and then deliberately healed that way so the damage might never be undone. Males had hurt her, Anne. Hands shoving her down, down, 
down into freezing water, voices laughing and sneering. A brutish male face grinning as he anticipated the trophy that would be pulled forth. She couldn't stop it. Couldn't save Elaine, sobbing on the floor. Couldn't save herself. No one was coming to rescue her, and these males would do what they wanted, and her body was not her own, not human, not for much longer. Nesta wrenched her thoughts back to the present, blasting back the memory. Her face veiled in the shadows beneath her pale hood, Clotho sat in silence, as if she'd seen the thoughts blare through Nesta, as if she knew how often the memory of that day in Hyben woke her. The limpid blue stone crowning the hood of Clotho's robe flickered like a siphon in the dim light as she slid a piece of parchment across the desk. You can begin today by shelving books on level 3. Take the ramp behind me to reach it. There will be a cart with the books, which are organized alphabetically by author. If there is no author, set them aside and ask for help at the end of your shift. Nesta nodded. When is the end of my shift? Using her wrists and the backs of her hands, Clotho pulled a small clock to herself. Pointed with a bulging knuckle to the six o'clock marker. Five hours of work. Nesta could do that. Fine. Clotho considered her again. Like she could see the churning, roaring sea inside her, that refused to leave her alone for so much as a moment, that refused to grant her a second of peace. Nesta lowered her eyes to the desk. Forced herself to release a breath. But with its escape past her lips, that familiar weight swept in. I am worthless and I am nothing, Nesta nearly said. She wasn't sure why the words bubbled up pressing on her lips to voice them. I hate everything that I am. And I am so, so tired. I am tired of wanting to be anywhere but in my own head. She waited for Clotho to gesture, to do anything to say she'd heard the thoughts. The priestess motioned to the library above and below. A silent dismissal. Feet heavy, Nesta made her way to the sloping ramp. The task was menial, but required enough concentration that time slipped away, her mind quieting to a blissful nothing. No one approached Nesta as she hunted down sections and shelves, fingers skimming over the spines of books as she searched for the right place. There were at least three dozen priestesses who worked and researched and healed here, though it was nearly impossible to count them when they all wore the same pale robes and so many kept the hoods over their faces. The ones who'd left their hoods down had offered her tentative smiles. This was their sanctuary, gifted to them by Resand. No one could enter without their permission. Which meant they'd approved her presence, for whatever reason. Nesta's hands were near withered with dust by the time a bell chimed six silvery peals throughout the cavernous library, ringing from its top levels down to the black pit. Some priestesses rose from where they worked at the desks and chairs on each level, some remained. She found Clotho at the same desk. Did she ever lift her hood? She must, in order to bathe, but did she ever show anyone her face? I'm done for the day, Nesta announced. Clotho slid another note across the desk. Thank you for your assistance. We will see you tomorrow. All right. Nesta pocketed the note. But Clotho held up a broken hand. Nesta watched with no shortage of awe as a fountain pen lifted above a piece of paper and began to write. Wear clothes you don't mind getting dusty. You'll wreck that beautiful dress down here. Nesta glanced to the grey gown she'd thrown on. All right, she repeated. The pen began moving again somehow spelled to connect with Clotho's thoughts. It was nice to meet you, Nesta. Fea speaks highly of you. Nesta turned away. No one likes a liar, priestess. She could have sworn a breath of amusement fluttered from beneath the female's hood. Cassian didn't come to dinner. Nesta had stopped in her room only long enough to wash the dust from her hands and face, and then nearly sprinted upstairs stomach growling. The dining room had been empty. The place setting for one confirmed that she was in for a solitary meal. 
She'd stared at the sunset-bathed city far below, the soul sounds her rustling dress and creaking chair. Why was she surprised? She'd humiliated him at Windhaven. He was probably with his friends at the river house, ranting at them to find some other way to deal with her. A plate of food appeared, dumped unceremoniously onto the place mat. Even the house hated her. Nesta scowled at the red-stoned room. Wine. None appeared. She lifted the glass before her. Wine. Nothing. She tapped her nails on the table's smooth surface. Were you told to not give me wine? Talking to a house, a new low. But as if in answer, the glass filled with water. Nesta snarled toward the open archway at her back. Funny. She surveyed the food, half a roast chicken seasoned with what smelled like rosemary and thyme, mashed potatoes swimming in butter, and green beans sautéed with garlic. That silence roared in her head, in the room. She drummed her fingers again. Ridiculous. This whole thing, this high-handed interference was ridiculous. Nesta stood and aimed for the doorway. Keep your wine. I'll get my own. Chapter 7 Without the wall's magic blocking access to the human lands, more winnowed Cassian after sundown directly to the manor that had become home and headquarters to Jurian, Vassa, and apparently Lucian. Even more than a year later, the ravages of war lay evident around the estate, trees felled, barren patches of earth where greenery had not yet returned, and a general bleak openness that made the grey-stoned house seem like an accidental survivor. In the moonlight, that starkness was even emptier, the remnants of trees silvered, the shadows in the pockmarked earth deeper. Cassian didn't know to whom the home had once belonged, and apparently neither did its new occupants. Thea had told him that they called themselves the Band of Exiles. Cassian snorted to himself at the thought. More didn't linger upon dropping him at the house's arched wooden door, smirking in a way that told him even if he begged her to help, she wouldn't. No, she wanted to see him play courtier, precisely as Rhys had asked. He hadn't planned on starting this mission today, but after that disastrous attempt at a lesson with Nesta, he'd needed to do something. Anything. Nesta had known exactly what bullshit she was pulling by refusing to get off that rock. How it would appear to Devlin and the other preening assholes. She'd known, and done it anyway. So as soon as he dumped Nesta at the house, he'd headed to a deserted cliff by the sea where the roar of the surf drowned the raging heat in his bones. He'd stopped by the river house to admit to his failure, but Thea had only simmered with annoyance at Nesta's behavior, and Reese had given him a wary, amused look. It was Amran who had said, let her dig her own grave, boy. Then offer her a hand. I thought that's what this past year has been, he'd countered. Keep reaching out your hand, had been Amran's only reply. He'd found more soon after that, explained that he needed to be transported, and here he was. He raised his fist to the door, but the wooden slab pulled away before he could touch it. Lucian's scarred, handsome face appeared, his golden eye wearing. I thought I sensed someone else arriving. Cassian stepped into the house, floorboards creaking beneath his boots. You just got here? No, Lucian said, and Cassian marked the tightness of his shoulders beneath the dark grey jacket he wore, the taut silence emanating from every stone of the house. He marked its layout, in case he needed to fight his way to an exit. Which, given the displeasure that Lucian radiated as he strode for an archway to their left, seemed a distinct possibility. Without turning, Lucian said, Eris is here. Cassian didn't falter. Didn't reach for the knife strapped to his thigh, though it was an effort to block the memory of Moore's battered face. The note nailed to her abdomen, her naked body dumped like garbage at the border of the autumn court. The fucking bastard had found her there and left her. She had been on death's threshold and... Cassian's plans for what he'd one day do to him went far beyond the pain inflicted by a knife. Eris's suffering would last weeks months. 
years. Cassian didn't care that Eris had convinced Kier to delay his visit to Valarius, had apparently done so out of whatever shred of kindness remained in him. Didn't care that Rhys had noted something in Eris that had earned his trust. None of that mattered to Cassian one fucking bit. His attention focused on the red-haired male seated near the roaring fire in the surprisingly fancy parlor. He knew enough to keep tabs on an enemy. Eris lounged in a golden chair, legs crossed, his pale face the portrait of courtly arrogance. Cassian's fingers curled. Every time he'd seen the prick these past five centuries, he'd struggled with it. This blinding rage at the mere sight of him. Eris smiled, well aware of it. Cassian. Lucian's gold eye clicked, reading Cassian's rage while warning flashed in his remaining russet eye. The male had grown up alongside Eris. Had dealt with Eris's and Beren's cruelty. Had his lover slaughtered by his own father. But Lucian had learned to keep his cool. Right. Rhys had asked Cassian to do this. He should think like Rhys, like more push aside the rage. Cassian gave himself a second to do so, vaguely aware of Vassa saying something. He had noted and half dismissed the two humans in the room, the brown-haired warrior, Jurian, and the red-haired young queen. If Rhys and Moore were here, they wouldn't say a word about anything in front of Eris. Would pretend this was a friendly visit, to check on how the human lands were holding together. Even if Eris was most likely their ally. No, Eris was their ally Rhys had bargained with him, worked with him. Eris had held up his end at every turn. Rhys trusted him. More, despite all that had happened, trusted him. Sort of. So Cassian supposed he should do so as well. His head hurt. So many things to calculate. He'd done it on battlefields, but these mind games and webs of lies. Why had Rhys asked him to do this? He'd been direct in dealing with the Illyrians, he'd laid out the hell that would be brought down upon them if they rebelled, and shown up to help with whatever they needed. That was in no way comparable to this. Cassian blinked, and registered what Vassa had said, General Cassian. A pleasure. He gave the queen a swift, perfunctory bow. Your Majesty. Jurian coughed, and Cassian glanced to the human warrior. Once human. Partially human. He didn't know. Jurian had been sliced apart by Amarantha, his consciousness somehow trapped within his eye, which she'd mounted on a ring and worn for five hundred years. Until his lingering bones had been used by Hyben to resurrect his body and return that essence into this form, the same one that had led armies on those long-ago battlefields during the war. Who was Jurian now? What was he? From his spot on a ridiculous pink sofa by the far wall, Jurian said, it only goes to her head when you call her that. Vassa straightened, her cobalt jacket a sharp contrast to the red gold of her hair. Of the three red-headed people in this room, Cassian liked her colouring the best, the golden hue of her skin, the large, uptilted blue eyes framed by dark lashes and brows, and the silken red hair, which she'd cut to her shoulders since he'd last seen her. Vassa said to Jurian, I am a queen, you know. A queen by night, and firebird by day, sold by her fellow human queens to a sorcerer lord who had enchanted her. Damned her into transforming each dawn into a bird of fire and ash. Cassian had waited until sundown to visit, so as to find her in her human form. He needed her to be able to speak. Jurian crossed an ankle over a knee, his muddy boots dull in the firelight. Last I heard, your kingdom was no longer yours. Are you still a queen? Vassa rolled her eyes, then looked to Lucian, who sank onto the sofa beside Durian. Like the Fey male had settled similar arguments between them before. But Lucian's attention was upon Cassian. Did you come with news or orders? Keenly aware of Eris's presence near the fire, Cassian kept his gaze upon Lucian. We give you orders as our emissary. He nodded to Durian and Vassa. But when you are with your friends, we only give suggestions. Eris snorted. 
Cassian ignored him, and asked Lucian, how's the spring court? He had to give Lucian credit, the male was somehow able to move between his three roles an emissary for the night court, ally to Durian and Vassa, and liaison to Tamlin, and still dress immaculately. Lucian's face revealed nothing of how Tamlin and his court fared. It's fine. Cassian didn't know why he'd expected an update regarding the High Lord of Spring. Lucian only gave those in private to Reese. Eris snorted again at Cassian's fumbling, and, unable to help himself, Cassian at last turned toward him. What are you doing here? Eris didn't so much as shift in his seat. Several dozen of my soldiers were out on patrol in my land several days ago and have not reported back. We found no sign of battle. Even my hounds couldn't track them beyond their last known location. Cashin's brows lowered. He knew he shouldn't let anything show, but. Those hounds were the best in Prithian. Canines blessed with magic of their own. Grey and sleek like smoke, they could race fast as the wind, sniff out any prey. They were so highly prized that the autumn court forbade them from being given or sold beyond its borders, and so expensive that only its nobility owned them. And they were bred rarely enough that even one was extremely difficult to come by. Eris, Cassian knew, had twelve. None of them could winnow? Cassian asked. No. While the unit is one of my most skilled in combat, none of its soldiers are remarkable in magic or breeding. Breeding was tossed at Cassian with a smirk. Asshole. Vassa said, Eris came to see if I could think of any reason why his soldiers might have gotten into trouble with humans. His hounds detected strange scents at the sight of the abduction. Ones that seemed human, but were, odd, somehow. Cassian lifted a brow at Eris. You believe a group of humans could kill your soldiers? They can't be that skilled, then. Depends on the human, Durian said, the male's face dark. Vassa's was a mirror. Cassian grimaced. Sorry. I sorry. Some courtier. But Eris shrugged a shoulder. I think plenty of parties are interested in triggering another war, and this would be the start of it. Though perhaps your court did it. I wouldn't put it past Resan to winnow my soldiers away and plant some mysterious sense to throw us off. Cassian flashed him a savage grin. We're allies, remember? Eris gave him an identical smile. Always. Cassian couldn't stop himself. Maybe you made your own soldiers vanish if they even vanished at all and are just making this up for the same bullshit reason you just spewed out. Eris chuckled, but Jurian cut in, there have been tensions amongst the humans regarding your kind. But as far as we know, as far as we've heard from Lord Grayson's forces, the humans here have kept to the old demarcation lines, and have no interest in starting trouble. Yet was left unsaid. Would asking about the human queens on the continent reveal Reese's hand? The conversation had shifted toward it, so he could bring it up as idle talk, rather than as the reason he'd come here. Fuck, his head hurt. What about your, your sisters? He nodded to Vassa. Would they have anything to do with this? Eris's gaze shot to him, and Cassian reigned in his curse. Perhaps he'd said too much. He wished more were here. Even if putting her and Eris in a room together. No, he'd save her that misery. Vassa's cerulean eyes darkened. We were just getting to that, actually. She gestured to Cassian. You've heard the same rumors we have, they're stirring again across the sea, and are poised to start trouble. Are they stupid enough to do it is the real question, Durian said. They're anything but stupid, Lucian said, shaking his head. But leaving a human scent at the site is so obvious a clue that it seems unlikely it was one of them. Any move they make is heavily weighed, Vassa said, glancing to the wall of windows overlooking the destroyed lands beyond. Though I cannot think why any of them would capture your soldiers, she said to Eris, who seemed to be monitoring each word out of their mouths. 
There are other fae on the continent itself, so why bother to cross the sea to take yours? And why not the spring courts? Tamlin wouldn't notice anyone missing at this point. Lucian cringed, and Cassian, while inclined to smirk at the thought of the asshole suffering, found himself frowning. If war was coming, they needed Tamlin and his forces in fighting shape. Needed Tamlin ready. Rhys had been visiting him regularly, making sure he'd be both on their side and capable of leading. How Rhys had managed not to kill the High Lord of Spring was something Cassian still couldn't understand. But that was why Rhys was High Lord, and Cassian his blade. He knew if he ever got the name of the human bastard who'd put his hands on Nesta, nothing would stop him from finding the man. A conversation he'd had with Nesta years ago, when she'd still been human, forever lurked in the back of his mind. How she'd stiffened at his touch, and he'd known, scented and seen the fear in her eyes and known that a man had hurt her. Or tried to. She'd never told him the details, but she'd confirmed it enough by refusing to share the man's name. He'd often contemplated how he'd kill the man, if Nesta gave him the go-ahead. Peeling his skin from his bones would be a good start. His friends would understand the wound it pressed. How far the pain of that ancient wound would push him to go. A raised Illyrian camp was all that remained of the first and last time he'd let himself sink to that level of rage. And Rhys had appointed him to play courtier. To put aside the blade and use his words. It was a joke. Eris uncrossed his legs. I suppose this could be to sow tensions amongst us. To make us eye each other with suspicion. Weaken our bonds. Hyben would have done that, Durian agreed. He might have taught them a thing or two. Before Nesta had beheaded him. But Vasa said, the queens require no teaching. They were well versed in treachery before they ever contacted Hyben. And have dealt with greater monsters than him. Cassian could have sworn flames rippled across her blue eyes. Both Durian and Lucian stared at her, the former's face utterly unreadable, and the latter's pained. Cassian suppressed his jolt. He should have asked someone before coming here how much time remained before Vassa would be forced to return to the continent, to the sorcerer lord at a remote lake who held her leash, and had allowed her to leave only temporarily, as part of a bargain Faya's father had struck. Faya's father, and Nesta's father. Cassian blocked out the memory of the man's neck being snapped. Of Nesta's face as it had happened. And deciding to damn caution to hell, he asked, which of the queens would do something this bold? Vassa's golden face tightened. Briolin. The once young, once human queen who had been turned high fey by the cauldron. But in its rage at whatever Nesta had taken from it, the cauldron had punished Briolin. She was made immortal fey, yes, but she was withered into a crone. Doomed to be old for millennia. She'd made no secret of her hatred for Nesta. Her desire for revenge. If Brylin made a move against Nesta, he'd kill the queen himself. Cassian tried to think over the bellowing beast in his head that tightened every muscle of his body until only bloody violence would appease it. Easy, Lucian said. Cassian snarled. Easy, Lucian repeated, and flame sizzled in his russet eye. The flame, the surprising dominance within it, hit Cassian like a stone to the head, knocking him from his need to kill and kill and kill whatever might threaten. They were all staring. Cassian rolled his tensed shoulders, stretching out his wings. He'd revealed too much. Like a stupid brute, he'd let them all see too much, learn too much. Send that Shadowzinger of yours to track Briolin, Durian ordered, his face grave. If she's somehow capable of capturing a unit of Fae soldiers, we need to know how. Swiftly. Spoken like the General Durian had once been. Cassian said to Vassa, you really think Briolin would do something like this? Be that blatant. Someone has to be trying to fool us into going after her. Lucian asked, how would she even get here and vanish that quickly? Crossing the sea takes weeks. She'd need to winnow to pull it off. 
The queens can winnow, Durian corrected. They did so during the war, remember? But Vassa said, only when several of us are together. And it is not winnowing as the Fey do, but a different power. It's akin to the way all seven high lords can combine their powers to perform miracles. Well, fuck. Eris said, I have it on good authority that the other three queens have scattered to the winds. Cassian tucked away the information and the questions it raised. How did Eris know that? Brylin has been residing alone in their palace for weeks now. Long before my soldiers vanished. So she can't winnow, then, Cassian concluded. And again, would she really be foolish enough to do something like this if the other queens have left? Vassa's eyes darkened. Yes. The other's departure would serve to remove obstacles to her ambitions. But she'd only do this if she had someone of immense power behind her. Perhaps pulling her strings. Even the fire seemed to quiet. Lucian's eye clicked. Who? You wonder who is capable of making a unit of Fae soldiers across the sea vanish? Who could give Brylin the power to winnow or do it for her? Who could aid Brylin so she'd be bold enough to do such a thing? Look to Koshe. Cassian froze as memories clicked into place, as surely as one of Amran's jigsaw puzzles. The sorcerer who imprisoned you is named Koshe. Is he, is he the bone carver's brother? Everyone gaped at him. Cassian clarified, the bone carver mentioned a brother to me once, a fellow true immortal and a death lord. That was his name. Yes, Vassa breathed. Koshe is, was, the bone carver's older brother. Lucian and Durian looked at her in surprise. But Vassa's gaze lay upon him. Fear and hatred filled it, as if speaking the male's name were abhorrent. Her voice hoarsened. Koshe is no mere sorcerer. He's confined to the lake only due to an ancient spell. Because he was outsmarted once. Everything he does is to free himself. Why was he imprisoned? Cassian asked. The story is too long to tell, she hedged. But know that Brylin and the others sold me to him not through their devices, but his. By words he planted in their courts, whispered on the winds. He's still at the lake, Lucian said carefully. Lucian had been there, Cassian recalled. Had gone with Nesta's father to the lake where Vassa was held captive. Yes, Vassa said, relief in her eyes. But Koshe is as old as the sea older. Some say he is death itself, Eris murmured. I do not know if that is true, Vassa said, but they call him Koshe the Deathless, for he has no death awaiting him. He is truly immortal. And would know of anything that might give Brylin an edge against us. And you think Koshe would do all of this, Cassian pressed, not out of sympathy for the human queens, but with the goal of freeing himself. Certainly. Vassa peered at her hands, fingers flexing. I fear what may happen if he ever gets free of the lake. If he sees this world on the cusp of disaster and knows he could strike, and strike hard, and make himself its master. As he once tried to do, long ago. Those are legends that predate our courts, Eris said. Vassa nodded. It is all I have gleaned from my time enslaved to him. Lucian stared out the window, as if he could see the lake across a sea and a continent. As if he were setting his target. But Cassian had heard enough. He didn't wait for their goodbyes before heading for the archway, and the front hall behind it. He'd made it two steps beyond the front door, breathing in the crisp night air, when Eris said behind him, you make a terrible courtier. Cassian turned to find Eris shutting the front door and leaning against it. His face was pale and stony in the moonlight. What do you know? As little as you, Cassian said, offering a truth that he hoped Eris would deem a deception. Eris sniffed the night breeze. Then smiled. She couldn't be bothered to come inside to say hello? How he detected Moore's lingering scent, Cassian didn't know. Perhaps Eris and his smokehounds had more in common than he realized. 
She didn't know you were here. A lie. Moore had probably sensed it. He'd spare her the pain of coming back here, and have Reese retrieve him. He'd fly north for a few hours until he was in range of Reese's power and then shoot a thought toward him. Eris's long red hair ruffled in the wind. Whatever it is you're doing, whatever it is you're looking into, I want in. Why? And no. Because I need the edge brile in hers, what Koshe has told her or shown her. To overthrow your father. Because my father has already pledged his forces to Brylin and the war she wishes to incite. Cassian started. What? Eris's face filled with cool amusement. I wanted to feel out Vassa and Durian. He didn't mention his brother, oddly enough. But they clearly know little about this. Explain what the fuck you mean by Baron pledging his forces to Brylin. It's exactly what it sounds like. He caught wind of her ambitions, and went to her palace a month ago to meet with her. I stayed here, but I sent my best soldiers with him. Cassian refrained from sniping about Eris opting out, especially as the last words settled. Those wouldn't happen to be the same soldiers who went missing, would they? Eris nodded gravely. They returned with my father, but they were, off. Aloof and strange. They vanished soon after and my hounds confirmed that the scents at the scene are the same as those on gifts Brylin sent to curry my father's favour. You knew it was her this entire time. Cassian motioned to the house and the three people inside it. You didn't think I'd just spill all that information, did you? I needed Vassa to confirm that Brylin could do something like that. Why would Brylin ally with your father only to abduct your soldiers? That's what I'd like to find out. What does Baron say? He is unaware of it. You know where I stand with my father. And this unholy alliance he's struck with Brylin will only hurt us. All of us. It will turn into a fey war for control. So I want to find answers on my own rather than what my father tries to feed me. Cassian surveyed the male, his grim face. So we take out your father. Eris snorted, and Cassian bristled. I am the only person my father has told of his new allegiance. If the night court moves, it will expose me. So your worry about Brylin's alliance with Beren is about what it means for you, rather than the rest of us. I only wish to defend the autumn court against its worst enemies. Why would I work with you on this? Because we are indeed allies. Eris's smile became lupine. And because I do not believe your High Lord would wish me to go to other territories and ask them to help with Brylin and Koshe. To help them remember that all it might take to secure Brylin's alliance would be to hand over a certain Arcaran sister. Don't be stupid enough to believe my father hasn't thought of that, too. Cashin's rage flashed red before his eyes. He'd revealed that weakness earlier. Let Eris see how much Nesta meant, what he'd do to defend her. Fool, he cursed himself. Stupid, useless fool. I could kill you now and not worry about this at all, Cassian mused. He'd enjoyed beating the shit out of the male that night on the ice with Feyre and Lucian. And he'd waited centuries to kill him, anyway. Then you would certainly have a war on your hands. My father would go straight to Brylin and Koshe, I suppose, and then go to the other discontent territories, and you would be wiped off the proverbial map. Perhaps literally, since the night court would be divvied up between the other territories if Resand and Feyre die without an heir. Cassian clenched his jaw. So you're to be my ally whether I wish it or not. The brute understands at last. Cassian ignored the barb. Yes. What you know, I want to know. I will notify you of any movement on my father's part regarding Brylin. So send out your shadow zinger. And when he returns, find me. Cassian stared at him from under lowered brows. Eris's mouth curled upward, and before he winnowed into the night like a ghost, he said, stick to fighting battles, general. 
Leave the ruling to those capable of playing the game. Chapter 8 Nesta didn't bother to go to the wine cellar. Or to the kitchen. They'd be locked. But she knew where the stairs lay. Knew that particular door, at least, would not be locked. Still snarling, Nesta yanked open the heavy oak door and peered down the steep, narrow stairwell. Spiral stairs. Each a foot high. Ten thousand steps, around and around and around. Only the occasional slitted window to offer a breath of air and a glimpse of progress. Ten thousand steps between her and the city and then a half-mile walk at least from the bottom of the mountain to the nearest tavern. An awaiting, blessed oblivion. Ten thousand steps. She was no longer human. This high fey body could do it. She could do it. She couldn't do it. The dizziness hit her first. Winding around, over and over, eyes trained downward to avoid a slip that would kill her, caused her head to spin. Her empty stomach churned. But she focused, counting each step. Seventy. Seventy-one. Seventy-two. The city below barely drew any closer through the occasional slitted windows she passed. Her legs started to shake. Her knees groaned with the effort of keeping her upright, balancing on the steep drop of each step. Nothing but her own breathing and the sound of her scuffing steps filled the narrow space. All she could see was the endlessly curving, perfect arc of the wall ahead. It never altered, save for those tiny, too rare windows. Around and around and around and around and around. 86, 87 down and down and down and down. One hundred. She halted, no window in sight, and the walls pushed, the floor kept moving. Nesta leaned into the red stone wall, let its coolness sink into her brow. Breathed. Nine thousand nine hundred steps to go. Bracing a hand on the wall, she renewed her descent. Her head spun again. Her legs wobbled. She got in eleven more steps before her knees buckled so suddenly she nearly slid. Only her hand grappling at the uneven wall kept her from wiping out. The stairwell spun and spun and spun, and she shut her eyes against it. Her jagged panting bounced off the stones. And in the stillness, she had no defenses against what her mind whispered. She couldn't shut out her father's final words to her. I loved you from the first moment I held you in my arms. Please, she'd begged the king of Hyben. Please. He'd snapped her father's neck anyway. Nesta gritted her teeth, blowing out breath after breath. She opened her eyes and stretched out her leg to take another step. It trembled so badly that she didn't dare. She didn't let herself dwell on it, rage about it, as she turned around. Didn't even let herself feel the defeat. Her legs protested, but she forced them upward. Away. Around and around again. Up and up, 111 steps. She was nearly crawling by the last 30, unable to get a breath down, sweat pooling in the bodice of her dress, her hair sticking to her damp neck. What the hell were the benefits of becoming high fay if she couldn't endure this? The point it is, she'd learn to like. The infrequent cycle, which Feya had warned would be painful, had actually been a boon, something Nesta was happy to worry about only twice a year. But what was the point of it of any of it if she couldn't conquer these stairs? She kept her eyes on each step, rather than the twisting wall and the dizzying sensation it brought. This hateful house. This horrible place. She grunted as the oak door at the top of the stairwell became visible at last. Fingers digging into the steps hard enough for the tips to bark in pain, she dragged herself up the last few, slithering on her belly onto the hallway floor. An arrived face first in front of Cassian, smirking as he leaned against the adjacent wall. Cassian had needed some time before seeing her again. 
He'd updated Reese and the others immediately upon returning, they'd received his information with door, samba faces. By the end of it, Osriel was preparing for some reconnaissance on Bryolin as Amran pondered what powers or resources the Queen and Koshe might possess, if they had indeed captured Eris's soldiers so easily. And then Cassian had been slapped with a new order, keep an eye on Eris. Beyond the fact that he approached you, Rhys had said, you are my general. Eris commands Baron's forces. Be in communication with him. Cassian had started to object, but Rhys had directed a pointed look at Osriel, and Cassian had caved. AZ had too much on his plate already. Cassian could deal with that piece of shit Eris on his own. Eris wants to avoid a war that would expose him, Fea had guessed. If Baron sides with Bryolin, Eris would be forced to choose between his father and Prithian. The careful balance he's struck by playing both sides would crumble. He wants to act when it's convenient for his plans. This threatens that. But no one had been able to decide which was the bigger threat for them, Bryolin and Koshe, or Beren's willingness to ally with them. While the Night Court had been trying to make the peace permanent, the bastard had been doing his best to start another war. After an unusually quiet dinner, Cassian had flown back up to the house. And found the oak door to the stairs open, Nesta's scent lingering. So he'd waited. Counted the minutes. It had been worth it. Seeing her claw her way onto the landing, panting, hair curling with the sweat sliding down her face, completely worth his generally shit day. Nesta was still sprawled on the hall floor when she hissed, whoever designed those stairs was a monster. Would you believe that Reese, AZ, and I had to climb up and down them as punishment when we were boys? Her eyes shimmered with temper, good. Better than the vacant ice. Why? Because we were young and stupid and testing boundaries with a high lord who didn't understand practical jokes regarding public nudity. He nodded toward the stairs. I got so dizzy on the hike down that I puked on AZ. He then puked on Reese, and Reese puked all over himself. It was the height of summer, and by the time we made the trek back up, the heat was unbearable, we all reeked, and the scent of the vomit on the stairs had become horrific. We all puked again as we walked through it. He could have sworn the corners of her mouth were trying to twitch upward. He didn't hold back his own grin at the memory. Even if they'd still had to hike back down and mop it all up. Cassian asked, what stair did you make it to? 111. Nesta didn't rise. Pathetic. Her fingers pushed into the floor, but her body didn't move. This stupid house wouldn't give me wine. I figured that would be the only motivator to make you risk 10,000 stairs. Her fingers dug into the stone floor once more. He threw her a crooked smile, glad for the distraction. You can't get up, can you? Her arms strained, elbows buckling. Go fly into a boulder. Cassian pushed off the wall and reached her in three strides. He wrapped his hands under her arms and hauled her up. She scowled at him the entire time. Glared at him some more when she swayed and he gripped her tighter, keeping her upright. I knew you were out of shape, he observed, stepping away when she'd proved she wasn't about to collapse, but a hundred steps. Really? Two hundred, counting the ones up, she grumbled. Still pathetic. She straightened her spine and raised her chin. Keep reaching out your hand. Cassian shrugged, turning toward the hall and the stairwell that would take him up to his rooms. If you get tired of being weak as a mewling kitten, come to training. He glanced over a shoulder. Nesta still panted, her face flushed and furious. And participate. Nesta sat at the breakfast table, grateful she'd left her room soon after sunrise to make the trek up to the dining room. It had taken her double the time it normally would, thanks to her stiff, throbbing legs. Getting out of bed had required gritted teeth and a litany of cursing. Everything afterward had only gotten worse. Bending to put her legs into her pants, going to the bathroom, 
even just heaving open the door. There wasn't one part of her legs that didn't ache. So she'd left her room early, not wanting to give Cassian the satisfaction of seeing her limp and grimace into the dining room. The problem, of course, was that now she wasn't entirely certain she could stand. So she'd taken a good, long while eating her meal. Was choking down the porridge when Cassian prowled through the dining room doors, took one look at her, and smirked. He knew. Somehow, the swaggering asshole knew. She might have snapped something, but Osriel stalked into the room on his heels. Nesta straightened at the Shadowzinger's appearance, the darkness clinging to his shoulders as he offered her a grim smile. Osriel was nothing short of beautiful. Even with those scarred hands and the shadows that flowed from him like smoke, she'd always found him to be the prettiest of the three males who called themselves brothers. Cassian slid into the chair opposite hers, his food instantly appearing before him, and said with grating cheer, Morning, Nesta. She threw him an equally saccharine smile. Good morning, Cassian. Osriel's hazel eyes danced, but he said nothing as he gracefully took his place beside Cassian, a plate of his own food appearing. I haven't seen you in a while, Nesta said to him. She couldn't remember the last time, actually. Osriel took a bite of his eggs before replying. Likewise. The Shadowzinger nodded toward her clothes. How's training? Cassian cut him a sharp look. Nesta glanced between them. There was no way Osriel didn't know about yesterday. Cassian had probably gloated about the incident with the stairs, too. She sipped from her tea. Training is fantastic. Absolutely riveting. Osriel's mouth curled up at the corner. I hope you're not giving my brother a hard time. She set down her teacup. Is that a threat, Shadowzinger? Cassian took a long drink from his own tea. Drained it to the dregs. Osriel said coolly, I don't need to resort to threats. The shadows called around him, snakes ready to strike. Nesta gave him a smile, holding his stare. Neither do I. She leaned back in her chair and said to Cassian, who was frowning at both of them, I want to train with him instead. She could have sworn Cassian went still. Interesting. Osriel coughed into his tea. Cassian drummed his fingers on the table. I think you'll find that Azed is even less forgiving than I am. With that pretty face, she crooned. I have a hard time believing that. Osriel ducked his head, focusing on his food. You want to train with AZ, Cassian said tightly, then go ahead. He appeared thoughtful for a moment, his eyes lighting before he added, though I doubt that you'll survive a lesson with him, when you can't manage to walk down a hundred stairs without being so sore the next morning that you're unable to get out of your chair. She braced her feet on the floor. He'd read every tinge of pain on her face if she stood, but letting him see he was right. Osriel studied the two of them as she planted her hands on the table, bit down on her yelp, and stood in a great rush. Cassian shoveled more eggs into his mouth and said around them, doesn't count when you use your hands to do most of the work. Nesta scalded her face into utter disdain, even as a hiss rose inside her. I bet that isn't what you've been telling yourself at night. Osriel's shoulders shook with silent laughter as Cassian set down his fork, his eyes gleaming with challenge. Cassian's voice dropped an octave. Is that what those smutty books teach you? That it's only at night? It took a heartbeat for the words to settle. And she couldn't stop it, the heat that sprang to her face, her glance at his powerful hands. Even with Osriel now biting his lip to keep from laughing, she couldn't stop herself. Cassian said with a wicked smile, it could be any time, dawn's first light, or when I'm bathing, or even after a long, hard day of practice. She didn't miss the slight emphasis he put on long, hard. Nesta couldn't stop her toes from curling in her boots. But she said with a slight smile, striding for the doorway, refusing to let one bit of the discomfort in her sore legs show, 
Sounds like you have a lot of time on your hands, Cassian. You're in deep shit, Osriel said mildly to him on the chilly veranda as Nesta donned her cloak inside. I know, Cassian muttered. He had no idea how it had happened, how he'd gone from mocking Nesta to taunting her with his own bedroom habits. Then imagining her hand wrapped around him, pumping him, until he was a heartbeat away from exploding out of his chair and leaping into the skies. He knew Azid had been well aware of the shift in his scent. How his skin had become too tight at the way she said his name, his cock an insistent egg rubbing against the buttons of his pants. He could count on one hand the number of times she'd addressed him by name. The thought of that one hand led him back to her hand, squeezing him rough and hard, just the way he liked it. Cassian gritted his teeth and breathed in the crisp morning air. Willed it to settle him. Made himself focus on the morning wind's sweet song. The wind around Valaris had always been lovely, gentle. Not like the vicious, unforgiving mistress that ruled the peaks of Illyria. AZ chuckled, the wind shifting the strands of his dark hair. You two need a chaperone up here. Yes. No. Yes. I thought you were the chaperone. AZ threw him a wicked smile. I'm not entirely sure I'm enough. Cassian flipped him off. Good luck today. AZ would leave soon to begin his spying on Briolin, Fair had decided it last night. Though Reese had asked Cassian to look into the human queens, the subterfuge would fall to AZ. Osriel's hazel eyes glimmered. He squeezed Cassian's shoulder, his hand a warm weight against the chill. Good luck to you, too. Cassian didn't know why he'd thought Nesta would enter the sparring ring with him today. She sat her ass right on the same rock as the day before and did not move. By the time Moore had appeared to winnow them to the camp, he'd managed to get enough control over himself that he'd stopped thinking about what Nesta's hands would feel like and started considering what they'd cover today. He'd planned to keep the lesson to an hour, then leave her at Reese's mother's old house while he did a standard check of the Illyrian war band's state of rebuilding their ranks. He wouldn't mention that they might be flying into battle soon, depending on what AZ learned. He didn't tell Nesta any of this information, either. Especially about Eris. She'd made her contempt of the Fey realms perfectly clear. And he'd be damned if he gave her one more verbal weapon to wield against him, since she'd likely see right through him and realize he knew all of this political scheming and planning was far beyond his abilities. He also didn't let himself consider whether it was wise to leave her alone up here even for an hour. So we're back to this. Cassian asked, ignoring how every single asshole in the camp watched him. Them. Her. Nesta picked at her nails, wisps of her braided hair drifting free in the wind. She'd hunched over her knees, keeping her body as compact as possible. He said, you'd stop being so cold if you got up and moved. She only folded one ankle over another. If you want to sit on that rock and freeze for the next two hours, go ahead. Fine. 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 Good one, NES. He threw her a mocking grin that he knew made her see red and strode to the center of the practice area. He halted in its heart, allowing his breathing to take over. When she didn't reply, he let himself fall into that calm, steady place within his mind, let his body begin the series of motions he'd performed for five centuries straight. The initial steps were to remind his body that it was about to start working. Stretching and breathing, concentrating on everything from his toes to the tips of his wings waking everything up. It got harder from there. Cassian yielded to instinct and movement and breath, only dimly aware of the female watching from that rock. Keep reaching out your hand. Cassian was breathless by the time he finished an hour later. Nesta, to his satisfaction, had become rigid with cold. But she hadn't moved. Hadn't even shifted during his exercises. Wiping the sweat from his brow, he noted that her lips had taken on a blue tinge. Unacceptable. 
He indicated Reese's mother's house. Go wait in there. I have business to attend to. She didn't move. Cassian rolled his eyes. Either you sit out here for the next hour, or you can go inside and warm up. She wasn't that stubborn, was she? Thankfully, a blast of icy wind hit the camp at that exact moment, and Nesta began moving toward the house. Its interior was indeed warm, with a fire crackling in the city hearth that occupied much of the main room. Thea or Reese must have woken the house for them. He held the door for Nesta as she walked in, already rubbing her hands. Slowly, Nesta surveyed the space, the kitchen table before the windows, the little sitting area that occupied the other half of the room, the narrow staircase that led to the exposed upstairs hallway and the two bedrooms beyond. One of those rooms had been his since childhood, the first bedroom, the first night indoors, he'd ever experienced. This house was the first true home he'd ever had. He knew every scratch and splinter, every dent and burn mark, all of it preserved with magic. There, the gouged out spot by the base of the railing, that was where he'd cracked his head when Reese had tackled him during one of their countless brawls. There, that stain on the old red couch, that was when he'd spilled his ale while the three of them were drunk out of their minds on their first solo night in this house at age 16 Reese's mother had been off in Valaris for a rare visit to her mate and Cassian had been too stupid drunk to know how to clean it. Even Reese, swaying with the combination of ale and liquor, had failed to lift the stain, his magic accidentally setting it instead of wiping it away. They'd rearranged the throw pillows to hide it from his mother when she returned the next morning, but she'd spied it immediately. Perhaps it had something to do with the fact that they'd still been drunk, given away by Azed's relentless hiccuping. Cassian nodded to the kitchen table. Since you're so good at sitting, why don't you make yourself comfortable? When she didn't answer, he turned to find Nesta standing in front of the hearth, arms tightly crossed, the flickering light dancing in her beautiful hair. She didn't look up at him. She'd always stood with that stillness. Even as a human. It had only amplified when she'd become high fae. Nesta stared at the fire as if it murmured to that burning soul of hers. What are you looking at? he asked. She blinked, seeming to realize he was still there. A log on the fire popped, and she flinched. Not in surprise, he noted, but in dread. Fear. He glanced between her and the fire. Where had she gone, for those few moments? What horror had she been reliving? Her face had blanched. And shadows dimmed her blue-gray eyes. He knew that expression had seen it and felt it so many times he'd lost track. There are some shops in the village, he offered, suddenly desperate for anything to remove that hollowness from her. If you don't feel like sitting in here, you could visit them. Nesta still said nothing. So he let it drop, and left the house in silence. Chapter 9 Nesta stepped into the warmth of the small shop. The bell above the door jangled as she entered. The floors were fresh pine, all polished and gleaming, a matching counter occupying the back, an open door beyond it revealing a rear room. Clothes for both males and females occupied the space, some displayed on dummies, others folded neatly along display tables. A dark-haired female appeared on the other side of the counter, her braided back hair shining in the lights. Her face was striking elegant and sharp contrasting with her full mouth. Her angular eyes and light brown skin suggested a heritage from another region, perhaps a recent ancestor from the Dawn Court. The light in those eyes was direct. Clear. Good morning, the female said, her voice solid and frank. Can I help you? If she recognized Nesta, she didn't let on. Nesta gestured down at her fighting leathers. I was looking for something warmer than this. The cold leaks through. Ah, the female said, glancing toward the door and the empty street beyond. Worried that someone might see her in here. Or waiting for another customer. The warriors are all such proud fools that they never complain about the leathers being cold. 
They claim they keep them perfectly warm. They're decently warm, Nesta confessed, part of her smiling at the way the female had said proud fools. As if she shared Nesta's instinct to be unimpressed by the males in the camp. But the cold still hits me. Hum. The woman folded back the partition on the counter, entering the showroom proper. She surveyed Nesta from head to toe. I don't sell fighting gear, but I wonder if we could get fleece-lined leathers made. She nodded toward the street. How often do you train? I'm not training. I'm. Nesta struggled for the right words. Honestly, what she was doing was being a wretched asshole. I'm watching, she said a shade pathetically. Ah. The female's eyes glinted. Brought here against your will. It was none of her business. But Nesta said, part of my duties to the night court. She wanted to see if the female would pry, to see if she really did not know her. If she would judge her for being a miserable waste of life. The female angled her head, her braid slipping over the shoulder of her simple, homespun gown. Her wings twitched, the motion drawing Nesta's eye. Scars ran down them unusual for the Fae. Osriel and Lucian were two of the few who bore scars, both from traumas so terrible Nesta had never dared ask for details. For this female to bear them as well. My wings were clipped, the female said. My father was a, traditional male. He believed females should serve their families and be confined to their homes. I disagreed. He won, in the end. Sharp, short words. Reese's mother, Faya had once told her, had nearly been doomed to such a fate. Only the arrival of his father had stopped the clipping from occurring. She'd been revealed as his mate, and endured the miserable union mostly from gratitude for her unharmed wings. No one, it seemed, had been there to save this female. I'm sorry. Nesta shifted on her feet. The female waved a slim hand. It's of no consequence now. This shop keeps me busy enough that some days I forget I could ever fly in the first place. No healer can repair them. Her face tightened, and Nesta regretted her question. It is extremely complex, all the connecting muscles and nerves and senses. Short of the High Lord of Dawn, I'm not certain anyone could handle it. The San, Nesta recalled, was a master of healing, Faya bore his power in her veins. Had offered to use it to heal Elaine from her stupor after being turned high Fay. Nesta blocked out the memory of that pale face, the empty brown eyes. Anyway, the female said quickly, I can make inquiries to my suppliers about whether the leathers could be made warmer. It might take a few weeks, possibly a month, but I'll send word as soon as I hear. That's fine. Thank you. A thought clanged through Nesta. I how much will it cost? She had no money. You work for the High Lord, do you not? The female angled her head again. I can send the bill to Valaris. They? Nesta didn't want to admit how low she'd fallen, not to this stranger. I actually don't need the warmer clothes. I thought recent paid you all well. He does, but I am. Fine. If the female could be blunt, so could she. I'm cut off. Curiosity flooded the female's eyes. Why? Nesta stiffened. I don't know you well enough to tell you that. The female shrugged. All right. I can still make inquiries. Get a price for you. If you're cold out there, you shouldn't suffer. She added pointedly, no matter what the High Lord may think. I think he'd rather Cassian threw me off the edge of that cliff over there. The female snorted. But she held out a hand toward Nesta. I memory. Nesta took her hand, surprised to find her grip like iron. Nesta Arkheron. I know, Emery said, releasing Nesta's hand. You killed the king of Hyburn. Yes. There was no denying that fact. And she couldn't bring herself to lie that she wasn't the least bit smug about it. 
Good. Emery's smile was a thing of dangerous beauty. She said again, good. There was steel in this female. Not just in her straight spine and chin, but in her eyes. Nesta turned toward the door and waiting cold, unsure what to do with the naked approval of what so many others had regarded either with awe or fear or doubt. Thank you for your help. So strange, to speak polite, normal words. Strange to wish to offer them, and to a stranger no less. Males and females, children darting amongst them, gawked at Nesta as she exited onto the street. A few hurried their children along. She met their stares with cool indifference. You're right to hide your children from me, she wanted to say. I am the monster you fear. Same task as yesterday. Nesta asked Clotho by way of greeting, still half-chilled from the camp she'd departed only ten minutes earlier. Cassian had barely spoken upon returning to Ryzen's mother's house, his face taut with whatever he'd dealt with at the other Illyrian villages, and Morrigan had been just as sour-faced when she'd appeared to winnow them back to the House of Wind. Cassian had dumped Nesta on the landing veranda without so much as a farewell before he pivoted to where Maud dusted herself off. Within seconds, he was carrying the blonde beauty into the brisk wind. It shouldn't have bothered her, seeing him flying away with another female in his arms. Some small part of her knew it wasn't remotely fair to feel that body-tightening irritation at the sight. She had pushed him away again and again, and he had no reason to believe she'd wish it differently. And she knew he had a history with Morrigan, that they'd been lovers long ago. She turned from the sight, entering the house through its dining room, where she found a bowl of some sort of pork and bean soup waiting. A silent, thoughtful offering. She'd just said to the house, I'm not hungry, before striding down to the library. Now she waited as Clotho wrote out an answer and handed over a piece of paper. Nesta read, there are books to be shelved on level 5. Nesta peered over the railing beside Clotho's desk, silently counting. Five was, very far down. Not within the first ring of true darkness, but hovering in the dimness above it. Nothing lives down there anymore, right? Bryaxis hasn't come back. Clotho's enchanted pen moved. The second note read, Bryaxis never harmed any of us. Why? The pen scratched along the paper. I think Bryaxis took pity on us. We saw our nightmares come true before we came here. It was an effort not to look at Clotho's gnarled hands or try to pierce the shadows beneath her hood. The priestess added to the note, I can reassign you to a higher level. No, Nesta said hoarsely. I'll manage. And that was that. An hour later, her leathers covered in dust, Nesta slumped at an empty wooden table, in need of a pause. That same bowl of pork and bin soup appeared on the table. She peered at the distant ceiling. I said I'm not hungry. A spoon appeared alongside the bowl. And a napkin. This is absolutely none of your business. A glass of water thudded down next to the soup. Nesta crossed her arms, leaning back in the chair. Who are you talking to? The light female voice had Nesta twisting around, stiffening as she found a priestess in the robes of an acolyte standing between the two nearest shelves. Her hood was thrown back, and Faylight danced in the rich coppery chestnut of her pin straight hair. Her large teal eyes were as clear and depthless as the stone usually atop a priestess's hood, and a scattering of freckles lay across her nose and cheeks, as if someone had tossed them with a careless hand. She was young almost coltish, with her slender, elegant limbs. Hi Fay, and yet? Nesta couldn't explain the way she sensed that there was something else mixed into her. Some secret beneath the pretty face. Nesta gestured to the soup and water, but they were gone. She scowled at the ceiling, at the house that had the nerve to pester her and then make her look like a lunatic. But she said to the priestess, I wasn't talking to anyone. The priestess hefted the five tomes in her arms. Are you finished for today? Nesta glanced at the cart of books she'd left unsorted. 
no. I was taking a break. You've only been working for an hour. I didn't realize anyone was timing me. Nesta allowed every bit of unpleasantness to show in her face. She'd already conversed with one stranger today, fulfilling her quota of basic decency. Being kind to a second one was beyond her. The acolyte remained unimpressed. It's not every day we have someone new in our library. She dumped the books onto Nesta's cart. These can be shelved. I don't answer to acolytes. The priestess drew up to her full height, which was slightly taller than average for fey females. A crackling sort of energy buzzed around her, and Nesta's power grumbled in answer. You're here to work, the acolyte said, her voice unruffled. And not only for Clotho. You speak rather informally of your high priestess. Clotho does not enforce rank. She encourages us to use her name. And what is your name? She would certainly be complaining to Clotho about this impertinent acolyte's attitude. The priestess's eyes glittered with amusement, as if aware of Nesta's plan. Gwyneth Badara. Unusual, for these fey to use family names. Even Rhys didn't use one, as far as Nesta knew. But most call me Gwyn. A level above, two priestesses walked by the railing in silence, hooded heads bowed and books in their arms. Nesta could have sworn one of them watched, though. Gwyn tracked the focus of her attention. That's Rosalyn and Deirdre. How can you tell? With their hoods on, they appeared nearly identical save for their hands. Their sense, Gwyn said simply, and turned to the books she'd left on the cart. Do you plan to shelve these, or do I need to take them elsewhere? Nesta leveled a flat look at her. Living down here, there was a good chance the priestesses didn't know who she was. What she'd done. What power she bore. I'll do it, Nesta said through clenched teeth. Gwyn hooked her hair behind her arched ears. Freckles dotted her hands, too, like splattered bits of rust. If marks of trauma lingered, any evidence was hidden by her robe. But Nesta knew well how invisible wounds could be. How they could scar as deeply and badly as any physical breaking. And it was for that reminder alone that Nesta said more gently, I'll do it right now. Perhaps she had a little bit of her decency quota left. Gwyn marked the change. I don't need your pity. The words were sharp, as clear as her teal eyes. It wasn't pity. I've been here for nearly two years, but I haven't become so disconnected from others that I can't tell when someone remembers why I am here and alters their behavior. Gwyn's mouth flattened to a line. I don't need to be coddled. Only spoken to like a person. I doubt you'll enjoy the way I speak to most people, Nesta said. Gwyn snorted. Try me. Nesta looked at her from under lowered brows again. Get out of my sight. Gwyn grinned, a broad, bright thing that showed most of her teeth and made her eyes sparkle in a way Nesta knew her own never had. Oh, you're good. Gwyn turned back to the stacks. Really good. She vanished into the gloom. Nesta stared after her for a long moment, wondering if she'd imagined the whole thing. Two friendly conversations in one day. She had no idea when such a thing had last occurred. Another hooded priestess drifted by, and offered Nesta a bob of the chin in greeting. Quiet settled around her, as if Gwyn had been a summer storm that blew in and evaporated within a moment. Sighing, Nesta gathered the books Gwyn had left on the cart. Hours later, dusty and exhausted and finally hungry, Nesta stood before Clotho's desk and said, same story tomorrow. Clotho wrote, are you not pleased by your work? I would be if your acolytes didn't boss me around like a servant. Gwyneth mentioned she had run into you earlier. She works for Merrill, my right hand, who is a fiercely demanding scholar. If Gwyneth's requests were abrupt, it was due to the pressing nature of the work she does. She wanted me to shelve her books, not find more. Other scholars need them. 
but I am not in the business of explaining my acolyte's behavior. If you did not like Gwyneth's request, you should have said so. To her. Nesta bristled. I did. She's a piece of work. Some might say the same of you. Nesta crossed her arms. Some might. She'd have bet that Clotho was smiling beneath her hood, but the priestess wrote, Gwyneth, like you, has her own history of bravery and survival. I would ask that you give her the benefit of the doubt. Acid that felt an awful lot like regret burned in Nesta's veins. She shoved it aside. Noted. And the work is fine. Clotho only wrote, Good night, Nesta. Nesta trudged up the steps, and entered the house proper. The wind seemed to moan through the halls, answered only by her grumbling stomach. The private library was mercifully empty when she strode through the double doors, instantly relaxing at the sight of all those books crammed close, the sunset on the city below, the Sidra a living band of gold. Sitting at the desk before the wall of windows, she said to the house, I'm sure you won't do it now, but I would like that soup. Nothing. She sighed up at the ceiling. Fantastic. Her stomach twisted, as if it'd devour her organs if she didn't eat soon. She added tightly, please. The soup appeared, a glass of water beside it. A napkin and silverware followed. A fire roared to life in the hearth, but she said quickly, no fire. No need. It banked to nothing, but the fey lights in the room flared brighter. Nesta was reaching for her spoon when a plate of fresh, crusty bread appeared. As if the house were a fussing mother hen. Thank you, she said into the quiet, and dug in. The fey lights flickered once, as if to say, you're welcome. Chapter 10 Nesta ate until she couldn't fit another morsel into her body, helping herself to thirds of the soup. The house seemed more than happy to oblige her, and had even offered her a slice of double chocolate cake to finish. Is this cashin approved? She picked up the fork and smiled at the moist, gleaming cake. It certainly isn't, he said from the doorway, and Nesta whirled, scowling. He nodded toward the cake. But eat up. She put down the fork. What do you want? Cassian surveyed the family library. Why are you eating in here? Isn't it obvious? His grin was a slash of white. The only thing that's obvious is that you're talking to yourself. I'm talking to the house. Which is a considerable step up from talking to you. It doesn't talk back. Exactly. He snorted. I walked into that one. He stalked across the room, eyeing the cake she still didn't touch. Are you really, talking to the house? Don't you talk to it? No. It listens to me, she insisted. Of course it does. It's enchanted. It even brought food down to the library unasked. His brows rose. Why? I don't know how your fairy magic works. Did you, do anything to make it act that way? If you're taking a page from Devlin's book and asking if I did any witchcraft, the answer is no. Cassian chuckled. That's not what I meant, but fine. The house likes you. Congratulations. She growled, and he leaned over her to pick up the fork. She went stiff at his closeness but he said nothing as he took a bite of the cake. He let out a hum of pleasure that travelled along her bones. And then took another bite. That's supposed to be mine, she groused, peering up at him as he continued to eat. Then take it from me, he said. A simple disarming manoeuvre would do, considering my centre of gravity is off balance and I'm distracted by this delicious cake. She glowered at him. He took a third bite. These are the things, NES, that you'd learn in lessons with me. Your threats would be a hell of a lot more impressive if you could back them up. She drummed her fingers on the desk. 
eyed the fork in his hands and pictured stabbing him in the thigh with it. You could do that, too, he said, reading the direction of her stare. I could teach you how to turn anything into a weapon. Even a fork. She bared her teeth, but Cassian only set down the fork with grating precision and walked out, leaving her the half-eaten cake. Nesta read the deliciously erotic romance she'd found on a shelf of the private library until her eyelids grew so heavy only iron wool could hold them open. It was then that she trudged down the hall to her bedroom and collapsed into bed, not bothering to change out of her clothes before she sprawled on the mattress. She woke freezing in the dark of night, roused herself enough to strip off the leathers, and climbed under the sheets, teeth clattering. A moment later, a fire blazed in the hearth. No fire, she ordered, and it vanished again. She could have sworn a tentative curiosity curled around her. Shivering, she waited for the sheets to warm to her body temperature. Long minutes passed, and then the bed heated. Not from her own naked body, but some manner of spell. The very air warmed, too, as if someone had blown a great breath into the space. Her shaking stopped, and she nestled into the warmth. Thank you, she murmured. The house's only answer was to slide the still open drapes shut. By the time they'd finished swaying, she was again asleep. Elaine had been stolen. By Hyben. By the cauldron, which had seen Nesta watching it and watched her in turn. Had noted her scrying with bones and stones and made her regret it. She had done this. Brought this upon them. Touching her power, wielding it, had done this, and she would never forgive herself, never. Elaine would surely be tormented, ripped apart body and soul. A crack cleaved the world. Her father stood before her, neck twisted. Her father, with his soft brown eyes, the love for her still shining in them as their light faded. Nesta jolted awake, nausea rippling through her as she grasped at the sheets. Deep in her gut, her soul, something writhed and twined around itself, seeking a way out, seeking a way into the world. Nesta shoved it down. Stomped on her power. Slammed every mental door she could on it. Dream, she told it. Dream and memory. Go away. Her power grumbled in her veins, but obeyed. The bed had become hot enough that Nesta kicked off the sheets before rubbing her hands over her sweat-soaked face. She needed a drink. Needed anything to wash this away. She dressed swiftly, not quite feeling her body. Not quite caring what time it was or where she was, thinking only of the obstacle between her and that pleasure hall. The door to the ten thousand steps was already open, the fey lights in the hall dimmed to near darkness. Her boots scuffed on the stones as she approached, glancing behind her to make sure no one followed. Hands shaking, she began the descent. Around and around and around. I loved you from the first moment I held you in my arms. Down and down and down. That ancient cauldron opening and I to stare at her. To pin her in place. The cauldron dragging her into itself, into the pit of creation, taking and taking from her, merciless despite her screaming. Around and down, exactly as she had been pulled in by the cauldron, crushed beneath its terrible power. Nausea swelled, her power with it, and her foot slipped. She had only a heartbeat to grab for the wall, but too late. Her knees banged into the steps, her face hitting a second later, and then she was twisting and careening down, blasting into the wall ricocheting off and tumbling down step after step after step. She flung out a hand blindly, nails biting into stone. Sparks exploded as she cried out and held on. The world stopped moving. Her body halted its plunge. Sprawled across the steps, and clutching the stone, she panted, great sawing breaths that cut with each inhale. She shut her eyes, savoring the stillness, the utter lack of motion. And in the quiet, pain set in. Barking, bleating pain across every part of her body. The coppery tang of blood filled her mouth. 
something wet and warm slid down her neck. A sniff told her it was blood, too. And her fingernails, the ones gripping the stone steps. Nesta blinked at her hand. She had seen sparks. Her fingers were embedded in the stone, the rock glowing as if lit with an inner flame. Gasping, she snatched back her hand, and the stone went dark. But the fingerprints remained, for furrows buried in the top of the step, a single hole in the riser where her thumb had pressed. Icy dread sluiced through her. Sent her to her battered legs, knees groaning as she sprinted upward. Away from that handprint, forever etched in stone. So, who won the fight? Cassian asked the next morning as she sat on her rock and watched him go through his exercises. He hadn't asked at breakfast about the black iron cut chin or how stiffly she'd moved. Neither had more upon her arrival. That the bruising and cuts remained at all told Nesta how bad the fall had been, but as High Fay, with her improved healing, they were already on the mend. As a human, she supposed, the fall might have killed her. Perhaps this fey body had its advantages. Being human, being weak in this world of monsters, was a death sentence. Her high fey body was her best chance at survival. Cashin's reticence had only lasted an hour into his routine. He stood in the center of the sparring ring, panting, sweat running down his face and neck. What fight? She examined her mangled nails. Even with the whatever it was she'd flung out to catch herself, her nails had cracked. She didn't let herself name what had come from within her, didn't let herself acknowledge it. By dawn, it had been strangled into submission. The one between you and the stairs. Nesta cut him a glare. I don't know what you're talking about. Cassian began moving once more drawing his sword and running through a series of movements that all seemed designed to hack a person in two. You know, three in the morning, you leave your room to get shit-faced drunk in town, and you're in such a rush to conquer the steps that you fall down a good thirty of them before you can stop yourself. Had he seen the step? The handprint? She demanded, how do you know that? He shrugged. Are you watching me? Before he could answer, she spat, you were watching and didn't come to help. Cassian shrugged again. You stopped falling. If you'd kept at it, someone would have eventually come to catch you before you hit the bottom. She hissed at him. He only grinned and beckoned with a hand. Want to join me? I should push you down those stairs. Cassian sheathed his sword down his back in one elegant movement. Five hundred years of training, he must have drawn and sheathed that sword so many times it was muscle memory. Well, he demanded, an edge creeping into his voice. If you've got those glorious bruises, you might as well claim it came from training and not a pathetic tumble. He added, how many stairs did you manage this time? Six to six. But Nesta said, I'm not training. At the edge of the ring, males were watching them again. They'd been watching Cassian first, partially with awe and partially with what she could only assume was envy. No one moved like he did. No one even came close. But now their stares turned amused, mocking him. Once, last year, she might have gone up to those males and ripped them apart. Might have let a bit of that terrible power within her show so they truly believed she was a witch and would curse them and a thousand generations of their offspring if they insulted Cassian again. Nesta stretched out her legs, leaning her bruised palms on the stone. Enjoy your exercises. Cassian bristled. But he held out his hand again. Please. She'd never heard him say that word. It was a rope thrown between them. He'd meet her halfway, let her win the power battle, admit defeat, if she would just get off the rock. She told herself to get up, to take that outstretched hand. But she couldn't. Couldn't bring her body to rise. His hazel eyes were bright with pleading in the morning sun, the wind dancing in his dark hair. Like he was made from these mountains, crafted from wind and stone. He was so beautiful. 
not in the way that Osriel and Reese were beautiful, but in an uncut way. Savage and unrelenting. The first time she'd seen Cassian, she couldn't take her eyes off him. She felt like she'd spent her life surrounded by boys, and then a man a male, she supposed, had suddenly appeared. Everything about him had radiated that confident, arrogant masculinity. It had been heady and overwhelming, and all she'd wanted, all she'd wanted for so many months, was to touch him, smell him, taste him. Get close to that strength and throw everything she was against it because she knew he'd never break, never falter, never balk. But the light in his eyes dimmed as he lowered his hand. She deserved his disappointment. Deserved his resentment and disgust. Even if it carved something vital from her. Tomorrow, then, Cassian said. He didn't speak to her again for the rest of the day. Chapter 11. The private library's doors were locked. Nesta jangled the handle, but it refused to open. She said quietly, open this door. The house ignored her. She tried the handle again, shoving a shoulder into the door. Open this door. Nothing. She continued slamming her shoulder into the door. Open this door right now. The house declined to obey. She gritted her teeth, panting. She'd had more books than yesterday to shelve, as the priestesses had apparently heard from Gwyn that Nesta was to be their errand girl. So they began dumping their tomes on her cart and a few asked her to retrieve books as well. Nesta had heeded them, if only because finding the requested books took her to new places in the library and occupied her thoughts, but by the time the clock had struck six, she was exhausted and dusty and hungry. She'd ignored the sandwich the house had laid out for her in the afternoon, and this had apparently pissed off the house enough that it now refused to allow her entry into the private library. All I want, Nesta ground out, is a nice, hot meal and a good book. She tried the handle again. Please. Nothing. Nothing at all. Fine. She stormed down the hall. Hunger alone carried her up to the dining room, where she found Cassian mid-meal, Osriel across from him. The Shadowzinger's face was solemn, his eyes wary. Cassian, his back to her, only stiffened, no doubt alerted either by her scent or the cadence of her steps. She didn't speak as she aimed for a chair halfway down the table. A place setting and spread of food appeared as she reached her seat. She had a feeling that if she took the plate and left, it'd vanish from her hands before she reached the door. Nesta maintained her silence as she slid into her chair, picked up her fork, and dug into the fillet of beef and roasted asparagus. Cassian cleared his throat and said to Osriel, how long will you be gone? I'm not sure. The Shadowzinger's eyes bore into her before he added, Vasa was right to suspect something deadly amiss. Things are dangerous enough over there that it would be wiser for me to keep my base here at the house and winnow back and forth. Curiosity bit deep, but Nesta said nothing. Vasa, she hadn't seen the enchanted human queen since the war had ended. Since the young woman had tried to speak to her about how wonderful Nesta's father had been, how he had been a true father to her, helped her and won her this temporary freedom, and on and on until Nesta's bones were screaming to get away her blood boiling to think that her father had found his courage for someone other than her and her sisters. That he'd been the father she had needed, but for someone else. He had let their mother die in his refusal to send his merchant fleet hunting for a cure for her, had fallen into poverty and let them starve, but had decided to fight for this stranger. This nobody queen peddling a sad tale of betrayal and loss. That thing deep in Nesta stirred, but she ignored it, pushed it down as best she could without the distraction of music or sex or wine. She took a sip of her water, letting it cool her throat, her belly, and supposed that would have to be enough. What did Reese say about it? Cassian asked around a mouthful of food. Who do you think insisted I not risk a base over there? Protective bastard. A note of affection rang in Cassian's words, though. Silence fell again. Osriel nodded at her. What happened to you? 
She knew what he meant, the black eye that was finally fading. Her hands and chin had healed, along with the bruising on her body, but the black eye had turned greenish. By tomorrow morning, it'd be gone entirely. Nothing, she said without looking at Cassian. She fell down the stairs, Cassian said, not looking at her, either. Osriel's silence was pointed before he asked, did someone, push you? Asshole, Cassian growled. Nesta lifted her eyes from her plate enough to note the amusement in Osriel's gaze, even though no smile graced his sensuous mouth. Cassian went on, I told her earlier today, if she'd bother to train, she'd at least have bragging rights for the bruises. Osriel took a calm sip of his water. Why aren't you training, Nesta? I don't want to. Why not? Cassian muttered, don't waste your breath, AZ. She glared at him. I'm not training in that miserable village. Cassian glared right back. You've been given an order. You know the consequences. If you don't get off that fucking rock by the end of this week, what happens next is out of my hands. So you'll tattle to your precious high lord, she crooned. Big, tough warrior needs oh so powerful Reese and to fight his battles. Don't you fucking talk about Reese with that tone, Cassian snarled. Reese is an asshole, Nesta snapped. He is an arrogant, preening asshole. Osriel sat back in his seat, eyes simmering with anger, but said nothing. That's bullshit, Cassian spat, the siphons on the backs of his hands burning like ruby flames. You know that is bullshit, Nesta. I hate him, she seethed. Good. He hates you, too, Cassian shot back. Everyone fucking hates you. Is that what you want? Because congratulations, it's happened. Osriel let out a long, long breath. Cassian's words pelted her, one after another. Hit her somewhere low and soft, and hit hard. Her fingers curled into claws, scraping along the table as she flung back at him, and I suppose now you'll tell me that you are the only person who doesn't hate me, and I'm supposed to feel something like gratitude, and agree to train with you. Now I tell you I'm done. The words rumbled between them. Nesta blinked, the only sign of surprise she'd allow. Osriel tensed, as if surprised as well. But she sliced into Cassian before he could go on. Does that mean you're done panting after me as well? Because what a relief that will be, to know you've finally taken the hint. Cassian's muscled chest heaved, his throat working. You want to rip yourself apart, go right ahead. Implode all you like. He stood, meal half finished. The training was supposed to help you. Not punish you. I don't know why you don't fucking get that. I told you, I'm not training in that miserable village. Fine. Cassian stalked out, his pounding steps fading down the hall. Alone with Osriel, Nesta bared her teeth at him. Osriel watched her with that cool quiet, keeping utterly still. Like he saw everything in her head her bruised heart. She couldn't bear it. So she stood, only two bites taken from her food, and left the room as well. She returned to the library. The lights blazed as brightly as they had during the day, and a few lingering priestesses wandered the levels. She found her cart, filled again with books needing to be shelved. No one spoke to her, and she spoke to no one as she began to work with only the roaring silence in her head for company. Amran had been wrong. Keep reaching out your hand was utter bullshit when the person it was extended to could bite hard enough to rip off fingers. Cassian sat on the flat top of the mountain in which the House of Wind had been built, peering down into the open-air training ring beneath him. The stars glinted overhead, and a brisk autumn breeze that whispered of changing leaves and crisp nights flowed past him. Below, Valaris was a golden sparkle, accented along the sidra with a rainbow of color. He had never failed at anything. Not like this. And he'd been so stupidly desperate, so stupidly hopeful, 
that he hadn't believed she truly refuse. Until today, when he'd seen her on that rock and known she'd wanted to get up, but watched her shut down the instinct. Watched her clamp that steel wall over herself. You're not the brooding type. Cassian started, whipping his head to find Fair sitting beside him. She dangled her feet into the emptiness, her golden brown hair ruffled by the wind as she peered into the training pit. Did you fly in? Winnowed. Reese said you were thinking loudly. Faye's mouth quirked to the side. I figured I'd see what was happening. A fine skin of power remained wrapped around his high lady, invisible to the naked eye but glittering with strength. Cassian nodded toward her. Why's Risey still got that ironclad shield on you? It was mighty enough to guard all of Valarius. Because he's a pain in the ass, Faya said, but smiled softly. He's still learning how it works, and I still haven't figured out how to break free of it. But with the queens a renewed threat, and Baron in the mix, especially if Koshe is their puppet master, Rhys is perfectly happy to leave it on. Everything with those queens is a fucking headache, Cassian grumbled. Hopefully, AZ will figure out what they're really up to. Or at least what Brylin and Koshe are up to. Rhys was still contemplating what to do about Eris's demands. Cassian supposed he'd get his orders on that front soon. And would then have to deal with the asshole. General to general. Part of me dreads what Osriel will find, Faya said, leaning back on her hands. Moore's heading off to Valahan again tomorrow. I worry about that, too. That she'll come back with worse news about their intentions. We'll deal with it. Spoken like a true general. Cassian knocked Faya's shoulder with his wing, a casual, affectionate gesture. One he never dared make with the females of any Illyrian community. Illyrians were psychotic on a good day about who touched their wings and how, and wing touching outside of the bedroom, training, or mortal combat was an enormous taboo. But Reese never cared, and Cassian had needed the contact. Always needed physical contact, he'd learned. Probably thanks to a childhood spent with precious little of it. Faya seemed to understand his need for a reassuring touch, because she said, how bad is it? Bad. It was all he could bring himself to admit. But she's going to the library. She went back to the library tonight. She's still down there for all I know. Faya gave a hum of contemplation, gazing at the city. His high lady looked so young he always forgot how young she truly was, considering what she'd already faced and achieved in her life. At 21, he'd still been drinking and brawling and fucking, unconcerned with anything and anybody except his ambition to be the most skilled of Illyrian warriors since in Alias himself. At 21, Faya had saved their world, mated, and found true happiness. Faya asked, did Nesta say why she won't train? Because she hates me. Faya snorted. Cassian, Nesta does not hate you. Believe me. She sure as shit acts like it. Faya shook her head. No, she doesn't. Her words were pained enough that he frowned. She doesn't hate you, either, he said quietly. Faya shrugged. The gesture made his chest ache. For a while, I thought she didn't. But now I don't know. I don't understand why you two can't just. He struggled for the right word. Get along. Be civil. Smile at each other. Faya's laugh was hollow. It's always been that way. Why? I have no idea. I mean, it was always that way with us, and our mother. She only had an interest in Nesta. She ignored me, and saw Elaine as barely more than a doll to dress up, but Nesta was hers. Our mother made sure we knew it. Or she just cared so little what we thought or did that she didn't bother to hide it from us. Resentment and long-held pain laced every word. That a mother would do such a thing to her children. But when we fell into poverty, when I started hunting, it got worse. 
Our mother was gone, and our father wasn't exactly present. He wasn't fully there. So it was me and Nesta, always at each other's throats. Faye rubbed her face. I'm too exhausted to go over every detail. It's all just a tangled mess. Cassian refrained from observing that both sisters seemed to need each other, that Nesta perhaps needed Faya more than she realized. And from mentioning that this mess between the two females hurt him more than he could express. Faya sighed. That's my long way of saying that if Nesta hated you. I know what it looks like, and she doesn't hate you. She might after what I said to her tonight. Osriel filled me in. Faya rubbed her face again. I don't know what to do. How to help her? Three days in and I'm already at my wit's end, he said. They sat in silence, the wind drifting past them. Mist gathered on the sidra far below, and white plumes of smoke from countless chimneys rose to meet it. Faya asked, so what do we do? He didn't know. Maybe the library work will be enough to pull her out of this. But even as he spoke the words, they rang false. Faya apparently agreed. No, in the library she can hide in the silence and amongst the shelves. The library was meant to balance what the training does. He rolled his shoulders. Well, she said she's not training in that miserable village, so we're at an impasse. Faya sighed again. Seems like it. But Cassian paused. Blinked once, and peered down at the training ring before him. What? He snorted, shaking his head. I should have known. A tentative smile bloomed on Faye's mouth, and Cassian leaned in to kiss her cheek. He only got within an inch of her face before his lips met Mike kissed steel. Right, the shield. That level of protection is insane. She smoothed her thick cream sweater. So is Reese. Cassian sniffed, trying and failing to detect her scent. He's got your scent shielded, too. Faya grinned. It's all part of the same shield. Helion wasn't joking about it being impenetrable. And despite everything, Cassian grinned back. Memory washed over him from when he'd met her in the dining room several levels below, this girl who would become his high lady. She'd been so horribly thin then, so dead-eyed and withdrawn that it had taken all his self-control not to fly to the spring court and rip Tamlin limb from limb. Cassian shook the thought away, focusing instead on the revelation before him. One last time. He'd try one last time. Chapter 12 Nesta stood in the training ring atop the House of Wind and scowled. I thought we were going up to Windhaven. Cassian strode over to the rope ladder laid out on the ground and straightened a rung. Change of plans. No trace of that red-hot anger had remained on his face this morning when she'd walked into the breakfast room. Osriel was already gone, and Cassian hadn't said a word about why he'd left. Something about the Queen's, presumably judging by what she'd heard the previous night. When she'd finished her porridge, she'd looked for any sign of Morrigan, but the female had never appeared. And Cassian had led her here, not speaking on the walk up. Everyone hates you. The words had lingered, like a bell that wouldn't stop ringing. He finally clarified, Moore's gone back to Valahan, and Rhys and Faya are busy. So there's no one to winnow us to Windhaven. We'll be training here today. He gestured to the empty ring. Free of any watching eyes. He added with a sharp grin that made her swallow, just you and me, N.E.S. Nesta had said last night she wasn't training at the village. She'd said it multiple times, Cassian had realized. She wasn't training at that miserable village. He should have realized it days ago. He knew her better than that, after all. Nesta might be willing to face down the king of Hyben himself, but she was proud as all hell. Appearing foolish, making herself vulnerable, she'd rather die. 
would rather sit on a freezing rock in the icy wind for hours than look like a fool in front of anyone, especially arrogant warriors predisposed to mock any female who attempted to fight like them. It didn't matter to him where she trained. So long as she began the training. If she refused today, he didn't know what he'd do. The morning sun beat down, promising a warm day, and Cassian removed his leather jacket before rolling up a shirt sleeve. Well, he asked, lifting his eyes to her face. I. The hesitation made his chest tighten unbearably. But he stomped on that hope, slowly folding his other sleeve. He wondered if she noticed his fingers trembling slightly. Pretend everything is normal. Don't scare her off. There was nowhere for her to plant that beautiful us here. He'd already moved the lounge chairs that Amran and sometimes more liked to use for sunbathing while he and the others trained. When Nesta remained by the doorway, Cassian found himself saying, I'll make a bargain with you. Her eyes flashed. Fay bargains were no idle thing. He knew Faya had already versed Nesta in them, when her sister had first come here. As a precaution. From Nesta's wary gaze, he knew she remembered Faya's warnings well, Fay bargains were bound by magic and marked in ink upon one's body. The ink would not fade until the bargain had been fulfilled. And if the bargain was broken, the magic could exact terrible vengeance. Cassian maintained a casual stance. If you do an hour of exercises right now, I'll owe you a favor. I don't need any favors from you. Then name your price. He struggled to calm his racing heart. An hour of training for whatever you want. That's a fool's bargain for you. Her eyes narrowed. I thought you were a general. Aren't you supposed to be good at negotiating? His mouth quirked upward. She wasn't fighting him. For you, I have no strategies. She studied him with unflinching focus. Anything I want? Anything. He added wryly, anything short of you ordering me to fall out of the sky and smash my head on the earth. She didn't smile the way he'd hoped. Her eyes turned to chips of ice. You truly believe me capable of such a thing? No, he said without hesitation. Her mouth tightened. Like she didn't believe him. And those were purple smudges under her eyes. How long had she worked in the library last night? Demanding to know why she'd stayed up so late wouldn't be wise. He'd save that battle for another time. In an hour, perhaps. She surveyed him again, and Cassian willed himself to stand still, to appear open and non-threatening and not like his very heart was in his bloody, outstretched hands. She said at last, fine. Let's just say it will be a favor. Of whatever size I wish. It was dangerous to allow this. Deadly. Stupid. But he said, yes. He extended his hand. One last time. Keep reaching out your hand. A bargain. He met her steely expression with his own. You train with me for an hour, and I'll owe you one favor of whatever size you wish. Agreed. She slid her hand into his and shook firmly. Magic zapped between them, and she gasped, recoiling. Cassian let it thunder into him, like a stampede of galloping horses. He rode it out. Whatever her power was, it had made the bargain more intense. Demanding. He scanned his hands, his bare forearms, seeking any hint of a tattoo beyond the Illyrian ones he bore for luck and glory. Nothing. It had to be somewhere. He peeled off his shirt and scanned the muscled planes of his torso. Nothing. He approached the narrow mirror leaned against one end of the ring, left there for them to study their technique while exercising alone. Stopping before it, Cassian twisted, staring over a shoulder at his tattooed back. There, dead in the center of the Illyrian tattoo snaking down his spine, a new tattoo had appeared. An eight-pointed star, whose compass points radiated in sharp lines across and up the groove of his back, 
twining with the Illyrian markings long inked there. The eastern and western points of the star shot right onto his wings, black blending into black. A matching one, he knew, would be on Nesta's spine. He tried not to think about her bare expanse of skin, now marked in black ink, as he faced her. Nesta's eyes weren't on the mirror, though. No, they'd fixed on his torso. On his chest, on his abdominal muscles, on his bare arms. Her pulse fluttered in her throat. He didn't dare move, not as her gaze fixed on the V of muscles that sloped beneath the waist of his pants. Not as her eyes darkened, her lashes bobbing as color crept over her pale skin. His blood heated, skin tightening over bone and muscle, as if it could feel the touch of her blue-gray eyes, as if it were her fingers running over his stomach. Lower. He knew better than to throw out a teasing remark. While her, and she'd not only refused to train, bargain or no, but she'd stop looking at him like that. Slowly, her eyes trailed up his body, lingering on his carved pectorals and the Illyrian tattoo that swirled over one of them before flowing down his left arm. He might have flexed. Slightly. His voice thick, he managed to say, ready. Cauldron boil him, he knew the question held more meanings than he cared to unravel. From the glimmer in her eyes, he knew she got it. But she squared her shoulders. All right. I owe you one hour of training. You sure as hell do. Cassian mastered his breathing, shoving aside that roaring desire. He strode to the center of the ring, but opted to keep his shirt off. Because of the warm day because his skin was now burning hot. He gestured to the space beside him, and flashed her his broadest grin. Let's see what you've got, Ark Heron. A bargain with Cassian. Nesta didn't know how she'd allowed herself to agree to it, to let that magic pass between them and mark her, but... Everyone hates you. Maybe it was that fact alone that had her agreeing to this insanity. She had no idea what favor she'd call in from him, but... Fine. This training ring, with its high walls, the sky her only witness, here, she supposed, she could let him do his worst. No matter that Cassian without a shirt bordered on obscene, even with the collection of scars peppering his golden brown skin. The one on his left pectoral was especially horrific and one she knew he hadn't received during the war with Hyben. She didn't want to know what had been bad enough to leave a scar on his quick healing body. Especially when all evidence of the devastating wound he'd gotten during the war was gone. Only rippling muscle and skin remained. Honestly, there were so many muscles she couldn't count them all. Muscles on his damned ribs. She didn't know people could have them there. And those ones that flowed into his pants, like a golden arrow pointing to exactly what she wanted. Nesta shook the thought out of her head as she approached Cassian in the center of the ring. He grinned like a fiend. She stopped a good three feet away, the morning sun warm on her hair, her cheeks. It was the closest she'd stood to him without arguing or bickering in, a long time. Cassian rolled his powerful shoulders, his sprawling tattoo shifting with the movement. All right. We start with the basics. Swords. She indicated the rack of weapons against the wall to the left of the archway into the stairwell. His mouth curled upward. You won't be getting to swords yet. You need to learn to control your movements, your balance. You'll develop basic strength and awareness of your body before you'll pick up even a wooden practice sword. He glanced at her laced-up boots. Feet and breathing. She blinked. Feet. Your toes especially. He was completely serious. What about my toes? Learning how to grip the ground, to balance your weight it builds a foundation for everything else. I'm going to be exercising my toes. He chuckled. You thought it'd be swords and arrows on day one? Arrogant ass. You threw my sister into the training ring and did just that. Your sister already possessed a skill set you don't have, and also lacked the luxury of time. 
Hunting to keep them fed had taught Faya that skill set. Hunting, while Nesta had stayed home, safe and warm, and let Faya venture into that forest alone. Those skills Faya had honed had allowed her to survive against the High Fae and all their terrors, but Faya only had them because of what she'd been forced to do. Because Nesta hadn't been the one to do it. To step up. She found Cassian watching carefully. As if he heard those thoughts, felt their weight on her. Faya taught me how to use a bow. Only a few lessons, and long ago, but Nesta remembered. It was one of the few times she and Faya had been allies. Not an Illyrian bow. Cassian gestured to a rack of massive bows and quivers beside the mirror. The bows were nearly as tall as a grown woman. It took me until I was a mature adult to have the strength to even string one of those. Nesta crossed her arms, drumming her fingers on her biceps. So I'm going to spend an hour out here, wiggling my toes. Cashin's grin bloomed again. Yes. At some point, Nesta began sweating. Her feet ached, her legs turned to jelly. She'd taken off her boots and gone through a few stances with Cassian, focusing on clenching her toes, finding her balance, and generally looking like a fool. At least no one was around to see her standing on one leg while hinging at the hip, the other leg rising behind her. Or using two wooden poles to steady herself while she swung her foot from pole to pole, working her way up each stick. Or doing a basic squat that it turned out was all wrong, her weight misplaced and back too arched. All basic, stupid things. And all things she failed utterly at. Cassian didn't seem even remotely impressed as she rose from the squat he'd made her hold while supporting a wooden stick above her head. Stand straight up, head first. Nesta obeyed. No. He motioned for her to sink back down. Head first. Don't curl your back or lean forward. Shoot straight up. I'm doing that. You're hunching. Push your feet into the ground. Grip with your toes as you bring your head right, yes. She glared as she stood. Cassian just said, do another good one, then our hour's up. She did so, panting hard, knees trembling and thighs bleating in burning pain. When she'd finished, she propped herself up with the pole she'd lifted over her head. That's it. Unless you want to bargain with me for a second hour. You really want to owe me two favors. If it'll keep you here to finish the lesson, sure. I'm not sure I can take any more of these stretches. Then we'll do some breathing work and then a cool down. What's a cool down? More stretching. He grinned. When she opened her mouth, he explained, it's designed to help bring your body back to a normal pace and limit any soreness you'll have later. His tone held no condescension. So she asked, and what's breathing work? Exactly what it sounds like. He put a hand on his stomach, right on those rippling muscles, and took a big, inhaling breath before slowly releasing it. Your power when you fight comes from many places, but your breathing is one of the big ones. He nodded toward the stick in her hands. Thrust it forward like you're skewering someone with a spear. Brows rising, she did so, the motion awkward and inelegant. He only nodded. Now do it again, and as you do, inhale. She did, the motion markedly weaker. And now do it again, but exhale with the thrust. It took her a second or two to orient her breathing, but she obeyed, shoving the stick forward as she blew out a breath. Power rippled down her arms, her body. Nesta blinked at the stick. I could feel the difference. It's all linked. Breath and balance and movement. Bulky muscle like this, he tapped that absurdly contoured stomach of his, means shit when you don't know how to utilize it. So how do you learn to control your breathing? He smiled again, hazel eyes bright in the sun. Like this. So began another series of movements, all so damn simple when he demonstrated, but nearly impossible to coordinate in her own body when she went to replicate them. 
But she focused on her breathing, on the power of it, as if her lungs were the bellows of some great forge. The sun arced higher, crossing the training space, dragging the shadows with it. Inhale. Exhale. Breaths accented by a deep lunge, or a squat, all balancing on one leg. All exercises she'd done in the first hour, but now revealed anew with the added layer of breathing. Breathing in and out, out and in, body and mind flowing, her concentration unwavering. Cashin's commands were firm, but gentle, encouraging without being irksome. Hold it, hold it, hold it and release. Good. Again. 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 There wasn't a part of her body that wasn't sliding with sweat, wasn't one part that wasn't shaking as he bade her lie down on a black mat at the far end of the ring. Cool down, he said, kneeling and patting the mat. She was too tired to object, practically flinging herself onto it and staring at the sky. The blue bowl arched into forever, the sun stinging against the sweat on her face. Wisps of clouds drifted through the dazzling blue, unconcerned with her entirely. Her mind had become as clear as that sky, the fog and pressing shadows gone. Do you like flying? She didn't know where the question came from. He peered down at her. I love it. The truth rang out in those words. It's freedom and joy and challenge. I met a female shop owner at Windhaven who'd had her wings clipped. She turned her head from the sky to look over at him. His face had tightened. Why do Illyrians do that? To control their women, Cassian said with quiet anger. It's an old tradition. Reason I tried to stamp it out by making it illegal, but change takes a while amongst the high fay. For stubborn asses like the Illyrians, it takes even longer. Emery I'm assuming that's who you met, since she's the only female shop owner, was one who slipped through the cracks. It was during Amarantha's reign, and, a lot of shit slipped through the cracks. His eyes turned haunted, not only from what had been done to Emery by her father, Nesta could tell, but at the memories of those fifty years. The guilt. And perhaps it was to save him from reliving those memories, to banish that unwarranted guilt in his eyes, that she nestled against the mat and said, cool down. You sound eager. She met his stare. I. She swallowed. Hated herself for balking, and forced herself to say, the breathing makes my head stop being so. Horrible. Awful. Miserable. Loud. Ah. Understanding washed over his face. Mine too. For a moment, she held his gaze, watched the wind tug at the strands of his shoulder-length hair. The instinct to touch the sable locks had her pressing her palms to the mat, as if physically restraining herself. Right. Cassian cleared his throat. Cool down. She'd done well. Really damn well. Nesta finished the cool down and sprawled on the black mat, as if needing to piece herself together. Rally her strength. Cassian let her, rising to his feet and walking to the water station to the right of the archway. You need to drink as much water as you can, he said, taking two glasses and filling them from the ewer on the small table. He returned to her side, sipping from his own. Nesta remained prone, limbs loose, eyes closed, the sunlight making her hair, her sweaty skin, shine. He couldn't stop the image from rising, of her lying in his bed like this, sated, her body limp with pleasure. He swallowed hard. She cracked open an eye, sitting up slowly, and took the water he extended. Chugged it, realized how thirsty she was, and eased to her feet. He watched as she aimed for the yore, filling her glass and draining it twice more before she finally set it down. You never told me what you wanted for the second hour of training, he said eventually. She looked over a shoulder. Her skin was rosy in a way he hadn't seen for a long, long time, her eyes bright. The breathing, she'd said, had helped her. Settled her. Looking at the slight change on her face, he believed it. What would happen when the high wore off remained to be seen? 
small steps, he assured himself. Small, small steps. Nesta said, the second hour was on the house. She didn't smile, didn't so much as wink, but Cassian grinned. Generous of you. She rolled her eyes, but without her usual venom. I have to change before I go to the library. As Nesta entered the archway, the gloom of the stairwell beyond it, Cassian blurted, I didn't mean what I said last night about everyone hating you. She halted, her blue-gray eyes frosting. It's true. It's not. He dared one step closer. You're here because we don't hate you. He cleared his throat, running a hand through his hair. I wanted you to know that. That we don't, that I don't hate you. She weighed whatever the hell lay in his stare. Likely more than was wise to let her see. But she said quietly, and I have never hated you, Cassian. With that, she walked through the doorway into the house, as if she hadn't hit him right in the gut, first with the words, then by using his name. It wasn't until she'd vanished down the stairs that he released the breath he'd been holding. Chapter 13 She was starving. It was the only thought that occupied Nesta as she shelved book after book. That, and how sore her body was. Her thighs burned with each foot she walked up and down the ramp of the library, her arms unbearably stiff with each book she lifted to its resting place. That much soreness, just from stretches and balance exercises. She didn't want to consider what a workout like the ones she'd seen Cassian go through would do to her. She was pathetic for being so weak. Pathetic for now being unable to walk so much as a step without grimacing. Call down, my ass, she grumbled, heaving a tome into her hands. She peered at the title and groaned. It belonged on the other side of this level, a good five-minute walk across the central atrium and down the endless hall. Her throbbing legs might very well give out halfway there. Her stomach gurgled. I'll deal with you later, she told the book, and scanned the other titles remaining in her cart. None, fortunately or unfortunately, needed to be shelved in the section that book belonged in. To lug the cart all the way over there would be exhausting, better to just carry the tome, even if it was an essentially meaningless trip to deposit one book. Not that she had anything better to do with her time. Her day. Her life. Whatever clarity she'd felt in the training ring levels and levels above fogged up again. Whatever calm and quiet she'd managed to capture in her head had dissipated like smoke. Only moving would keep it at bay. Nesta found the next shelf required, quite a ways above her head, with no stool in sight. She rose onto her toes, legs shrieking in protest, but it was too high. Nesta was on the taller side for a female, standing a good two inches above Faya, but this shelf was out of reach. Grunting, she attempted to shelve the book with her fingertips, arms straining. Oh, good. It's you, a familiar female voice said from down the row. Nesta pivoted to discover Gwyn striding swiftly toward her, arms laden with books and coppery hair shimmering in the dim light. Nesta didn't bother to look pleasant as she lowered herself fully onto her feet. Gwyn angled her head, as if finally realizing what she'd been doing. Can't you use magic to put it up on the shelf? No. The word was cool and sullen. Gwyn's brows twitched toward each other. You don't mean to tell me you've been shelving everything by hand. How else would I do it? Gwyn's teal eyes narrowed. You have power, though, don't you? It's none of your concern. It was no one's concern. She had none of the high phase usual gifts. Her power, that thing, was utterly alien. Grotesque. But Gwyn shrugged. Very well. She dumped her books right into Nesta's arms. These can go back. Nesta staggered under the book's weight and glared. Gwyn ignored the look, instead glancing around before lowering her voice. Have you seen Volume 7 of Lavinia's The Great War? Nesta scanned her memory. No. I haven't come across that one. 
Gwyn frowned. It's not on its shelf. So someone else has it. That's what I was afraid of. She released a dramatic breath. Why? Gwyn's voice quieted into a conspiratorial whisper. I work for someone who is very, demanding. Memory tugged at Nesta. Someone named Meryl, Clotho had told her the other day. Her right hand. I take it you're not fond of the person. Gwyn leaned against one of the shelves, crossing her arms with a casualness that belied her priestess's robes. Again, she wore no hood and no blue stone atop her head. Honestly, while I consider many of the females here to be my sisters, there are a few who are not what I would consider nice. Nesta snorted. Gwyn again peered down the row. You know why we're all here. Shadow swarmed her eyes, the first Nesta had seen there. We all have endured. She rubbed her temple. So I hate, I hate to even speak ill of any one of my sisters here. But Meryl is unpleasant. To everyone. Even Clotho. Because of her experiences. I don't know, Gwyn said. All I know is that I was assigned to work with Meryl and aid in her research, and I might have made a teensy mistake. She grimaced. What manner of mistake? Gwyn blew out a sight toward the darkened ceiling. I was supposed to deliver Volume 7 of The Great War to Meryl yesterday, along with a stack of other books, and I could have sworn I did, but this morning, while I was in her office, I looked at the stack and saw I'd given her Volume 8 instead. Nesta reigned in her eye rolling. And this is a bad thing? She'll kill me when it's not there for her to read today. Gwyn hopped from foot to foot. Which could be any moment. I got away the instant I could, but the book isn't on the shelf. She halted her fidgeting. Even if I found the book, she'd spot me swapping it into the pile. And you can't tell her? Gwyn couldn't be serious about the killing thing. Though with the fairies, Nesta supposed it might be a possibility. Despite this place being one of peace. Gods, no. Meryl doesn't accept mistakes. The book is supposed to be there, I told her it was there, Anne. I messed up. The priestess's face paled. She looked almost ill. Why does it matter? Emotion stirred in those remarkable eyes. Because I don't like to fail. I can't. Gwyn shook her head. I don't want to make any more mistakes. Nesta didn't know how to unpack that statement. So she just said, ah. Gwyn went on, these females took me in. Gave me shelter and healing and family. Again, her large eyes darkened. I cannot stand to fail them in anything. Especially someone as demanding as Meryl. Even when it might seem trivial. Admirable, though Nesta was loath to admit it. Have you left this mountain since you arrived? No. Once we come in, we do not leave unless it is time for us to depart back to the world at large. Though some of us remain forever. And never see daylight again. Never feel fresh air. We have windows, in our dormitories. At Nesta's confused expression, she clarified, they are glamoured from sight on the mountainside. Only the High Lord knows about them, since they are his spells. And you now, I suppose. But you don't leave. No, Gwyn said. We don't. Nesta knew she could let the conversation end there, but she asked, and what do you do with the time you're not in the library? Practice your, religious things. Gwen huffed a soft laugh. In part. We honor the mother, and the cauldron, and the forces that be. We have a service at dawn and at dusk, and on every holy day. Nesta must have made a face of distaste because Gwen snorted. It's not so dull as all that. The services are beautiful, the songs as fair as any you'd hear in a music hall. That did sound rather interesting. I enjoy the dusk services, Gwyn continued. The music was always my favorite part of it, you know. I mean, not here. 
I was a priestess and acolyte still, before I came here. She added a shade quietly, in Sangrava. The name sounded familiar to Nesta, but she couldn't place it. Gwyn shook her head, her face pale enough that her freckles stood out in stark relief. I need to return to Meryl before she starts wondering where I am. And come up with some way to save my hide when she can't find that book in the pile. She jerked her chin to the books in Nesta's hands. Thanks for that. Nesta only nodded, and the priestess was gone, coppery brown hair fading from sight. She made it back to her cart with minimal wincing and grunting, though standing still for so long with Gwyn had made it nearly impossible for her to start walking again. A few priestesses drifted by, either directly past her or on one of the levels above or below, utterly silent. This whole place was utterly silent. The only bit of color and sound came from Gwyn. Would she remain here, locked beneath the earth, for the rest of her immortal life? It seemed a shame. Understandable for what Gwyn must have endured, yes, what all these females had endured and survived. But a shame as well. Nesta didn't know why she did it. Why she waited until no one was around before she said into the hushed air of the library, can you do me a favor? She could have sworn she sensed a pause in the dust and dimness, a piqued interest. So she asked, can you get me volume 7 of The Great War? By someone named Lavinia. The house had no problem sending her food, perhaps it could find the tome for her. Again, Nesta could have sworn she felt that pause of interest, then a sudden vacancy. And then a thump sounded on her cart as a grey leather-bound book with silver lettering landed atop her pile. Nesta's lips curved upward. Thank you. A soft, warm breeze brushed past her legs, like a cat wending between them in warm greeting and farewell. When the next priestess passed, Nesta approached her. Excuse me. The female halted so swiftly her pale robes swayed with her, the blue stone on her hood gleaming in the soft fey light. Yes. Her voice was soft, breathy. Curly black hair peeked out from her robe, and rich brown skin gleamed on her lovely, delicate hands. Like Clotho, she wore her hood over her face. Meryl's office, where is it? Nesta gestured to the cart behind her. I have a few books for her but don't know where she works. The priestess pointed. Three levels up, level two, at the end of the hall on your right. Thank you. The priestess hurried along, as if even that moment of social interaction had been too much. But Nesta gazed toward the level three stories above. Her aching body did not make for easy stealth work, but Nesta mercifully didn't encounter anyone on her way up. She knocked on the shut wood door. Enter. Nesta opened the door to a rectangular cell of a room, occupied by a desk on the far side and two bookshelves lining both long walls. A small pallet lay to the left of the desk, a blanket and pillow neatly aligned. As if the hooded priestess with her back to Nesta sometimes couldn't be bothered to return to the dormitory to sleep. No sign of Gwyn. Nesta wondered if she'd already been dismissed for her so-called failure. But Nesta took a few steps into the room, surveying the shelf to her right before she said, I brought the books you requested. The female hunched over her work, the scratching of her pen filling the room. Fine. She didn't so much as turn. Nesta scanned the other shelf. Their volume eight of the Great War. Nesta had taken a silent step toward it when the priestess's head snapped up. I didn't ask for any more books. And where's Gwyneth? She should have returned half an hour ago. Nesta asked as blandly and stupidly as she could, who's Gwyneth? Meryl turned at that, and Nesta was greeted with a surprisingly young face and a stunningly beautiful one. All the high fae were beautiful, but Meryl made even more look drab. Hair white as fresh snow contrasted against the light brown of her skin, and eyes the color of a twilight sky blinked once, twice. As if focusing on the here and now and not whatever work she'd been doing. She noted Nesta's leathers, the lack of any robes or stone atop her braided hair, 
and demanded, Who are you? Nesta. She hefted the books in her arms. I was told to bring these to you. Volume 8 of the Great War lay mere inches away. If she just stuck out a hand to her left, she could snatch it off the shelf. Swap it out with Volume 7 from the stack in her arms. Meryl's remarkable eyes narrowed. She looked as young as Nesta, yet an ornery sort of energy buzzed around her. Who gave you those orders? Nesta blinked, the portrait of stupidity. A priestess. Meryl's full mouth tightened. Which priestess? Gwyn was right in her assessment of this female. Being assigned to work with her seemed more like a punishment than an honor. I don't know. You all wear those hoods. These are the sacred clothes of our order, girl. Not those hoods. Meryl returned to her papers. Nesta asked, because it would piss off the female, so you didn't ask for these books, Roslyn. Meryl threw down her pen and bared her teeth. You think I'm Roslyn? I was told to bring these books to Roslyn, and someone said your, her office was here. Roslyn is on level 4. I am on level 2. She said it as if it implied some sort of hierarchy. Nesta shrugged again. And might have enjoyed the hell out of it. Meryl seethed, but returned to her work. Roslyn, she muttered. Insufferable, inane Roslyn. Endless prattling. Nesta reached a stealthy hand toward the shelf to her left. Meryl whipped her head around, and Nesta snapped her arm down to her side. Never disturb me again. Meryl pointed to the door. Get out and shut the door behind you. If you see that silly Gwyneth, tell her she's expected here immediately. Apologies, Nesta said, unable to keep the glimmer of annoyance out of her eyes, but Meryl was already twisting back to her desk. It had to be now. One eye on the priestess, Nesta moved. She coughed to cover the whisper of books moving. And by the time Meryl whipped her head around again, Nesta made sure she wasn't so much as looking toward the shelf. Where Volume 7 of The Great War stood in place of Volume 8, which now sat atop the other books in Nesta's arms. Nesta's heart pounded in her entire body. Meryl hissed, what are you lingering for? Get out. Apologies, Nesta repeated, bowing at the waist, and left. Shut the door behind her. And only when she stood in the silent hall did she allow herself to smile. She found Gwyn the same way she'd found Meryl, by asking a priestess, this one more quiet and withdrawn than the other. So trembling and nervous that even Nesta had used her most gentle voice. And been unable to shake the heaviness in her heart as she'd walked to the first level reading area. Across the hushed, cavernous space, it was easy to hear Gwyn soft singing as she flitted from table to table looking at the piles of discarded books. Trying desperately to find the missing tome. The words of Gwyn's merry song were in a language Nesta didn't know, but for a heartbeat, Nesta allowed herself to listen, to savor the pure, sweet voice that rose and fell with sinuous ease. Gwyn's hair seemed to glow brighter with her song, skin radiating a beckoning light. Drawing any listener in. But Meryl's warning clanged through the beauty of Gwyn's voice and Nesta cleared her throat. Gwyn whirled toward her, glow fading even as her freckled face lit with surprise. Hello again, she said. Nesta only extended volume 8 of the Great War. Gwyn gasped. Nesta threw her a wicked smile. This was shelved improperly. I swapped it with the right book. Gwyn didn't seem to need more than that, thankfully, and clutched the book to her chest like a treasure. Thank you. You've just saved me from a terrible tongue lashing. Nesta arched a brow at the book. What's Meryl researching, anyway? Gwyn frowned. Lots of things. Meryl's brilliant. Horrible, but brilliant. When she first came here, she was obsessed with theories regarding the existence of different realms, different worlds. Living on top of each other without even knowing it. 
whether there is merely one existence, our existence, or if it might be possible for worlds to overlap, occupying the same space but separated by time and a whole bunch of other things I can't even begin to explain to you because I barely understand them myself. Nesta's brows rose. Really? Some philosophers believe there are 11 worlds like that. And some believe there are as many as 26, the last one being time itself, which. Gwyn's voice dropped to a whisper. Honestly, I looked at some of her early research and my eyes bled just reading her theorizing and formulas. Nesta chuckled. I can imagine. But she's researching something else now. Yes, thank the cauldron. She's writing a comprehensive history of the Valkyries. The who? A clan of female warriors from another territory. They were better fighters than the Illyrians, even. The Valkyrie name was just a title, though they weren't a race like the Illyrians. They hailed from every type of fey, usually recruited from birth or early childhood. They had three stages of training, novice, blade, and finally Valkyrie. To become one was the highest honor in their land. Their territory is gone now, subsumed into others. And the Valkyries are gone, too. Yes. Gwyn sighed. Valkyries existed for millennia. But the war the one 500 years ago wiped out most of them, and the few survivors were elderly enough to quickly fade into old age and die afterward. From the shame, legend claims. They let themselves die, rather than face the shame of their lost battle and surviving when their sisters had not. I've never heard of them. She knew little about any of the Fey history, both by choice and because of the human world's utter lack of education on it. The Valkyrie history and training were mostly oral, so any accounts we have are through whatever passing historians or philosophers or tradespeople wrote down. It's just bits and pieces, scattered in various books. No primary sources beyond a few precious scrolls. Merrill got it into her head years ago to begin compiling all of it into one volume. Their history, their training techniques. Nesta opened her mouth to ask more, but a clock chimed somewhere behind them. Gwyn stiffened. I've been gone too long. She'll be furious. Merrill would indeed. Gwyn twisted toward the ramp beyond the reading area. But she paused, looking over her shoulder. But not as mad as she would have been with the wrong book. She flashed Nesta a grin. Thank you. I am in your debt. Nesta shifted on her feet. It was nothing. Gwyn's eyes sparkled, and before Nesta could avoid the emotion shining there, the priestess sprinted toward Merrill's chambers, robes flying behind her. Nesta made it to her room without collapsing from sheer exhaustion or Merrill realizing she'd been duped and coming to kill her, both of which she considered to be great accomplishments. She found a hot meal waiting on the desk of her bedroom, and she'd barely sat down before she tore into the meat and bread and medley of roasted vegetables. Standing again was an effort, but she made it to her bathroom, where a hot bath was already steaming away. Getting into the tub required all her concentration, hefting one leg at a time, and she moaned with relief as the delicious heat soaked through her. She lay there until her body had loosened enough to move, and fell into the warmed sheets without bothering to put on a nightgown. There would be no trying the stairs tonight. No dreams chased her awake, either. Nesta slept and slept and slept, though she could have sworn that her door opened at one point could have sworn a familiar, beckoning scent filled her room. She reached toward it with a sleep-heavy hand, but it was already gone. Chapter 14 Cassian stood in the training ring, trying not to stare at the empty doorway. Nesta hadn't come to breakfast. He'd let it slide because she hadn't come to dinner, either, but that had been because she'd been passed out cold in her bed. Naked. Or close to it. He hadn't seen anything when he'd poked his head into her room, at least, nothing that might have scrambled his mind to the point of uselessness, but her bare shoulder had suggested enough. He'd debated waking her and insisting that she eat, but the house had stepped in. 
a tray had appeared beside her doorway, full of empty plates. As if the house was showing him precisely how much she'd eaten. As if the house was proud of what it had gotten her to eat. Good work, he'd muttered into the air, and the tray vanished. He made a mental note to ask Reese about it later whether the house was sentient. He'd never heard his high lord mention it in five centuries. Considering the filthy things he'd done in his bedroom, his bathroom, fuck, in so many of the rooms here, the idea of the house watching him. Cauldron boil him alive. So Cassian had let Nesta sleep through breakfast, hoping the house had at least brought the meal to her room. But it meant he had no idea if she'd show up. She'd made a bargain with him yesterday, and he'd come here today to see if she'd at least meet him. Prove yesterday hadn't been a fluke. Minutes dripped by. Maybe he'd been a fool to hope. To think one lesson might be enough. Muffled cursing filled the stairwell beyond the archway. Each scrape of boots seemed to move slowly. He didn't dare to breathe, not as her cursing grew nearer. Inch by inch. As if it was taking her a long, long time to climb the stairs. And then she was there, hand braced on the wall, a grimace of such misery on her face that Cassian laughed. Nesta scowled, but he only said, relief wobbling his knees, I should have realized. Realized what? She stopped five feet from him. That you'd be late because you're so sore you can't climb the stairs. She pointed to the archway. I got up here, didn't I? True. He winked. I'll let that count as part of your warm-up. To get the muscles in your legs loose. I need to sit down. And risk not being able to get back up. He grinned. Not a chance. He nodded to the space beside him. Stretches. She grumbled. But she got into position. And when Cassian began to instruct her through the movements, she listened. Two hours later, sweat poured down Nesta's body, but the aching had at least ceased. You need to get the lactic acid out of your muscles, that's what's hurting you, Cassian had said when she'd complained non-stop for the first thirty minutes. Whatever the hell that meant. She lay on the black mat, panting again, taking in the cloudy sky. It was a good deal crisper than yesterday, with tendrils of mist wandering past the ring every now and then. When do I stop being sore? she asked Cassian breathlessly. Never. She turned her head toward him, about as much movement as she could manage. Never? Well, it gets better, he amended, and moved down to her feet. May I? She had no idea what he was asking, but she nodded. Cassian lightly wrapped his hands around her ankle, his skin warm against her foot, and lifted her leg upward. She hissed as a muscle along the back of her thigh shrieked in protest, drawing so tight she gritted her teeth. Breathe into it when I push the leg toward you, he ordered. He waited until she exhaled before he lifted her leg higher. The tightness in her thigh was considerable enough that she stopped thinking about his calloused, warm hands against her bare ankle, about how he knelt between her legs, so close she turned her head away to stare at the red rock of the wall. Again, he told her, and she exhaled, winning another inch. Again. Cauldron, your hamstrings are tight enough to snap. Nesta obeyed, and he kept stretching her leg upward, gaining inch after inch. The soreness does get easier, Cassian said after a moment, as if he weren't holding her leg flush to his chest. Though I have plenty of days when I can barely walk at the end. And after a battle. I need a week to recover from that alone. I know. His eyes found hers, and she clarified, I mean I saw you. In the war. Saw him hauled in unconscious, his guts hanging out. Saw him in the sky, death racing at him until she screamed for him, saved him. Saw him on the ground, broken and bleeding, the king of Hyben about to kill them both. Cassian's face gentled. As if he knew what memories pelted her. I'm a soldier, Nesta. It's part of my duties. 
part of who I am. She looked back toward the wall, and he lowered her leg before starting on the other. The tightness in that hamstring was unbearable. The more stretching you do, he explained when she squeezed her eyes shut against the pain, the more mobility you'll gain. He nodded toward the rope ladder laid out on the floor of the training ring, where he'd had her run it up and down, knees to chest, keeping within each of the boxes, for five minutes straight. You're nimble on your feet. I took dancing lessons as a girl. Really? We weren't always poor. Until I was 14, my father was as rich as a king. They called him the Prince of Merchants. He gave her a tentative smile. And you were his princess? Ice cracked through her. No. Elaine was his princess. Even Faya was more his princess than I ever was. And what were you? I was my mother's creature. She said it with such cold it nearly froze her tongue. Cassian said carefully, what was she like? A worse version of me. His brows twitched together. I. She didn't want to have this conversation. Even the sunlight failed to warm her. She pulled her leg from his hands and sat up, needing the distance between them. And because it looked like he'd speak again, Nesta said the only thing she could think of. What happened to the priestesses in Sangrava two years ago? He went wholly still. It was terrifying. The stillness of a male ready to kill, to defend, to bloody himself. But his voice was terribly calm as he asked, why? What happened? His mouth tightened, and he swallowed once before he said, Hyben was looking for the cauldron back then, for the pieces of its feet. One was hidden at the temple in Sangrava, its power used to fuel its priestess's gifts for millennia. Hyben found out, and sent a unit of their deadliest and cruelest warriors to retrieve it. Cold rage filled his face. They slaughtered most of the priestesses for sport. And raped any they found to their liking. Horror, icy and deep, sluiced through her. Gwyn had. You met one of them, he asked, in the library. She nodded, unable to find the words. He closed his eyes, as if reeling his rage back into himself. I heard that Moore had brought one in. Osriel was the one who made it out there first, and he killed any of the Hyben soldiers left, but by that point. He shuddered. I don't know what became of the other survivors. But I'm glad one wound up here. Safe, I mean. With people who understand, and wish to help. So am I, Nesta said quietly. She rose on surprisingly loose legs and blinked down at them. They don't hurt as much. Stretching, Cassian said, as if that were answer enough. Never forget the stretching. The spring court made Cassian itch. It had little to do with the bastard who ruled it, he'd realized, but rather the fact that the lands lay in perpetual spring. Which meant plumes of pollen drifting by, setting his nose to running and skin to itching, until he was certain that at least a dozen insects were slithering all over him. Stop scratching, Reese said without looking at him as they strode through a blooming apple orchard. No wings to be seen today. Cassian lowered his hand from his chest. I can't help it if this place makes my skin crawl. Reese snorted, gesturing to one of the blossoming trees above them, petals falling thick as snow. The feared general, felled by seasonal allergies. Cassian gave an unnecessarily loud sniffle, earning a full chuckle from Reese. Good. When he'd met his brother half an hour ago, Reese's eyes had been distant, his face solemn. Reese halted in the middle of the orchard located to the north of Tamlin's once lovely estate. The afternoon sun warmed Cashin's head, and if his entire body weren't itching so damned much, he might have lain on the velvety grass and sunned his wings. I'd peel my skin off right now, if it'd stop the itching. There's a sight I'd like to see, a voice said behind them, and Cassian didn't bother to look pleasant as they found Eris standing at the base of a tree five feet away. 
Amid the pink and white blossoms, the cold-faced autumn court air looked truly fairy, as if he'd stepped out of the tree, and his one and only master was the earth itself. Eris, Reese purred, sliding his hands into his pockets. A pleasure. Eris nodded at Reese, red hair dappled in the sunlight leaking through the blossom-heavy branches. I only have a few minutes. You asked for this meeting, Cassian said, crossing his arms. So out with it. Eris shot him a look laced with distaste. I'm sure you've reported my offer to Reese and. He did, Reese said, dark hair ruffled by a soft, sighing breeze. As if even the wind itself loved to touch him. I didn't appreciate the threats. Eris shrugged. I merely wanted to make myself clear. Spit it out, Eris, Cassian said. One more minute here, and the itching would drive him mad. He wished anyone else could have come in his stead. But he'd been appointed by Reese to deal with the bastard. General to general. Eris had asked for the meeting this morning, naming this location as neutral ground. Thankfully, its lord had no interest in patrolling who entered these lands. Eris kept his eyes on Reese. I assume your Shadowzinger is off doing what he does best. Reese said nothing, revealed nothing. Cassian followed his lead. Eris went on with a shrug, we are wasting our time, gathering information rather than acting. His amber eyes gleamed in the shade of the apple tree. Regardless of the Death Lord pulling their strings, if the human queens intend to be a thorn in our sides, we could simply deal with them now. All of them. My father would be forced to abandon his plans. And I'm sure you could invent some reason that has nothing to do with me or what I've told you to excuse their removal. Cassian blurted, you want us to take out the queens? It was Eris's turn to say nothing. Rhys, too, remained silent. Cassian threw them an incredulous look. We kill those queens and we'll be in a greater mess than ever. Wars have been started for less. Killing even one queen, let alone four, would be a catastrophe. Everyone would know who'd done it, regardless of the reasons would invent to justify it. Rhys angled his head. Only if we're sloppy. You're kidding, Cassian said to his brother. Half kidding, Rhys said, throwing him a dry smile. It didn't quite meet his eyes, though. A grave distance lurked there. But Rhys turned to Eris. Tempting as it may be to take the easy way out, I agree with my brother. It's a simple solution to our current problems, and to thwarting your father, but it would create a conflict far greater than any we're anticipating. Rhys surveyed Eris. You know that already. Eris still said nothing. Cassian glanced between them, watching Rhys piece it together. Rhys asked solemnly, why does your father want to start a war so badly? Why does anyone go to war? Eris reached out a long, slender hand, letting the falling petals gather there. Why does Valahan not sign the treaty? The borders of this new world have not yet been set. Baron doesn't have the military strength to control the autumn court and a territory on the continent, Cassie encountered. Eris's fingers closed around the petals. Who says he wants land on the continent? He surveyed the orchard as if to make a point. Silence fell. Rhys murmured, Baron knows another war that pits Fey against Fey would be catastrophic. Many of us would be wiped out entirely. Especially. Rhys tilted his head back to take in the apple blossoms. Especially those of us who are weakened. And when the dust settles, there would be at least one court left vacant its lands bare for the taking. Eris looked toward the hills beyond the orchard, green and gold and glowing in the sunlight. They say a beast prowls these lands now. A beast with keen green eyes and golden fur. Some people think the beast has forgotten his other shape, so long has he spent in his monstrous form. And though he roams these lands, he does not see or care for the neglect he passes, the lawlessness, the vulnerability. Even his manner has fallen into disrepair, half-eaten by thorns, 
though rumors fly that he himself destroyed it. Enough with the double talk, Cassian said. Tamlin's staying in his beast form and is finally getting the punishment he deserves. So what? Eris and Rhys held each other's gaze. Eris said, you've been trying to bring Tamlin back for a while. But he isn't getting better, is he? Rhys's jaw tightened, his only sign of displeasure. Eris nodded knowingly. I can delay my father from allying with Brylin and starting this war for a little while. But not forever. A few months, perhaps. So I'd suggest your shadows in a hurry. Find a way to deal with Brylin, find out what she wants and why. Discover whether Koshe is indeed involved. At best, we'll stop them all. At worst, we'll have proof to justify any conflict and hopefully win allies to our side, avoiding the bloodshed that would carve up these lands once more. My father would think twice before standing against an army of superior strength and size. You've turned into quite the little traitor, Reese said, stars winking out in his eyes. I told you years ago what I wanted, High Lord, Eris said. To seize his father's throne. Why? Cassian asked. Eris grasped what he meant, apparently, because flame sizzled in his eyes. For the same reason I left Morrigan untouched at the border. You left her there to suffer and die, Cassian spat. His siphons flickered, and all he could see was the male's pretty face, all he could feel was his own fist, aching to make contact. Eris sneered. Did I? Perhaps you should ask Morrigan whether that is true. I think she finally knows the answer. Cashin's head spun, and the relentless itching resumed, like fingers trailing along his spine, his legs, his scalp. Eris added before winnowing away, tell me when the Shadowzinger returns. Petals streamed past, thick as a mountain blizzard, and Cassian turned to Reese. But Reese's gaze had gone distant, once again distracted. He stared toward the faraway hills, as if he could see the beast that roamed there. Cassian had witnessed Reese going deep into his own head often enough. Knew his brother was prone to withdrawing while appearing perfectly fine. But this level of distraction. What's the matter with you? Cassian scratched his scalp. This fucking place. Reese blinked, as if he'd forgotten Cassian stood beside him. Nothing. He flicked a petal off the gauntlet of his leathers. Nothing. Liar. Cassian tucked in his wings. But Reese wasn't listening again. He didn't say a word before he winnowed them home. Nesta stared into the reddish gloom of the staircase. She'd been just as sore as yesterday while working in the library, but thankfully Merrill hadn't come to rip into her about the swapped book. She spoke to no one but Clotho who had given her only perfunctory greetings. So Nesta had shelved in the dimness, surrounded by whispers of rustling paper, only pausing to wipe the dust from her hands. Priestesses drifted by like ghosts, but Nesta had no glimpse of coppery brown hair and large teal eyes. She honestly didn't know why she wished to see Gwyn. What Cassian had told her about the attack on the temple wasn't the sort of thing she had any right to bring up. But Gwen didn't seek her out, and Nesta didn't dare go up to the second level to knock on Merrill's door to see if Gwen was there. So it was silence and soreness, and the roaring in her head. Maybe it was the roaring that had brought her to the stairwell, instead of to her bedroom to wash up. The gloom beckoned, challenging her like the open maw of some great beast. A WIRM, poised to devour her whole. Her legs moved of their own accord and her foot landed upon the first step. Down and down, around and around. Nesta ignored the step with the five holes embedded in it. Made a point not to look down as she carefully stepped over it. Silence and roaring and nothing nothing nothing. Nesta made it to step 150 before her legs nearly gave out again. Sparing herself another tumble, she panted on the steps, leaning her head against the stone. In that roaring silence, she waited for the stairs to stop twisting around her. And when the world was again still, she made the long, 
horrible climb back up. The house had dinner waiting on her desk, along with a book. Apparently, it had noted her request for a book the other day and deemed the Great War too dull. The title of this one was suitably smutty. I didn't know you had dirty taste, Nesta said wryly. The house only responded by running a bath. Dinner, bath, and a book, Nesta said aloud, shaking her head in something close to awe. It's perfect. Thank you. The house said nothing, but when she stepped into her bathroom, she found that it wasn't an ordinary bath. The house had added an assortment of oils that smelled of rosemary and lavender. She breathed in the heady, beautiful scent, and sighed. I think you might be my only friend, Nesta said, then groaned her way into the tub's welcoming warmth. The house was apparently so pleased by her words that as soon as she lay back, a tray appeared across the width of the tub. Laden with a massive piece of chocolate cake. Chapter 15 The seventh level of the library was unnerving. Standing at the stone railing on level six, clutching a book to be shelved, Nesta stared into the darkness mere feet from her, so thick that it hovered like a layer of fog, veiling the levels below. Books dwelled down there. She knew that, but she'd never been sent down to those dark levels. Had never seen one of the priestesses venture past the spot where she now stood, peering over the railing. Ahead of her, the darkness beckoned down the ramp. Like it was an entry into some dark pit of hell. Hyben's twin ravens were dead. Did their blood still stain the ground far below? Or had Rhys and Bryaxis wiped even that trace of them away? The darkness seemed to rise and fall. Like it was breathing. The hair on her arms rose. Bryaxis was gone. Set loose into the world. Even Fea and Ryzen's hunting hadn't retrieved the thing that was fear itself. And yet the darkness remained. It pulsed, tendrils of shadow drifting upward. She'd stared too long into its depths. It might gaze back. But she didn't move from the rail. Couldn't remember how she'd come down this far, or which book she still held in her hands. There was night, and there was the darkness of extinguishing a candle, and then there was this. Not only the true absence of light, but, a womb. The womb from which all life had come and would return, neither good nor evil, only dark, dark, dark. Nesta. Her name drifted to her as if rising from the depths of some black ocean. Nesta. It slid along her bones, her blood. She had to pull back. Pull away. The darkness pulsed, beckoning. Nesta. She whirled, nearly dropping the book over the edge. Gwyn was standing there, eyeing her. What are you doing? Heart thundering. Nesta twisted toward the darkness, but it was only that. Murky darkness, through which she could now barely make out the sublevels beneath. As if the thick, impenetrable black had vanished. It. I. Gwyn, arms laden with books, strode to her side and surveyed the dark. Nesta waited for the chiding, the ridicule and disbelief, but Gwyn only asked gravely, What did you see? Why? Nesta asked. Do you see things in that darkness? Her voice was thin. No, but some of the others do. They say the dark has trailed them. Right to their doors. Gwyn shivered. I saw darkness, Nesta managed to say. Her heart would not calm. Pure darkness. The likes of which she had not seen since she'd been inside the cauldron. Gwyn glanced between Nesta and the chasm below. We should go higher. Nesta lifted the book still in her shaking arms. I need to shelve this. Leave it, Gwyn said, enough authority lacing her words that Nesta dropped the book onto a dark wood table. The priestess put a hand to Nesta's back, escorting her up the sloping ramp. Don't look behind, Gwyn muttered out of the corner of her mouth. What level is your cart on? 4. 
She began to twist her head to gaze over her shoulder, but Gwyn pinched her. Don't look behind, Gwyn murmured again. Is it following? No, but. Gwyn's swallow was audible. I can feel something. Like a cat. Small and clever and curious. It's watching. If you're joking. Gwyn reached into the pocket of her pale robe and pulled out the blue stone of the priestesses. It fluttered with light, like the sun on a shallow sea. Hurry now, she whispered, and they increased their pace, reaching the fifth level. No other priestesses approached, and there was no one to witness Gwyn urging, keep going. The stone in her hand glimmered. They made another loop upward, and just as they reached the fourth level, that presence, that sensation of something at their backs eased. They waited until they'd reached Nesta's cart before Gwyn dumped her books on the ground and flung herself into the nearest tufted armchair. Her hands trembled, but the blue stone had gone dormant again. Nesta had to swallow twice before she could say, what is that? It's an invoking stone. Gwyn unfurled her fingers, revealing the gem within her hand. Similar to the siphons of the Illyrians, except that the power of the mother flows through it. We cannot use it for harm, only healing and protection. It was shielding us. No, I mean, that darkness. Gwen's eyes matched her stone almost perfectly, right down to the shadows that now veiled her expression. They say the being that dwelled down there is gone. But I believe some piece of it might have lingered. Or at the very least altered the darkness itself. It didn't feel like that. It felt, older. Gwyn's brows rose. Are you an adept in such things? There was no condescension in the words, only curiosity. I? Nesta blinked. Do you not know who I am? I know you are the High Lady's sister. That you slew the King of Hyben. Gwyn's face grew solemn, haunted. That you, like Lady Feya, were once mortal. Human. I was made by the cauldron. At the King of Hyben's order. Gwyn traced her fingers over the smooth dome of the invoking stone. It rippled with light at the touch. I didn't know such a thing was possible. My other sister, Elaine, we were forced into the cauldron and turned high fey. Nesta swallowed again. It, imparted some of itself to me. Gwyn considered the railing the open drop into the darkness beyond it. Light calls to like. Yes. Gwyn shook her head, hair swaying. Well, perhaps don't go down to level six again. It's my job to shelve the books. Make it known to Clotho and she'll ensure those books are given to others. It seems cowardly. I don't wish to learn what might come crawling out of that darkness if you, cauldron maid fear it. Especially if it's, drawn to you. Nesta sank into the chair beside Gwyn's. I'm not a warrior. You slew the king of Hyben, Gwyn repeated. With the shadows in his knife. Luck and rage, Nesta admitted. And I had made a promise to kill him for what he did to me and my sister. A priestess walked by, beheld them lounging there, and scurried off. Her fear left a tang in the air like burned food. Gwyn sighed after her. That's Riven. She's still uncomfortable with any manner of contact with strangers. When did she arrive? Eighty years ago. Nesta started. But sorrow filled Gwyn's eyes as she explained, we do not gossip about each other here. Our stories remain our own to tell or to keep. Only Riven, Clotho and the High Lord know what happened to her. She will not speak of it. And there has been no help for her. I am not privy to that information. I know of the resources available to us, but it is not my business whether Riven has utilized them. From the worry that now etched Gwyn's face, Nesta knew she had used those services. Or had at least tried. Gwyn tucked her hair behind her arched ears. I meant to find you yesterday to thank you again for switching out that book, but I got tied up with Meryl's work. 
She inclined her head. I'm in your debt. Nesta rubbed at a persistent cramp in her thigh. It was nothing. Gwyn noted the movement. What's wrong with your leg? Nesta gritted her teeth. Nothing. I'm training every morning with Cassian. She had no idea if Gwyn knew of him, so she clarified, the High Lord's General. I know who he is. Everyone knows who he is. It was impossible to read Gwyn's face. Why do you train with him? Nesta brushed a clump of dust off her knee. Let's just say that I was presented with several options, all designed to curb my behavior. Training with Cassian in the morning and working here in the afternoon was the most palatable. Why do you need to curb your behavior? Gwyn truly didn't know about what a horrible, wretched waste she'd become. It's a long story. Gwyn seemed to read her reluctance. What manner of training is it? Combat. Right now, it's a whole lot of balancing and stretching. She nodded toward Nesta's leg. Such things are painful. They are when you're as out of shape as I am. A pathetic weakling. Two more priestesses passed by, and apparently the presence of one of them was enough to send Gwyn launching to her feet. Well, I should be getting back to Meryl, she declared, any trace of solemnity gone. She nodded to the drop into the pit. Don't go looking for trouble. Gwyn turned on her heel, blue flashing in her hand. The sight of that blue made Nesta blurt, why don't you wear that stone on your head like the others? Gwyn pocketed the gem. Because I don't deserve to. Is this really all we'll be doing? Nesta demanded the next morning in the training ring as she rose from what Cassian had called a curtsy squat. Balance and stretching. Cassian crossed his arms. So long as you keep having shit balance, yes. I don't fall that often. Only every few minutes. He motioned for her to do another squat. You still keep your weight on your right leg when you stand. It opens up your hip, and your right foot rolls slightly to the side. Your entire center is off. Until we correct that, you're not starting anything more intense, no matter how nimble you are on your feet. You'd only injure yourself. Nesta puffed out a breath as she did another squat her right leg sweeping out behind her left as she ducked low. Fire quivered along her left thigh and knee. How many curtsies had she practiced under her mother's sharp eye? She'd forgotten they were this demanding. Like you stand so perfectly. I do. Unflinching arrogance laced every word. I've been training since I was a child. I was never given the chance to learn how to stand incorrectly. You have twenty-five years of bad habits to break. She rose from the squat, legs shaking. She had half a mind to call in their bargain and order him to never make her do another squat again. And you truly enjoy this endless exercising and training. Two more, and then I'll tell you. Grumbling, Nesta obeyed. Only because she was tired of being as weak as a mewling kitten, as he'd called her several nights ago. When she was done, Cassian said, get some water. The mid-morning sun beat down on them relentlessly. I don't need you to tell me when to drink, she snapped. Then go ahead and faint. Nesta met his hazel stare, the no-nonsense face, and drank the water. To stop her head spinning, she told herself. When she'd gulped down a glass, Cassian said, I was born to an unwed female in a settlement that makes Windhaven look like a tolerant, welcoming paradise. She was shunned for bearing a child out of wedlock, and forced to give birth to me alone in a tent in the dead of winter. Horror lurched through her. She'd known Cassian was lowborn, but that level of cruelty because of it. What of your father? You mean the piece of shit who forced himself on her and then went back to his wife and family? Cassian let out a cold laugh that she rarely heard. There were no consequences for him. There never are, Nesta said coolly. She blocked out the image of Thomas's face. There are here, Cassian growled, as if he sensed the direction of her thoughts. Cassian gestured to the city below, 
hidden by the mountain and the house blocking the view. Rhys changed the laws. Here in the night court, and in Illyria. His face hardened further. But it still requires the survivor to come forward. And in places like Illyria, they make life a living hell for any female who does. They deem it a betrayal. That's outrageous. We're all fey. Forget the high fey or lesser fey bullshit. We're all immortal or close to it. Change comes slowly for us. What humans accomplish in decades takes us centuries. Longer, if you live in Illyria. Then why do you bother with the Illyrians? Because I fought like hell to prove my worth to them. His eyes glittered. To prove that my mother brought some good into this world. Where is she now? He'd never spoken of her. His eyes shuttered in a way she had not witnessed before. I was taken away from her when I was three. Thrown out into the snow. And in her so-called disgraced state, she became prey to other monsters. Nesta's stomach twisted with each word. She did their backbreaking labor until she died, alone and. His throat worked. I was at Windhaven by then. I wasn't strong enough to return to help her. To bring her somewhere safe. Rhys wasn't yet High Lord, and none of us could do anything. Nesta wasn't entirely certain how they'd wound up speaking of this. Apparently, Cassian realized it as well. It's a story for another time. But what I meant to try to explain is that through it all, through every awful thing, the training centered me. Guided me. When I had a shit day, when I was spat on or pummeled or shunned, when I led armies and lost good warriors, when Rhys was taken by Amarantha, through all of that, the training remained. You said the other day the breathing helped you. It helps me, too. It helped Faya. She watched the wall rise in his eyes, word after word. As if he waited for her to rip it down. Rip him down. Make of that what you will, but it's true. Oily shame slithered through her. She'd done that brought this level of defensiveness to him. Heaviness weighed on her. Started gnawing on her insides. So Nesta said, show me another set of movements. Cassian scanned her face for a heartbeat, his gaze still shuttered, and began his next demonstration. The house had a taste for romance novels. Nesta stayed up later than she should have to finish the one it had left the day before, and when she returned to her room that evening, another was waiting. Don't tell me you somehow read these. She leafed through the volume on her nightstand. In answer, two more books thumped on the surface. Each one utterly filthy. Nesta let out a small chuckle. It must get awfully dull up here. A third book plopped atop the others. Nesta laughed again, a rusty, hoarse sound. She couldn't remember the last time she'd laughed. A true, Bella Deep laugh. Maybe before her mother had died. She'd certainly had nothing to laugh about once they'd fallen into poverty. Nesta nodded toward the desk. No dinner tonight? Her bedroom door only swung open to reveal the dimly lit hallway. I've had enough of him for one day. She'd barely been able to speak to Cassian for the rest of their lesson, unable to stop thinking of how he'd put up a wall without her so much as saying a word, anticipating that she would go after him, assuming that she was so awful she couldn't have a normal conversation. That she'd mock him about his mother and their pain. I'd rather stay here. The door opened wider. Nesta sighed. Her stomach ached with hunger. You're as much a busybody as the rest of them, she muttered, and aimed for the dining room. Cassian sat alone at the table, the setting sun gilding his black hair in golds and reds, shining through his beautiful wings. For a heartbeat, she understood Faya's urge to paint things, to capture sights like this, preserve them forever. How was the library, he asked as she claimed the seat across from him. Nothing tried to eat me today, so it was fine. A plate of roast pork and green beans appeared with a glass of water before her. He'd gone still, though. 
something tried to eat you on another day. Well, it didn't get close enough to try, but that was the general impression I received. He blinked, his siphons glowing. Tell me. Nesta wondered if she'd said something wrong, but she related the incident with the darkness and finished with Gwyn's assistance. She hadn't seen the priestess after that, but at the end of the day there had been a note on her cart that said, just a friendly reminder to stay away from the lowest levels. Nesta had snorted, balling up the note, but she'd kept it in her pocket. Across from her, Cashin's face was pale. You saw Bryaxis once, Nesta said into the silence. A few times, he breathed. His skin had turned greenish. I know we should keep hunting for Bryaxis. It's not a good thing that it's out in the world. But I don't think I could endure encountering it again. What was it like? His eyes met hers. My worst nightmares. And I'm not talking about petty phobias. I mean my deepest, most primal fears. I've put some of the worst, most vile monsters into the prison, but these were monsters in every sense of the word. It's. I don't think anyone can understand unless they've seen it. He glanced at her again, and she could tell he was bracing for her venom. Monster, she was a monster. The knowledge cut and sliced deep. But she said, hoping to let him see she wouldn't pry into his business just to hurt him, what manner of creatures did you put in the prison? Cassian took a bite of food. A good sign that this, at least, was acceptable territory. When you lived in the human world, you had legends of the dread beasts and fairies who would slaughter you if they ever breached the wall, didn't you? Things that slithered through open windows to drink the blood of children. Things that were so wicked, so cruel there was no hope against their evil. The hair on her neck rose. Yes. Those stories had always unnerved and petrified her. They were based on truth. Based on ancient, near-primordial beings who existed here before the high face split into courts, before the high lords. Some call them the first gods. They were beings with almost no physical form, but a keen, vicious intelligence. Humans and fae alike were their prey. Most were hunted and driven into hiding or imprisonment ages ago. But some remained, lurking in forgotten corners of the land. He swallowed another mouthful. When I was nearing three hundred years old, one of them appeared again, crawling out of the roots of a mountain. Before he went into the prison and confinement weakened him, Lanthes could turn into wind and rip the air from your lungs, or turn into rain and drown you on dry land, he could peel your skin from your body with a few movements. He never revealed his true form, but when I faced him, he chose to appear as swirling mist. He fathered a race of fairies that still plague us, who thrived under Amarantha's reign, the Boggy. But the Boggy are lesser, mere shadows compared to Lanthes. If there is such a thing as evil incarnate, it is him. He has no mercy, no sense of right or wrong. There is him, and there is everyone else, and we are all his prey. His methods of killing are creative and slow. He feasts on fear and pain as much as the flesh itself. Her blood chilled. How did you trap such a thing? Cassian tapped a spot on his neck where a scar slashed beneath his ear. I quickly learned I could never beat him in combat or magic. Still have the scar here to prove it. Cassian smiled faintly. So I used his arrogance against him. Flattered and taunted him into trapping himself in a mirror bound with ashwood. I bet him the mirror would contain him and Lanthe's bet wrong. He got out of the mirror, of course, but by that time, I'd dumped his miserable self into the prison. Nesta lifted a brow. He cut her a sharp smile that didn't meet his eyes and said, not just a brute after all. No, he wasn't, even though she'd said as much to him, but she'd never once believed it. Cassian went on, of all the occupants of the prison, Lanthes is the one I dread finding a way out. Would such a thing ever happen? I don't think so, thank the cauldron. That prison is inescapable. Unless you're Amran. Nesta didn't want to talk about Amran. Or think about her. 
You said you put others in. Half of her didn't want to know. He shrugged, as if it were of no consequence that he had done such remarkable things. Seven-headed Lubia, who made the mistake of surfacing from the caves of the deep ocean to prey on girls along the western coast. Blue Anus, who was a terror to behold cobalt skin and iron claws and, like Lubia, a taste for female flesh. Lubia, at least, swallowed her prey swiftly. Anus, she took longer. Anus was like Lanthes in that regard. His throat bobbed, and he tubbed back the collar of his shirt to reveal another scar, the horrific, thick one above his left pectoral. She'd spied it the other day in the training ring. That's all that remains of it now, but Anus had shredded through my chest with those iron claws and was nearly at my heart when Osriel intervened. So I suppose her capture is shared between the two of us. He drummed his fingers on the table. And then there was. I've heard enough. Her words were breathless. I'll never sleep tonight. She shook her head, taking another bite of food. I don't know how you can, having faced all that. He leaned back in his seat. You learn to live with it. How to block the horrors from your present thoughts. He added a touch quietly, but they still lurk there. In the back of your mind. She wished she knew how to do such things, to push all the thoughts that devoured her behind some wall, or into a hole within her, so she could bury them deep. Cassian asked her, voice still quiet, the darkness in the library, do you think it reacted to you specifically? When she said nothing, he pressed, because of your powers. I don't have any powers, she lied. Training with Amran hadn't done a lick to help her understand them, anyway. Then who left that handprint on the stairs? She didn't bother to look pleasant. Maybe Lucian. He's got fire in his veins. He said your fire was different from his. That it burned cold, somehow. Perhaps you should lock me up in that prison, then. He set down his fork. I'm just asking you a question. Does it matter if I have powers? Cassian shook his head in what seemed to be a mixture of admiration and disgust. You might have been born human, but you're pure fairy. Answering questions with questions, evading an honest answer. I can't tell if that's a compliment or not. It's not. His teeth flashed. The kind of powers you have aren't the sort that should sit idly by. They need an outlet, and training. Balancing and stretching. His jaw clenched. What happened with you and Amran? Why so many questions tonight? Because we're talking like normal people, and I want to know. About all of it. Nesta rose from the table, aiming for the door. What does it matter to you? Let's not retread old territory, NES. She threw over a shoulder, I hadn't realized we'd moved beyond it. Bullshit. Here's the part where you remind me everyone hates me, and I leave. Cassian shot from his seat, blocking her path to the door in three strides. She'd forgotten how fast he was, how graceful despite his size. He glowered down at her. It never mattered to me whether you took half the cauldron's power or a drop. It still doesn't matter. Why? Nesta couldn't stop herself from asking. Why do you even bother? His features turned stark. Why did you stay at my side when we went up against the King of Hyben during that last battle? As if that were an answer. She couldn't bear it, this talk, the expression on his face. Because I was a stupid fool. She shoved past him. What is it you're afraid of, he asked following her into the hall. She drew up short. I'm not afraid of anything. Liar. Nesta turned slowly. Let him see every bit of anger rippling through her. Cashin's eyes gleamed in savage satisfaction. His siphons flared, casting red light upon the stones, like watery blood had been spilled. His mouth twisted to the side in a crooked, mocking grin. 
Do you know how your eyes glow when your power rises to the surface? Like molten steel. Like silver fire. He'd done it on purpose riled her like this. To get her to show her hand. Nesta's fingers curled into claws at her sides. She took a step toward him. Cassian held his ground. So she took another step. Another. Until they were close enough that a heaving breath would have had her chest brushing his. Until she was baring her teeth at his still smirking face. Cassian surveyed her. Gazed into her eyes and breathed, beautiful. He didn't halt the hand she laid on his muscled chest. Or when she pushed against that chest, backing him into the wall, his wings splaying on impact. He just stared and stared at her, marveling hungry. Nesta didn't, couldn't, move as Cassian leaned to whisper in her ear, the first time I saw that look on your face, you were still human. Still human, and I nearly went to my knees before you. His breath caressed the shell of her ear and she couldn't stop her eyes from fluttering shut. His smile brushed against her temple. Your power is a song, and one I've waited a very, very long time to hear, Nesta. Her back arched slightly at the way he said her name, the way he bit out the second syllable. Like he was imagining clamping his teeth down on other parts of her. But only her hand bridged their bodies. Only her hand, now bunching up his shirt his thundering heartbeat pulsing beneath it. Until Cassian lowered his face an inch, and grazed the tip of his nose along her neck. Beneath her hand, his chest heaved upward as he inhaled a great, greedy breath of her scent. Too far. She shouldn't have let herself go this far with him, let him this close. Yet she couldn't withdraw. Couldn't do anything but let him brush his nose over her neck again. The urge to press her body into his, to feel his warmth and hardness grinding into her, nearly overrode every rational thought. Cashin's hands remained at his sides, though. As if waiting for her to give permission. Nesta pulled her head back, away, just enough to see his features. Her knees nearly wobbled at the desire blazing in them. Liquid, unrelenting desire, all fixed upon her. She couldn't get a breath down as she drowned in that stare. As low, sensitive parts of her tightened and began throbbing, her breasts becoming heavy and aching. His nostrils flared, scenting that, too. She couldn't. She couldn't do this to him. To herself. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't. Nesta began to withdraw her hand from his chest, but he slid his own atop it rubbed his thumb over the back of her hand, and just that graze of calloused flesh had her grinding her teeth, unable to think, to breathe. Cassian whispered in her ear, do you know what I'm going to think of tonight? A small sound must have come out of her, because he grinned as he stepped to the side. Let go of her hand. The absence of his warmth, his scent, was like a bucket of ice water. He smiled, nothing but wickedness and challenge. I'm going to think of that look on your face. He took another step down the hall. I'm always thinking of that look on your face. She couldn't sleep. The sheets chafed, strangled her, smothered her with their heat until sweat ran down her body. I'm always thinking of that look on your face. Nesta lay in the darkness, her breathing uneven, her body flushed and aching. She'd barely been able to focus on reading when she'd returned to her room. And she'd been tossing and turning in bed for what had felt like hours now. I'm always thinking of that look on your face. She could see it, Cassian in his own bed, sprawled out like a dark king, gripping himself, pumping hard. She managed to whisper into the room, come back at dawn. She didn't know if the house obeyed. Didn't find out if it understood why she wanted privacy as she traced her hand up her nightgown, the slide of silk against her skin nearly unbearable. She moaned into her pillow as her fingers slid between her legs, instantly slippery with the wetness pooled there, which hadn't gone away since she'd been left standing in that hallway. Her hips arched into the touch, and she gritted her teeth, letting out a long hiss as she dragged her fingers down her aching, throbbing center. I'm always thinking of that look on your face. 
She slid her fingers in deep, writhing at the intrusion, unable to stop seeing Cashin's face, that half-smile, that light in his eyes. The powerful body and beautiful wings. She withdrew her fingers nearly to their tips, and as she plunged them back in, it was Cashin's hand she pictured there, felt there. Cashin's other hand that rose to clasp her breast, squeezing hard, just the way she liked it, a sharp, slight edge of pain to heighten the pleasure. It was Cashin's hand she rode, biting her lip to keep her moaning contained. It was Cashin's hand that brought her over the edge and into a release so intense she nearly cried out. It was Cashin's hand that slid into her, over and over again, release after release, until Nesta lay wrung out and panting upon the bed, with only the darkness to hold her. Chapter 16 Cassian hadn't slept well. It was hard to sleep well when he'd been so aroused he'd had to pleasure himself not once but three times just to calm the hell down enough to close his eyes. But he awoke before dawn aching for her, her scent still in his nose, and another release had barely taken the edge off. He told her exactly what he planned to do last night, but meeting Nesta's stare over the breakfast table the next morning was more uncomfortable than he'd anticipated. She'd beaten him to the table, and had been reading a book while she ate. It lay closed now, but from the spine, he gleaned that it was one of the romances she favoured so much. To break the silence, Cassian asked, What are you reading? Colour stained Nesta's pale cheeks. And he could have sworn it took an effort of will for her to meet his eyes, too. A romance. I gathered that. What's this one about? She dropped her gaze quickly. But the blush remained. He knew it had nothing to do with the novel. But she lifted her eyes to him again, spine stiffening. Like she was working hard as hell to make herself meet his stare. Her fingers clenched her fork. And when he looked at them, she pulled her hand under the table. As if it were blazing with proof. His blood heated as he realized the blush her embarrassment. He made himself take deep, steadying breaths. They had to train together for the next two hours. Being at attention wasn't only unhelpful, but inappropriate in the training ring. It didn't make him stop picturing it, that hand between her legs, her body as aching for release as his had been. The way she'd probably bitten her lip, just as he had, to keep from crying out. His cock grew hard, pushing at his pants to the point of pain. Cassian shifted in his seat, trying to free up any space for himself. It only succeeded in making the hard seam rub against his cock, the friction enough to make him grit his teeth. Training. They had training. The book, Nesta said, a bit breathlessly, is about. Her nostrils flared and her eyes went a bit unfocused. A book. Interesting, Cassian murmured. Sounds great. He had to get out of this room. Had to sort his shit out before he went upstairs. The heat between them didn't belong in the training ring. Where the fuck was Azid when he needed him? Cassian had played buffer for more for years, where the fuck was she when he needed her? But he couldn't rise from his chair. If he did, Nesta would see precisely how she'd affected him. That is, if she hadn't already scented it and understood the shift in his smell. And if she looked at the bulge in his pants with that heat she'd had in her eyes last night, the heat he'd come to just picturing her, he might very well make a fool of himself. It was a risk he was willing to take. Had to take, before he laid her flat on the table and removed their clothing piece by piece. Cassian shot out of his chair, muttering, I'll see you there, and left. The book, Nesta repeated to herself, staring at her porridge, is about a book. She cupped her forehead in her hands. Idiot. At least Cassian Haddon seemed to be listening. But whatever willingness had been in his eyes last night seemed reluctant today, as if he couldn't help, didn't want that heat between them, that tension. He'd practically run out of the room to avoid her. Training would be awful. He was waiting in the ring the portrait of a swaggering warrior. Nesta didn't dare look at his pants. 
to what she could have sworn she'd glimpsed straining at the stays and buttons when he'd fled the room. But if he appeared unruffled, then fine. She'd match him in it. Nesta rolled her shoulders, approaching him. More stretching and balance. No. Their eyes met, and there was only clear, determined calm and a challenge. We'll do the warm-up, and then we're moving into some core work. She gaped. Her, core. Abdominals, he clarified, and pink washed across his face. He cleared his throat. Filthy mind. He flicked her cheek. Too much smut. She batted him away and gestured to the muscles hidden beneath his shirt. You're going to make me look like that. His low laugh rippled over her body. No one can look like this but me, N.E.S. Arrogant ass. Reese and Osriel do, she said sweetly. I've got one or two muscles on them. I don't see it. He winked. Maybe they're in other places. She couldn't help it. Couldn't stop it. Not the flash of desire, but the smile that overtook her face. She huffed a laugh. Cassian stared like he hadn't seen her before. His shock was enough that Nesta dropped her smile. All right, she said. Warm up, then abdominals. She hated abdominal exercises. Mostly because she couldn't do them. I knew you didn't have much muscle, Cassian observed as Nesta lay Bella down on the ground, having collapsed onto her front after trying to hold a full body plank, but this is absolutely pathetic. Aren't you supposed to be my inspirational teacher? You can't do more than five seconds. She spat, and how long can you do? Five minutes. Nesta pushed herself onto her elbows. I'm sorry if I haven't had 500 years of core work. I asked you to hold that plank for 30 seconds. She shoved onto her knees, stomach aching. He'd had her doing curls upward, then leg extensions while lying on her back, and then lifting a smooth five-pound rock over her head while she tried to raise herself from lying prone into a sitting position using only her stomach muscles. She hadn't been able to do more than one or two of any of them before her body gave out. No amount of wool or grit could make it move. This is torture. Bracing her hands on her knees, Nesta pointed to the ring. If you're so perfect, do everything you just ordered me to do. Cassian snorted. A ten-year-old Illyrian boy could do it in the span of a few minutes. Then do your big, tough male routine. He smirked. All right. You want to mouth off? then I'll show you my big, tough male routine. He slung his shirt off. Tied back his hair. And this was a different sort of torture. To watch him go through the same exercises, only harder, heavier, faster. To watch the muscles of his stomach ripple, muscles everywhere ripple. To watch sweat glisten and then run down his golden body, over his tattoos along the eight-pointed star of their bargain on his spine before sliding into the waist of his pants. But he'd been professional during their lesson. Utterly professional and distant, as if this training ring was sacred to him. Nesta couldn't tear her eyes away as he completed his exercises, panting softly. She tried not to wonder if that panting was how he'd sounded last night when he'd pleasured himself. But Cashin's hazel eyes were clear triumphant. In another age, another world, he might have been deemed a warrior god by mortals. After what he'd told her about the monsters he'd put in the prison, he might very well be considered a great hero in this age. The kind that would one day be whispered about around a fire. People would name their children after him. Warriors would want to be him. A fine warrior would be known as Cassian Reborn. She'd called him a brute. What? Cassian wiped the sweat from his face. She asked, to distract herself from her thoughts, are there truly no female fighting units amongst the Illyrians? She hadn't seen any during the war. His smile faded. We tried once and it failed spectacularly. 
So, no. There aren't. Because Illyrians are backward and horrible. He winced. Have you been talking to AZ? Just my observations. He untied his hair, the thick, straight locks falling around his face. The Illyrians. I told you. Progress is slow. It's an ongoing goal of ours, me and Reese, I mean. It's that hard for the females to become warriors. It's not just the training. It's running the social gauntlet, too. And then there's the blood rite, which they'd also have to complete. What's the blood rite? What it sounds like. He rubbed his neck. When an Illyrian warrior comes into his full power, usually in his twenties, he has to go through the blood rite before he can qualify as a full warrior and adult. Would-be warriors from every clan and village get sent in, usually three or four from each, all of them scattered across an area in the Illyrian mountains. We're left there for a week with two goals, survival, and making it to Ramiel. What's Ramiel? She felt like a child with these questions, but her curiosity got the better of her. Our sacred mountain. He drew a familiar symbol in the dirt, an upward-pointing triangle with three dots above it. A mountain, she realized. And three stars. It's the symbol of the night court. The blood rite always takes place when Arctus, Carinth, and Orists, our three holy stars, shine above it for one week a year. On the final day of the rite, they're directly above its peak. So you hike to the mountain? We kill our way to the mountain. His eyes had turned hard. We're drugged and dumped into the wilderness, with nothing but our clothes. And you have to participate? Once you're in, you can't leave. At least until the rite is over, or you reach the peak of Ramiel. If anyone breaks into the rite to extract or save you, the law declares that both of you will be hunted down and killed for the transgression. Even Reese isn't exempt from those laws. Nesta shivered. It sounds barbaric. That's not the half of it. A spell is in place so our wings are rendered useless and no magic may be used. He held up a hand, displaying the red siphon on its back. Magic is rare amongst Illyrians, but when it does manifest, it requires siphons to be controlled, filtered into something usable. But it gives us an advantage over the other Illyrians without it so the spell levels the playing field. Illyrians do possess magic on one night a year, though, the night before the blood rite, when the warband leaders can winnow the drugged novices into the wilds. Don't even ask me why that is. No one knows. Osriel can winnow all the time, though. AZ is different. In a lot of ways. His tone didn't invite further questioning. So without the use of magic in the right, you kill each other the normal way. Swords and daggers. Weapons are banned, too. At least ones that are brought in from the outside. But you can build your own. You need to build your own. Or else you'll be slaughtered. By the other warriors. Yes. Rival clans, enemies, assholes seeking notoriety, all of it. In some villages, the higher the kill count, the more glory you bring. The most backward clans claim the slaughter is to thin out the weaker warriors, but I always thought it was a grand waste of any potential talent. Cassian dragged a hand through his hair. And then there are the creatures that roam the mountains, ones that can easily bring down an Illyrian warrior with claws and fangs. A murky memory surfaced, of Faya telling her about the horrible beasts she'd once encountered in the region. Cassian went on, so you're facing all of that while trying to make your way to Ramiel's slopes. The majority of the males forget to save enough strength for the end of the week to make the climb. It's a full day and night of brutal climbing, where one fall can kill you. Most don't even make it to the base of the mountain. But if they do, the opponent changes. You're not facing other warriors, you're pitting yourself, your very soul, against the mountain. It's usually that fact that breaks anyone who tries to scale it. And what, you make it to the top and get a trophy? 
Cassian snorted, but his words were serious. There's a sacred stone atop it. Touch the stone first, and you win. It will transport you out immediately. And everyone else when the week is done. Whoever is left standing is considered a warrior. Where you are when it ends sorts you into one of the three echelons of warrior, named after our holy stars, Octosian, the ones who don't make it to the mountain but survive, Aristian, the ones who make it to the mountain but don't reach the top, and Corinthian, the ones who scale the summit and are considered elite warriors. Touching the stone atop Ramiel is to win the right. Only a dozen warriors in the past five centuries have reached the mountain. You touched the stone, I take it. Reese, AZ, and I touched it together, even though we were deliberately separated from each other at the beginning. Why? The leaders feared us and what we'd become. They thought the warriors or beasts would handle us, if we didn't have each other to lean against. They were wrong. His eyes glittered fiercely. What they learned was that we love each other as true brothers. And there was nothing that we wouldn't do, no one we wouldn't kill, to reach each other. To save each other. We killed our way across the mountains, and made it through the breaking, the worst of Ramiel's three routes to the top and we won the damn thing. We touched the stone in the same moment, the same breath, and entered the Corinthian tier of warriors. Nesta failed to keep the shock off her face. And you say only twelve have become Corinthian, in five hundred years? No. Twelve made it to the mountain and became Aristian. Only three others, besides us, won the blood rite and became Corinthian. His throat bobbed. They were fine warriors, and led exemplary units. We lost two of them against Hyben. Likely in that blast that had decimated a thousand of them. The blast she'd shielded him from. Him, and only him. Nesta's stomach clenched, nausea sliding through her. She forced herself to take a long breath. So you think females can't participate in the right? Moore would likely win the damn thing in record time, but no. I wouldn't want even her participating in the right. The unspoken part of his reasoning lay coldly in his eyes. There would be a different, worse kind of violence to defend against, even if the females were as highly trained as the males. Nesta shivered. Could you have a female unit without them taking the blood right? They would never be honored as true warriors without it, without one of those three titles. Well, I would consider them warriors, but not the rest of the Illyrians. No other units would fly with them. They'd consider it a disgrace and an insult. She frowned and he held up his hands. Like I said, change comes slowly. You heard the bullshit Devlin spewed about your cycle. That's considered progress. In the past, they'd kill a female for picking up a weapon. Now they decontaminate the blade and call themselves modern thinkers. Disgust contorted his features. Nesta eased to her feet and scanned the sky. Her head had cleared only slightly. She didn't relish the prospect of shelving books when her body was already aching. But perhaps she'd see Gwyn. Training the Illyrian females, Cassian went on, wouldn't be about fighting in our wars. It would be about proving they're equally as capable and strong as the males. It would be about mastering their fear, honing the strength they already have. What do they fear? Becoming my mother, he said softly. Going through what she endured. What the priestesses beneath the mountain had endured. Nesta thought of the quiet priestesses who did not leave the mountain, who dwelled in the dimness. Riven flashed through her memory, hurrying past, unable to stomach a stranger's presence. Gwyn, with her bright eyes that sometimes darkened with shadows. Cassian tilted his head to the side at her silence. What is it? Would you train non-Illyrian females? I'm training you, aren't I? I mean, would you consider? She didn't know how to elegantly phrase it, not like silver-tongued resand. The priestesses in the library. If I invited them to train with us here, where it's private and safe. Would you train them? 
Cassian blinked slowly. Yes. I mean, of course, but. He winced. Nesta, many of the females in the library do not want to be, cannot stand to be around males again. Then we'll ask one of your female friends to join. More or anyone else you can think of. The priestesses might not even be able to stomach having me present. You'd never hurt anyone like that. His eyes softened slightly. It's not about that for them. It's about the fear, the trauma they bear. Even if they know I'd never do that to them, I might still drag up memories that are incredibly difficult for them to face. You said this training would help me with my problems. Perhaps it could help them. At the very least give them a reason to get outside for a bit. Cassian watched her for a long moment. Then he said, whoever you can get up here with us, I'll gladly train. More's away, but I can ask Faya. Not Faya. Nesta hated the words. The way his back stiffened. She couldn't look at him as she said, I just. How could she explain the tangle between her and her sister? The self-loathing that threatened to consume her every time she looked at her sister's face. All right, Cassian repeated. Not fair. But I need to give her and Risa heads up. You should probably ask Clotho for permission, too. A warm hand clasped her shoulder and squeezed. I like this idea, NES. His hazel eyes shone bright. I like it at LOT. And for some reason, the words meant everything. Chapter 17 I have a proposition for you. Stomach muscles throbbing, legs aching, Nesta stood before Clotho's desk as the priestess finished writing on whatever manuscript she was annotating, her enchanted pen scratching along. Clotho lifted her head when the pen dotted its last mark and wrote on a scrap of paper, yes. Would you allow your priestesses to train with me every morning in the ring at the top of the house? Not all of them, just whoever might be interested. Clotho sat perfectly still. Then the pen moved. Train for what? To strengthen their bodies, to defend themselves, to attack, if they wish. But also to clear their minds. Help steady them. Who will oversee this training? You? No. I'm not qualified for that. I'll be training with them. Her heart pounded. She wasn't sure why. Cassian will be overseeing it. His not handsy, I mean, his respectful Anne. Nesta shook her head. She sounded a proper fool. Beneath the shadows of her hood, Nesta could sense Clotho's gaze lingering upon her. The pen moved again. Not many will come, I'm afraid. I know. But even one or two. I'd like to offer. Nesta gestured to a pillar beyond Clotho. I'll put a sign-up sheet there. Whoever wants to join is welcome. Again, that long stare from beneath the hood, its weight like a phantom touch. Then Clotho wrote, whoever wants to join has my blessing. Nesta pasted the sign-up sheet onto the pillar that day. No one had inked their name on it by the time she departed. She awoke early made the trek to the library to check the list, and found it still empty. It'll take time, Cassian consoled her when he read whatever lay etched on her face as she stepped into the training ring. He added a shade softly, keep reaching out your hand. So Nesta did. Every afternoon when she arrived at the library, she checked the list. Every evening when she left, she checked it as well. It was always empty. At training, Cassian began to instruct her on basic footwork and body positioning in hand-to-hand -hand combat. No punches or kicks, not yet. Nesta held that infernal plank for 10 seconds. Then 15. Then 20. 30. Cassian added weights to her exercises, in order to build up her flimsy arms. Heavy stones with carved handles to carry while she did her lunges and squats. All while she breathed and breathed and breathed. She tried the stairs again. 
made it to step 500 before her muscles demanded she turn around. The next night, she halted on 610. Then 750. She didn't know what she'd do at the bottom, find a tavern or a pleasure hall and drink herself stupid, she supposed. If she made it, she'd deserve it, she told herself with each step. At night, exhaustion weighed so heavily she could barely eat and bathe before tumbling into bed. Barely read a chapter of a book before her eyelids drooped. She'd found a smutty novel she'd already read and loved in one of the trunks Elaine had packed, and had laid it on the desk. She'd said to the air, I found this for you. It's a present. The book had vanished into nothing. But in the morning, she'd found a bouquet of autumnal flowers upon her desk, the glass vase bursting with asters and chrysanthemums of every color. A week passed, during which she barely saw Gwyn, though she learned through Clotho that Merrill had been pushing her hard with the Valkyrie research. But Nesta had so many books to shelve that the hours passed swiftly. Especially once she began using the books to train. While striding up the ramp, she'd hold a heavy stack and execute an assortment of lunges. Several times, she caught passing priestesses a level above peering at her while she did so. Every day, she checked the sign-up sheet on the pillar beyond Clotho's desk. Empty. Day after day after day. Keep reaching out your hand, Cassian had told her. But what would it matter, she began to wonder, if no one bothered to reach back. You hold your fist like that when you punch someone and you'll shatter your thumb. Panting, with sweat running down her back in great rivers, Nesta scowled at Cassian. She held up the fist he'd ordered her to make, her thumb inside her folded fingers. What's wrong with my fist? Keep your thumb atop the knuckles on your pointer and middle finger. He made a fist to demonstrate and wiggled the thumb tucked against his fingers. If your thumb makes the hit, it's going to hurt like hell. Studying the fist Cassian extended, Nesta mimicked the positioning on her own hand. What then? He jerked his chin. Get into the position we went over yesterday. Feet parallel, rooting your strength into the ground. I know, I know, Nesta muttered, and took up the stance he'd spent three days making her practice. She observed her feet as they shuffled into position, then she bent her knees slightly, bobbing twice to make sure she'd secured her center of power. Cassian circled her. Good. Any punch you make should be swift and precise, not a wild swing that'll knock you off balance and deprive your arm of strength. Your body and breath will power the punch more than your actual arm. He took up a similar stance and struck at the air. He moved so smoothly, so brutally, that the blow was done before she could blink. He held out his arm when he'd finished, muscles shifting. He'd rolled up his sleeves against the warm autumn day, but hadn't taken his shirt off entirely. In the stark sunlight, the tattoo along his left arm seemed to drink down the brightness. Line up the first two knuckles with your forearm. That's what you want to hit with, and the strength in your arm will carry right through to them. If you hit with your ring finger and pinky, you'll break your hand. I had no idea punching was so fraught with peril. Apparently, it takes brains to be a brute. Nesta flattened her brows, but focused on aligning her forearm and the knuckles he'd indicated. That's it. To hit with the proper knuckles, you need to angle your wrist downward just a fraction. Why? So your wrist doesn't snap. She lowered her arm. Considering how many ways there are to break my own hand when punching someone, it doesn't seem worth it. That's why a good warrior knows when to pick his battles. He lowered his fist. You have to ask yourself if the risk is worth it each time. And do you always throw a punch with perfect form? Yes, Cassian said without one ounce of doubt. He shook his hair from his eyes. Well, most of the time. There have been some brawls when I didn't have the right angle and balance, but a punch, even one that could break my hand, was the best way out of a bind. I've shattered my hand. He squinted at the sky, as if doing a mental tally. Oh, probably ten times. 
in 500 years. I can't be perfect every moment of every day, N.E.S. His eyes flickered. There had been no repeats of that madness in the hallway last week. And she'd been too tired at night to even make it up to the dining room, let alone to pleasure herself in bed. Right, he said. Now shift your hips into the punch. He struck at the air again. He moved more slowly this time, letting her see how his body flowed into the blow. It will engage your core and your shoulder, both of which had extra power. Another jab. So those abdominal exercises are useful beyond wanting to show off your muscles. He threw her a wry grin. You really think this is just for show? I think I've caught you looking at yourself in that mirror at least a dozen times each lesson. Nesta nodded to the slender mirror across the ring. He chuckled. Liar. You use that mirror to watch me when you think I'm not paying attention. She refused to let him see the truth on her face. Refused to so much as lower her head. She focused again on her stance. All business today, huh? You want me to train, Nesta said coolly, so train me. Even if no priestesses showed up, even if she was a stupid fool for hoping that they would, she didn't mind this training. It cleared her head, required so much thinking and breathing that the roaring thoughts had little chance to devour her whole. Only in the quiet moments did those thoughts pounce again, usually if she lost focus while working in the library or bathing. And when that happened, the stairwell always beckoned. The infernal ten thousand steps. But would it do anything, the training, the work, the stairs, beyond keeping her busy? The thoughts still waited like wolves to swarm her. To rip her apart. I loved you from the first moment I held you in my arms. The wolves prowled closer, claws clicking. Where'd you go? Cassian asked. Hazel eyes dim with worry. Nesta took up her stance again. It sent the wolves retreating a step. Nowhere. Elaine was in the private library. Nesta knew it before she'd cleared the stairs, covered in dust from the library. Her sister's delicate scent of jasmine and honey lingered in the red-stoned hall like a promise of spring, a sparkling river that she followed to the open doors of the chamber. Elaine stood at the wall of windows, clad in a lilac gown whose close-fitting bodice showed how well her sister had filled out since those initial days in the night court. Gone were the sharp angles, replaced by softness and elegant curves. Nesta knew she herself had looked like that at one point, even if Elaine's breasts had always been smaller. She peered down at herself, bony and gangly. Her sister turned toward her, glowing with health. Elaine's smile was as bright as the setting sun beyond the windows. I thought I'd drop by to see how you were doing. Someone had brought Elaine here, since there was no way in hell she had climbed those ten thousand steps. Nesta didn't return her sister's smile, but rather gestured to her body, the leathers, the dust. I've been busy. You look a little better than you did a few weeks ago. The last time she'd seen Elaine, a week before she'd come to the house. She'd passed her sister in the bustling market square they called the Palace of Bone and Salt, and though Elaine had halted, no doubt intending to speak to her, Nesta had kept walking. Haddon looked back before vanishing into the throng. Nesta didn't wish to consider how poorly she'd look then, if the picture she presented now was better. You've got good colouring, I mean, Elaine clarified striding from the windows to cross the room. She stopped a few feet away. As if holding herself back from the embrace she might have given. Like Nesta was some sort of disease-ridden leper. How many times had they been in this room during those initial months? How many times had it been this way, only with their positions switched? Elaine had been the ghost then, too thin, with her thoughts turned inward. Somehow, Nesta had become the ghost. Worse than a ghost. A wraith, whose rage and hunger were bottomless, eternal. Elaine had only needed time to adjust. But Nesta knew she herself needed more than that. Are you enjoying your time up here? 
Nesta met her sister's warm brown eyes. When human, Elaine had easily been the prettiest of the three of them, and when she'd been turned high fay, that beauty had been amplified. Nesta couldn't put her finger on what changes had been wrought beyond the pointed ears, but Elaine had gone from lovely to devastatingly beautiful. Elaine never seemed to realize it. It was always that way between them, Elaine, sweet and oblivious, and Nesta, the snarling wolf at her side, poised to shred anyone who threatened her. Elaine is pleasant to look at, her mother had once mused while Nesta sat beside her dressing table, a servant silently brushing her mother's gold-brown hair, but she has no ambition. She does not dream beyond her garden and pretty clothes. She will be an asset on the marriage market for us one day, if that beauty holds, but it will be our own maneuverings, Nesta, not hers, that win us an advantageous match. Nesta had been twelve at the time. Elaine barely eleven. She'd absorbed every word of her mother's scheming, plans for futures that had never come to pass. We shall have to petition your father to go to the continent when the time is right, her mother had often said. There are no men here worthy of either of you. Fea hadn't even been considered at that point, a sullen, strange child whom her mother ignored. Human royalty rules they're still lords and dukes and princes, but their wealth is tapped out, many of their estates nearing ruin. Two beautiful ladies with a king's fortune could go far. I might marry a prince. Nesta had asked. Her mother had only smiled. Nesta shook her head clear of the memories and said at last, I don't have any choice but to be here, so I don't see how I could be enjoying myself. Elaine wrung her slender fingers, nails kept trimmed short for her work in the gardens. I know the circumstances for your coming here were awful, Nesta, but it doesn't mean you need to be so miserable about it. I sat by your side for weeks, Nesta said flatly. Weeks, while you wasted away, refusing food and drink. While you appeared to hope you'd just wither and die. Elaine flinched. But Nesta couldn't stop the words from pouring out. No one suggested you either shape up or be shipped back to the human lands. Elaine, surprisingly, held her ground. I wasn't drinking myself into oblivion and, and doing those other things. Fucking strangers. Elaine flinched again, her face coloring. Nesta snorted. You're living amongst beings who have none of our human primness, you know. Elaine squared her shoulders again, just as Nesta added, it's not like you and Grayson didn't act on your feelings. It was a low blow, but Nesta didn't care. She knew Elaine had given her maidenhead to Grayson a month before they'd been turned fey. Elaine had been glowing the next morning. Elaine cocked her head. Didn't dissolve into the crying mess she usually became when Grayson came up. Instead she said, you're angry with me. Fine, then. She could be direct, too. Nesta shot back, for packing my things while Reese and Faya told me I'm a worthless pile of shit. Yes. Elaine crossed her arms and said calmly, sadly, Faya warned me this might happen. The words struck Nesta like a slap. They'd spoken of her, her behavior, her attitude. Elaine and Faya, that was the new status of things. The bond Elaine had chosen. It was inevitable, Nesta supposed, stomach churning. She was the monster. Why shouldn't the two of them band together and shove her out? Even if she'd foolishly believed that Elaine had always seen every horrible part of her and decided to stick by her anyway. I still wanted to come, Elaine went on with that focused calm, the quiet steel building in her voice. I wanted to see you, to explain. Elaine had chosen Faya, chosen her perfect little world. Amran hadn't been any different. Nesta's spine stiffened. There is nothing to explain. Elaine held up her hands. We did this because we love you. Spare me the bullshit, please. Elaine stepped closer, brown eyes wide. Undoubtedly wholly convinced of her own innocence, her innate goodness. It's the truth. We did this because we love you, and worry for you, and if father were here. Don't ever mention him. 
Nesta bared her teeth, but kept her voice low. Never fucking mention him again. She forbade her leash to slip completely. But she felt it, the stirring of that terrible beast inside her. Felt its power surge, blazing yet cold. She lunged for it, shoving it down, 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 but it was too late. Elaine's gasp confirmed that Nesta's eyes had gone to silver fire, as Cassian had described it. But Nesta smothered the fire in her darkness, until she was cold and empty and still once more. Pain slowly washed over Elaine's face. An understanding. Is that what this is all about? Father? Nesta pointed to the door, finger shaking with the effort of keeping that writhing power at bay. Each word from Elaine's mouth threatened to undo her restraint. Get out. Silver lined Elaine's eyes, but her voice remained steady, sure. There was nothing that could have been done to save him, Nesta. The words were kindling. Elaine had accepted his death as inevitable. She hadn't bothered to fight for him, as if he hadn't been worth the effort, precisely as Nesta knew she herself wasn't worth the effort. This time, Nesta didn't stop the power from shining in her eyes, she shook so violently she had to fist her hands. You tell yourself there's nothing that could have been done because it's unbearable to think that you could have saved him, if you'd only deigned to show up a few minutes earlier. The lie was bitter in her mouth. It wasn't Elaine's fault their father had died. No, that was entirely Nesta's own fault. But if Elaine was so determined to root out the good in her, then she'd show her sister how ugly she could be. Let a fraction of this agony rip into her. This was why Elaine had chosen Faya. This. Faya had rescued Elaine time and again. But Nesta had sat by, armed only with her viper's tongue. Sat by while they starved. Sat by when Hyben stole them away and shoved them into the cauldron. Sat by when Elaine had been kidnapped. And when their father had been in Hyben's grip, she had done nothing, nothing to save him, either. Fear had frozen her, blanketing her mind, and she'd let it do so, let it master her, so that by the time her father's neck had snapped, it had been too late and entirely her fault. Why wouldn't Elaine choose Faya? Elaine stiffened, but refused to balk from whatever she beheld in Nesta's gaze. You think I'm to blame for his death? Challenge filled each word. Challenge, from Elaine, of all people. No one but the King of Hyben is to blame for that. The quaver in her voice belied her firm words. Nesta knew she'd hit her mark. She opened her mouth, but couldn't continue. Enough. She had said enough. That fast, the power in her receded, vanishing into smoke on the wind. Leaving only exhaustion weighing her bones, her breath. It doesn't matter what I think. Go back to Faya and your little garden. Even during their squabbles in the cottage, fighting over who got clothes or boots or ribbons, it had never been like this. Those fights had been petty, born of misery and discomfort. This was a different beast entirely, from a place as dark as the gloom at the base of the library. Elaine headed for the doors, purple dress sweeping behind her. Cassian said he thought the training was helping, she murmured, more to herself than to Nesta. Sorry to disappoint you. Nesta slammed the doors so hard they rattled. Silence filled the room. She didn't twist toward the windows to see who might fly past with Elaine, who'd be witness to the tears Elaine would likely shed. Nesta slid into one of the armchairs before the unlit fireplace and stared at nothing. She didn't stop the wolves when they gathered around her again, hateful, razor-sharp truths on their red tongues. She didn't stop them as they began to rend her apart. When Elaine burst into the dining room of the house, Cassian and Reese were shaking off the frigid air that had been howling through Windhaven. Her brown eyes were bright with tears, but she kept her chin high. I want to go home, she said, voice wobbling slightly. Cassian looked at Reese, who'd dropped off the middle arc heron's sister before retrieving Cassian from Windhaven. He'd wanted to see for himself how ready the Illyrians were to fight. 
that Reese had found nothing lacking both elated Cassian and filled him with dread. If war began once more, how many would die? It was a soldier's lot in life to fight, to march with death beside him, and he had led males into battle multiple times. Yet how many promises had he foolishly made to the families of those who'd fallen in the recent war that the peace would last for a while? How many more families would he have to comfort? He didn't know why it was different this time, why it weighed so heavily. But while Reese and Devlin had been speaking, Cassian had been staring at the children of Windhaven, wondering how many would lose their fathers. Cassian cast the memory aside as Reese surveyed Elaine, his violet blue eyes missing nothing. What happened? When Reese spoke like that, it was more of a command than a question. Elaine waved a hand in dismissal before flinging open the veranda doors and striding into the open air. Elaine, Reese said as he and Cassian trailed her into the dying light. Elaine stood by the rail, the breeze caressing her hair. She's not getting any better. She's not even trying. She wrapped her arms around herself and stared toward the distant sea. Reese turned to him, his face grave. Faya warned her. Cassian swore softly. Nesta is making progress, I know she is. Something set her off. He added, because Reese was still looking like cold death personified, it'll take time. Maybe no more visits from her sisters, for the time being. At least not without her permission. He didn't want to isolate Nesta. Not at all. If Elaine wants to see her again, let me ask Nesta first. Reese's voice slithered like liquid night. What about Faya? She doesn't want Faya here. Power rumbled through Reese, guttering the stars in his eyes. Calm the fuck down, Cassian snapped. They have their own shit to sort out. You threatening to obliterate Nesta every time it comes up doesn't help. Reese held his stare, the inherent dominance in it like the force of a tidal wave. But Cassian weathered it. Let it wash past him. Then Reese shook his head and said to Elaine, I'll fly you home. Elaine didn't object when Reese scooped her up and launched into the red and pink stained sky. When there were a speck of black and purple over the rooftops, Reese sweeping along the gilded river as if giving Elaine a scenic tour, then and only then did Cassian enter the house. He stormed across the dining room and into the hallway. He charged down the stairs, his feet eating every inch of distance until he flung open the family library's doors. What the fuck happened? Nesta was sitting in an armchair before the dark fireplace, fingers digging into the rolled arms of the seat. A queen on a quilted throne. I don't want to talk to you, was all she said. His heart thundered, his chest heaving as if he'd run a mile. What did you say to Elaine? She leaned forward to peer at him. Then rose to her feet, a pillar of steel and flame, her lips curling back from her teeth. Of course you'd assume I'm the one at fault. She prowled closer, her eyes burning with cold fire. Always defending sweet, innocent Elaine. He crossed his arms, letting her get as close to him as she wanted. Like hell would he yield one step to her. I'll remind you that you've been the chief defender of sweet, innocent Elaine until recently. He'd witnessed her go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Faye capable of slaughtering her without giving it a thought, all for her sister. Nesta only simmered, near shaking with rage. Or cold. Cauldron, it was cold in here. Only the heated floors offered any reprieve. Fire, he said, and the house obeyed. A great blaze flared to life in the hearth behind him. No fire she said, focused upon Cassian, though her words were not to him. The house seemed to ignore her. No fire, she ordered. He could have sworn she blanched slightly. For a heartbeat, he was again in Reese's mother's house in Windhaven. She'd been staring and staring into the fire, as if speaking to it, as if unaware that even he was there. The fire crackled and popped. Nesta seed to the open air, I said. A log cracked, as if the house were merrily ignoring her, adding heat to the flame. 
But Nesta flinched. Barely a blink and half a shudder, but her entire body went rigid. Fear and dread flashed over her features, then vanished. Strange. Whatever curiosity Nesta noted on his face had her bristling again before launching toward the open doors of the library. Where are you going, he demanded, unable to keep the temper from his voice. Out. She hit the hall and aimed for the stairwell. Cassian stalked after her, a snarl ripping from his throat. He quickly closed the distance between them. Leave me alone, she bit out. What's the plan, NES? He trailed her to the lowest level of the house and the stairwell halfway down the corridor. You tear into the people who love you until they eventually give up and leave you alone. Is that what you want? She yanked on the handle of the ancient door and threw him a withering glare over a shoulder. She opened her mouth, then shut it against whatever had been about to come out. As if she'd bank herself for him. Pity him. Spare him. Like he needed shielding from her. Say it, he hissed. Just fucking say it. Nesta's gaze lit with that silver fire. Her nose crinkled with animalistic rage. The siphons atop his hands warmed, readying for an enemy he refused to acknowledge. Her eyes slid down to the red stones. And when they again lifted to his face, the unholy fire in her stare was gone. Replaced by something so dead and vacant it was like gazing into the unseeing eyes of a fallen soldier on a battlefield. He'd seen crows pick at eyes that dead. Nesta said nothing as she turned back to the stairwell and began her descent. Chapter 18 There was only the red stone of the stairwell, and her jagged breathing, and the knives that had turned inward and sliced and sliced, the walls pushing in, her legs burning with each step downward. She didn't want to be in her head, didn't want to be in her body. Wanted the beating of drums and the riotous song of a fiddle to fill her with sound, to silence any thought. Wanted to find a bottle of wine and drink deep, let the wine pull her out of herself, set her mind drifting and numb. Down and down and down. Around and around and around. Nesta passed the step with her burning handprint. Passed step 250. 300. 500. 800. It was on step 803 that her legs began to wobble. The roaring in her head dulled as she focused upon keeping upright. By step 1000, she had stopped entirely. There was only the spinning silence. Nesta closed her eyes and leaned her brow into the cool stone to her right, bringing up an arm to rest against it, as if she were clinging tight to a lover. She could have sworn a heartbeat thumped within the stone, as surely as if it beat within a chest beneath her ear. It was her own pounding blood, she told herself. Even as she clung to the wall, that heartbeat. She let her breathing soar in and out of her. Let the trembling of her body ease. The heartbeat in the stone faded. The wall turned icy beneath her flushed cheek. Rough against her fingertips. She began the walk upward. One step after another after another. Thighs straining, knees groaning, chest on fire. Her head had emptied by the time she half crawled up the last twenty steps. She'd had to stop five times to rest. Five times, only for as long as it took to catch her breath and steady herself, just until the roaring threatened to press in again. She was wrung out, utterly empty, by the time she arrived back at the landing. Cassian leaned against the opposite wall, his face grave. I don't feel like sparring with you, she said flatly, too drained to be angry. She knew she could call in their bargain to order him to fly her down to the city, but she didn't possess the energy to even bother. Good night. He moved into her path, wings blocking her. What step did you reach this time? As if it mattered. One thousand. Her legs throbbed and throbbed. Impressive. Nesta lifted her stare to his face, and found him earnest. She didn't bother to hide the weariness weighing on every part of her. 
She made to walk past him, but he didn't lower his wings. Short of punching her way through, she wasn't getting by. What? What set you off today? Everything. She didn't want to say more. What did Elaine say to you? She couldn't revisit that conversation, couldn't talk about her father or his death or any of it. So she shut her heavy eyes. Why don't they sign up for training? He knew who she meant. Maybe they're not ready. I thought they'd sign up. Is that what you're upset about? His question was so gentle, so sad. Nesta opened her eyes. Some of them have been here for hundreds of years and still haven't been able to come back from what they endured. So what hope do I have? He rubbed at his shoulder, as if it were sore. We've been working for barely two weeks, Nesta. Physically, you might be seeing changes, but what's happening in your mind, your heart, will take far longer than that. Fuck, it took Faya months. I don't want to hear about Faya and her special journey. I don't want to hear about Reese's journey, or Morrigan's, or anyone's. Why? The words, the rage, built again. She refused to speak, instead focusing on tamping down that power inside her until it didn't so much as murmur. Why, he pushed. Because I don't, she snapped. Put those bat wings away. Cassian obeyed, but stepped closer, towering over her. Then I'll tell you about my special journey, NES. His tone was icy in a way she'd never heard. No. I slaughtered every person who hurt my mother. She blinked up at him, the weight in her vanishing at the vicious words. Cashin's face held only ancient rage. When I was old and strong enough, I went back to the village where I was born, where I'd been ripped from her arms, and I learned that she was dead. And there was no one I could fight to change that. They refused to tell me where they'd buried her. One of the females hinted that they'd dumped her off the cliff. Horror and something like pain went through her. His eyes flared with cold light. So I destroyed them. Anyone who wasn't responsible, children and some females and the elderly, I let them leave. But anyone who had played a role in her suffering. I made them suffer in return. Reese and Osriel helped me. Found the piece of shit who'd sired me. I let my brothers tear him apart before I finished him. The words hung between them. He said with soft fury, it took me ten years before I was able to face it. What I'd done to those people, and what I'd lost. Ten years. He was trembling, but not with fear. So if you want to take ten years to face whatever is eating you alive from the inside out, go ahead. You want to take twenty years, go ahead. Silence fell, interrupted only by their uneven panting. Nesta breathed, do you regret what you did? No. Such unflinching honesty. The same honesty that now assessed her, marking every roaring, sharp piece of her. Nesta dipped her head, as if it had stop him from seeing everything. Warm, strong fingers cupped her chin, calluses scraping against her skin. She let him lift her head. She hadn't realized he'd come closer. That only inches separated them. Unless she'd been the one to drift toward him, drawn by each brutal word. Cassian kept his light grip on her chin. Whatever you need to throw at me, I can take it. I won't break. No challenge laced the words. Only a plea. You don't understand, she said, voice rasping. I am not like you and the others. That's never bothered me one bit. He lowered his hand from her chin. She straightened. It should. You say that like you want it to bother me. It bothers everyone. Even oh so special resand. His teeth flashed, any semblance of softness gone. I told you once, and I'll say it again, don't take that snide fucking tone when you speak about him. He's not my high lord. I may speak of him as I wish. She made to step away, but he gripped her wrist, 
holding her in place. Let go. Make me. Use that training and make me. Hot temper poured in. You're an arrogant bastard. And you're a haughty witch. We're evenly matched. She snarled. Let go. Cassian snorted, but obeyed, turning his face as he backed a step away. And it was the light of victory in his eyes, the clear sense that he believed he'd somehow unnerved her and won this fight that had her grabbing the front of his leather jacket. Nesta told herself it was to knock that smirk off his face that she curled her fingers in the leather and hauled her mouth to his. Chapter 19 For a heartbeat, there was only the warmth of Cashin's mouth, the press of his body, the stiffness in his every trembling muscle as Nesta slanted her lips over his, rising onto her toes. She'd kissed him with her eyes open, so she could see precisely how his own widened. Nesta pulled away a moment later and found his eyes still wide, his breathing harsh. She laughed softly, making to unhook her fingers from his jacket and strut down the hall. She only got as far as lowering her right hand before he surged forward to kiss her back. The force of that kiss knocked them toward the wall, the stone slamming into her shoulders as all of him lined up against all of her, a hand sliding into her hair while the other gripped her hip. The moment Nesta hit that wall, the moment Cassian enveloped her, it destroyed any illusion of restraint. She opened her mouth, and his tongue swept in, the kiss punishing and savage. And the taste of him, like snow-kissed wind and crackling embers. She moaned, unable to help herself. It seemed that sound was his undoing, for the fingers in her hair dug into her scalp, angling her head so he could better taste her, claim her. Her hands roved over his muscled chest, desperate for any skin, anything to touch as their tongues met and parted, as he licked the roof of her mouth, as he slid his tongue over her teeth. She met him stroke for stroke, and all sense of self went flying from her. She plunged her fingers into his hair, and it was as soft as she'd imagined, the strands like silk against her skin. Every hateful thought eddied from her mind. She gave herself to the distraction, welcomed it with open arms, let the kiss burn through all of it. There was only his mouth and his tongue and his teeth, licking and tasting and biting, there was only the strength of his body, pressing against hers, but not nearly close enough. He slid his hands around her, grasping her ass, and lifted her into the air. She wrapped her legs around his middle, and moaned again as he pressed himself between her thighs. She needed this temporary reprieve from her mind, that thing burning deep inside her, the memories that hounded her. She needed this. Needed him. Cassian ground into her, and groaned into her mouth at the first push of his hips. She arched her back at that deep-throated sound, bearing her neck to him. He seized on it, dragging his mouth from hers. His tongue traced a line up the column of her neck, dragging heat in its wake, and reached that spot just below her ear that had her clenching, had her whimpering. He let out a laugh against her skin. Like that, he murmured, and licked it again. Her breasts ached, and she moved against him, seeking any contact with his chest, any bit of friction. But Cassian buried his face against her neck, teeth clamping down lightly atop her fluttering pulse. The slight hurt set her panting, the scrape of his tongue over the spot at her eyes rolling back in her head. He pulled his head from her neck, though. And Nesta had never been laid so bare as she was while he ground his hips into her again and watched her writhe. A dark smile graced his mouth. So responsive, he purred in a voice she'd never heard but knew she'd crawl to hear again. He drove his hips between hers, a lazy, thorough push of the hardness of him into the throbbing ache of her. She scrambled to regain any sense of control, of sanity found herself wanting to hand it all over to him, to let him touch and touch and touch her, lick and suckle and fill her. Cassian growled, as if he read that in her stare, and kissed her again. Their tongues tangled, their bodies pressed so tightly she could feel his heartbeat against her chest. He tasted her thoroughly, withdrew, and tasted her again. Like he was learning every place in her mouth. 
She had to feel his skin. Had to feel the hardness pushing into her with her hands, her mouth, her body. She'd go mad if she didn't, go mad if she couldn't get these clothes off, go mad if he stopped kissing her. Nesta wedged her hand between their bodies, seeking him out. Cassian groaned again, long and low, as her hand cupped him through the leather of his pants. The breath stole out of her. The sheer size of him. Her mouth watered. She was aching, so wet that every stitch of the seam down the center of her pants was torture. His kiss turned deeper, wilder, and she grappled with the laces and buttons of his pants. There were so many she didn't know where to find the ones to undo them, her fingertips ripping at every loop, nearly clawing to get him free. Cashin's panting caressed her skin as he nipped at her bottom lip, her ear, her jaw. Her own staccato breathing echoed it, fire roaring in her blood, and he captured her mouth again, moaning into her as she gave up on the laces and buttons and laid her hand flat against him. He bucked as she rubbed the heel of her palm down his length, marveling at each inch. He tore his mouth from hers. If you keep doing that, I'll. Nesta did it again, dragging the heel of her palm upward, toward the tip she knew pressed against his lower abdomen. His hips arced toward her, and he tilted back his head, exposing the strong column of his throat. She learned the shape of him through his pants, and pressed her hand harder, working him. He gritted his teeth, chest heaving like a bellows, and the sight of him coming undone had her leaning forward. Had her clamping her teeth onto his neck. Just as she rubbed him again, harder and rougher. He hissed. With her name on his lips, his hips thrust into her hand with a strength that made her core throb to the point of pain, imagining that force, that size and heat, buried deep in her. Another punishing rub of her palm, a scrape of teeth at his neck, and Cassie interrupted. His wings tucked in tight as he came, and each spurt of his cock shuddered through his pants, echoing along her hand as she stroked and stroked him. When Cassian had stilled, when he was shaking only then did Nesta remove her face from his neck. His hazel eyes were wide enough that the whites shone around them. A blush stained his golden cheeks, so enticing that she nearly leaned forward to lick that, too. But he remained gaping like he'd realized what he'd done and regretted it. Every bit of desire, of blessed distraction within her winked out. Nesta shoved at his chest, and he immediately let go, almost dropping her to the floor as their bodies pulled apart. She didn't wait to hear his words of regret, that this had been a mistake. She wouldn't let him hold that power over her. So Nesta curled her lips in a cold, cruel smile and said as she left, someone's quick off the mark. Cassian couldn't look Osriel in the face at breakfast the next morning. His brother had returned late last night, refused to say anything about what he'd found regarding Brylin, and only insisted that today they'd all meet at the river house and learn of it together. Cassian hadn't cared. He'd barely listened to Osriel asking about training. He'd come in his pants after a few touches from Nesta, soaking himself like he was no better than he'd been in his youth. But the moment she had kissed him in the hall, he'd lost all semblance of sanity. He'd turned into something just short of an animal, licking and biting at her neck, unable to think clearly beyond the base instinct to claim. The taste of her had been like fire and steel and a winter sunrise. That had just been her mouth, her neck. If he got his tongue between her legs, he shifted in his seat. Did something happen that I, as your chaperone, should know about? Osriel's dry question dragged Cassian from his rising arousal. From the amusement on his brother's face, he knew AZ could not only scent that arousal but see it on his face. No, Cassian grumbled. He'd never hear the end of it if he admitted what he'd done. He'd found his pleasure, and Nesta had not. He'd never allowed such a thing to happen. But he'd come hard enough to see stars, and only then realized she had not. That he'd embarrassed himself, that he'd left her unsatisfied, and if it was the only taste of her he'd ever get, he'd monumentally fucked it all to hell. And then there'd been her parting shot, blasting what was left of his pride into shards. Quick off the mark, 
she'd purred, like what they'd done hadn't meant anything. He knew it was bullshit. He'd felt her frantic need, heard her moans and wanted to devour them whole. But that kernel of doubt took root. He had to make it even, somehow. Had to get the upper hand again. Osriel cleared his throat, and Cassian blinked. What? I said, are you two ready to head down to the river house? Two? He blinked through the cloud of arousal. Osriel chuckled, shadow skittering. Did you listen at all last night? No. At least you're honest. Osriel smirked. You and Nesta are wanted down there. Because of the shit with Elaine? Osriel stilled. What happened to Elaine? Cassian waved a hand. A fight with Nesta. Don't bring it up, he warned when Osriel's eyes darkened. Cassian blew out a breath. I take that as a no regarding the meeting topic, then. It's about what I discovered. Reese said he requires you both there. It's bad, then. Cassian surveyed the shadows gathered around AZ you all right? His brother nodded. Fine. But shadows still swarmed him. Cassian knew it was a lie, but didn't push it. AZ would speak when he was ready, and Cassian would have better success convincing a mountain to move than getting AZ to open up. So he said, all right. We'll meet you there. Chapter 20. Nesta could barely stand to be near Cassian as they flew over Valarius. Every glance, every scent of him, every touch while he carried her down to the river house grated along her skin, threatening to bring her back to last night, when she'd been starved for any taste of him. Thankfully, Cassian didn't speak to her. Barely looked at her. And by the time the sprawling manor along the river appeared, she'd forgotten to be annoyed by his silence. Two weeks up at the house, and the city suddenly loomed large, too loud, too full of people. This meeting will be fast, Cassian promised as they landed on the front lawn, as if he'd read the tension in her body. Nesta said nothing, unable to speak with the churning in her stomach. Who would be here? Which of them would she have to face, to endure them judging her so-called progress? They'd probably all heard of her fight with Elaine, gods, would Elaine be present? She followed Cassian into the beautiful house, barely noting the round table in the heart of the entry, crowned with a massive vase full of freshly cut flowers. Barely noting the silence of the house, not a servant to be seen. But Cassian paused before a landscape painting of a towering, barren mountain, void of life yet somehow thrumming with presence. Snow and pines crusted the smaller peaks around it, but this strange, bald mountain. Only a black stone jutted from its top. A monolith, Nesta realized, stepping closer. Cassian murmured, I didn't realize Faya had painted Ramiel. The sacred mountain from the blood rite. Indeed, three stars faintly glowed in the twilight skies above the peak. It was a near-perfect, real-life rendering of the night court's insignia. I wonder when she saw it, Cassian mused, smiling faintly. Nesta didn't bother to suggest Faya might have simply peered into Ryzen's mind. Cassian continued onward, leading her down the hall without another word. Nesta steeled herself as he stopped before the study doors, the same room where she'd sat and received a public lashing, and then flung one open. Reese and Faya sat on the sapphire couch before the window. Osriel leaned against the mantel. Amran had curled herself into an armchair, bundled in a grey fur coat, as if the nip in the air today were a blast of winter. No Elaine, no Morrigan. Faya's gaze was wary. Cold. But it warmed as she smiled at Cassian, who strode to her and kissed her cheek or tried to. He said to Reese, really? She's shielded even in here. Reese stretched out his long legs, crossing one ankle over the other. Even in here. Cassian rolled his eyes and plopped into the armchair beside Amran's, surveying her fur coat and saying, it's barely cold today. Amran's teeth flashed. 
keep talking like that and it'll be your pelt I wear tomorrow. Nesta might have smiled had Amran not turned toward her. Tension, thick and painful, stretched between them. Nesta refused to look away. Amran's red lips curled, her bob of black hair gleaming. Faya cleared her throat. All right, AZ. Let's hear it. Osriel folded his wings, shadows writhing around his ankles and neck. Queen Brylin has been busier than we thought, but not in the way we expected. Nesta's blood went cold. The queen who had leaped into the cauldron of her own free will, desperate to be turned young and immortal. She'd emerged a withered crone, an immortal. Doomed to be old and bent forever. Osriel went on, in the week I've been watching her, I, learned what her next steps are. The way he hesitated before he said learned said enough, he tortured it out of someone. Many people. Nesta glanced at his scarred hands, and Osriel tucked them behind his back, as if he noted her attention. Get on with it, Amran snapped, rustling in her chair. The other queens indeed fled from Briolin weeks ago, as Eris said. She alone sits in the throne room of their shared palace. And what Eris revealed about Beren was true, too, the High Lord visited Briolin on the continent, pledging his forces to her cause. A muscle ticked in Osriel's jaw. But Briolin's gathering of armies, the alliance with Beren, is only the auxiliary force to what she has planned. He shook his head, shadows slithering over his wings. Briolin wishes to find the cauldron again. In order to retrieve her youth. She'll never attain the cauldron, Amran said, waving a hand gleaming with rings. No one but us, Miriam, and Drake can know where it's hidden. Even if Briolin did uncover its location, there are enough wards and spells on it that no one could ever break through. Briolin knows this, Osriel said gravely. Nesta's stomach churned. Osriel nodded to Cassian. What Vasa suspected is true. The Death Lord Koshe has been whispering in Briolin's ear. He remains trapped at his lake, but his words carry on the wind to her. He is ancient, his depth of knowledge fathomless. He pointed Briolin toward the dread trove, not for her sake, but for his own ends. He wishes to use it to free himself from his lake. And Briolin is not the puppet we believed her to be, she and Koshe are allies. He added to Cassian, you need to ask Eris whether Beren knows about this. And the trove. Cassian nodded into the ensuing silence. Nesta found herself asking, what's the dread trove? Amran's eyes glowed with a remnant of her power. The cauldron made many objects of power, long ago, forging weapons of unrivaled might. Most were lost to history and war, and when I went into the prison, only three remained. At the time, some claimed there were four, or that the fourth had been unmade, but today's legends only tell of three. The mask, Rhys murmured, the harp, and the crown. Nesta had a feeling none of them were good. Faya frowned at her mate. They're different from the objects of power in the Hume City. What can they do? Nesta had tried her best to forget that night she and Amran had gone to test her so-called gift against the horde within those unhallowed catacombs. The objects had been half-imprisoned in the stone itself, knives and necklaces and orbs and books, all shimmering with power. None of it pleasant. For the dread trove to be worse than what she'd witnessed. The mask can raise the dead, Amran answered for Rhys. It is a death mask, moulded from the face of a long-forgotten king. Wear it and you may summon the dead to you, command them to march at your will. The harp can open any door, physical or otherwise. Some say between worlds. And the crown. Amran shook her head. The crown can influence anyone, even piercing through the mightiest of mental shields. Its only flaw is that it requires close physical proximity to initially sink its claws into a victim's mind. But wear the crown and you could make your enemies do your bidding. Could make a parent slaughter their child, aware of the horror but unable to stop themselves. And these things were lost. Nesta demanded. Reese threw her a frown. 
Those who possessed them grew careless. They were lost in ancient wars, or to treachery, or simply because they were misplaced and forgotten. What does it have to do with the cauldron? Nestor pushed. Light calls to light, Faya murmured, looking to Amran, who nodded. Because the trove was made by the cauldron, so might the trove find its maker. She angled her head. Bryolin was made, though. Can't she track the cauldron herself? Amran drummed her fingers on the arm of her chair. The cauldron aged Bryolin to punish her. A glance at Nesta. Or punish you, I suppose. Nesta kept her face carefully blank. Amran went on, but I think you took something from it when you seized your power, girl. Faya looked toward Nesta, her voice soft as she asked, what exactly happened in the cauldron? Every image, thought, feeling pelted Nesta. Smothered her, exactly as she had to smother the rising power in her at her sister's question. No one spoke. They all just stared. Cassian cleared his throat. Does it matter? Everyone faced him, and Nesta nearly sagged with relief at the shift of their attention. Even as something kindled in her chest at his words. His defense of her. It'd help us gain insight, Faya said. We can discuss it later, Cassian began, but Nesta straightened. I. They all halted. Twisted toward her. Her mouth went dry. Nesta swallowed against it, praying they didn't see the shaking hands she tucked under her thighs. Her thoughts swarmed her, each memory screaming, and she didn't know where to start, how to explain it. Breathe. It calmed her mind whenever Cassian led her through their exercises. So she let herself inhale, then slowly exhale. Again. A third time. And into the silence, Nesta said, I wasn't aware of what I took. Just that I was taking things the cauldron did not want me to have. It seemed fitting, given what it was doing to me. There. That was all she could say, would say. But Faya nodded, eyes shining bright with something Nesta could not place. Faya said to Amran, so it's highly possible that the cauldron couldn't imbue Bryolin with the ability to track it. All it could do was give Bryolin the ability to track anything it made, a sorry shadow of the original gift. The others nodded, and Nesta dared a look at Cassian, who gave her a soft smile. Like in saying the few words she'd managed to get out, she'd somehow done something, worthy. Her chest tightened. Had she done so many unworthy things that her scant contribution earned that much praise? Nesta forced herself to ignore the nauseating thought as Amram continued, if you were to gather all three objects, you could use the potency of their combined made essence to track down the cauldron, no matter where it is. Not to mention gain three objects of terrible power, Osriel added grimly. Capable of granting even a human army an advantage against the Fae. Raise the dead, Cassian mused, his face tightening, any trace of that approving smile gone, and you'd have an unstoppable force, able to march without rest or food. Open any door, and you could move that army of the dead wherever you wished. And with unrestrained influence, you could make any enemy territory and its people bow to you. Silence again filled the room. Nesta's heart thundered. And all Koshe wants is to be free from his lake. Reese asked Osriel. But Amran answered. No one really knows the full scope of the Trove's powers. Beyond freeing him from his lake, Koshe may very well know something about the Trove that we don't, some greater power that manifests when all three are united. Reese looked at Osriel, who nodded grimly. What is a Death Lord? Nesta asked into the silence. Their stares struck her like stones. Cassian answered, tapping the scar on the side of his neck. I told you of Lanthes, the wound he gave me. He is literally deathless. Nothing can kill him. Koshe, too, cannot be killed. He is the master of his own death. He lowered his hand from the horrible scar. The gleam in his eye suggested that his thoughts had turned toward her own powers. 
She ignored the thing that writhed within her in answer and confirmation, cold fire licking up her spine. Mercifully, Cassian went on, they are death lords. The words hung in the air. Rhys cursed. I'd forgotten about Lanthes. Cassian threw him a dry look, again tapping that scar. I haven't. To Nesta's horror, Amran shuddered. Amran. Faya cleared her throat. So they are trying to find this dread trove in order to track down the cauldron for Bryolin, and likely free Koshe in the process. And launch a war, with Beren as her ally, that would grant them whatever territories they wish. Or give some to Koshe, depending on what bargain he strikes with Bryolin, probably one to his advantage. Again, Bryolin is well aware of Koshe's insidious influence, Osriel said. If her strings are being pulled, it is only because she's allowing it to achieve her own ends. Cassian said, so we've got them on one front, and Baron here, ready and eager to go into war with Bryolin so he might expand his own territory after the carnage halts. Nesta's head spun. She'd had no idea any of this was occurring. She'd picked up hints, but nothing that had confronted her with the knowledge of the danger that faced them. To be on the brink of such disaster again. She shifted in her seat. Fair asked Osriel, Brylin has not found the dread trove yet. Osriel shook his head. Not as far as I could tell. The dread trove was last rumoured to be here in Prithian. That's all Koshe knows, apparently. We have that on our side at least. Brylin won't risk coming over here, not yet. Even with Beren as an ally. And Koshe is bound to his lake. But they are readying Brylin to come, gathering her realm's greatest spies and warriors. There was already a host of them at the Queen's palace. Why Brylin and Koshe took Eris's soldiers is something I still haven't figured out. He gestured to Cassian. You need to meet with Eris. Cassian nodded. I will. But we'll have to shore up the borders. Warn the courts. Tell them of Baron's plan. To hell with secrecy. We'd expose Eris in doing that, Rhys countered. And lose a valuable ally, he added when Cassian rolled his eyes. Eris is a snake, but he's useful. His motives might be selfish and power-hungry, but he can offer us a great deal. He frowned, and said carefully, I agree with AZ. I want you to update Eris on this, as you promised. Fine, Cassian agreed. But what of warning the courts about the trove? No, Rhys said. We'd only risk one of them going after it. Baron would send out every warrior and spy of his to find it first. That he hasn't done so already suggests he doesn't know about the trove, but we need Eris to confirm. Fair asked, why didn't we look for the trove when we were hunting for the cauldron ourselves? The book was easier to find, Amran said. And it has been ten thousand years since anyone used the trove. I assumed it was all at the bottom of an ocean. So we find it, Cassian declared. Any ideas? Made objects tend to not wish to be found by just anyone, Amran cautioned. That they have faded from memory that even I didn't think of them immediately in the fight against Hyben, suggests that perhaps they willed it that way. Wanted to stay hidden. True things of power have such gifts. You say that as if the objects have a sentience, Cassian said. They do, Amran said, storms drifting across her eyes. They were made in a time when wild magic still roamed the earth, and the Fey were not masters of all. Made objects back then tended to gain their own self-awareness and desires. It was not a good thing. Amran's face clouded with memory, and a chill whispered over Nesta's spine. Rhys mused, just as I'm able to alter a mind to forget, perhaps they have a similar gift. But Brylin is made, Amran said. Nesta's mouth again went dry. When Brylin was made, it likely removed from her the dread trove's glamour for lack of a better term. Recognized her as kin. Where she might have glanced over a mention of the items before and never thought twice, now it stuck. Or perhaps called to her, 
presented itself in a dream. All of them, all at once, looked at Nesta. You, Amran said quietly, are the same. So is Elaine. Nesta stiffened. If they're all enchanting you to forget, how is it that Osriel was able to remember and bear the information here? Perhaps once you learn of it, recognize it, the spell is broken, Amran said. Or perhaps the dread trove wants us to know of it now, for some dark reason of its own. The hair on Nesta's arms rose. Cassian shifted in his seat. So we track down the dread trove, how? Elaine spoke from the doorway, having appeared so silently that they all twisted toward her, using me. Chapter 21 Nesta's head went silent as Elaine's words finished sounding in the room. Thea had twisted in her seat, face white with alarm. Nesta shot to her feet. No. Elaine remained in the doorway, her face pale but her expression harder than Nesta had ever seen it. You do not decide what I can and cannot do, Nesta. The last time we involved ourselves with the cauldron, it abducted you, Nesta countered, fighting her shaking. She found the words, the weapons she sought. I thought you didn't have powers anymore. Elaine pursed her lips. I thought you didn't, either. Nesta's spine straightened. No one spoke, but their attention lingered on her like a film on her skin. You will not go looking for it. Amran said coolly, so you look for it, girl. Nesta turned to the small female. I don't know how to find anything. Like calls to like, Amran countered. You were made by the cauldron. You may track other objects made by it as well, as Briling can. And because you are made by it, you are immune to the influence and power of the trove. You might use them, yes, but they cannot be used upon you. A glance to Elaine. Either of you. Nesta swallowed. I can't. But to let Elaine involve herself, jeopardize her safety. Amran said, you track the cauldron. It nearly killed me. It trapped me like a bird in a cage. Elaine said, then I will find it. I might require some time to reacquaint myself with my powers, but I could start today. Absolutely not, Nesta spat, fingers curling at her sides. Absolutely not. Why? Elaine demanded. Shall I tend to my little garden forever? When Nesta flinched, Elaine said, you can't have it both ways. You cannot resent my decision to lead a small, quiet life while also refusing to let me do anything greater. Then go off on adventures, Nesta said. Go drink and fuck strangers. But stay away from the cauldron. Faya said, it is Elaine's choice, Nesta. Nesta whirled on her, ignoring the warning flicker of primal wrath in Reese's stare. Keep out of this, she hissed at her youngest sister. I have no doubt you put these thoughts in her head, probably encouraging her to throw herself into harm's way. Elaine cut in sharply, I am not a child to be fought over. Nesta's pulse pounded throughout her body. Do you not remember the war? What we encountered? Do you not remember the cauldron kidnapping you, bringing you into the heart of Hyben's camp? I do, Elaine said coldly. And I remember Faye rescuing me. Roaring erupted in Nesta's head. For a heartbeat, it appeared that Elaine might say something to soften the words. But Nesta cut her off, seething at the pity about to be thrown her way. Look who decided to grow claws after all, she crooned. Maybe you'll become interesting at last, Elaine. Nesta saw the blow land, like a physical impact, in Elaine's face, her posture. No one spoke, though shadows gathered in the corners of the room, like snakes preparing to strike. Elaine's eyes brightened with pain. Something imploded in Nesta's chest at that expression. She opened her mouth, as if it could somehow be undone. But Elaine said, I went into the cauldron, too, you know. And it captured me. And yet somehow all you think of is what my trauma did to you. 
Nesta blinked, everything inside her hollowing out. But Elaine turned on her heel. Find me when you wish to begin. The doors shut behind her. Every awful word Nesta had spoken hung in the air, echoing. Fea said to her, gratingly gentle, it wasn't an easy choice for me to ask Elaine to endanger herself like this. Nesta twisted to Fea. Can't you find the trove? She hated each cowardly word, hated the fear in her heart, hated that in merely asking, she'd exposed her preference for Elaine. You've got all that magic, and you were made yourself, even if it wasn't by the cauldron. You trained, you are a warrior. Can't you find it? Again, that silence. But a different kind. Like a thunderhead about to break. No, Faya said quietly. I can't. She looked to Reese, who nodded, his eyes shining. Everyone watched Faya now. But Faya's attention remained fixed upon Nesta. I can't risk it. Why? Nesta snapped. Because I'm pregnant. Silence fell. Silence, and then Cassian let out a whoop of such joy that it shattered the fraught silence into smithereens, leaping from his chair to tackle Reese. They went down in a tangle of wings and dark hair, and then Amran was saying to Faya, light dancing in her eyes, Congratulations, girl. Osriel stooped to press a kiss to Faya's head, or an inch from it. I knew that stupid shield wasn't just to practice something Helion taught you, Cassian was saying, giving Reese a smacking kiss on the cheek before turning to Faya and grabbing her to him. Reese and relented on the shield enough that Cassian could wrap his arms around her, still laughing. And as Reese dropped the shield, Faya's scent filled the room. It was Faya's usual scent, only, only something new. A smaller, softer scent, like a budding rose, lay within it. Cassian laughed. No wonder you've been a moody bastard, Reese. I suppose we're about to learn a whole new level of overprotective. Faye glowered at him, then up at her mate. We've already had discussions about this. The shield is a compromise. Amran smiled broadly. What was his starting offer? Faya scowled. That he never leave my side for the next ten months. The Faye took longer to grow children, Nesta had learned from poring over the books in the house's library during her initial weeks here. A month longer than a human pregnancy. How far along are you? Osriel asked, gazing at Faya's still flat stomach. She slid her fingers over it, as if anyone's attention there made her wish to protect the child inside. Two months. Cassian pivoted toward Reese. You've been hiding this for two months. Reese threw him an arrogant smile. We thought you'd all guess it by now, to be honest. Cassian laughed again. How can we guess when you've got her bundled in that shield? Moody bastard, remember? Cassian grinned, and said to Osriel, we're going to be uncles. Faya groaned. Mother help this child. Osriel's own grin bloomed at that, but Faya's gaze slid to Nesta. Nesta said quietly to her sister, congratulations. For she'd said nothing, had only been able to stand and watch them all, their joy and closeness, as if she were looking in through a window. But Faya offered her a tentative smile. Thank you. You'll be an aunt, you know. God's help this child indeed, Cassian muttered, and Nesta glared at him. She turned to Reese and Faya and found the former watching her carefully, the epitome of ease with his arm around his mate's shoulders, the gleam in his eye one of pure threat. Nesta let him see it then. That she bore no ill will toward Faya or the babe. Some primal part of her understood that Reese was not only male, but a fey male, and he would eliminate any threats to his mate and child. That he'd do it slowly and painfully and then walk away from her shredded corpse without an ounce of regret. It was self-preservation, perhaps some new fey instinct of her own, that had Nesta bowing her chin slightly, letting him see she meant no harm, would never hurt them. Reese's own chin dipped, and that was that. Nesta said to Faya, 
Did you tell Elaine? Before Faya could reply, Osriel said, What about more? Faya smiled. Elaine was the only one who guessed. She caught me vomiting two mornings in a row. She nodded toward Osriel. I think she's got you beat for secret keeping. I'll tell more when she returns from Valahan, Reese said. Given your reaction, Cass, I don't trust that she can keep her excitement to herself if I tell her while she's there, even if she doesn't say anything to them. And I don't want a potential enemy knowing. Not yet. Vayan? Amran asked. Nesta had never learned the story of how the female and the summer court's Prince of Adriata had become entwined. She supposed now she never would. Not yet, Rhys repeated, shaking his head. Not until Faya's father along. Nesta angled her head at her sister. So you can't do magic while pregnant? Faya winced. I can, but given my unusual set of gifts, I'm not sure how it might impact the baby. Winnowing is fine, but some other powers, when we're still so early in the pregnancy, could strain my body dangerously. Reese's hand tightened on her shoulder. It's a pain in the ass. Faya flicked at the hand gripping her arm. As much of a pain in the ass as he's become. Reese winked at her. Faya rolled her eyes. But then she said to Nesta, Elaine will need time to dust off her powers to try to see the trove. But you, Nesta. You could SCRY again. Reese added, as swiftly as possible. Time is not our ally. Nesta asked Amran, you're not made. Not as you were, Amran said. She gave Nesta a wicked grin. Afraid? Nesta ignored the taunt. Even Cashin's bright happiness had faded. What choice do I have? Nesta asked. If it was between her and Elaine, there was no choice at all. She would always go first if it meant keeping Elaine from harm. Even if she'd just hurt her sister more than she could stomach. You do have a choice, Reese said firmly. You will always have a choice here. Nesta threw him a cool look. I'll search for it. She glanced at her sister's stomach, the hand idly resting atop it. Of course I'll search for it. Cassian wanted to have a word with Reese about the Illyrian legions, so Nesta found herself walking to the front entry of the river house alone. She'd made it halfway down the hall when Faya called her name, and Nesta paused, right in front of the painting of Ramiel. Faya's smile was tentative. I'll wait with you until he's done. Don't bother, Nesta almost said, but reined it in. They walked in silence to the main entry, all those paintings and portraits of everyone but her and their mother watching them. The quiet tightened, becoming nearly unbearable as they halted in the sprawling foyer. Nesta could think of nothing to say, nothing to do with herself. Until Faya said, it's a boy. Nesta whipped her head toward her sister. The baby? Faya smiled. I wanted you to know first. I told Reese to wait until I told you, but. Faya chuckled as renewed shouts of joy echoed down the hall. I suppose he's telling Azad and Cassian now. But Nesta needed a breath to sort through it, the offering of kindness Faya had extended, what she had revealed, how can you possibly know it's sex? The smile faded from Faya's face. During the conflict with Hyben, the bone carver showed me a vision of the child I'd have with Reese. How did he know? I don't know, Faya admitted, her hand again drifting to her stomach. But I didn't realize how much I wanted a boy until I knew I'd bear one. Likely because having sisters was so horrible for you. Faya sighed. That's not what I meant. Nesta shrugged. Faya might say that, but the feeling was no doubt there. Everything that had just happened with Elaine. Faya seemed to sense the direction of her thoughts. Elaine was right. We've become so focused on how her trauma impacted us that we forget she was the one who experienced it. It was directed at me, not you. I've been guilty of the same things, Nesta. 
Sorrow dimmed Feya's eyes. It was unfair for Elaine to level that truth only at you. Nesta didn't have an answer to that, didn't know where to start. Why not tell Elaine about the baby's sex first? She discovered the pregnancy. I wanted you to know this part before anyone else. I hadn't realized you were keeping score. Fair gave her an exasperated look. I'm not, Nesta. I just... Do I need an excuse to share things with you? You're my sister. I wanted to tell you before anyone else. That's it. Nesta didn't have an answer to that, either. Thankfully, Cashin's voice filled the hallway as he bid his farewell to Reese. Good luck, Fea said softly before rushing to meet a jubilant Cassian, and Nesta knew her sister didn't only mean with the dread trove. Chapter 22 Do you think Nesta can find the trove? Osriel asked Cassian as they relaxed in the sitting room that separated their bedchambers, flames crackling in the hearth before them. The night had turned chill enough that they needed the fire, and Cassian, who'd always loved fall despite the pricks in the autumn court, savoured the warmth. I hope so, Cassian hedged. He couldn't stomach the thought of Nesta putting herself in danger, but he understood her motivations entirely. If he'd had to pick between sending one of his brothers into danger or doing it himself, he would always, always, choose himself. Though he'd winced at every harsh word that had come out of Nesta's mouth to Elaine, he couldn't fault the fear and love behind her decision. Could only admire that she had stepped up, if not for the good of the world, then to keep her sister safe. Osriel said, Nesta really should do a scrying. Cassian gazed across the space between their two armchairs. They'd sat in them, before this fire, so many times that it was an unspoken rule that Osriel's was the one on the left, closer to the window, and Cashin's the one to the right, closer to the door. A third sat to Osriel's left, usually for Reese, and a fourth to Cashin's right, always for more. A lace-lined golden throw pillow adorned the fourth chair, a permanent mark of her ownership. Amran, for whatever reason, rarely stayed here long enough to see this room, so no chair had ever been held for her. Nesta isn't up for a scrying, Cassian said. We don't even know what power she has left. But Elaine had confirmed it for everyone, both sisters still possessed their cauldron-gifted powers. Whether they were as powerful as before, he had no idea. You do know, though, Osriel countered. You've seen it even beyond when it glows in her eyes. Cassian hadn't told anyone about the step he'd found with the clear finger holes burned into it. He wondered if Osriel had somehow learned of them, the news brought to him on his shadow's whispers. She's volatile right now. The last time she did a scrying, it ended badly. The cauldron looked at her. And then took Elaine. He'd seen every horrific memory flash before Nesta's eyes today. And though he understood that Elaine had spoken true, claiming the trauma of that memory, Cassian knew firsthand the lingering horror and pain of a loved one stolen and hurt. Osriel stiffened. I know. I helped rescue Elaine, after all. AZ hadn't so much as hesitated before going into the heart of Hyben's war camp. Cassian leaned his head against the back of the chair, rustling his wings through the gaps crafted to accommodate them. Nesta will scry on her own, eventually, if she's capable. If Brylin and Koshe find just one of the dread trove items. Let Nesta try it her way first. Cassian held Azed's stare. If we go in and order her to do it, it'll backfire. Let her exhaust her other options before she realizes only one is viable. Osriel studied his face, then nodded solemnly. Cassian blew out a breath, watching the flames leap and flutter. We're going to be uncles, he said after a moment, unable to keep the wonder from his voice. Osriel's face filled with pride and joy. A boy. It wasn't a guarantee that a high lord's firstborn would be his heir. The magic sometimes took a while to decide, and often jumped around the birth order completely. Sometimes it found a cousin instead. Sometimes it abandoned the bloodline entirely. 
or chose the air in that moment of birth, in the echoes of a newborn's first cries. It wouldn't matter to Cassian, though, if Rhys's son inherited his world-shaking power, or barely a drop. It wouldn't matter to Rhys, either. To any of them. That boy was already loved. I'm happy for Rhys, Cassian said quietly. So am I. Cassian looked over at AZ you think you'll ever be ready for one? Ever be ready to confess to more what's in your heart? I don't know, Osriel said. Do you want a child? It doesn't matter what I want. Distant words, ones that prevented Cassian from prying further. He was still happy to be Moore's buffer with Osriel, but there'd been a change lately. In both of them. Moore no longer sat beside Cassian, draped herself over him, and Osriel, those longing glances toward her had become few and far between. As if he'd given up. After five hundred years, he'd somehow given up. Cassian couldn't think why. Azid asked, do you want a child? Cassian couldn't stop the thought that flashed, of him and Nesta against the wall a level below, her hand rubbing him exactly the way he liked it, her moans like sweet music. He'd left her unsatisfied, she'd run off before he could make it even between the two of them. He'd gone up to Windhaven after the meeting earlier, and hadn't seen her at dinner. Wasn't even sure what the hell he'd say to her, how they'd have a conversation. It was like the unfinished bargain inked across their backs, that imbalance of pleasure. And a matter of what he unashamedly could call male pride. She had the upper hand now. Had looked so damn smug when she'd cut him, quick off the mark. His knee bounced, and he glowered at the flame. Cassian? He realized Osriel had asked him a question. Right about children. Of course I want children. He'd contemplated it often, what manner of family he'd build for himself, how he'd make sure his children never spent a moment thinking they were unloved and unwanted, never, ever spent a moment hungry or scared or cold or in pain. But no female had ever come along who tempted him enough to fight for that future. He supposed, deep down, that was what he was holding out for, the mating bond. What he'd seen between Faya and Reese. Cassian blew out another breath and got to his feet. Osriel lifted a silent brow. Cassian aimed for the door. He wouldn't be able to rest, to focus, until he evened the playing field. As he entered the hall, he muttered without looking back, turn a blind eye, chaperone. Curled up in bed, a book propped on the thick down comforter, Nesta was just getting to the sizzling first kiss in her latest novel when a knock thudded on her door. She slammed the book shut and sat up against the pillows. Yes. The handle turned, and there he was. Cassian still wore his leathers, the overlapping scales of them full of shadows that made him look like some great, writhing beast as he shut the door. He leaned against the carved oak, his wings rising high above his head like twin mountain peaks. What? She slid the book onto the nightstand, sitting up further. His eyes dipped to her sleeveless silk nightgown, then quickly returned to her face. What, she demanded again, angling her head. Her unbound hair slid over a shoulder, and she saw him mark that, too. His voice was rough as he said, I've never seen you with your hair down. She always wore it braided across her head or pinned up. She frowned at the locks that flowed to her waist, the gold amongst the brown glimmering in the dim light. It's a nuisance when it's down. It's beautiful. Nesta couldn't stop her swallow as she lifted her gaze. His eyes were blazing, yet he remained leaning against the door, hands trapped behind his body. As if he were physically restraining himself. His scent drifted to her, darker, muskier than usual. She bet all the money she didn't have that it was the scent of his arousal. It set her pulse hammering, careening so far off the path of sanity that she scrambled after its vanishing leash. To let him affect her so easily, so greatly unacceptable. She didn't dare look below his waist, not as she shaped her lips into a cool smile. Here for more. I'm here to settle the debt between us.
His words were guttural. Her toes curled beneath the blanket. But her voice remained surprisingly calm. What debt? The one I owe you for last night. He spoke as if there was no room in him for teasing, for humor. His eyes drifted lower than her face, noting the hammering of her pulse. We have unfinished business. She grappled for anything to guard against him. Male pride is a thing of wonder. When he didn't respond, she threw another wall his way, why are you even here? You made it clear enough that last night was a mistake. He was having none of it. I never said that. His attention remained fixed on her hammering pulse. You didn't need to. I saw it in your eyes. His gaze snapped to hers. The only mistake was that I came before I could taste you. Nesta knew he didn't mean her mouth. Or her skin. Cassian went on, the only mistake was that you ran off before I could get on my knees. Breathing became difficult. Won't your friends tell you this is a mistake? She gestured to the air between them. My friends have nothing to do with this. With what I want from you. He said it with such intent that her breasts pebbled. His eyes dipped again, and when he saw her nipples hard against the silk of her nightgown, his entire being seemed to focus on it. On her. All five hundred years of being a trained warrior, an apex predator. All of it, narrowing on her. His appraisal enveloped her like a rush of wind, a fire. What about training, she breathed. This stays out of training. His eyes had turned wholly dark. Her skin tightened, becoming almost painful as she went molten and throbbing between her legs. Nesta. A note of pleading had entered his voice. He was trembling, the door behind him rattling with the force of his deteriorating self-control. She looked then. Below his waist. At what strained against his pants. Her head emptied out, and there was only him and her and the space between them. Cassian let out a growl, the sound a plea as well. She made herself say, this stays out of training and everything else. This is just sex. Something shifted in his expression, but he said, just sex. This was sure to be a mistake, sure to be something she paid for, suffered for. But she couldn't bring herself to deny him. Deny herself. Just for tonight, she'd allow it. So Nesta met his eyes again, took in every trembling, restrained inch, and said, yes. Cassian lunged for her, a beast freed of its cage, and she barely had time to twist toward the edge of the bed before his lips were on hers, devouring and claiming. Deep purring sounds vibrated from his chest through her fingers as she clawed off his jacket, his shirt, ripping through the fabric. He tore his lips from hers only long enough to pull his shirt away, the fabric snaring on his wings before falling to the floor. Then he was on her again, climbing onto the bed, and she spread her legs for him, letting his body fall into the cradle between her thighs. She couldn't stop her moan as he drove his hips into hers, the leather of his pants sliding against her. He plunged his tongue into her mouth, the kiss like a brand, one hand sliding up her bare thigh, tugging her nightgown with it. When he reached her hip and still had found no underwear, he hissed. Look to where he pressed his hardness against her and realized that only the leather of his pants separated him from her wetness. She was shaking, and not from fear, as he took a trembling hand and slid her nightgown higher. Pulled it up to her navel and then stared at her, bare and gleaming, pressed against the bulge in his pants. His chest heaved, and she waited for that brutal, demanding touch, but he only leaned down and pressed a kiss to her throat. Tender coaxing. Cassian pressed another to her shoulder, and she shivered. Shivered more as he dragged his tongue over the spot. He kissed the hollow of her throat. Licked it. He slipped the straps of her nightgown down her arms. Kissed her collarbones. With each kiss, he pulled down the neck of her nightgown further. Until his breath warmed her bare breasts. Cassian let out a sound from the back of his throat 
from his gut. Like some sort of starved, tormented creature. He stared at her breasts, and she couldn't breathe under that burning gaze. Couldn't breathe as his head dipped and he wrapped his lips around her nipple. Nesta arced off the bed, a breathless sound rupturing from her. Cassian only repeated the movement on her other breast. And then raked his teeth across the sensitive peak before clamping down lightly. She moaned then, tipping her head back, thrusting her chest up toward him in silent plea. Cassian let out that dark laugh and returned to her other breast, teeth grazing, teasing, biting. She strained her hands toward him, toward where he'd gone still between her legs. She needed him now. In her hand or her body, she didn't care. But Cassian only pulled away. Pulled up, and knelt before her. Surveyed her spread beneath him, her nightgown a bunch of silk around her middle, everything else bared to him. His own feast to devour. I owe you a debt, he said in that guttural voice that made her writhe. He watched her hips undulate, and braced his large, powerful hands on either thigh. He waited for her to signal that she understood what he intended. What she'd dreamed of for so long, in the darkest hours of the night. In a choked whisper, she said, yes. Cassian gave her a feral, purely male smile. And then his hands tightened on her bare thighs, spreading them wider. His head lowered, and all she could see was his dark hair, gilded by the lamps, and his exquisite wings, rising above them both. He didn't waste time with gentle touches and tastes. Parting her with one hand, he dragged his tongue clear up her center. The world fractured, reformed, and fractured again. He cursed against her wetness, and he reached down with his other hand to adjust himself in his pants. He licked her again, lingering at the spot atop the apex of her legs. Sucking it into his mouth, teeth nipping, before he withdrew. She arched, unable to stop the moan breaking from her throat. Cashin's tongue ran downward in an unhurried sweep, and he pressed a hand to her abdomen, stilling her, as he slid his tongue straight into her core. It curled into her, driving deeper than she'd expected, and she couldn't think, couldn't do anything but luxuriate in it, in him. You taste, he growled against her making his way up again toward the bundle of nerves in short, teasing licks, even more delicious than I dreamed. Nesta whimpered, and he flicked his tongue there. Her whimper turned to a cry, and he laughed against her and flicked his tongue again. Release became a shimmering veil, just beyond her grasp but drifting closer. So wet, he breathed, and licked at her entrance, as if determined to consume every drop of her. Are you always this wet for me, Nesta? She wouldn't allow him the satisfaction of the truth. But she couldn't think of a lie, not with his tongue pumping in and out of her, coaxing her toward but still denying her the pressure and relentless pounding she so badly needed. Cassian snickered, as if he knew the answer anyway. He licked her, his silken hair brushing over her belly, and looked up to meet her gaze. As their eyes locked, he slid a finger into her. She cried out, and he trailed a hand from her thigh to hold her open again as he licked at that spot while his finger pumped in and out of her in a teasingly slow rhythm. More, she wanted more. She undulated her hips against him, hard enough to drive his finger deeper. Greedy, he murmured onto her, and withdrew his finger nearly to its tip. Only to add a second finger as he plunged back in. Nesta let go entirely then. Let go of sanity and any pride as he filled her with those two fingers. He sucked and nibbled, and release gathered around her like an iridescent mist. Cassian growled again, given over to whatever need drove him, and the reverberations of the sound echoed into places of her that had never been touched. In and out his fingers slid, stretching and filling, all while he tasted and savoured. Nesta rode his hand, his face, grinding into him with abandon. Holy gods. Cashin's teeth grazed against her. Nesta. The sound of her name on his lips against her most sensitive place sent her mind scattering into eternity. She bowed off the bed with the force of her climax, and he became ravenous, 
fingers pumping and pumping, tongue and lips moving against her, like he'd devour her pleasure whole. He didn't stop until she'd collapsed against the mattress, until she was limp and reeling and trying to piece her mind back together. The slide of his fingers out of her left her empty and aching, the removal of his tongue and mouth from between her legs like a cold kiss. Cassian was panting, still hard as he rose up and stared at her. She couldn't move, couldn't remember how to move. No one had ever done that to her. Made her feel like that. It had knocked the breath from her, the thoroughness of her pleasure. Like the world could be remade in the force of what had erupted from her. She just watched the carved, heaving muscle of his chest, his wings, his handsome face. Nesta reached for the cop she was dying to feel, to taste, but he backed off the bed. Cassian grabbed his shirt and aimed for the door. We're even now. Chapter 23 Watching Nesta climax had been as close to a religious experience as Cassian had ever had. It had rocked him to his very core, and only pure wool and pride had kept him from spilling in his pants again. Only pure wool and pride had made him back off the bed when she'd reached for him. Only pure wool and pride had made him leave the room, when all he'd wanted was to plunge his cock into that sweet, tight warmth and ride her until they were both screaming. He couldn't get her perfect taste out of his mouth. Not as he washed for bed. Not as he pumped himself dry, soaking his sheets. Not as he ate breakfast. Couldn't stop feeling the clamp of her around his fingers, like a burning, silken fist. He'd washed his hands a dozen times by the time he faced Nesta in the training ring, and he could still smell her there, could still feel her, taste her. Cassian banished the thought from his mind. Along with the knowledge that Nesta might have felt good on his fingers, on his tongue, but it would be nothing compared to how she'd feel on his cock. She'd been tight enough that he knew it'd be paradise and madness, his undoing. And she'd been so drenched for him that he knew he'd do deplorable things to be allowed to taste that wetness again. The Nesta who emerged into the training pit was the one he saw every morning, though. No hint of a blush or a sparkle in her eye to tell him she'd enjoyed herself. But maybe that was because Osriel walked in behind her. His brother took one look at him and smirked. AZ knew. Could either sent Cassian on Nesta, or could already sent Nesta on Cassian, even from across the ring. Cassian didn't regret what he'd done with her. Not at all. And maybe it was the fact that it had been two years since he'd had any sort of sex but he couldn't remember the last time he'd been so ridden by his own base need. Some small, quiet part of his brain whispered otherwise. He ignored it. Had ignored it for a long time now. Morning, AZ, Cassian said cheerfully. He nodded to Nesta. NES. How'd you sleep? Her eyes flashed with the anger that was like kindling to his own, but then she smiled coolly. Like a babe. It was to be a game, then. Which one of them could pretend that nothing had happened the longest? Which one of them might seem the least affected? Cassian threw her a grin that declared he was in. And he'd make her crawl before the end. Nesta merely began to unlace her boots. He jerked his chin toward Osriel. Why are you up here? I thought I'd do some training myself before heading out for the day. AZ said, his shadows lingering in the archway, as if fearful of the bright sunlight in the ring. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? Cassian could have sworn Nesta's fingers stalled on the laces of her boots. He drawled, nothing at all. We're starting on hand-to-hand -hand combat. My least favorite, Osriel said. Towing off her boots, Nesta asked, why? AZ observed her striding barefoot into the ring. I like swordplay better. Hand-to-hand -hand is too close for my tastes. He doesn't like getting a face full of someone's armpit sweat, Cassian said, chuckling. Osriel rolled his eyes but didn't deny it. Nesta watched the Shadowzinger with a frankness that most people shied from. Osriel returned the look with a stillness that most people ran from. 
Even Feyre had been hesitant around AZ initially, but Nesta considered him with the same unflinching assessment she laid upon everyone. Maybe that was why Osriel had never said a bad word about Nesta. Never seemed inclined to start a fight with her. She saw him, and was not afraid of him. There weren't many people who fit that bill. Nesta said, show me how you two fight. Osriel blinked, but she added, I want to know what I'm up against. When neither of them said anything, she asked, what I saw in battle was different, wasn't it? Yes, Cassian said. A variation of what we do here, but it requires a different sort of fighting. Shadows clouded her eyes, as if the memory of those battlefields haunted her. He said, we won't start battle training for a while yet. Years, probably. AZ was watching her as if he, too, had marked the shadows in her eyes. Cassian asked him, you want to do a little sparring? It's been a while since I wiped the floor with you. He needed to get the energy out, the lingering, addling desire from last night. Needed to burn it from his body through movement and breath. AZ rolled a shoulder, unruffled and calm, eyes glittering as if he marked Cassian's need to expel that coiled up energy. But AZ peeled off his jacket and his shirt, leaving the siphons atop the backs of his hands, anchored in place around the wrist and threw a loop on his middle finger. Cassian did the same as he removed his own shirt. Nesta's stare seared him from across the ring. Cassian might have flexed his stomach muscles as he approached the chalk-lined circle. AZ shook his head and muttered, pathetic, Cass. Cassian winked nodding to his brother's equally muscled stomach. Where have you been exercising these days? Here, Osriel said. At night. After he returned from spying on their enemies. Can't sleep? Cassian took up a fighting stance. A shadow curled around Osriel's neck, the only one brave enough to face the sunlight. Something like that, he said, and settled into his own stance across from Cassian. Cassian let it drop, knowing Azad would have told him already if he'd wanted to share what had been hounding him enough to exercise at night, rather than in the morning with them. Cassian explained to Nesta, who stood a few feet outside the chalk ring, we'll go full speed, then stop, and I'll break it down for you. All right? He needed to expunge this energy before he'd dare let himself be that close to her. Nesta crossed her arms, face so neutral he wondered for a moment if he'd dreamed some wild fantasy last night of his head between her legs. Shaking off the thought, he again looked to AZ. Their eyes met, AZ's face as unreadable as Nesta's, and Cassian gave a nod. Begin. It started with footwork, a slow circling, an assessment, waiting for the other to reveal his first move. Cassian knew AZ's tricks knew which side AZ favoured and how he liked to strike. The problem was, AZ knew all of his techniques and shortcomings, too. They circled each other again, Cashin's feet pounding a steady beat on the dry ground. Well, he asked AZ why don't you show me what all that nighttime brooding has resulted in. AZ's mouth curved. He refused to take the bait. The sun beat down on them, warming Cashin's bare skin and hair. Is this really all it is? Nesta asked. Circling and taunting? Cassian didn't dare look her way. Not even for an instant. As soon as he so much as blinked at her, Osriel would strike, and strike hard. But. Cassian grinned. And glanced toward Nesta. AZ fell for his deception launching toward him at last. Cassian, waiting for it, met the fist AZ sent flying for his face, blocking and deflecting and counter-striking. AZ caught the blow, ducked the second Cassian had waiting, and aimed one for Cassian's exposed ribs. Cassian blocked, counter-punched, and then the sparring unfolded. Fists and feet and wings, punch and block, kick and stomp, breath sawing out of them as he and AZ tried to break past each other's defences. Neither of them put the full force of their bodies into the blows, not the way they do in a real brawl, when one punch could shatter a jaw. 
But they used enough power to make Cassian's ribs bleat at the impact, to make AZ wish out a breath as Cassian landed a lucky hit to his stomach. AZ was spared from having the air knocked out of him by twisting, otherwise the fight would have ended right then and there. Around and around the ring, fists flying, teeth bared in fierce grins, they lost themselves to sweat and sun and breathing. They'd been born for such things, endured centuries of training that had honed their bodies into instruments of violence. To allow their bodies to do just what they wished was its own sort of freedom. Faster and faster they fought, and even Cassian's breathing became labored. Though Cassian had more bulk, Osriel was quick as hell, they were evenly matched. They might be at this for hours, if they were truly facing each other as enemies. Might have been at it for days, if they'd been opponents in one of the old wars, where entire battles had come to a standstill to watch great heroes go head to head. But time wasn't unlimited, and he did have a lesson to get through with Nesta. Right, Cassian panted through gritted teeth as he blocked AZ's kick and bounced a step back, circling again. Whoever lands the next blow wins. That's ridiculous, AZ panted back. We go until one of us eats dirt. AZ had a vicious competitive streak. It wasn't boastful and arrogant, the way Cassian knew he himself was prone to be, or possessive and terrifying like Amran's. No, it was quiet and cruel and utterly lethal. Cassian had lost track of how many games they'd played over the centuries, with one of them certain of a win, only for AZ to reveal some master strategy. Or how many games had been reduced to only Reese and AZ left standing, battling it out over cards or chess until the middle of the night, when Cassian and Moore had given up and started drinking. They circled again, but AZ snapped his head toward Nesta, eyes wide. Cassian looked, heart leaping into his throat. Osriel struck, a punch to the jaw hard enough that Cassian staggered. Reeling, steadying himself, he cursed. AZ let out a soft laugh, eyes flickering. He'd wielded the same deception that Cassian had used at the start of this, played the one card that would get Cassian to remove his focus from an opponent. It had happened before against Hyben. Nesta had screamed his name, and even in the midst of the battlefield, he'd abandoned his soldiers and rushed for her, not caring about anything other than reaching her, saving her. Only, Nesta had saved him. And she had screamed his name to get him out of the cauldron's range. His soldiers had been blasted apart a moment later. And when he'd looked at her face, he'd understood something, something that the past year and a half had shredded apart and turned cold. Cassian rolled his shoulder, hand at his jaw as he said to AZ, bastard. AZ laughed again, and they turned toward Nesta. She remained a pillar of cool calm, but a line of colour stained her cheeks. There was no wind to blow her scent to him, but from the way her throat bobbed as she glanced between them. Osriel let out a cough and walked toward the water station. You're drooling, Cassian said to her, and Nesta went rigid. If there was anything enticing, she hissed, entering the ring, it was seeing Osriel punch your face. Cassian motioned for her to get into her fighting stance. Keep telling yourself that, N.E.S. What do you know of the dread trove? The what? Gwyn turned from the desk where Nesta had found the priestess singing softly to herself, situated just outside Merrill's shut office door. The dread trove, Nesta said, wincing at her sore body's protestations as she took a seat on the edge of Gwyn's desk. Three ancient artifacts. Gwyn shook her head. I've never heard of such a thing. Nesta was still sweaty from the lesson with Cassian and Osriel. They'd walked her through the punches and kicks and steps they'd done with ease, though neither had laughed when she was clumsy or ungraceful. Seeing them spar had been overwhelming. Their beautiful forms, tattooed and scarred and carved with muscle, gleaming with sweat as they fought with a viciousness and intelligence she'd never seen. She'd been sweating herself when they'd finished, wondering what it'd be like to be between those two male bodies, letting them turn all that lethal attention on worshipping her. Elaine would faint to hear such thoughts. 
and to hear that Nesta had already had two males in her bed not once but twice, and had enjoyed every second of it. But the males Nesta had shared herself with Haddon looked like Cassian and Osriel. Haddon been Cassian and Osriel. Nesta had made herself focused during the lesson, but as soon as she'd left them in the training ring, filthy thoughts had poured in, leaving her half distracted while she'd walked down to the library. The thought of Cassian pumping into her mouth while Osriel pounded into her from behind, the two of them working her in tandem. Talking to Gwyn about the dread trove had sobered her up fast enough. It seems like the trove has a glamour to make people forget that it exists, Nesta said to Gwyn, and succinctly explained what it was, along with vague details about why it was wanted. She didn't mention Queen Briolin, or Koshe, or the Cauldron. Only that the trove must be found quickly. And that Gwyn should not mention it to anyone. Nesta supposed that in doing so, she directly disobeyed Reese's order for silence, but, to hell with him. When she was done, Gwyn was wide-eyed, her face so pale that her freckles stood out in stark relief. And you must find it. I don't have the faintest idea where to begin looking. Which one to find first? Gwyn chewed on her bottom lip. We do have an extensive card cataloging system, she mused idly, but peered toward the stacks beyond them, to the open pit at the bottom of the library. But they don't list what's below level 7. I know. Gwyn angled her head. So why come to me? You're clearly good at what you do, if you're working with someone as demanding as Meryl. If you have a spare moment, any help would be appreciated. Or just point me in a direction. Let me finish proofing this chapter and then I'll see what I can discover. Nesta offered a tight smile. Thank you. Gwyn waved a hand. Finding objects to help our court protect the world is rather exciting. About as exciting as I'm willing to get these days, but it shall be an adventure. You could come to training if you want another sort of adventure. Nesta said carefully. Gwyn offered her a tight smile. That's not for me, I'm afraid. Why not? Gwyn gestured to Nesta's fighting leathers, the overlapping scales. I'm not a warrior. Neither am I. But you could be. Gwyn shook her head. I don't think so. If I wished to be a warrior, I would have gone that route as a child. Instead I offered myself as an acolyte and that is what I am. You don't have to give up one thing to be the other. Training is exercise. Learning to breathe and stretch and fight. Aren't you researching Valkyries for Meryl? That might even give you further insight. Nesta patted a thigh. And I already have muscle building up. Two weeks, and I can tell the difference. Why would a priestess need muscular thighs? Nesta narrowed her eyes as Gwyn went back to her work. Is it Cassian? Cassian is a good and honourable male. I know he is. She'd always known it. She pressed, but is it Cassian's presence that makes you hesitate? There had been no hint this morning as to what had gone on between them last night. As if the debt between them had been paid, and he had no further interest in touching her. Like she was an itch scratched and that was it. Or perhaps he had not enjoyed it as she had. It unsettled her, that she spent so much time thinking about it. Gwyn didn't answer, and Nesta knew she had no right to push, not when colour stole over Gwyn's cheeks and her head bowed slightly. Shame it was shame and fear. Something in Nesta's chest tightened as she began to walk away. All right. Let me know if you learn anything regarding the trove. Nesta mulled the conversation over during the hours she worked. When she checked the sign-up sheet as she left the library at sundown, no names had been added. She felt Clotho's eyes on her as she surveyed the empty page. Nesta at last turned toward the priestess, seated at her desk with her hands folded before her. Silence stretched between them, but Nesta said nothing as she left. She went to the stairwell rather than to her room or the dining room and stared down into the curving redness of the steps. Nesta began the descent, slower this time, 
contemplating each placement of her foot. Let each step downward be a thought, a piece of one of Amran's puzzles, that she sifted through. Down and down she went, turning over each word and glance from Gwyn during the time Nesta had worked in the library. Step to step, she told herself with each burning, trembling movement of her legs. Step to step to step. Again, she replayed the conversation. Each step was a different word, or motion, or scent. Nesta was on step 2000 when she halted. She knew what she had to do. Chapter 24 Five days later, Cassian sat before the desk of the library's high priestess and watched her enchanted pen move. He'd met Clotho a few times over the centuries, found she had a dry, wicked sense of humor and a soothing presence. He'd made a point not to stare at her hands, or at the face he'd only seen once, when Moore had brought her in so long ago. It had been so battered and bloody it hadn't looked like a face at all. He had no idea how it had healed beneath the hood. If Madger had been able to save it in a way she hadn't been able to save Clotho's hands. He supposed it didn't matter what she looked like, not when she had accomplished and built so much with Reese and more within this library. A sanctuary for females who'd endured such unspeakable horrors that he was always happy to carry out justice on their behalf. His mother had needed a place like this. But Reese had established it long after she'd left this world. He wondered if Osriel's mother had ever considered coming here, or if he'd ever pushed her to. Well, Clotho, he said, leaning back in the chair, surrounded by the sounds of rustling parchment and the robes of the priestesses like fluttering wings, you asked for an audience. Her pen made a flourish as it finished what she'd been writing. I have asked Nesta twice now not to practice in the library, and she has disregarded my request. For five days, she has blatantly ignored my commands to stop. Cashin's brows rose. She's practicing down here. Again, the pen scraped over the paper. He glanced to the open pit to his left, as if he'd spot Nesta down there. A week had passed since that madness in her bedroom, and they had not spoken of it, done nothing further. He wasn't entirely sure it would be wise to continue. In addition to the grueling set of exercises to hone her body, Cassian had walked her through the minutiae of hand-to-hand -hand combat, individual steps and movements that could be assembled in endless combinations. Learning each of those steps required not just strength but focus to remember which movement correlated with the numbered step, to let her body start to remember all on its own, a jab, a hook, a high kick. He'd lost count of how many times he'd caught her muttering at her body to remember so she didn't need to think so hard. But he knew she liked the punches. The kicks. A light shone in her face as her body flowed through the motions, a slingshot of strength all narrowing to a point of impact. He'd always felt that way when he did the movements correctly, like his body and mind and soul had lined up and begun singing. Clotho wrote, Nesta has practiced constantly of late. Has she done any damage? No. But I asked her to stop, and she has not. He suppressed his smile. Perhaps the morning lessons weren't demanding enough. Is her work suffering for it? No. That's beside the point. His mouth twisted to the side. Clotho wrote, I need you to put a stop to this. Does it bother the others? It distracts them, to see someone kicking and punching at shadows. Cassian had to duck his head so she wouldn't read the amusement in his eyes. I'll talk to her. Is she down there now? He nodded to the sloping ramp. With your permission, of course. This was their safe harbor. It didn't matter if he was a member of Reese's court, or that he'd come here before. Every time, he asked permission. He'd only ever failed to do so once, when Hyben's ravens had attacked. Yes. I give you permission to enter. Nesta is on level 5. Perhaps you shall manage to get through to her. Taking that as his cue, Cassian rose. You do know this is Nesta Ukharan we're talking about. She does nothing unless she wishes to. 
and she's the least likely to listen to me. Clotho huffed a laugh. She has a will of iron. Of steel. He smiled. Good seeing you, Clotho. You as well, Lord Cassian. Just Cassian, he said, as he had said so many times now. You are lord in good deeds. It is not a title born, but earned. He bowed his head as he said thickly, thank you. It took him until he reached the section where Clotho had said Nestor would be to shake off the high priestess's words. What they meant to him. The scuffing steps greeted him first, then the steady, rhythmic breathing he'd come to know so intimately. Cassian made his breathing match it, turned his own steps silent, and peered into the next row of stacks. Anyone walking along the ramp would only have to look to the right to see Nesta standing there, in a near-perfect fighting stance, throwing punches toward the shelf. She'd picked five books as targets and worked through each punch toward them as if they were the parts on a body he'd shown her where to strike. Then she halted, blew out a breath and brushed back a strand of errant hair, and straightened the books before returning to the metal cart behind her. You're still dropping your elbow, he said, and she whirled, falling back against the cart with enough surprise that he swallowed his laugh. He'd never seen Nesta Arkharan so, ruffled. She lifted her chin as she stalked toward him. He watched every movement of her legs. She'd stopped throwing her weight onto her right leg so much, and muscles shifted in her thighs, sleek and strong. Three weeks might not be much time for a human body to pack on muscle, but she was high fay now. I'm not dropping my elbow, she challenged, emerging from the row of stacks and into the flat area before the slope of the ramp. I just saw you do it twice with that right hook. She leaned against the end of a long shelf. I assume Clotho sent you to reprimand me. He shrugged. I didn't know you were so invested in the training that you kept at it down here. Her eyes practically glowed in the dimness. I'm tired of being weak. Of depending on others to defend me. Fair enough. Before I dispense with the lecture about ignoring Clotho's requests, let me just say that. Show me. Nesta stepped away from the shelf and squared off against him. Show me where I'm dropping my elbow. He blinked at the rippling intensity in her face. Then he swallowed. Swallowed, because there she was, a glimpse of that person he'd known before the war with Hyben had ended. A glimmer of her like a mirage, like if he looked at it too long, she'd slip away and vanish. So Cassian said, get into your stance. Nesta obeyed. Hoping Clotho wouldn't come shove him over the railing for disobeying her orders, he said, all right. Throw the right hook. Nesta did so. And dropped her damn elbow. Get back into position. She did, and he asked, may I? Nesta nodded, and kept perfectly still as he made minute adjustments to the angle of her arm. Punch again. Slowly. She heeded him, and his hand wrapped around her elbow as it began to dip. See? Keep this up. He maneuvered her arm back into starting position. Don't forget to flow the weight through your hips. He took her arm, keeping a good foot of distance between their bodies, and moved it through the punch. Like this. All right. Nesta reset herself, and he took a step away. Without his order, she did the punch again. Perfectly. Cassian whistled. Do that with more force and you'll shatter a male's jaw, he said with a crooked grin. Give me a combination 1 2, then 4 5 3, then 1 1 2. Nesta's brows bunched as she reset herself. Her feet shifted into position, grounding her weight into the stone floor. And then she moved, and it was like watching a river, like watching the wind cut through a mountain. Not perfect, but close. If you did that against an opponent, Cassian said, they'd be on the ground, gasping for air. And then I'd make the kill. Yes, a sword through the heart would finish the job. But if you struck their chest hard enough with that final punch, 
you might make one of their lungs collapse. On a battlefield, you'd opt for either the killing blow with a sword or just leave them there, unable to move, for someone else to finish off while you face the next opponent. She nodded, as if this all seemed like perfectly normal conversation. Like he was giving her gardening tips. All right. Cassian cleared his throat and tucked back his wings, so, no more practicing in the library. The next person Clotho asks to scold you probably won't be someone you feel like talking to. Nesta's eyes darkened as she considered which of her least favorite people it would be, and she nodded again. His task done he said, give me one more combination. He rattled off the order. Her smile was nothing short of feline as she did just that. And her right hook didn't so much as bob downward. Good, he said, and turned toward the ramp that would lead him out. He startled at what he beheld, priestesses stopped along the railings on several different levels, staring toward them. Toward Nesta. At his attention, they instantly began walking or working or shelving books. But a young priestess with coppery brown hair, the only one of them with no hood or stone, lingered at the rail the longest. Even from a level below and across the pit, he could see that her large eyes were the color of shallow, warm water. They were wide for a moment before she, too, quickly vanished. Cassian looked back to Nesta, who met his stare with near-simmering eyes. Your right hook was perfect this morning, he murmured. Yes. But not when I watched you in the stacks. I figured you'd correct me. Shock and delight slammed into him. She'd moved out of the stacks before she let him do so. Into plain view. So they would all see him teaching her. He gaped at her. You can tell Clotho I won't need to practice in the library anymore. Nesta said mildly, and turned back down the row. She'd known Clotho and the others would never invite him, and never go up to the ring to see what he could do. How he'd teach them. So she'd shown the priestesses what she was learning, day after day. More than that, she'd pissed off Clotho enough that the priestess had ordered him down here. Where Nesta had used him in a demonstration. Not for herself, but for the priestesses who drifted over to watch. Cassian let out a soft laugh. Crafty, Ark Heron. Nesta lifted a hand over a shoulder in farewell as she reached her cart. They'd needed to see it, Nesta realized. What Cassian was like when he taught her. That there was touching, but it was always with her permission, and always professional. Needed to see how he never mocked her, only gently corrected. And needed to see what he'd taught her. Hear him say precisely what she could do with all those punching and kicking combinations. What the priestesses might learn to do. But that evening, as Nesta left, the sign-up sheet remained blank. She looked back at Clotho, who sat at her desk, as she always did, from dawn until dusk. If the priestess gathered that she'd been played, she didn't let on. But there was something like sorrow leaking from Clotho, as if she, too, had wanted to see that sheet filled today. Nesta didn't know why it mattered. Why Clotho's sorrow knocked the wind from her, but then Nesta was moving, up through the house to the ten thousand steps. Perhaps she was good for nothing after all. Perhaps she'd been a fool to think that this trick might convince them. Maybe physical training wasn't what they required to overcome their demons, and she'd been arrogant enough to assume she knew what they needed. Down and down the stairs Nesta walked, the walls pressing in. She only made it to stair 900 before she turned around, her steps as heavy as if they'd been weighed with lead blocks. Nesta was still sweating and breathing hard when she stumbled into her room and found a book on the nightstand. She raised a brow at the title. This isn't your usual sort of romance, she said to the room. It wasn't a romance at all. It was an old bound manuscript called The Dance of Battle. Nesta said, you can take this one back, thank you. The last thing she wanted to read at night was some dreary old text about war strategy. The house did no such thing, and Nesta sighed and picked up the manuscript, the black leather binding so age-worn it was butter-soft. 
A familiar smell drifted to her from the pages. You didn't leave this for me, did you? The house replied by plopping down a stack of romances, as if to say, this is what I would have chosen. Nesta peered at the manuscript, full of cash and scent, as if he'd read it a thousand times. He'd left it for her. Deemed her worthy of whatever lay inside. Nesta perched on the edge of the bed and thumbed open the text. It was midnight when she took a break from reading the dance of battle and rubbed her temples. She hadn't put it down, not even to eat dinner at her desk, holding it with one hand while she devoured her stew with the other. It was astonishing how much of the art of warfare was like the social manipulation her mother had insisted she learn, picking battlegrounds, finding allies amongst the enemies of one's enemies. Some of it was wholly new, of course, and such a precise way of thinking that she knew she'd have to read the manuscript many times to fully grasp its lessons. She'd been aware that Cassian knew how to lead armies. Had watched him do so with unflinching precision and cleverness. But reading the manuscript, she realized she had never understood just how much advanced thinking went into planning battles and wars. Nesta set the manuscript on her nightstand and lay back against her pillows. She pictured Cassian on a battlefield, as he'd been that day he'd gone up against a Hyben commander and thrown a spear so hard the mail had been hurled from his horse upon impact. He departed from the manuscript's advice in only one way, he fought on the front lines with his soldiers, rather than commanding from the rear. She let her thoughts drift for a time, until they snared upon another tangle of thorns. Did it matter if the priestesses didn't show up for training? Beyond her own reluctance to concede failure, did it matter? It did. Somehow, it did. She had failed in every aspect of her life. Utterly and spectacularly failed, and keeping others from realizing it had been her main purpose. She had shut them out, had shut herself out, because the weight of all those failures threatened to shatter her into a thousand pieces. Nesta rubbed her face with her hands. Sleep was a long time coming. Sweat was still running down her body when Nesta entered the library the next afternoon, aiming for the ramp to take her down to where she'd left her cart. She didn't have the courage to look at the empty sign-up sheet. To rip it down. She didn't have the courage to look at Clotho and admit her defeat. She kept walking. But Clotho halted her with an upraised hand. Nesta swallowed. What? Clotho pointed behind Nesta, her gnarled finger indicating the doorway. No, the pillar. And it was not sorrow leaking from the priestess, but something like buzzing excitement. Something that made Nesta whirl on her heel and stride for the pillar. A name had been scrawled on the sheet. One name, in bold letters. One name, ready for tomorrow's lesson. GWYN. Part 2. Blade. Chapter. 25. Stop looking so nervous, Cassian muttered out of the corner of his mouth. I'm not nervous, Nesta muttered back, even as she bounced on her feet, trying not to stare toward the open archway as the clock ticked toward nine. Just relax. He straightened his jacket. You're the one fidgeting, she hissed. Because you're making me fidget. Steps scuffed on the stone beyond the archway, and Nesta's breath rushed from her in a wave she didn't realize she was holding back as Gwyn's coppery brown hair appeared. In the sunlight, the color of her hair was extraordinary, strands of gold glinting, and her teal eyes were a near perfect match to the stones the other priestesses wore. Gwyn beheld them standing in the center of the ring and stopped short. The tang of her fear set Nesta approaching. Hello. Gwyn's hands were shaking as she took another step into the ring and peered into the open bowl of the sky. The first time she'd been outside truly outside in years. Cassian, to his credit, moved to the rack of wooden practice weapons that he'd claimed they wouldn't be using for months, and pretended to adjust them. Gwyn swallowed. I, um I realized on the way up here that I don't have proper clothes. She gestured to her pale robes. 
I suspect these will not be ideal. Cassian said without looking over, I can teach you in the robes, if you wish. Whatever's most comfortable. Gwyn offered him a tight smile. I'll see how today's lesson goes and then decide. We wear the robes mostly from tradition, not strict rules. She met Nesta's gaze again as she smiled. I forgot how it feels to have the full sun upon my head. She peered up again. Forgive me if I spend some time gawking at the sky. Of course, Nesta said. She hadn't encountered Gwyn yesterday after seeing that she'd signed up for this morning's lesson, but she'd been almost afraid to, worried that one accidentally uttered sour remark would make Gwyn reconsider. Words stalled in Nesta's throat, but Cassian seemed to anticipate that. All right. No more chit-chat. N.E.S., show our new friend, Gwyn, is it? I'm Cassian. N.E.S., show her your feet. Feet? Gwyn's copper brows rose. Nesta rolled her eyes. You'll see. Gwyn grasped the concept of grounding through her feet better than Nesta had, and certainly had no issues with dropping her weight into her right hip and other things Nesta had worked to correct for three weeks. Even with the robes, it was clear that Gwyn was built lithe and lean, accustomed to the casual grace of the fay that Nesta was only learning. She'd expected to have to coax her friend, but once Gwyn overcame her initial trepidation, she was a willing participant, and a merry companion. The priestess laughed at her own mistakes, and did not bristle at corrections from Cassian. By the end of the lesson, though, Gwyn's robe was damp with sweat, tendrils of hair curling around her flushed face. Cassian ordered them to drink some water before their cooldown. As Gwyn poured herself a glass, she said, at the temple in Sangrava, we had a set of ancient movements that we would go through every sunrise. Not for battle training, but for calming the mind. We did cooldowns after those, too, though we called them groundings. The movements took us out of our bodies, in a way. Let us commune with the mother. The grounding settled us back into the present world. Why did you sign up for this, then? Nesta drank the glass Gwyn extended. If you already have mind calming exercises you're accustomed to. Because I don't ever want to feel powerless again, Gwyn said softly, and all those easy smiles and bright laughs were gone. Only stark, pained honesty shone in her remarkable eyes. Nesta swallowed, and though instinct told her to pull away, she said quietly, Me too. The bell above the shop door jangled as Nesta entered brushing off the snowflakes that had stuck to the shoulders of her cloak. Cassian had needed to go up to the Illyrian mountains after their second lesson with Gwyn, and to her surprise, he had asked Nesta to join him. He'd already cleared it with Clotho that she'd be a few hours late for her work at the library. He hadn't explained why beyond a casual comment about getting her out of the house and into the fresh air. But she'd accepted, and hadn't told him why, either. Cassian hadn't even seemed curious when she requested he leave her at Windhaven so she could go shopping. Perhaps a spark had gleamed in his eye, as if he'd guessed, but he'd been distant, quiet. Given that Cassian was up here to meet with Eris, she didn't blame him. He'd left Nesta by the fountain in the center of the freezing village, making sure she knew that if she needed to warm up, Reese's mother's house was unlocked. Valaris was still gripped in Summer's hand, Autumn just barely tugging it away, but Windhaven had already yielded completely to Winter's embrace. Nesta wasted little time in entering the shop. Nesta, Emery said by way of greeting, peering over a young-looking male's broad shoulder and wings from where she stood helping him at the counter. It's good to see you. Was that relief in her voice? Nesta made sure the door behind her was firmly latched before striding in the snow on her boots leaving muddy tracks alongside those left by Emery's customer. The male half turned toward Nesta, revealing a blandly handsome face, dark hair tied back at the nape of his neck, and glassy brown eyes. The asshole was drunk. Asshole seemed to be the correct term, since Emery's rigid posture revealed distaste and wariness. Nesta sauntered up to the counter, giving the male a once-over that she knew usually made people want to throttle her. 
From the way he stiffened, swaying slightly on his booted feet, she knew it had worked. Good morning, she said cheerfully to Emery. Another thing males seem to detest, being ignored by a female. Wait your turn, which, the male grumbled, turning back to the counter and Emery. Emery crossed her arms. I think we're done here, Bellius. We're done when I say we're done. The words were half slurred. I have an appointment, Nesta said, leveling a cool glance at him. She sniffed at the male. Her nose crinkled. And you seem to need an appointment with a bath. He turned fully to her, muscled shoulders pushing back. Even with the glazed expression, I are bald in his stare. Do you know who I am? A drunk fool wasting my time, Nesta said. Two siphons a blue darker than Osriel's sat atop the backs of his large hands. Get out. Emery stilled, as if bracing herself for the retaliation. But she said before the male could reply, we'll discuss this later, Bellius. My father sent me to convey a message. Message received, Emery said, chin lifting. And my answer is the same, this store is mine. If he wants one so badly, he can open his own. Hateful bitch, Bellius bit out, swaying back a step. Nesta laughed, cold and hollow. Fay and humans had more in common than she'd realized. How many times had she witnessed her father's debtors darkening their doorstep to shake him down for money he didn't have? And then there had been the time when they had gone beyond threats. When they'd left her father's leg shattered. Any sense of safety shattered with it. Get out, Nesta said again, pointing to the door as Bellius bristled at her fading laughter. Do yourself a favor and get out. Bellius rose to his full height, wings flaring. Or what? Nesta picked at her nails. I don't think you want to find out the or what part. Bellius opened his mouth, but Emery said, Your father now has my answer, Bellius. I suggest you get some water from the fountain before you fly home. Bellius only spat onto the floorboards and stalked for the exit, throwing Nesta a hazy glare as he slammed the door behind himself. In silence, Nesta and Emery watched him stagger into the snow-swept street and spread his wings. Nesta frowned as he shot into the sky. Friend of yours? Nesta asked, facing Emery at the counter again. My cousin. Emery cringed. His father is my uncle. On my father's side. She added before Nesta could ask, Bellius is a young, arrogant idiot. He's due to participate in the blood rite this spring, and his arrogance has only grown these past months as he anticipates becoming a true warrior. He's skilled enough that he got placed on a scouting unit to the continent and just returned to celebrate his accomplishment, apparently. Emery wiped at an invisible speck of dirt on the counter. I didn't expect him to be drunk midday, though. That's a new low for him. Color stained her cheeks. I'm sorry you had to witness it. Nesta shrugged. Dealing with drunk fools is my specialty. Emery kept fiddling with the imaginary spot on the counter. Our fathers were two of a kind. They believe children should be harshly disciplined for any infraction. There was little room for mercy or understanding. Nesta passed her lips. I know the type. Her mother's mother had been the same way before she died of a deep-rooted cough that had turned into a deadly infection. Nesta had been seven when the stern-faced dame who had insisted on being called Grandmama had beaten her palms raw with a ruler for missteps in her dancing lessons. Worthless clumsy girl. You're a waste of my time. Maybe this will help you remember to pay attention to my orders. Nesta had only felt relief when the old beast had died. Elaine, who'd been spared the cruelties of grandmama's tutelage, had wept and dutifully laid flowers at her grave, one soon joined by their mother's stone marker. Faya had been too young to understand, but Nesta had never bothered to lay flowers for her grandmama. Not when Nesta bore a scar near her left thumb from one of the woman's nastier punishments. Nesta had only left flowers for her mother, who
whose grave she had visited more often than she cared to admit. She hadn't once visited her father's grave outside Valarius. Are you all right? Nesta asked Emery at last. Will Bellius return? No, Emery said, shaking her head. I mean, I'm fine. But no, he's a member of the Ironcrest War Band. Their lands are a few hours' flight from here. He won't return anytime soon. She shrugged. I get these little visits from my uncle's family every now and then. Nothing I can't handle. Though Bellius was a new one. I guess they think he's adult enough now to bully me. Nesta opened her mouth, but Emery offered her another half smile and changed the subject. You look well. Far healthier than when I saw you. What was it now? Almost three weeks ago. She gave Nesta an assessing glance. You never came back. We moved our training to Valarius, Nesta explained. I was about to write to you before Bellius interrupted me. I asked about making leathers with fleece inside. Emery leaned her forearms on the immaculate counter. It can be done, but it's not cheap. Then it's beyond my means, but thank you for finding out anyway. I could order it and let you pay it off as you're able. It was a generous offer. Far beyond the kindness anyone had ever shown Nesta in the human realm, when her father had been trying to sell his wood carvings for a few pitiful coppers. Only Faya had kept them fed and clothed, earning scant amounts for the pelts and meat she hunted. She'd kept them alive. The last time she'd hunted for them, the food had run out the day before. If Faya hadn't returned home with meat that night, they either would have had to starve to death or beg in the village. Nesta had told herself that day that Thomas would take her in, if necessary. Maybe even Elaine, too. But his family had been hateful, with too many mouths to feed already. His father would have refused to feed her, without question. She'd been prepared to offer the only thing she had to barter to Thomas, if it would have kept Elaine from starving. Would have sold her body on the street to anyone who'd pay her enough to feed her sister. Her body had meant nothing to her, nothing, she'd told herself as she'd felt her options closing in. Elaine meant everything. But Faya had come back with that food. And then vanished over the wall. Three days afterward, Nesta broke it off with Thomas. Enraged, he'd launched himself at her, pinning her against the enormous woodpile stacked along the barn wall. Spiteful whore, he'd growled. You think you're better than me? Acting like a queen when you haven't got shit. She'd never forget the sound of her dress tearing, the greed in his eyes as his hands poured at her skirts, trying to raise them as he fumbled with the buckle on his belt. Only pure, undiluted terror and survival instinct had saved her. She'd let him get close, let him think her strength had failed, and then clamped her teeth down on his ear. And ripped. He'd screamed, but he'd loosened his grip on her just enough that she'd broken free and scrambled through the snow, spitting his blood out of her mouth, and did not stop running until she'd reached the cottage. And then word had come of their father's ships, found, with all the wealth intact. Nesta knew it was a lie. The trunks of jewels and gold had not come from that doomed shipment, but from Tamlin, payment for the human woman he'd stolen away. To help the family he'd doomed to die without Faye's hunting. Nesta shook off the memory. It's all right. But thank you. Emery rubbed her long, slender hands together. It's freezing, and I'm about to take my lunch break. Would you like to join me? Beyond Cassian, no one had invited her to dine in a long time. She'd given them no reason to. But there it was, an honest, simple offer. From someone who had no idea how terrible she was. Having lunch with Emery was an indulgence, it was only a matter of time until the female learned more about Nesta. Until she heard every horrible thing, and then the invitations would stop. Had she been any better than Bellius? drunk and simmering with hatred for months. If Emery knew, she'd kick her out of this shop, too. But for now, neither rumour nor truth had reached Emery. I would like that, 
Nesta said, and meant it. The back room of Emery's shop was as immaculate as the front, though crates of extra stock were stacked against one wall. Two windows looked out onto a snow-covered garden, and beyond that, the nearest mountain peak squatted, blocking the grey sky with its rocky bulk. A small kitchen lay to the right, little more than a hearth and a counter and a small work table. A few wooden chairs sat around it, and Nesta realised the table was also the dining area. A place setting had been laid there for one person. Just you. Nesta asked as Emery went to the wood counter and gathered a platter of roast beef and a dish of roasted carrots. She set them on the table before Nesta and grabbed a loaf of bread, along with a bowl of butter. Just me. Emery opened a cabinet to retrieve a second place setting. No mate or husband to bother me. She spoke a bit tensely, like there was more to it than that, but Nesta said, me neither. Emery threw her a wry look. What about that handsome General Cassian? Nesta blocked out the memory of his head between her thighs, his tongue at her entrance, sliding into her. Not a chance, Nesta said, but Emery's eyes glimmered with knowing. Well, it's nice to meet another female who's not obsessed with marriage and babymaking, Emery said, sitting at the table and gesturing for Nesta to do the same. She'd put some roast beef, carrots, and bread onto Nesta's plate, and slid the bowl of butter to her. It's cold, but it's meant to be eaten that way. I usually stop for lunch only long enough to feed myself. Nesta dug in and grunted. It's delicious. She took another bite. Did you make this? Who else would? We don't have any sort of food shops here except the butcher. Emery pointed with her fork to the garden beyond the building. I grow my own vegetables. These carrots came from that garden. Nesta took a bite. They have a lovely flavor. Butter and thyme and something bright. It's all in the spices. Which are in short supply around here, unfortunately. Illyrians don't particularly know or care about them. My father used to be a merchant, Nesta said, a chasm yawning open in her at the words. She cleared her throat. He traded spices from all over the world. I can still remember the smell in his offices, it was like a thousand different personalities all crammed into one space. Faye had loved to hang about their father's office, more fascinated in the trade than what Nesta had been taught was acceptable for a wealthy girl. Faye had always been that way, completely uninterested in the rules that governed their lives, uninterested in becoming a true lady who would help advance their family's fortunes through an advantageous marriage. They had rarely agreed on anything. And those visits to their father's offices had resulted in a simmering resentment between them. Faya had tried to get her interested, had shown her so many rarities to tempt her. But Nesta had barely listened to her sister's explanations, mostly eyeing up their father's business partners for whether their sons might be a good match. Faya had been disgusted. It had made Nesta even more determined. Did you travel with him? No, my two sisters and I remained home. It wasn't appropriate for us to travel the world. I always forget how similar human ideas of propriety are to the Illyrians. Emery took another bite. Would you have wanted to see the world, if you could? It was half a world, wasn't it? With the wall in place. Still better than nothing. Nesta chuckled. You're right. She considered Emery's question. If her father had offered to bring them on one of his ships, to let them see strange and distant shores, would they have gone? Elaine had always wanted to visit the continent to study the tulips and other famed flowers, but her imagination had stretched no further. Faya had talked once about the glorious art in the continent's museums and private estates. But that was all the western edge of it. Beyond that, the continent was vast. And to the south, another continent sprawled. Would she have gone? I would have put up a fight, Nesta said at last, but in the end, I'd have yielded to curiosity. Do you still have any family in the human lands? My mother died when I was twelve, and my father. 
he did not survive the most recent war. Their parents died during my childhood. I have no kin on my father's side, and my mother had one cousin, who lives on the continent and conveniently forgot about us when we fell on hard times. Nesta had written letter after letter when they'd fallen into poverty, begging her cousin Aston to take them in. They'd gone unanswered, and then the money for postage had run out. Nesta still wondered if their cousin had ever learned what had become of the relatives she'd ignored and left to die. Nesta asked carefully, what about your family? She'd seen and heard enough from Bellius to have a general idea, but she couldn't help asking. Mother died giving birth to me, and my elder brother died in a skirmish between war bands ten years before I was born. My father died during the war with Hyben. The words were stiff, cold. I do not bother with the rest of my kin, though my father's family makes it a point to try to claim this store and his wealth as their own. They're not entitled to it, are they? No. Reese and changed the inheritance law centuries ago to include females, but my uncles don't seem to care. They still show up every now and then to bother me like Bellius did. They believe a woman should not run her own business, that I should wed a male in this village and leave the store to them. She grimaced. They're vultures. Emery had finished her lunch and poured some tea for each of them. It's a shame that you won't be coming up here very often. I could use another sensible person to talk to. Nesta blinked at the compliment, the bit of truth it revealed about Emery, she was unhappy in this place. All those questions about travelling. Would you ever move away? Emery choked on a laugh. And go where? At least here I know people. I've never left this village. Never even been up to that mountaintop over there. She gestured to the window, and Nesta made it a point not to look at her wings. Nesta sipped from her tea. It was a strong brew, with a bit of a bite. She must have made a face because Emery explained quietly, tea is in short supply here a luxury that I indulge. But to spread it out, I add a little willow bark to it. It also helps with some of my, pains. What pains? My wings sometimes hurt. The scars, I mean. Like an old wound. Nesta kept her pity tamped down. She finished her tea right as Emery did, and said, thank you for the food. Rising, she picked up her plate. I'll get it. Emery hustled around the table. Don't trouble yourself. She moved with an easy grace, like someone confident in her body. Nesta drifted to the front of the shop, but then said, at last voicing her reason for visiting, the training I'm doing with Cassian in the House of Wind is open to anyone, any female, I mean. Females who have experienced, hardship. Emery's wings, her horrible family, were not the same as what Gwyn had endured, but everyone's traumas wore different masks. We train each morning, from 9 to 11, though we sometimes run until noon. You're welcome to come. Emery stiffened. I have no way of getting there, but I appreciate the offer. Someone could come retrieve you, and bring you back. Nesta didn't know who, but if she had to ask Reese himself, she would. It's a generous offer, but I have my shop to run. Emery's face yielded nothing, as battle-hardened as Osriel's. I'm not interested in a warrior's training. I doubt it would win me patrons in this town to have them know I'm doing such a thing. You don't seem like a coward. The words rang between them. Emery bit her lip. But Nesta shrugged. Send word if you wish to join us. The offer stands. Cassian hated to admit it, but for a spoiled, soulless asshole, Eris had his uses. Mostly one the bubble of heat that warmed them against the chill winds wending through the pines of the Illyrian steppes. Some fire magic to warm their bones. The dread trove, Eris mused, surveying the heavy grey sky that threatened snow. I've never heard of such items. Though it does not surprise me. Does your father know of them? The steppes weren't neutral ground, but they were empty enough that Eris had finally deigned to accept Cassian's request to meet here. 
after taking days to reply to his message. No, thank the mother, Eris said, crossing his arms. He would have told me if he did. But if the trove has a sentience like you suggested, if it wants to be found. I fear that it might also be reaching out to others as well. Not just Brylin and Koshe. Baron in possession of the trove would be a disaster. He'd join the ranks of the King of Hyben. Could become something terrible and deathless like Lanthes. So Brylin failed to inform Baron about her quest for the trove when he visited her. Apparently, she doesn't trust him, either, Eris said, face full of contemplation. I'll need to think on that. Don't tell him about it, Cassian warned. Eris shook his head. You misunderstand me. I'm not going to tell him a damn thing. But the fact that Brylin is actively hiding her larger plans from him. He nodded, more to himself. Is this why Morrigan is back in Valahan? To learn if they know about the trove? Maybe, Cassian lied. She was still trying to convince them to sign the new treaty. But Eris didn't need to know that. Here I was, Eris said, thinking Morrigan was going there so often to hide from me. Don't flatter yourself. It's only coincidence. He wasn't sure if the lie held. Why shouldn't I flatter myself with such thoughts? You flatter yourself, thinking you're more than a mongrel bastard. Cashin's siphons glinted atop his hands, and Eris smirked at the evidence that he'd landed the blow. But Cassian forced himself to say calmly, that's all the information I have. You've given me a great deal to consider. Make sure you keep it quiet, Cassian warned again. Eris winked before winnowing away. Alone in the howling wild, Cassian blew out a breath. Embraced the chill winds, the pine-fresh scent, and willed it to wash away his irritation and discomfort. But it lingered. For some reason, it lingered. Chapter 26 Without doing extra training between the stacks, Nesta found herself less exhausted when she left the library. Cassian had retrieved her from Windhaven after two and a half hours, and she'd already been so bored sitting in Reese's mother's house that she'd nearly smiled to see him. But Cassian's face had been tight, his eyes cold and distant, and he'd barely spoken to her when Reese had appeared. Reese had barely spoken to her, either, but that was to be expected. It was better if they didn't speak at all. Yet Cassian Haddon said more than I'll see you later before leaving again with Reese after the High Lord had brought them back to the House of Wind, his face still tight and angry. With the extra energy buzzing through her that night, wondering incessantly why Cassian had been so upset, Nesta didn't feel like eating in her room and falling asleep. So she found herself in the doorway of the dining room. Cassian was lounging in his chair, a glass of wine in his hand, staring at nothing. A brooding warrior prince, contemplating the death of his enemies. She took a step into the room, and the wine glass vanished. She snorted. I'm not so wine addled that I'd steal it from your hand. The house is under specific orders, no wine when you're in the room. He flexed his fingers as he sat up. It took it from me. Ah. She claimed the seat across from him as a place setting and a plate of food appeared, along with water for both of them. Cassian returned to staring at his half-eaten food. She hadn't seen his face this grave since the war. Did something happen with the queens or the trove? He blinked. What? Then gave a one-shouldered shrug. No, just. Eris was his usual charming self today. He pushed around the roast chicken with his fork. Nesta picked up her own fork, hungry enough that she let the subject drop as she devoured her food. When she'd taken the edge off her hunger, she said, I asked Emery to join training. I'm assuming she said no. His words were flat, his face distant. Indeed. But if she changes her mind, I thought maybe someone could winnow her here. Sure. She could tell he wasn't just being short with her, he was so preoccupied with whatever was eating at him that he could barely talk.
It bothered her more than it should have. Bothered her enough that she asked, what happened? She made herself eat more, acting as casual as possible, trying to coax him into opening up. To talk about what had brought that bruised look to his eyes. His gaze lowering to his plate, Cassian told her about the meeting with Eris. So Eris is set on helping us find the trove and making sure his father doesn't get his hands on it, or hear about it, Nesta said when he'd finished. Isn't that a good thing? Why are you riled? Why do you look so battered? It's the ugliness of his fucking soul that riles me. I don't care if he calls me a mongrel bastard. Eris had called him such things today, she realized. Rage rippled through her. It's just that, ally or not, I hate him. He's so slick and unruffled and... I can't stand him. He set down his fork and stared toward the window behind her. Eris and his twisted word games and politics are an enemy I don't know how to handle. Every time I meet with him, I feel like he's got the upper hand. Like I can only catch up to him, and he sees through my every fumbling attempt at being clever. Maybe that makes me a stupid brute after all. True sorrow filled his face and enough self-loathing that Nesta rose from her seat. He went still as she rounded the table, only lifting his head when she leaned against the edge of the table beside his plate. Reese should kill him and be done with it. If anyone is going to kill Eris, it will be more or me. His hazel eyes were nearly pleading. Not with her, she knew, but with fate. But killing him would prove him and his ilk right about me. And regardless of how I feel about Eris, he would be a better high lord than Beren. No matter what I want, there's still the well-being of the autumn court to consider. Cassian was good. In his soul, in his warrior's heart, Cassian was good in a way Nesta knew most people were not. In a way she knew she was not and would never be. He was not a warrior who killed on a whim, but a male who carefully considered every life he had to take. Who'd defend what he loved until death? Anaris. He'd hurt Cassian. With what he'd done to Morrigan, yes, but also with the words so similar to ones that Nesta herself had wielded. The wound lay in Cassian's eyes, as raw as any injury. Shame rushed through her. Shame, and anger, and a wild sort of desperation. She couldn't abide the pain in his eyes, teetering on the brink of despair. Couldn't stand the absence of the grinning and winking and swaggering she knew so well. She'd do anything to get rid of that look in his eyes. Even for a few moments. So Nesta braced her hands on the arms of his chair as she brushed a kiss to his neck. Cashin's breath caught. But she pressed another kiss to the soft, warm skin of his neck, just beneath his ear. Another, lower now, closer to the collar of his dark shirt. He trembled, and she kissed the hard knot in the center of his throat. Licked it. Cassian shifted in his chair, groaning softly. His hand rose to clasp her hip, as if he'd push her away, but she removed him. Let me, she said against his neck. Please. He swallowed, and that hard knot moved against her mouth. But he didn't stop her, and so Nesta kissed him again, moving to the other side of his neck. Reaching that spot just beneath his ear as she laid a hand on his chest and felt his heartbeat hammering into her palm. She didn't kiss his mouth. She didn't want that distraction. Not as she slid between him and the table and dropped to her knees. His eyes went wide. Nesta. She reached for the top of his pants, the bulge already pressing through. Please, she said again, and met his stare. From where she knelt between Cashin's legs, he towered over her, but the edge in his eyes softened almost imperceptibly before he nodded. He reached to help her with the buttons and stays, but she lightly laid a hand atop his. Her fingers were steady, sure, as she unfastened his pants. Her head wholly clear. The muscles in his thighs shifted against her as she pulled him free and nearly gasped. His cock was enormous. Beautiful, and hard, and absolutely enormous. Her mouth dried out, every plan she'd had requiring sudden reassessment. 
there was no way he'd fit entirely in her mouth. Perhaps no way he'd even fit in her body. But she sure as hell wanted to try. Her fingers shook a little as she stroked them down the thick, long shaft. The skin was so soft, softer than silk or velvet. And he was hard as steel beneath. He shuddered, and she lifted her eyes to find his gaze fixed on her hand. How do you like it, she asked, her voice breathy as hot need washed through her. She wrapped her hand around his cock, her fingers barely able to reach around him completely. Gentle. She made a feather-soft pass over him, squeezing lightly. Cassian shook his head, as if beyond words. She stroked him again, slightly harder. Like this. His chest heaved, his teeth shining as he gritted them. But he shook his head. Nesta smiled, and when she pumped him a third time, she squeezed hard, letting her nails graze the sensitive underside of his shaft. His hips arced off the chair, and she pinned a hand to them. I see, she murmured, and did it again. Harder still, twisting her fist as she reached the round head. He tried to arch into her hand, but she pinned him again with that other hand. And this, she purred, head lowering. Do you like this? Nesta licked across his broad head, tongue sliding into the small slit across its tip. She licked up the small bead of moisture already gathered there. Everything in her body turned molten, a surge of wetness slicked between her thighs as the taste of him filled her mouth, salt and something more, something vital. Oh, gods, Cassian panted. And the words, the groan they were born on, were so delicious that Nesta sucked his tip into her mouth and grazed her tongue along its underside. He leaned his head back against the chair, hissing. She licked up his shaft in one long motion. Rubbed her thighs together as she tasted him, felt all that hot, proud steel against her mouth. She licked down the other side, coating him, making it easier for herself as she put her mouth around him again and slid him between her lips. He filled her almost immediately, and she glanced down to discover there was enough of him still exposed that she needed to add her hand. Nesta, he pleaded, and she made another pass at him, pulling him out nearly all the way before swallowing him again, letting her throat relax, desperate for as much of him in her mouth as could fit. Cashin's hand speared into her hair, gripping, and she realized he was holding himself back. Didn't want to ram himself into her, hurt her, displease her. And that wouldn't do. Not at all. She wanted him undone, wanted him grabbing her head and fucking her mouth as hard as he wished. So when Nesta took him into her mouth again, hand working in unison, she dragged her teeth. Lightly enough to hurt, just a bit. Cassian bucked, and she let him, swallowing him down greedily, squeezing him with her hand enough to tell him she wanted this, wanted him to let himself go. She withdrew her lips to the tip of him, rolling her tongue around him, and gazed at him from under her lashes. His eyes were on her, wide and glazed with lust. And when Cassian met her stare, beheld her looking up at him. He unleashed himself. He couldn't take it. It was torture, a special kind of torture, to have Nesta kneeling before him with his cock in her mouth and hand and not be able to roar with pleasure. But then she stared at him through her lashes, and the sight of her with his cock between her lips snapped something. He didn't care that they were in the dining room, that a wall of windows and doors lined half the space and anyone flying by might see. Cassian slid his other hand into her hair, fingers twining into her braided coronet, and he thrust up into her mouth. She took him deep, and moaned so loudly it reverberated along his cock and straight into his balls. They tightened further, and release gathered in his spine, a scorching knot that had him arcing into her mouth again. He was utterly at her mercy. Nesta moaned once more, a soft encouragement, and Cassian needed nothing else. Gripping her hair, her scalp, holding her in place, he thrust his hips. She met him with each stroke, mouth and hand working in unison, until the slick heat of her, the teeth that sometimes grazed him, teased him, the tightness of her fist they were unbearable, were all he cared about. 
Cassian fucked her mouth, and her moaning had him deciding he'd fuck the rest of her, too. Strip those punts off her and drive into her so hard she'd be screaming his name to the ceiling. He made to pull out, but Nesta refused to move. He growled, his fingers clamping on her head to still her. I want to be inside you, he managed to say, his voice like gravel. But Nesta looked up at him again from under her lashes, and he watched his length disappear into her mouth. His tip bumped against the back of her throat. Oh, gods. He clenched his teeth. I want to finish inside you. Nesta only huffed a laugh, and sucked him down so deep that he couldn't stop it. Couldn't stop the release as she slid her other hand into his pants and cupped his balls, squeezing softly. Cassian came with a roar that shook the glasses on the table, arcing up into her as he spilled himself down her throat. She weathered it, weathered him, and when he'd stopped shuddering, she smoothly, gracefully, slid her mouth off him. Nesta held his stare while she swallowed. Swallowed down every ounce of what he'd spilled into her mouth. And then her lips curved upward, a queen triumphant. Cassian panted, not caring that his cock was still out, slick and leaking, only that she was mere inches away and he was going to return this particular favor she'd given him. Nesta rose to her feet, eyes flicking to his cock. The heat in her gaze threatened to burn him, and the scent of her arousal wrapped itself around him and dug its claws in deep. Take off your pants, he growled. Nesta's smile only grew, pure feline amusement. He'd fuck her on this table. Right now. He didn't care about anything else, about the common space they were in or Eris or Briolin or Koshe or the Dread Trove. He needed to be inside her, to feel that hot tightness around him and claim her as she had claimed him. Nesta's fingers slid to the buttons and laces of her pants, and he shook as he watched them free the top button. Steps scuffed down the hall. A warning. From someone who knew how to remain silent. Cassian stiffened, then shoved his aching cock into his pants. Nesta heard the sound and moved a few feet away, refastening that top button. Cassian had just finished setting himself to rights when Osriel strode in. Good evening, his brother said with a grating level of calm, striding toward the table. AZ. Cassian wasn't able to keep the bite out of his tone. He met his brother's too aware stare and silently conveyed every bit of annoyance he felt at his timing. Osriel only shrugged, surveying the food the house had brought him. As if he knew exactly what he'd interrupted and took his chaperone duties very seriously. Nesta was watching them, but as soon as Cassian turned to her, she launched into movement, pushing off the table and aiming for the door. Good night. She didn't wait for him to respond before she was gone. Cassian leveled a glare at AZ thanks for that. I don't know what you're talking about, AZ said, even as he smiled down at his food. Asshole. AZ chuckled. Don't show your hand all at once, Cass. What's that supposed to mean? AZ nodded toward the doorway. Save something for later. Busybody. AZ took a bite. You let her suck your cock in the middle of the dining room. At a table I'm currently using to eat my dinner. I'd say that entitles me to an opinion. Cassian laughed, his earlier gloom chased away. By her. All by her. Fair enough. Chapter. 27. Nesta hadn't the faintest idea how she'd look Cassian in the face the next morning, but Gwyn provided a buffer she was all too eager to use. She met the priestess on the steps up to the training pit, and Gwyn offered her a bright smile. Morning. Morning, Nesta said, falling into step with her. Anything on the trove? Gwyn shook her head. She still wore her robes, though she'd taken to tying back her hair in a tight braid. I even asked Meryl last night. She broke through that glamour, but beyond a few mentions in old texts, she couldn't find anything more than what you already know. Not a hint about when or where they were lost, or who lost them. 
We can't even uncover who last possessed them, since it's information that goes back at least 10,000 years. It was always a shock to remember just how old the Fae were. How old Amran must be, to have remembered the dread trove objects when they were still free in the world. But apparently even Amran had no memory of who'd last used them. Nesta shoved away the thought of the female, and the accompanying cold slice of pain. It might prove an impossible task, Gwyn said, mouth twisting to one side. Is there no other way of finding it? There was. It involved bones and stones. Nesta's body locked up. No, she lied. There's no other way. You're going up to Windhaven. Nesta found herself asking Cassian as Gwyn bade them farewell at the end of their lesson. Gwyn had started on fighting stances that morning, and it had taken enough focus from all of them that Nesta hadn't had a moment to really speak to him alone. There had been one slightly overlong glance when she'd appeared, and that had been it. She had no regrets about what she'd done in the dining room. Even if it had been glaringly obvious that Osriel had known what he was interrupting. But standing here alone with Cassian. The taste of him lingered in her mouth, as if he'd branded himself onto her tongue. She'd lain awake in bed last night thinking of every stroke, every sound he'd made, still feeling the press of his fingers into her head as he'd thrust into her mouth. The memory alone had made her slide a hand between her legs, and she'd needed to find release twice before her body calmed enough to sleep. Cassian plucked his jacket from where he'd left it, shrugging into the black leather and scales. I need to inspect the legions again. Make sure they're preparing for possible conflict and that the recruits are in good shape. Ah. Their eyes met, and she could have sworn his darkened, as if remembering every delicious moment from the night before. But she shook her head, clearing away the cobwebs. Gwyn's doing well, Cassian said, nodding to the archway where the priestess had disappeared. She's a nice girl. Nesta had learned that Gwyn was twenty-eight indeed, just a girl to him. I like her, Nesta admitted. Cassian blinked. I don't think I've ever heard you say that about anyone. She rolled her eyes, but he added, it's too bad the other priestesses won't come. Nesta checked the sign-up sheet every day, but no one else had added their name. Gwyn told Nesta that she'd personally invited a few of the priestesses, but they were too scared, too unsure. I don't know what I can do to encourage them, Nesta said. Keep doing what you're doing. He finished fastening his jacket. A brisk autumn breeze flowed past, bringing with it scents from the city below, bread and cinnamon and oranges, roast meats and salt. Nesta inhaled, identifying each one, wondering how they could all somehow combine to create a singular sense of autumn. Nesta angled her head as an idea struck her. If you're stopping by Windhaven, can you do me a favor? Cassian stood in Emery's shop and made his best attempt at a non-threatening smile as he laid out the contents of the sack he'd carried. Emery peered at what he placed onto her pristine counter. Nesta gave you this. Technically, Nesta had informed him, the house had given it to her. But she'd asked the house for these items, intending them to be brought here. She said it's a gift. Emery picked up a brass tin, pried open the top, and inhaled. The smoky, velvety scent of tea leaves floated out. Oh, this is good stuff. She lifted a glass vial of finely ground powder. When she twisted the lid off, a nutty, spicy scent filled the shop. Come in. Her sigh was like a lover's. She moved to another and another, six glass containers in total. Turmeric, cinnamon, allspice, cloves, and. She peered at the label. Black pepper. Cassian laid the last container on the table, a large marble box that weighed at least two pounds. Emery yanked off the lid and let out a laugh. Salt. She pinched the flaky crystals between her fingers. A lot of salt. Her eyes shone as a rare smile flitted across her face. It made her look younger, wiped away the weight and scars of all those years with her father. Please tell her I say thank you. 
He cleared his throat, remembering the speech Nesta had drilled into him. Nesta says you can thank her by showing up to training tomorrow morning. Emery's smile wavered. I told her the other day, I have no means to attend. She thought you'd say that. If you want to come, send word, and one of us will bring you. It'd have to be Reese, but he doubted his brother would object. If you can't stay the full time, that's fine. Come for an hour, before your shop opens. Emery's fingers fell away from the spices and tea. It's not the right time. Cassian knew better than to push. If you ever change your mind, let us know. He turned from the counter, aiming for the door. He knew Nesta had given the gift in part to tempt Emery to join, but also from the kindness of her heart. He'd asked why she was sending these items, and she'd said, Emery needs spices and good tea. It had stunned him, just as it had stunned him earlier to hear her admit that she liked Gwyn. Nesta around Gwyn was a wholly different creature than who she was with the court. They didn't tease or laugh with each other, but an easiness lay between them that he'd never witnessed, even when Nesta was with Elaine. She'd always been Elaine's guardian, or Faya's sister, or cauldron maid. With Gwyn, he wondered whether Nesta liked the girl because with her, she was simply Nesta. Perhaps she felt that way around Emery, too. Had she gone into Valaris, night after night, not only to distract and numb herself, but to be around people who didn't know the weight of all she carried? Cassian reached the door, blowing out a soft breath. He'd refused to think of what she'd done to him in the dining room while they'd been training, especially with Gwyn there but seeing Nesta's tentative smile as she'd shoved the tea and spices into a bag had him suppressing the urge to push her against the wall and kiss her. He had no idea where things stood with them. If they were back to a favor for a favor. She'd given him no inkling about whether she'd let him into her bed, or if she'd gotten on her knees to knock him out of the brooding he'd fallen into. If she had, it implied some level of caring about his well-being, didn't it? And pity. Fuck, if she'd sucked him because she pitied him. No. It hadn't been that. He'd seen the desire in her eyes, felt the softness of her mouth on his neck in those initial touches. It had been comfort, given in the only way she knew how. Cassian opened the door and looked back, finding Emery still at the counter, her hand resting on the array of spices and tea. Her eyes were solemn, her lips a tight line. She didn't seem aware of his presence, so he took that as his cue to leave and leaped into the skies. Nesta climbed the steps to the training ring, pondering the dread trove. She assumed the others had met with no better luck than she had, and if things were indeed as urgent as Osriel had claimed, then perhaps library research wasn't the best route. But her stomach clenched to weigh the other option, to recall what had occurred the first and only time she'd scried. Her hands shook as she climbed the last of the steps. She squeezed her fingers into fists, blowing out a steady breath through her nose. Cassian already stood in the center of the ring. He grinned as she emerged. It was a wider grin than his usual ones, excited and pleased. Nesta's eyes narrowed as she stepped into the brightness of the ring. Gwyn was already waiting a few feet from Cassian, a smile lighting her own face. And before them, drinking a glass at the water station, stood Emery. Chapter 28 As graceful as Gwyn had been, Emery proved to be equally awkward and unbalanced. It has to do with your wings, Cassian said with such gentleness that Nesta, balancing on one leg and sweeping the other up behind her, nearly fell into the dirt next to Emery. Without full use of your wings, your body compensates for its off-kilter balance in ways like that. He nodded toward the ground-eating spill she'd taken. Gwyn halted her own balancing. Why? The wings usually act as a counterweight. He offered a hand to help Emery rise. They're full of delicate muscles that constantly adjust and steady without us so much as thinking about it. Emery ignored his hand and stood herself. Cassian explained carefully, many of the key muscles can be impacted when someone's wings are clipped. Gwyn glanced to Nesta, 
who tensed, frowning. Gwyn and Emery had fallen into an easy camaraderie within minutes. That could have been due to Gwyn peppering Emery with questions about her shop as they'd gone through the opening exercises. Emery dusted the dirt off the legs of her leathers, looser than the ones Nesta wore, as if she were uncomfortable with the skin-tight norm. Cashin's eyes softened. Which of the healers clipped you? Emery's chin lifted, color stealing across her face. She met his eyes, though, with a level of directness that Nesta could only admire. My father did it himself. Cassian swore, low and nasty. Emery said, voice cold, I fought him, so his work became even sloppier. Gwyn and Nesta kept quiet as Emery stretched out her right wing nearly all the way before it bunched and shuddered. So did Emery's face. I can't extend this one past here. She stretched out the left wing to barely half its length. This is all I can get on this side. Cassian looked like he'd be sick. He deserved to die in that battle. Deserved to die a long time before that, Emery. His siphons glared in answer, and something wild and wicked heated in Nesta's blood at the pure rage in his face, his growling words. Emery folded back her wings. He deserved to die for far more than what he did to my wings. If you're going to come to Valaris every day, I can get Maja up here. She's the court's private healer. Rhys had brought Emery, Nesta had learned. And would return her in an hour. Emery only went stiffer. I appreciate the offer, but it's unnecessary. Cassian opened his mouth, but Nesta interrupted, enough chit-chat. If we only get Emery for an hour today, then walk us through the punching, Cassian. Let her see what she'll need to catch up to. Emery threw her a grateful look, and Nesta offered her a slight smile in return. Cassian nodded, and from the gleam in his eye, she knew he was well aware of why she'd interrupted. Gwyn asked Emery, do you have libraries in Illyria? Another lifeline thrown. No. I've never been in one. The stiffness faded from Emery's posture, word by word. Gwyn retied her shining hair at the nape of her neck. Do you like to read? Emery's mouth curled upward. I live alone, up in the mountains. I have nothing to do with my spare time except work in my garden and read whatever books I order through the mail service. And in the winter, I don't even have the distraction of my gardening. So, yes. I like to read. I cannot survive without reading. Nesta grunted her agreement. What manner of books? Gwyn asked. Romances, Emery said, adjusting her own hair, the thick black braid full of reds and browns in the sunlight. Nesta started. Emery's eyes lit. You too? Which ones? Nesta rattled off her top five, and Emery grinned, so broadly it was like seeing another person. Have you read Sale in Drake's novels? Nesta shook her head. Emery gasped so dramatically that Cassian muttered something about sparing him from smut-obsessed females before heading farther into the ring. You must read her books. You must. I'll bring the first one tomorrow. You'll stay up all night reading it, I swear. Smut? Gwyn asked, catching Cassian's muttered words. There was enough hesitation in her voice to make Nesta draw up straight. Nesta glanced at Emery, realizing the female didn't know about Gwyn, her history, or why the priestesses lived in the library. But Emery asked, what do you read? Adventure, sometimes mysteries. But mostly I have to read whatever Meryl, the priestess I work with, has written that day. Not as exciting as romance, not by a long shot. Emery said casually, I can bring one of Drake's books for you, too, one of her milder ones. An introduction to the wonders of romance. Emery winked at Nesta. Nesta waited for Gwyn to refuse, but the priestess smiled. I'd like that. Reese appeared in the ring precisely when he said he would. One hour no more, no less. Red dirt and sweat covered Emery, 
but her gaze shone bright as she bowed to the High Lord. Gwyn, however, stilled, those large teal eyes looking even more unearthly as they widened. No fear tinged her scent, but rather something like surprise, or. Reese threw her an easy smile, one Nestor would have bet was crafted to put people at ease in his oh so magnificent presence. The casual smile of a male used to people either fleeing in terror or falling to their knees in worship. Hello, Gwyn, he said warmly. Good to see you again. Gwyn blushed, shaking herself out of her stupor, and bowed low. My lord. Nesta rolled her eyes, and found Rhys watching her. That casual smile sharpened as he met her stare. Nesta. Rhys and. The other two women were glancing between them, the bouncing of their stares almost comical. Cassian just strode to Nesta's side and slung an arm around her shoulders before drawling to Reese. these ladies are going to hand your ass to you in combat soon enough. Nesta made to step out from under the heavy, sweaty weight of his arm, but Cassian clamped a too friendly hand on her shoulder, his grin unfaltering. Reese's gaze slid between them, little warmth to be found in his eyes but plenty of wariness. Little Princeling didn't like her with his friend. Nesta leaned into Cassian. Not much, but enough for a trained warrior like Reese to note. A dark, silken hand brushed inside her mind. A request. She debated ignoring it, but found herself opening a small door through the steel, spiked barrier she kept around herself day and night. The door was essentially a peephole, and she allowed what she supposed was the equivalent of her mental face to peer through it to the dark, sparkling plain beyond. What? You are to treat Gwyn with kindness and respect. The thing that stood beyond the fortress of her mind was a creature of claws, scales, and teeth. It was veiled from sight beneath writhing shadows and the occasional passing star glinting in the darkness, but every now and then a glimpse of a wing or a talon shone. Mind your own business. Nesta slammed that small viewing hole shut. She blinked, slowly registering Emery asking Cassian about tomorrow morning's lesson, and what she'd missed today by leaving an hour early. Ryzen's eyes glittered. Cassian's arm remained around Nesta, and his thumb moved over her shoulder in an idle, reassuring caress. Whether he knew of or sensed her silent conversation with his high lord, he didn't let on. Ready? Rhys asked Emery, that kind, lovely smile appearing again. Emery might have blushed. Rhys and had that effect on people. Nesta often wondered how fair could stand it all the people lusting after her mate. Nesta pushed out of Cashin's arm again, and this time he let her. She followed Emery to where she was gathering her heavy cloak. So you'll come back tomorrow? Nesta asked. A glance over her shoulder revealed Gwyn walking to the water station, either to give the two males privacy or from discomfort at being left with them. Guilt pricked at Nesta for that abandonment, and she made a mental note not to allow it to happen again. Gwyn had been fine with Cassian these past days, she did not touch him, and he did not touch her but she hadn't shied from him as she did now. Nesta didn't want to think about why that was, what scars had been etched so deeply in Gwyn that two of the most trustworthy males in this entire land couldn't put her at ease. Recent might be an arrogant, vain bastard, but he was honourable. He fought like hell to protect innocence. Her dislike of him had nothing to do with what he'd proved so many times, he was a fair, just ruler, who put his people before himself. No, she just found his personality, that slick smugness, grating. Emery answered, I'll come back tomorrow. Nesta angled her head. I had no idea tea and spices were that convincing. Emery smiled slightly. It wasn't only the gift, but the reminder of what they mean. What's that? Emery gazed skyward, closing her eyes as an autumn breeze rippled past that there is a world beyond Windhaven. That I am too much of a coward to see it. You're not a coward. You said I was the other day. Nesta winced. I spoke in anger. You spoke truth. 
I stayed awake that night thinking of it. And then you had Cassian deliver the spices and tea and I realized that there is a world out there. A vast, vibrant world. Maybe these lessons will make me a little less scared of it. Nesta offered a tentative smile. Sounds like a good enough reason to me. Cassian watched Reese's face carefully as Nesta and Emery spoke, and Gwyn drifted over to join them. Promises of books to be swapped filled the air. Reese said to him, This is an interesting development. Cassian didn't bother to make his face look pleasant. I could have done without you giving Nesta a mental warning. Reese's brows narrowed. How did you know I did that? The bastard didn't even try to deny it. I noticed the way she tensed. And I know you well, brother. You saw Gwyn and thought the worst of Nesta. She's treated her, and Emery, with kindness. That's what pissed you off. I'm pissed off that you can't seem to believe even one good thing about her. That you refuse to fucking believe one good thing about her. Was it necessary to bait her like that? Regret glimmered in Reese's eyes. Cassian went on, you're not making it easier. Let her build these bonds, and stay the hell out of it. Reese blinked. I'm sorry. I will. Cassian blew out a breath. Reese added, did you really feel you had to put your arm around her shoulders to restrain her? I don't want the two of you within three feet of each other. You have a pregnant mate, Reese. You'll kill anyone that presents a threat to Faya. You're a danger to all of us right now. I'd never harm someone Faya loves. You know that. There was enough tension in the words that Cassian clapped his brother on the shoulder, squeezing the hard muscle beneath. Maybe drop Emery off on the other side of the house tomorrow. Give Nesta some time to sort her shit out. All right. The three females approached them. Reese opened his wings and said to Emery, Shall we? Emery took the hand Reese extended. Yes. She looked to Cassian, then to Nesta, and said, Thank you. Damn if it didn't hit him in the heart, that gratitude and hope in Emery's eyes. Reese gathered her to him, careful of the intimate press of her wings against his body, and shot into the sky. As Reese soared above the house's wards, just before he winnowed to Windhaven, he said to Cassian, I don't know what the fuck the two of you have been doing in this house, but it reeks of sex. Cassian snorted. A polite male never tells. Reese's laughter rumbled in his mind. I don't think you know what the word polite means. Thank the gods for that. His brother laughed again. I told AZ playing chaperone would be useless. Chapter 29 Nesta's legs gave out on step 3000. Panting, sweat running down her back, down her stomach, she braced her hands on her trembling thighs and closed her eyes. The dream had been the same. Her father's face, filled with love and fear, then with nothing as he died. The crack of his neck. Hyben's sly, cruel smile. Cassian and Osriel hadn't been at dinner, and she'd received no explanation for it. They were probably either at the river house or out in the city, and she'd been surprised to find herself wishing for the company. Surprised to find that the silence of the dining room pressed on her. Of course she wouldn't be invited out. She'd made a point to be as unpleasant as possible for well over a year now. And more than that, they had no obligation to include her in everything. No one had any obligation to include her at all. Or the desire to, apparently. Her panting echoed off the red stone. She'd awoken from the nightmare in a cold sweat, and had been halfway here before she realized where she was going. If she even made it to the bottom, where would she go? Especially in her nightgown. She could still see her father behind her closed eyes. Felt every flash of horror and pain and fear she'd endured during those months surrounding the war. She had to find the dread trove, somehow. She'd failed every task they'd ever given her. 
had failed to stop the wall from being blasted apart, failed to save the Illyrian legion from the cauldron's incinerating blow. Nesta shut down that train of thought. Something thudded on the step beside her, and she blinked to find a glass of water. Thank you, she said, drinking deep, letting its coolness settle her further. She asked into the dimness, have you read any books by Sale Lindrake? The house didn't answer, which she assumed amounted to a no. A friend is bringing me one of her novels tomorrow. I'll share it with you when I'm done. Nothing. Then a cool breeze ran down the stairwell, soothing her sweaty brow. Thank you, she said again, leaning into the breeze. Something else clinked beside her on the step, and she found two flat oval stones and three chunks of aged brown bone ankle bones of some ovine beast. Her mouth dried out. Bones and stones, for scrying. I can't, she rasped. That breeze knocked the bones together, they're clicking like a question thrown into the stairwell. Why? Bad things happened the last time. The cauldron looked at me. And took Elaine. She couldn't stop her body from locking up. I can't endure it, risk it. Not even for this. The bones and stones vanished, along with that cooling breeze. Nesta began the ascent, groaning softly. With each step, she could have sworn she tasted disappointment in the air. Nesta has to start looking for the trove, Amran said, swirling her wine in its glass as she sat across from Cassian at the river house's massive dining table. Their monthly court dinner, as usual, had turned into hours of talking around this table, and multiple bottles of wine later, as the clock ticked toward one in the morning, none of them showed any signs of moving. Only Fea had gone to bed. Being pregnant made her unbearably sleepy, she'd groused. So tired that she needed naps throughout the day, and was asleep most nights by nine. Cassian met Amran's grey stare. Nesta's been looking. Don't push her. Reese said from where he lounged at the head of the table, she's had the priestesses researching for her. I'd hardly call that looking. Vian, seated beside Amrin, his arm draped over the back of her seat, asked, you still haven't asked Helion to research the trove in his libraries. Vian was the only person outside of the night court and Eris whom Reese had allowed to know of their search. But it had come with a risk, Vian served Tarquin, High Lord of the Summer Court. Though he had promised Rhys not to say anything about it to Tarquin without prompting, if Tarquin asked Vian about it, he'd find his allegiances held in a precarious balance. Tarquin and Rhys's relationship had healed since the war, but not enough for Rhys to trust the male with knowledge of the trove. And Cassian, who'd gotten into one tiny little fight that might have resulted in one tiny little building being destroyed the last time he'd been in the summer court was inclined to agree. Not about Tarquin. No, he liked the male. And liked Vian a great deal. But there were wicked people in the summer court, in every court, and he did not trust that they were as kind as their ruler. Halion is a last resort, Reese said, sipping his wine which we may come to in a matter of days if Nesta does not at least attempt a scrying. The last words were directed toward Cassian. I'd have Elaine try her hand before we approach him, though. Elaine had already departed with Feya, claiming she had to be up with the dawn to tend to an elderly fairy's garden. Cassian didn't exactly know why he suspected this wasn't true. There had been some tightness in Elaine's face as she'd said it. Normally when she made such excuses, Lucian was around, but the male remained in the human lands with Jurian and Vassa. Cassian countered, Nesta will do it, if only to keep Elaine from putting herself at risk. But you have to understand that Nesta was deeply affected by what happened during the war Elaine was taken by the cauldron after she scried. You can't blame her for hesitating. Amran said, we do not have the time to wait for Nesta to decide. I say we approach Elaine tomorrow. Better to have both of them working on it. Osriel stiffened, an outright sign of temper from him as he said quietly, there is an innate darkness to the dread trove that Elaine should not be exposed to. But Nesta should. Cassian growled. Everyone stared at him. 
He swallowed, offering an apologetic glance to AZ, who shrugged it off. Amran drained her wine and said to Cassian, Nesta has a week. One more week to find the trove with her own methods. Then we seek out other routes. She threw a nod toward Osriel. Including Elaine, who is more than capable of defending herself against the darkness of the trove, if she chooses to. Don't underestimate her. Cassian and Osriel looked to Reese, who merely sipped from his own wine. Amran's order held. As Reese is second in this court, short of Reese overruling her, her word was law. Cassian glowered at Amran. It's not right to wield Elaine as a threat to manipulate Nesta into scrying. There are harsher ways to convince Nesta, boy. Cassian leaned back in his chair. You're a fool if you think threats will make her obey you. Everyone tensed again. Even Varian. Amran's lips spread in a sharp grin. We are on the cusp of another war. We let the cauldron slip from our hands in the last one and it nearly cost us everything. Amran's new fey form was proof of that she'd yielded her immortal, otherworldly self to remain in this body. No grey fire glowed in her eyes. She was mortal, in the way that high fey were mortal. Varian's fingers tangled in the blunt ends of her hair, as if to reassure himself that she was here, she'd remained with him. We must head off this potential disaster before we lose the advantage. If we need to manipulate Nesta into scrying, even by using Elaine against her, then we'll do what is necessary. His stomach tightened. I don't like it. You don't have to like it, Amran said. You just have to shut up and do as you're told. Amran, Reese said, the word laced with reprimand and warning. Amran didn't so much as blink in remorse, but Varian frowned at her. What? she snapped. The Prince of Adriata gave her an exasperated smile. Haven't we talked about this? About, being nice? Amran rolled her eyes. But her face softened ever so slightly as she met Cashin's stare again. A week. Nesta gets a week. Three days passed. Emery came to each lesson, and while Gwyn had mostly caught up to Nesta's progress, Emery would need more work. So Nesta and Gwyn partnered with each other, going through the sets of exercises that Cassian showed them before he worked one-on-one -on -one with Emery on her balance and mobility. None of them minded, not when Emery had been right about the Sail Lynn Drake books. Nesta had stayed up two nights in a row reading the author's first novel, which was as toe-curlingly erotic as she could have wished. And, as promised, Emery had brought a copy of one of Drake's tamer novels for Gwyn, who had arrived blushing the next morning and told Emery that if the book was considered tame, then she could only imagine the content of the others. After that first day, Emery stayed for the entire length of their lessons, which had now officially stretched into a full three hours, deciding that her morning business traffic was slow enough to risk it. So they trained, and between their exercises they talked about books, and Nesta woke on the fourth morning and found herself, excited to see them again. She was shelving a tome in the library that afternoon when Gwyn found her. Thanks to Gwyn's lesson each morning, she'd been busier in the afternoons, which meant that Nesta rarely saw her in the library save for when Gwyn was running through the stacks, hunting for some book or another for Meryl. Occasionally, Nesta heard a lovely, soaring snippet of song from some distant corner of the library, the sole indicator that Gwyn was near. But that afternoon, it was Gwyn's panting that announced her presence seconds before she appeared, her eyes wide enough that Nesta went on alert, scanning the dimness behind the priestess. What? Had the darkness below chased her? Gwyn mastered herself enough to say, I don't know how, but Meryl learned you swapped the book out. She gasped for air as she pointed up to a level high above. You should go. Nesta frowned. Who cares? I'm not going to let her scare me off like some errant child. Gwyn blanched. When she's in a fury, it is. It is what, Gwyneth Badara, crooned a female voice from the stacks. When I'm in a fury, it is what? Gwyn winced, turning slowly as the white-haired beauty appeared from the gloom. 
Her pale robes flowed behind her as if on a phantom wind, and the blue stone atop her hood flickered with light. Gwyn bowed her head, face paling. I meant nothing by it, Meryl. Nesta ground her teeth at the bow, the fear on Gwyn's face, in her soft words. Priestesses halted along the railings above them. Meryl turned her remarkable eyes to Nesta. I do not appreciate thieves and liars. Neither do I, Nesta said coolly, lifting her chin. Meryl hissed. You tried to play me for a fool in my very own office. She didn't so much as look at Gwyn, who cringed away. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh? You mean when I went to see the book that my inane assistant had incorrectly given me, oh, yes, I knew about that from the start and found the proper volume instead, with your scent upon it, it wasn't you who did it. Meryl looked between Gwyn and Nesta. It is inexcusable to ask others to make up for your own stupidity and carelessness. Gwyn's fear grated against her senses. Nesta said, voice dropping, Gwyn did no such thing. And who cares? Are you so bored down here that you have to invent these dramas to entertain yourself? She waved a hand to the open walkway behind Meryl. We're both busy. Clear off and let us work in peace. Someone gasped on a level above. Meryl laughed, that phantom wind around her whispering. Do you not know who I am, girl? I know that you are keeping us from our work, Nesta said with that flat calm she knew made people irate. And I know that this is a library, but you hoard books like it is your own personal collection. Meryl bared her teeth. You think I do not know you? The human girl who was shoved into the cauldron and came out high fay. The female who slew the king of Hyben and held up his head like a trophy as his blood rained upon her. Surprise lit Gwyn's face at the graphic description. Nesta didn't allow herself to so much as swallow. The wind whispers to me even here, under so much stone, Meryl said. It finds its way in through the cracks and murmurs the goings-on of the world in my ear. Meryl snorted. Do you think you are entitled to do as you please now? Nesta's power rumbled in her veins. She stomped on it, shoved it down and strangled it. I think you like to hear yourself talk too much. I am descended from Rabath, Lord of the Western Wind, Meryl seethed. Unlike Gwyneth Badara, I am no lucky to be dismissed. To hell with this witch. To hell with restraint and hiding. Nesta let enough of her power simmer to the surface that she knew her own eyes glowed. Let it crackle, even as she ignored its wild, unholy bellowing. Gwyn had backed away a step. Even Meryl blinked as Nesta said, with a fancy title like that, surely such a petty grudge should be beneath you. Nesta smiled, savage and cruel. Meryl only glanced between her and Gwyn before saying, get back to your work, nymph. Wind snapping at her heels, Meryl stalked into the gloom. Nesta dropped the thread of her power, quelling its music and roaring with an iron hand. But it wasn't until Meryl's brisk wind faded that Gwyn leaned against a stack, rubbing her hands over her face. The priestesses who'd been watching launched into movement again, their whispering filling the library. Nesta asked into the rustling quiet, Nymph. Gwyn lowered her hands, noted the lack of glowing power in Nesta's eyes, and sighed in relief. But her voice remained casual. My grandmother was a river nymph who seduced a high fey male from the autumn court. So I'm a quarter nymph, but it's enough for this. Gwyn gestured to her large eyes, blue so clear it could have been the shallow sea and her lithe body. My bones are slightly more pliant than ordinary high fays, but who cares about that? Perhaps that was why Gwyn was so good at the balancing and movement. Gwyn went on, my mother was unwanted by either of their people. She could not dwell in the rivers of the spring court, but was too untamed to endure the confinement of the forest house of autumn. So she was given in her childhood to the temple at Sangrava, where she was raised. She partook in the great rite when she was of age, and I, we, my sister and I, I mean, were the result of that sacred union with a male stranger. She never found out who he was, 
for the magic chose him that night, and no one ever showed up to ask about twin girls. We were raised in the temple as well. I never left its grounds until, until I came here. Such pain filled Gwyn's eyes then. Such terrible pain that Nesta knew not to ask about her mother, or the twin sister. Gwyn shook her head, as if dispelling the memory. She spread her fingers. My twin had the webbed fingers of the nymphs I don't. Had. Again, Gwyn sighed. Meryl will make your life a living hell, you know. She can try, Nesta said mildly. It'd be difficult to make it any worse. Well, now we have a common enemy. Meryl will never forget this. She nodded toward the railings where the priestesses had been. Though I suppose they won't, either. It's not every day someone stands up to her. Only Clotho can really make her fall in line, but Clotho lets her have her way, mostly because Meryl throws those windy tantrums that can send everyone's manuscripts scattering. Anytime you need someone to knock Meryl down a few pegs, let me know. Gwyn smiled slightly. Next time, perhaps I'll have the courage to do it myself. It seemed the priestesses didn't forget what Nesta had done. Nesta, Gwyn, and Emery were going through their opening stretches, Cassie and Stone-faced and eagle-eyed to catch any mistake, when footsteps scuffed in the archway beyond the pit. They all paused at the three hooded figures who emerged, hands clasped so tightly that their knuckles were white. But the priestesses stepped into the sunlight, the open air. Blinked up at it, as if remembering what such things were. Gwyn nimbly rolled to her feet, grinning so broadly that Nesta was momentarily taken aback by it. The priestess had been pretty in the library, but with that joy, that confidence as she aimed for the three priestesses, she had emerged into a beauty to rival Meryl or more. Or maybe nothing had changed at all beyond that confidence, the way Gwyn's shoulders were pushed back, her head high, her smile free as she said, Roslyn. Deirdre. Ananke. I was hoping you'd come. Nesta hadn't checked the sign-up sheet that morning. Had stopped believing anyone except Gwyn would ever come to training. But the three of them huddled together as Cassian offered a casual smile that was nearly a replica of Reese's. Designed to put people at ease and lessen the threat of his power, his body. Ladies, he said, gesturing to the ring. Welcome. Roslyn and Ananke said nothing, but the one in the middle, Deirdre, tugged back her hood. Nesta clamped down on every instinct that would have had her gasping. Emery, on the mat beside her, seemed to be trying to do the same. A long, vicious scar cut across Deirdre's face, narrowly missing her left eye. It was raised, stark white against her brown skin, and flowed from her tightly curling black hair to her slender, lovely jaw. Her round dark eyes, framed by a thick sweep of lashes that made them seem even rounder, were wide but determined as she said, we hope we are not too late. All of them looked to Nesta. But she wasn't the leader here. She threw Cassie in a glance, and he gave her a shrug as if to say, I'm just the instructor. Another scar flowed down Deirdre's neck, disappearing beneath her robe. For such scars to exist on a high fay at all suggested an event of such violence, such horror, that Nesta's stomach clenched. But she stepped toward the priestess. We were just starting. Give me those stones and bones, please, Nesta said quietly to the house as she sat in the private library, a map of all seven courts before her, Cassian a step behind her. A small earthenware bowl appeared beside the map, filled with them. Nesta swallowed against the dryness in her mouth. Cassian whistled. It really does listen to you. She peered over a shoulder. She'd invited him here after she'd returned from working in the library out of pure caution, she told herself. If she lost control, if she wasn't able to witness where her finger landed on the map, someone had to be here. That person just so happened to be him. Never mind that he'd once stood beside her, his hand upon her back as it was now, and let her lean into his warmth and strength. Cassian glanced between the bowl of scrying instruments and the map. Why did you change your mind? 
Nesta didn't give herself time to hesitate before she slid her fingers into the bowl and scooped up the handful of stones and bones. They clinked against each other, hollow and ancient. I couldn't stop thinking about those priestesses who came to practice today. Roslyn said she hadn't set foot outside in sixty years. And Deirdre, with those scars. She took a long breath. I am asking them to be brave, to work hard, to face their fears. Yet I'm not doing the same. No one accused you of that. I don't need anyone to say it. I know it. And I might fear this scrying, but I fear being a cowardly hypocrite even more. The priestesses had been novices in every sense of the word, and Anki had such terrible balance she'd fallen over trying to plant her toes in the dirt. Roslyn had been only a fraction better. Neither had removed their hoods, not as Deirdre had done but Nesta had caught glimpses of wine-red hair on Roslyn and golden hair on Ananki, their skin pale as cream. Cassian said, you sure you don't want to do this with Rhys and Amran around? Nesta squeezed the bones and stones in her fist. I don't need them. He fell silent, letting her concentrate. It had taken a few moments the first and only time she'd done it. To let her mind go empty, to wait for that tug through her body that had hauled her toward an unseen force. She'd been whipped across the earth, and when she'd opened her eyes, she'd been standing in a war tent, the king of Hyben before her, the cauldron a squatting, dark mass beyond. Nesta closed her eyes, willing her mind to quiet as she lifted her tight fist over the map. She focused upon her breathing, upon the rhythm of Cashin's breathing. Her swallow was loud to her ears. She'd failed at everything. But she could do this. She'd failed her father, failed Faya for years before that. Failed her mother, she supposed. And with Elaine, she'd failed as well, first in letting her get taken by Hyben that night they'd been stolen from their beds, then by letting her go into that cauldron. Then when the cauldron had taken her into the heart of Hyben's camp. She'd failed and failed and failed, and there was no end to it, no end. Anything? Don't talk. Cassian grunted, but sidled closer, his warmth now solidly at her side. Nesta willed her mind to empty. But it couldn't. It was like being in that damned stairwell, she just circled around and around and around, down and down. The Dread Trove. She had to find the Dread Trove. The mask, the harp, the crown. But the other thoughts pressed in. Too many. The mask, she strained to think. Where is the mask of the dread trove? Her palm slickened with sweat, the stones and bones shifting in her fist. If the mask was aware like the cauldron had been. She couldn't let it see her. Find what she loved most. Couldn't let it see her, find her hurt her. The mask, she willed the stones and bones. Find the mask. Nothing answered. No tug, no whisper of power. She exhaled through her nostrils. The mask, she willed them. There was nothing. Her heart thundered, but she tried again. A different route. Thought of their common origin, the one she and the trove shared. The cauldron. Yawning emptiness answered. Nesta furrowed her brow, clenching the items harder. Pictured the cauldron, the vast bowl of darkest iron, so large multiple people could have used it as a bathtub. It had a physical shape, yet when that icy water had swallowed her, there had been no bottom. Just a chasm of freezing water that had soon become utter darkness. The thing that had existed before light the cradle from which all life had come. Sweat beaded on her brow, as if her very body rebelled against the memory, but she made herself recall how it had sat in the king of Hyben's war tent, squatting atop the reeds and rugs, a primordial beast that had been half asleep when she'd entered. And then it had opened an eye. Not one she could see, but one that she could feel fixed on her. It had widened as it realized who stood there, the female who had taken so much, too much. It had narrowed all of its deathless power, its rage, upon her, 
a cat trapping a mouse with its paw. Her hand shook. Nesta? She couldn't breathe. Nesta. She couldn't endure it, the memory of that ancient horror and fury. She opened her eyes. I can't, she rasped. I can't. The power, I don't think I have it anymore. It's there. I've seen it in your eyes, felt it in my bones. Try again. She couldn't summon it. Couldn't face it. I can't. She dropped the stones and bones into their dish. She couldn't endure the disappointment in Cashin's voice, either, as he said, all right. She didn't eat dinner with him. Didn't do anything except crawl into her bed and stare up at the darkness, and free fall into it. It was searching for her. Winding through the hallways of the house, wending like a dark snake, it searched and sniffed and hunted for her. She couldn't move from her bed. Couldn't open her eyes to sound the alarm, to flee. She felt it come closer, crawling up the stairs. Down her hallway. She couldn't move her body. Couldn't open her eyes. Darkness slid through the crack between her door and the stone floor. No, it couldn't have found her. It would catch her this time, hold her down on this bed and rip from her everything she had taken from it. The darkness slithered to her bed, and she forced her eyes open to see it gather over her, a cloud with no shape, no form, but such wicked presence that she knew its name before it leaped. She screamed as the cauldron's darkness pinned her to the bed, and then there was nothing but the horrible weight of it filling her body, tearing her apart from the inside out. And then nothing. Cassian jolted awake and reached for the knife on his nightstand. He didn't know why. He'd had no nightmare, heard no sound. Yet terror and dread sluiced through him, ratcheting up his heartbeat. The lone siphon on his hand glowed like fresh blood, as if also seeking an enemy to strike. Nothing. But the air had gone cold as ice. So cold his breath clouded, and then the lamps flared to life. Flared and flickered, flashing, as if desperately signalling to him. As if the house were begging him to run. He vaulted from the bed, and the door opened before he could careen into it. Launching into the hall, knife in hand, he didn't care that he was in his undershorts, or that he only had one siphon. AZ's door flung open a heartbeat later, and his brother's steps closed in behind him as Cassian hit the stairs and raced down them. He'd reached the landing of Nesta's level when she screamed. Not a scream of rage, but of pure terror. His body distilled at that scream, as if it were no more than the knife in his hand, a weapon to be used to eliminate and destroy any threats to her, to kill and kill and not stop until every last enemy was dead or bleeding. Her door was open, and light blazed from within. Silvery, cold light. Cassian, AZ warned, but Cassian pushed himself faster, running as swiftly as he ever had in his life. He slammed into the archway of her door, rebounding off it and into the room, and came up short at what he beheld. Nesta lay in her bed, body arched. Bathed in silver fire. She was screaming, hands ripping at the sheets, and that fire burned and burned without destroying the blankets, the room. Burned and writhed, as if devouring her. Holy gods, Osriel breathed. The fire radiated cold. Cassian had never heard of such a power amongst the High Fae. Fire, yes, but fire with warmth. Not this icy, terrible twin. Nesta arched again, sobbing through her teeth. Cassian lunged for her, but Osriel grabbed him around the middle. He snarled, debating whether he could rip out of Osriel's arms, but the hold Azid had on him was too clever. Nesta screamed again, and a word appeared in it. No. She began shouting it, pleading, no, no, no. Nesta arched once more, and that fire sucked in, as if a great inhale had been made, and was about to be exhaled, rupturing through the world. The windows of the room blew out. Night burst in, 
full of shadows and wind and stars. And as Nesta erupted, silver fire blasting outward, Reese pounced. He smothered her fire with his darkness, as if he'd dropped a blanket on it. Nesta screamed, and this time it was a sound of pain. The night cleared enough that Cassian could see Reese at the bed, roaring something that the wind and fire and stars drowned out. But from his lips, Cassian knew it was her name. Nesta! Reese shouted. The wind cleared enough for Cassian to hear this time. Nesta! This is a dream! Nesta's fire reared again, and Reese shoved a wave of blackness upon her. The entire house shook. Cassian thrashed against Osriel, bellowing at Reese to stop it, stop hurting her. Reese's darkness pushed down, and Nesta's flame battled upward, as if their two powers were swords clashing in battle, fighting for the advantage. Dominance thundered in Reese's words this time. Wake up. It's a dream. Wake up. Nesta still fought, and Reese gritted his teeth, power gathering again. Let me go, Cassian said to Osriel. AZ, let me go right now. Osriel, to his surprise, did. Cassian knew the odds were against him. He had a knife and one siphon. To get caught in the magic between Nesta and Reese would be akin to entering a lion's den unarmed. But he walked to where Silver Fire and Darkest Night battled. And he said with steady calm, Nesta. The silver fire flickered. Nesta. He could have sworn her consciousness, that power, shifted toward him. Just long enough. The wave of Reese's power that hit her wasn't the brute attack of earlier, but a soft wave that washed over that flame. Banked it. Reese went still in a way that told Cassie and his brother was no longer fully present, but rather in the mind of the female who had gone unmoving upon the bed. He'd rarely thought twice about Reese's gifts as a demity, Fair's gift, too, but he'd never been more grateful for it. Cassian barely dared to breathe. Osriel hovered behind him as Reese stood before the bed. Slowly, that flame receded. Vanished like smoke. Slowly, Nesta's body relaxed. And then her breathing evened out, her body going limp. Blissfully unconscious. Cassian swallowed, his heart pounding so hard he knew Osriel could hear it as his brother came up beside him. Then Reese inhaled sharply, his body full of movement again. Osriel asked, his own shadows gathering at his shoulders, what happened? But Reese just walked to the little sitting area and slumped into a chair. The High Lord's hands were shaking, trembling so wildly that Cassian had no idea what to do. From the worry etched on Osriel's face, Neither did his brother. Cassian asked, Should we send for Faya? No. The word was a snarl. Reese's eyes flared like violet stars. She doesn't come near here. Was that? Osriel glanced to the bed and the unconscious female atop it. That was Nesta's true power? That silver fire. Only the surface of it, Reese whispered hands still shaking as he ran them down his face. Fuck. Cassian braced his feet, as if he could physically intercept whatever Reese was about to say. I went into her nightmare. Reese peered up at Cassian. Why didn't you tell me you attempted a scrying today? It didn't work. And Nesta's fear and guilt had been so heavy in the room that his chest had ached. He'd left her alone afterward, knowing she'd want privacy. Reese blew out a shuddering breath. The scrying was a trip wire. For the memories. I caught that as I went in. His throat worked, as if he'd heave, but he held it down. She was dreaming of the cauldron. Of, of when she went in. Cassian had never seen Reese at such a loss for words. I saw it, Reese whispered. Felt it. Everything that happened within the cauldron. Saw her take its power with her teeth and claws and rage. And I saw, felt, what it took from her. Reese rubbed his face, and slowly straightened. He met Cassian's stare unflinchingly, 
his eyes full of remorse and agony. Her trauma is. Reese's throat bobbed. I know, Cassian whispered. I guessed, Reese breathed, but it was different to feel it. What is her power? Osriel asked. Death, Reese whispered, hands trembling again as he got to his feet and aimed toward the window, which was now repairing itself shard by shard, as if a careful, patient hand worked upon it. He gazed at the female sleeping in the bed, and fear clouded the face of the High Lord of the Night Court. Pure Death Chapter 30 The dream had been real and not real, and there had been no end to it, no escape. Until a familiar male voice had said her name. And the terror had stopped, as if the axis of the world had shifted toward that voice. That voice, which became a doorway, full of light and strength. Nesta had reached a hand toward it. And then there had been another male voice in her mind, and this one had been familiar as well, and full of power. But it had been kind, in a way she had never heard the voice be to her, and it had eased her from the black pit of the dream, leading her with a star-flecked hand back to a land of drifting clouds and rolling hills under a bright moon. She had curled up on one of those hills, safe and guarded in the moonlight, and slept. Nesta dozed, heavy and dreamless, and did not open her eyes until sunlight, not moonlight, kissed her face. She was in her room, the sheets askew and half spilled on the floor, but Cassian was sleeping in a chair beside her bed. His head was at an awkward angle, and his wings drooped onto the stone and he was wearing only his undershorts and a blanket that looked as if someone had draped it over his lap. It had been a nightmare, she realized with a cold splash of awareness. She'd dreamed of the cauldron, she'd been lost in it, screaming and screaming. And it had been his voice she'd heard. His voice Anne. There was no sign of Resand. Just Cassian. She stared at him for long minutes, the unusual paleness of his face, the brow still scrunched with worry, as if he fretted for her even in his sleep. The sun gilded his dark hair and shone through his wings, bringing out the undertones of reds and golds in both. Like a knight guarding his lady. She couldn't stop the image, sprung from the pages of her childhood books. Like a warrior prince, with those tattoos and that muscle-bound chest. Her throat tightened unbearably, her eyes stinging. She would not let herself cry, not for herself or for the sight of him keeping watch beside her bed all night. But it was as if her furious blinking woke him, as if he could hear the flutter of her lashes. His hazel eyes shot to hers, like he always knew precisely where she was. And they were so full of worry, of that unrelenting goodness, that she had to fight like hell to keep the tears from falling. Cassian said gently, hey. She clamped down on herself. Hello. Are you all right? Yes. No. Though not for the reason he believed. Good. He groaned, stretching, first his arms and then his wings. Muscles rippled. You want to talk about it? No. That's fine. And that was that. But Cassian threw her a half smile, and it was so normal, so him in a way that no one else was or would ever be, that her throat tightened again. You want breakfast? Nesta managed to answer his half-smile with one of her own. I like your priorities, General. What happened to you? Emery asked as they panted through their abdominal exercises. You look white as death. Bad dreams, Nesta said, willing herself not to look to where Cassian stood, instructing Roslyn from a respectful distance on how to do a proper squat. They'd had a quiet breakfast, but it hadn't been awkward. It had been comfortable, easy. Pleasant. Gwyn asked, on Nesta's other side, do you have them often? Yes. Nesta finished a sit-up, grunting through the weakness in her middle. Me too, Gwyn said quietly. Some nights, I need a sleeping potion from our healer to knock me out. Emery gave Gwyn an assessing look. Emery never asked about Gwyn's past, 
or the histories of the other priestesses, but she was a cunning female. Surely she'd seen the way they kept a healthy distance from Cassian, scented their hesitation and fear, and put a few things together. Emery asked Nesta, what did you dream about? Nesta's body locked up, but she launched back into motion, refusing to let the memories master her. I dreamed of the cauldron. What it did to me. Gwyn said, playing with her hair, I dream of my past, too. But Gwyn's admission, Nesta's own, didn't weigh them down. Nesta's head had cleared slightly. And somehow, she found she could push herself harder. Perhaps in voicing those truths, they'd given them wings. And sent them soaring into the open sky above. How are you holding up? Cassian sat across from Reese's desk at the river house, an ankle resting on a knee, and asked, me. How about you? You look like hell. Yesterday was a rough day, followed by a rough night. Reese rested his head atop a propped fist on his desk. Cassian angled his head. What happened before the disaster that was last night? Gods, he'd nearly wept this morning to open his eyes and find Nesta staring at him, her face clear and free of pain. The shadow still lingered, yes, but he'd take anything over her screaming. Over that magic Reese could only explain as pure death. When Reese didn't answer, Cassian said, Reese. Reese didn't look at him as he whispered, The baby has wings. Joy sparked through Cassian even as the broken whisper and what those words meant made his blood go cold. You're sure? We had an appointment with Maja yesterday morning. But he's only a quarter Illyrian. It was possible, of course, for the baby to have inherited wings, but unlikely, given that Reese himself had been born without them, and only conjured them through whatever strange, unearthly magic he possessed. He is. But Feyre was in an Illyrian form when he was conceived. That can make a difference. I thought she only made the wings, nothing else. She shapeshifts. She transforms her entire self into the form she takes. When she grants herself wings, she essentially alters her body at its most intrinsic level. So she was fully Illyrian that night. She doesn't have the wings now. No. She shifted back before we knew. So let her change back into an Illyrian to bear the babe. Reese's face was stark. Maja has put a ban on any more shape-shifting. She says that to alter Feyre's body in any way right now could put the baby at risk. On the chance that it could be bad for the baby, Feyre is forbidden to so much as change the color of her hair until after the birth. Cassian raked a hand through his hair. I see. But, Reese, it'll be all right. It's not that bad. Reese snarled. It is bad. For so many God's damned reasons, it is fucking bad. Reese was as close to being beside himself as Cassian had seen him since he'd returned from Amarantha's court. Breathe, Cassian said calmly. Reese's eyes simmered, the stars within them winked out. Fuck you. Take a breath. Reese and. Cassian gestured to the window behind him, the lawn sloping down to the river. You want to go fight it out, I've got energy to burn. The study doors opened, and Osriel walked in. From the grim expression etched on his face, he already knew. Osriel claimed the seat beside Cassian. Tell us what you need, Reese. Nothing. I need to not fall apart so my mate doesn't pick up a whiff of this when she comes home for lunch. Reese narrowed his eyes, and power rumbled in the room. No one says a word about this to Faya. No one. Didn't Maja warn her? Osriel asked. Not strongly. She only mentioned an elevated risk during labor. Reese let out a harsh laugh. An elevated risk. Cashin's stomach twisted. Osriel said, I know this is bad timing, but there is another thing to consider, Reese. Reese lifted his head again. Osriel's face was like stone. Faya won't show for another few weeks, 
but someone will notice soon enough. People will learn of her pregnancy. I know. Eris will learn. He's our ally. I suspect he'll be focused more on dealing with his father and finding his missing soldiers than on this. Then Azed went for the throat. And Tamlin will learn. Rhesus Snarl set the lights guttering. And Cassian shot Osriel a warning glare, but Azed said, unafraid and unbowed, we need to be prepared for any fallout. Like I give a fuck about Tamlin right now. That Rhys couldn't understand what Azed meant told Cassian how distraught and terrified he was. Cassian tried to mimic Azed's calm tone. He may react badly. He sets foot over this border and he dies. I don't doubt that, Cassian said. But Tamlin is already hanging by a thread. You and Lucian have made it clear that he's barely improved this past year. Learning of Feyre's pregnancy might make him crumble again. With a new war possible and Brylin up to her bullshit with Koshe, we need a strong ally. We need the Spring Court's forces. So where to hide her pregnancy from him? No. But we need to summon Lucian, Osriel said, just a shade tightly, as if he didn't like it one bit. We need to tell him the news, and permanently station him at the Spring Court to contain any damage and to be our eyes and ears. Silence. They let the words sink in for Reese. The idea of coddling Tamlin makes me want to shatter that window, Reese said, but it was with enough of a grumble that Cassian nearly sagged in relief. At least that sharp edge of violence had been dulled. Just a fraction. I'll contact Lucian, Osriel offered. Fear still lingered in Reese's eyes, so Cassian walked around the desk and hauled his high lord to his feet. Reese let him. Cassian slung an arm around Reese's shoulders. Let's go get blooded up. 